Yes, sir. We are live now. My dear esteemed colleagues and dear friends from Pan India who have joined this program virtually, a very hearty welcome to the second day and the penultimate day of the NUCD 9th edition. Dear friends, to recap yesterday's, I'll take only one minute to say that yesterday's program centered around seven sessions were fabulous. We had discussed regarding the nutritional management of type 2 diabetes mellitus, focusing on the comprehensive weight management. Manisha, we had a full session on the renal diet by Rudrashish. We had a session on the protein in diabetic diet. The next two sessions were new concepts in diabetes. We discussed six new concepts, remission and reversal, re-reversal by Mohan, the foster control matters by myself, and the mind, body, medicine, and diabetes by Sanjay Kalra. In the second, we, we, we discussed three more concepts, sarcopenia, the newer, uh, the, the, the newer clusters in, in, in uh, type 2 diabetes in India by Anjana, sarcopenia by Rajesh Rajput, and the Nafeld by, by Dr. Uh, Shibram. We then passed on to a session, a very, very important session, on the on the oral drugs and before that we had a session on the concept of monitoring we can only change what we measure john gave a fabulous presentation on the tir cgms followed by hb1c versus tir by no less a person than professor sk sarma from jaipur and also he spoke also on the structured uh, cell monitoring blood glucose then we had a session on the interchangeable insulin Following that, we had a full session on oral hypoglycemic drugs, starting with Vilda, followed by metformin in pre-diabetes. Fantastic talk by Dr. J.J. Mukherjee. We had a talk on the, on the, the evidences for dapagliflozin. Fantastic session. And also, re-emergence of sulfonuria by Kalyanda from Calcutta. Last, we passed on to a session on the insulin, where we discussed regarding the co-formulation we discussed regarding the oral semaglutide in detail and also the hospital based management of hyperglycemia with Degludec, a, a, a game changer and new evidence presented by, by it, 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 a great talk by, by Dr. Somik Ghosh. Dear friends, while we pass today, I must tell you that we have very important sessions today, observing session, clinical practical sessions. Today, first session we start as John just now pointed out, we have two consecutive sessions the complications. Diabetes sweet disease with sour company and the morbidities are very important to discuss. So we'll start up the discussion on the CKD. And you know, I have a person for you who is fabulous. She will introduce herself through her talk, Manisha. Absolutely fabulous regarding the CKD in diabetes. Followed by, we, 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 we have talk on a very new system by a person whom you know, who all of us adore because of his devotion to his speciality. He gave the oration recently, Vidyut, my dear friend. I'm calling my first name Vidyut, you are so angered to me. And yes. musculoskeletal system in diabetes, a new, fabulously new topic. And 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 followed that by by the by the on the on the uh, on the on the sexual dysfunction diabetes by no less a person than Deepak Jumani. We pass on after this to, to a very important session on the technology. And we have brought for you today, dear friends, the automated insulin delivery system, AIDS, which introduced last year. And Dr. Sambit Das, Professor Sambit Das will speak about it, followed by our very dear friend Jyoti, the head of technical division of the RSSDI. He will be addressing us on the smart insulin pens, followed by CGMS by no less a person that are dear, very, very dear Dr. Bansi Sabo. Dear friends, the next session will be very exciting on the autoimmunity and diabetes. We'll, we'll start off with a talk by no less a person than the, than, 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 than the presiding officer of all that you are seeing, Professor Dr. Alok Kanungo. He had worked extensively on the ladder 
his PhD also on the young diabetics and ladder. And uh, I had requested him to speak on his topic. He was speaking on the ladder, followed by the by the autoimmunity and 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 and, and type one diabetes by CB Sanjeevi from from Stockholm, from the Karolinska Stockholm. And uh, and you know it is it's it, it's it's a, it's a it's a great talk by Sanjeevi and followed by we have for you a gentleman from Kanpur, whom all of you know, who is called the king of clinical type 1 diabetes. Largest population of type 1 diabetes in the country. Rishi, my dear friend, Professor Dr. Rishi Shikla from Kanpur, he is going to speak to us on the clinical aspects of managing type 1 diabetes in our country. Dear friend, following that, we have a very exciting session. The dual GLP and the GIP agonist decrease appetite in diabetes mellitus is absolutely a new talk, a topic which has hitherto not been discussed in detail. And we have from United States, our dear friend, Dr. Debji Tripathi, to do justice to this, the dual combination and decrease appetite and its clinical positioning in, in diabetology. He is an authority on that. Followed by a talk on the PCOD, polycystic ovary disease, by our dear friend Dr. Jargar, and next followed by the by by by, by Dr. Nikhil Tandon, Padamsi, Dr. Nikhil Tandon from Ames, Delhi, on a on a topic, the long term outcome of GDM. Following this, we have four independent lectures, and the independent lectures center around the CV benefit and CV prevention by DPP four SGLT two combination. We we have the treatment with GTO vessel insulin by, by dear Arundhati who will be joining us from the Brugat, followed by the, 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 the drugs by, by our own Dr. Avay Shao speaking to us regarding the basal insulin therapy. And that's the program for the today. Dear friends, it's my great opportunity, privilege to hand over the session to, to Professor Dr. Jain, Tripat, Jain Panda, who is the uh, head of the Department of Medicine and Diabetology at the Civil College Cutter. And without taking any more time, I just request all of you to, to listen to the topic relaxedly. We have got set questions because, you know, this year's NUCD, like other years, but this year it is more this year, we have to make it interactive. So there are full time for the context setting by the chairperson. There are the three great lectures in every, every session, followed by a moderator and full panel discussion. Over to Jayant uh, to invite the first session speaker and take it forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the wrap up of yesterday's program. Yesterday, we have received many good feedback regarding the content of scientific discussions and the time uh, keeping and very relevant issues which were put forth. And you have also highlighted today's program in today's sessions, which are interesting. And we have faculties who are best in their field and from the national and the international importance. I welcome all of you to the session seven, the complications in diabetes one. Following that, we have another session on complication, complication in diabetes two. In this session, we have <clears throat> Dr. Manoj Shotrai who will be chairing this session and introducing our uh, guest speakers and three important topics of CKD, musculoskeletal system in diabetes and heart failure prevention will be covered by Professor Manisha Shahai from Hyderabad, Professor Bidud Das from Katak and Dr. P.K. Shahu from Bhuvaneshwar. Following that, in the panel discussion, we will have Dr. Rajiv Chawla along with our faculties and Dr. Bharat Panigrahi will be moderating the session. So without delay, I invite all the faculties, chairperson and moderator and hand over to Dr. Manoj Chotrai for the introduction of the first speaker and starting the first session. Sir, on mute, Karun, sir, on mute. <clears throat> Manoj sir, unmute Karandu. Hello, good morning. Yeah, yeah, we are audible now. Yes, yes Manoj. So, 
um, we'll be uh, dealing this uh, session on complications of uh, diabetes. So uh, mainly the kidney, the kidney is more, mostly affected and it is seen that 40% of the uh, diabetics, they have kidney disease. The most peculiar is, pro pro problem is those who are undiagnosed, they have also 30 to 40 percent, they have got all kidney disease. And pre-diabetics, they, they are more suffer, 17 to 18 percent of the pre-diabetics, they also suffer from kidney disease. So kidney play, play, plays a pivotal role in our system and diabetes affects it. So we'll be the, the discussing, Dr. Manisha Sahai Manisha will be discussing on CKD in diabetes. And uh, I have not received the uh, full... It, it's coming on the screen. Come on the oh, screen. Yes. Oh, Manisha Sahai, she's the head, head professor and head of the department of Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad, and editor-in-chief in Journal of Transplantation, deputy chair, CME Committee of International Society, and uh, president of Hyderabad Nephrology Forum, Hello, Academy of Medical Sciences and uh, KDI Geo Anime Working Group member, examiner in MRCP and reviewer in, in international journals. And she has got 13 med gold medals and uh, 165 publications and uh, many more things to her credit. She is the vice president of Indian Society of Nephrology and council member for International Society of Nephrology, chairs South Asia Regional Board. Now, Dr. Manisha, Manisha Sahai will be speaking on CKD in diabetes. Madam, over to you. So thank you for the nice introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me here. So at the outset, I would like to congratulate uh, the faculty for hosting and organizing such a grand conference with such a good uh, uh, audience and good comments so far. So today we'll be de uh, dealing with the diabetic kidney disease, which is one of the major complications of, of diabetes as was highlighted by the chairperson. So we call it the CKD, chronic kidney disease is a global killer in plain sight. People are not aware of chronic kidney disease. If you see the figures, approximately roughly 18% of Indians have diabetes, 18 to 20%. Hypertension is seen in 25%. But do you know CKD occurs in 17%? CKD is almost as common as diabetes, but people are not aware of it. People are aware of diabetes, thankfully now, hypertension, heart disease, but they are not aware of chronic kidney disease. This is our own Indian study, uh, which shows that out of all cause of CKD, diabetic CKD is the most common, the forerunner in India, which causes CKD. And unfortunately, Though we have so many services available in India, India cannot provide dialysis to all patients of diabetic CKD. You must be aware of PM Yojana where they are starting dialysis centers in all the districts of India, huge exercise. But remember, even with all these facilities, we can do dialysis only for 50,000 new patients every year. And how many patients of CKD need dialysis every year? Two lakh. So out of two lakh people, we will be providing dialysis only to 50,000 and 1.5 lakh will just die. We know that we have dialysis and transplant. So apart from the limited facilities, it's very costly. The dialysis is roughly 30,000 rupees per month. So 2,000 rupees per session, every alternate day patient comes for dialysis. So it's a very poor quality of life for the patient and it's lifelong. Transplant is available, but India does around 12,000 transplants per year. And we need how many transplants? Two lakh per year. Can we meet the numbers? And then transplant is expensive as well. So if we don't treat diabetic CKD, this is where we end, dialysis or transplant, which is limited and the cost is huge. In addition, the diabetic CKD, apart from contributing to the cost and poor quality of life, look at the effect on cardiovascular diseases. A person who has diabetes and CKD is shown in the violet bar and all risks are multiplied congestive heart failure, acute myocardial infarction, CVAs, peripheral vascular disease, ASCVD and death. Everything is multiplied so many times, twice, if a patient has both diabetes as well as CKD. Therefore, DKD management and knowing about it is important and that's why the importance of this session. Now remember, diabetic patient can have two types of kidney diseases. First kidney disease where the kidney disease is because of hyperglycemia. That is the main culprit. 
And this is typically diabetic kidney disease or diabetic nephropathy as it was called. And here generally you have proteinuria, it progresses gradually and it's associated with diabetic retinopathy. So this is the main focus of discussion today. And almost 70% of diabetics with kidney disease have this type of kidney disease. We call it DKD. Now a diabetic person can have kidney disease because of other reasons. Maybe because of lupus nephritis, maybe some glomerular disease can occur in a diabetic. So these diseases are called non-diabetic kidney diseases. They are not associated with retinopathy. They have a rapid progression and they need separate treatment. So this is not we are discussing today. We are discussing diabetic kidney disease, which is because of hyperglycemia. Now, how do we identify diabetic kidney disease? What are the symptoms of kidney disease? Remember, we have five stages of CKD. In a diabetic also, we can have these five stages of CKD progression. The last stage is where the patient needs dialysis or transplant. And then slowly the patients of diabetes progress from one, two, three, four, five stages. In stage one and two, there is no abnormality. Patient is completely asymptomatic. All diabetics, they may have CKD, many of them, but we don't know, no symptoms. So early DKD can be asymptomatic. The last stage, you have symptoms. And this is where the patient comes to the nephrologist. There's decreased urine output, swelling of pit. So this everybody recognizes. And most of the patients in our OPs come in this stage when they have full-blown edema and swelling. The middle stage, the stage three and four, again, they have symptoms. But many of the times, the symptoms may not be related to the kidney. They may be affecting the blood, anemia, hypertension. The patient may have pruritus, may have loss of appetite, vomiting. And the patient may have cardiac symptoms, may have respiratory system, breathlessness symptoms. So the patients keep on going to different specialities. They never end up with the nephrologist because creatinine is often not done because nobody thinks that the cause of this symptom in a diabetic may be kidney because the symptoms are related to other organs. So what I have emphasized is that diabetic kidney disease in the early stages, you may miss it. Therefore, screening is essential. So all diabetics, let us see what type of screening should we do. So what is the toolkit for screening? Only two tests, urine albumin and creatinine. With the creatinine, calculate the EGFR. So this method, all diabetics should undergo these two tests. This is the message which should go across. Urine albumin, repeated measurements are important, at least two out of three measurements. And we should not test for urine albumin in the presence of fever, UTI, or if the patient is pregnant or sugars are uncontrolled, CHF. So you should check when the diabetic person is otherwise stable. And we all know that microalbuminuria, then you have moderately increased albuminuria, severely increased albuminuria. So nowadays we don't use the term microalbuminuria, but again, we call it moderate or severe. Remember the numbers, less than 30 milligram per day is fine. More than 300 milligram per day, it's already in the stage of severe albuminuria. So please do a urine albumin test. You can do it with a dipstick, which gives a semi-quantitative estimation, or you can send it to the lab and you will have this report. The other important thing is the creatinine and GFR. So asymptomatic diabetics also, this should be done and get the creatinine from the lab. The lab can do the GFR if you want. Otherwise, this smart formula can be downloaded on all smartphones. It is free for download. And you use the CKD EP formula not nowadays, not the other ones. So you have to just fill the creatinine, the age, gender. And the new CKD EP formula even raises the so creatinine, age, and gender, and you have the GFR. So on your prescriptions, on the physician's prescription, always urine albumin report should be there and the GFR should be mentioned. It's mandatory, which many of us do not do. So after checking the albumin and GFR, we can classify the patient as with stage of CKD. The left side, you can see the GFR, G1 to G5. So G5 means the last stage. So if the GFR is between less than 15, you call it G5. And suppose the albumin is more than 300, you call it A3. So if a person comes with albumin more than 300 and a GFR less than 15, you call it G5A3. So this is how, how it should look on your prescription. Just remember, think honestly, are you writing it? Many of us are not. We should do it. Even the nephrologist sometimes don't write. That is wrong. So that's the first step. Dive, you should screen and diagnose uh, DKD early. So should you screen everyone? No. All two diabetics, type 2 diabetics from onset, you have to screen. Whereas type 1 diabetic, you can start screening after five years of onset of diabetes. So please remember, most of the patients are type 2 diabetes and all of them annually urine albumin creatinine ratio and a GFR. Who should be doing the screening? Should the nephrologist do the screening? No, because by the time patient comes to nephrologist, they already have stage 5. 
So it's no use. Nephrologists should do it, but the mean people doing it should be the physicians and GPs. You have 10 lakh physicians and GPs in India and only 2,000 nephrologists. So screening of all diabetics cannot be done by nephrologists alone. And they are the correct people, the physicians, because who will be seeing diabetic patients who are asymptomatic regarding the kidney. So all these patients, please screen. And if screening is positive, then we do all the other investigations, LFT, RFT, the iron profile, calcium profile. We also look at the ultrasound, lipid profile. So all these tests are done in case the screen is positive. And this is generally the domain of the nephrologist. Remember one thing, renal biopsy. So should we do renal biopsy for all patients of diabetic nephropathy? No, it's not required. You should do renal biopsy only when there are some suspicious features. For example, hematuria, rapidly progressive renal failure, nephrotic syndrome, systemic features, example, rash, or if the diabetic person does not have retinopathy. So these are the uh, clues that the patient may be having the non-diabetic kidney disease, which I said may be because of other conditions, not because of hyperglycemia. So this is not to be managed by the physician, refer to the nephrologist. So if any of these things are there, routine diabetic nephropathy, these things will not be there. No hematuria, retinopathy is generally there. It is slowly progressive. So those diseases should be managed by the physician, but any such suspicion, refer to nephro for a renal biopsy. Fine, so we have such patient who has come to your clinic, 47 years old, software professional. He's a diabetic, hypertensive, he's a smoker. He is on the obese side, blood pressure 140-90, HbA1c is 8.3, creatine is 2.1, his GFR is already 36. Cholesterol is a bit high, he has bilateral NPDR and kidney size is normal. He is on metformin and glimepiride, tell me satan, CT. So this is generally the prescription what we get from many of the referring uh, physicians or GPs. So is this enough? So there are one, two, three drugs on the prescription. Is this enough? What do the guidelines say? Remember, the first point in your prescription should be a diet advice. Healthy plate. So healthy plate for diabetic nephropathy is again like a normal plate. Half of it fruits and vegetables. One fourth is carbohydrate. That two whole grain. And one fourth should be lean protein. So this can be advised for all early stages of diabetic nephropathy. Avoid animal protein. Go for plant protein. Plant protein is better. So protein should not be restricted in a vegetarian. They should be allowed to take all uh, vegetarian protein diet. If they want to take animal protein, then you can use egg or chicken, fish. Meat should be avoided. And the first point on the prescription should be about diet, which should include salt advice. So say salt half teaspoon per day if the patient is hypertensive, one teaspoon if not hypertensive. But remember to tell, avoid salt substitutes. They will go and purchase salt substitutes. They should not be used. Go for natural spices. You can go for lemon. You can go for garlic and onion powders. They also have the same taste without sodium. Avoid soya salt. These things should be told, soya sauce and all. People have a lot of salads nowadays. Then they put salad dressing on that. Salad dressing should also be avoided. It contains sodium. So this is the first point on your prescription. What should be the second point? Lifestyle advice. So for diabetic nephropathy patients, 150 minutes per week. That's 30 minutes per day, five days a week. Right, stop smoking. That should be mentioned on the prescription. It's important. About BP control, what target? This patient is 140, 90 BP. Is that okay? No. What do the latest guidelines say? Bring the BP down to 120 unless the patient is not able to tolerate it. Fine. So the second should be about BP advice target BP and what drug the person is on tell me satan 40 mg do you agree with that remember it's correct ras block it should be the first line drug but the dose is wrong remember for diabetic nephropathy nephroprotection you should go to 80 mg tell me satan so the message is all ACE inhibitors or ERBs whatever you are using use full dose unless the patient has side effects and do not combine ACE or R both should not be combined any of them so tell me satan dose was increased to 80 mg Still, after that, the blood pressure was not controlled. So what should be the second line drug in diabetic nephropathy? Calcium channel blocker can be used. Then still not controlled, you can go for loop diuretics or thiazide diuretics, depending on the GFR. Then mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, then minoxidil and hydrolyzine. Lastly, clonidine or moxinidine. This is the way it should be used in a patient with diabetic kidney disease. So this patient was therefore initiated on telmisartan, made ATMG, amlodipine was added and chlorothalidone. Uh, was already there. So triple drug combination. 
So that was about BP control. His BP got controlled. What about blood sugar? Target 6.5 to 8 is the latest guideline in diabetic nephropathy. Why the targets are so much varying? For younger patients who are not having any other comorbidities, who can manage hypoglycemia, you can go for stricter targets. So for this patient, software 47 years, go for 6.5. For older individuals who are staying alone, hypoglycemia, unawareness, many comorbidities, go for lighter target. 8 is okay. Remember, HbA1c is not very accurate, but still we use it. It may be falsely low or falsely high in case of diabetic kidney disease. So use it with a pinch of salt. This is the best available as of now. But as you must have heard yesterday, uh, continuous monitoring of blood glucose is also coming in a big way in diabetic nephropathy where you have a discrepancy between the blood sugars and HbA1c. So this can also be used. So glycemic targets have told you. Now, how do we attain these glycemic targets for diabetic nephropathy? Remember that it's not only glucose control now. A glucocentric approach is not enough. We should look at protection of other organs, preservation of beta cell function, weight reduction, minimum hypoglycemia. So all these things in a good quality of life. So what drugs is this patient on? He's taking metformin and glimepiride. Is that correct? His GFR is more than 30. It's around 36, which we saw. So this person, metformin continuing is correct. You can continue with the metformin. Depending on the GFR, you can adjust the dose. So more than 60, same dose. 45 to 60, also same dose. But you have to monitor carefully. 30 to 45, half the dose. And less than 30, stop metformin. So metformin still remains the first drug of choice for renal protection as well. Now second, what do we do? SGLT2 inhibitors. They have come in a big way and they should be the second drug of choice. In this patient, they are not there. So you may say SGLT2, they reduce the hyperglycemia by excreting sugar in the urine. How they are renoprotective? They are renoprotective because they counteract the hyperfiltration. The kidney damage occurs by hyperfiltration. We know that as there is more and more nephron loss, the remaining kidney starts hyperfiltering. The more nephrons work, the more disease they become. So overwork spoils the kidney, hyperfiltration spoils the kidney. And how do SGLT2 inhibitors help here? We all know that SGLT2 block the SGLT2 in the proximal tubule. And as a result, what happens? More sodium and glucose, it reaches the distal tubule. And in the distal tubule, what happens is we have macula densa, which receives this sodium. And then what does it do? It tells the efferent arteriole that already I'm receiving so much of sodium and glucose. So do not filter more blood. As a result, there is constriction of the efferent arteriole and there is decreased pressure inside the glomerulus. And this brings down the hyperfiltration. And this is the main mechanism of renal protection by SGLT2 inhibitors. They have other mechanisms as well, but this is one of the main ones. And that is why they are very smart drugs. They are helpful in weight reduction, reduce the BP, cardioprotective, they reduce hyperfiltration, they are smart diuretics. They decrease the albuminuria, decrease the renal work and decrease inflammation. So many mechanisms of action and multi-pronged effect of SGLT2. So this drug should be added in the prescription. Therefore, for this person, dapagliflozin was added 10 milligram and chlorothalidone was reduced to avoid the risk of dehydration because dapagliflozin also causes uh, some uh, renal protection uh, by excreting the extra water. So what happened was creatinine went up to 2.2 and the urine sugar became three plus. So patient was scared that creatinine is going up, but we told that that can occur with Dapagliflozin, no need to stop it. Future renal protection is going to be there. So the albumin had come down, but not totally come down after dapagliflozin. Creatinine started declining. So after DAPA and metformin, what do we do? SGLT2 is not enough. You have residual risk after SGLT2 as well. So what is the next step? Next step is to add GLP-1 receptor agonists. So these are other renal protective drugs which should be added if the patient is not well controlled on SGLT2 or if the patient does not tolerate SGLT2, these can be added. So these are other important renoprotective drugs. So this was done. The patient was started on liraglutide as well. Now, is the prescription complete? Do we need to do anything? Still some proteinuria is there. Around UPCR is the protein is around 430 milligram, not normal. So the creatinine has come down. So now we have evidence from Fidelio trial and you have fidelity trial, which show that finrenone can be added. It is renoprotective and cardioprotective. So this is another new drug for the management of diabetic nephropathy, which helps in renoprotection. So 10 milligram finrenone was added. So now the prescription looks like this. 
Is this complete as of now? Let us see. Any other therapy? Yes. Do not forget to add statin for all patients of taptic nephropathy, even if the cholesterol is normal. This is for cardiovascular benefit. So above the age of 18 years, all diabetics with nephropathy should be on statin. Bicarbonate should be added to maintain serum bicarbonate 22. Aspirin is added only if the history of cardiovascular disease is there. Uricosidic agents, the uric acid was 7.4 for this patient, not required. Only symptomatic hyperuricemia you should add. Otherwise, many prescriptions we keep on adding allopurinol, febixostat. Add if the uric acid is above 9 or if the patient is symptomatic. And manage anemia and mineral bone disease by giving iron and erythropoietin. This patient was okay. So, diabetic nephropathy does not only mean glucose control. So, many other parameters need to be looked at. So, now this prescription seems complete. We have added atorvastatin. Sodium bicarbonate was added as well. So, recent concept is not glucocentric approach, it's a holistic approach. So, coming to the end of my talk, the prescription which had three um, drugs written on it was not complete. And now the prescription is complete where you have, you can see how many measures, 10 measures. So, the 10 commandments for diabetic nephropathy. You may think why Madam is talking again and again this, we all know, but this is a study published in Leading Journal. We are also authors of this in leading institutes from India, only 40%, 48% patients are on ROS blocker, 40% are on statins, metformin only 25%, and iron and ESA therapy for diabetic nephropathy non-existent. So remember, it's important. There are a couple of recent advances. We have non-albuminuric DKD, which we will discuss during the questionnaire, where albuminuria is not there, still the patient has DKD. This is associated with more of macrovascular disease and absence of retinopathy has a better prognosis. However, the drugs are not very effective. And we have so many other players as well. I'm not talking about that. This looks like a scary slide, but yeah, at the same time, an exciting slide because so many pathways are there and new drugs are coming up. So ladies and gentlemen, concluding, I have great regard for Indian doctors. We are all trying to do our best in our fields, but we are working alone. We need to collaborate. Together, we can make a difference. That's why the purpose of this seminar the physician talking to the nephro and endos. Prevention is better than cure. You can see testing is only testing and treatment prevention, 3,000 per month. Dialysis transplant is 30,000 per month. So I think this should be the main message. If you want to really take hold of diabetic nephropathy, screen them early and for treatment, use a 10-point agenda. So this will go a long way in preventing diabetic nephropathy. Thank you for a patient here. Thank you, Dr. Saha, for a very nice presentation and uh, information. Only thing is that many cases we are seeing that diabetes is controlled, but the creatine is more than three. Th those cases, what should be done? Yes, absolutely, sir. So what happens is as the creatinine goes up to three, you all know that the diabetes automatically gets controlled. Patients become very happy that my sugar was not controlled for 10, 15 years. Now it's becoming controlled so, and we get scared because hypoglycemia is an early sign of diabetic nephropathy. So uh, many of the times the patients are tested when they develop low blood sugar or sugar gets controlled. But what do we do now? So still in this condition, will you use SGLT2? You have to use SGLT2. You can reduce the dose of other anti-hypoglycemic agents. You have to add SGLT2 or nephroprotection. We are underusing these drugs. In addition, see that the RAS blockade is complete. So all those 10 points, what I have told, are for those patients who even if they have a normal blood sugar, you still have to use all those 10 points. So that should be done. The message should go across the 10 points. It's not only for management of diabetes. Diabetes management is one point. Other nine points also have to be done. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Now, Dr. Ponda, anything you to be done? We'll, we'll go on to the next uh, topic, sir. Professor Bidudda, sir. So you have to invite Professor uh, Bidudda, sir, for the next talk. We introduce him and let him start the talk. We'll be having discussion at the end, uh, uh, Dr. Chutrai. Okay. Okay. Now it is uh, Professor Bidudda will be telling on musculoskeletal system in diabetes. And uh, Professor Bidudda needs no, uh, yeah, he's the father of uh, um, autoimmune disease. Uh, or, uh, that, se that section he has started in SC Medical College, immunology. Previously, we didn't know that immunology and rheumatology are separate, but they, they 
he has created the department in that and he is he has got his faculty in institute of sciences faculty of public health foundation many awards to his distinction and he is the best odisha citizen award he has get so many awards and he is loved by a, a great people all the patients love him and his outdoors sometimes last seven, one one am at 1 am he will be seeing patients without charging anything and um, patient will be uh, waiting for him so he needs no uh, uh, introduction dr bidu dr bidu dr insusan himself so i invite dr das to start his uh, subject on musculoskeletal actually uh, the musculoskeletal system is very relevant in a diabetic that has been uh, realized of late and uh, professor das uh, being a doyen in immunology and dermatology and inspired uh, lakhs of followers and students uh, to the speciality it's a, a very a nice moment to hear him at this juncture regarding the musculoskeletal system in diabetes so without much delay we present you professor bidur das for the topic musculoskeletal system in diabetes sir well, thank you jan uh esteemed uh, chairperson uh, dr manoj babu uh, dr jayant uh my teacher whom i love professor das ashok das uh and of course uh, alok tanango forced me to come and give this talk and i told him that i don't deal with diabetes i'm a purely clinical immunologist who deals mostly with uh, immunological problems but lately as i i can understand uh, that the musculoskeletal manifestations in diabetes are pretty common and they are mostly seen by orthopedicians they hardly come to a rheumatologist when they do come they are almost in an advanced stage and there is very little we can do about them and a lot of people even don't know these musculoskeletal manifestations are part of diabetes uh, i must congratulate uh, professor Manisha, I was impressed. Excellent talk, madam. I was pretty impressed with your talk. Now, all of us know, as as I've told you, that is a very important uh, manifestation of diabetes mellitus. Now, we see hundreds of patients of different uh, from uh, of different diseases, including uh, mostly autoimmune diseases. but when these patients come with uh, problems of the bone or the joint or the muscle they normally say that we are being treated uh, for this disease by other specialities for la large many years and uh, when we realize that actually is a diabetic and uh, that is not that has been taken as a separate kind of problem and they have not been linked uh, and the whole issue comes to light that perhaps uh, that uh, equation has not been worked out and most of them receive very little attention compared to the most serious micro microvascular complications and understanding i can understand that because they are more serious uh, life threatening compared to the musculoskeletal conditions but these conditions uh, if they are recognized early they affect the quality of life quite badly and uh, if they can be recognized early and you manage them early you can significantly improve the quality of life uh before i proceed i must uh, talk about a case where i realized why these cases are missed and why people don't understand uh, the link between diabetes and musculoskeletal symptom uh, this guy came uh, in december mid december to us he is from he was from pune he is a air force person uh, he came he showed a lot of people there with his problems like he had swelling of fingers of both the fingers both the hands difficulty in making a fist and there was tightening of skin around the fingers for 6 months and for this reason he has gone around multiple specialists including orthopedicians and he did not get in relief he was a diabetic for 20 years very very important clue there he had coronary artery disease 2009 and has been put on a stent is on medication mostly oral diabetic uh, agents i don't know is hba1c and all that is not available to us blood pressure is 130 80 and the musculoskeletal examination showed no tenderness of the joint but only swelling of the joints uh, around the mcp and pips 
other systems were normal. Now he has been subjected, he has gone from Pune to Delhi, and then because he stays in Orissa, he landed up in Orissa and has been investigated extensively at Bhuvaneshwar, seen by physicians, orthopedicians, and even rheumatologists. And uh, the uh, spectrum of differential diagnosis was from rheumatoid arthritis to connective tissue disease to scleroderma to multiple myeloma to chronic regional pain syndrome. You can see the wide ranging. And all that you see, his fingers were quite puffy and the skin was tight and he was unable to flex his fingers. Now, these were the investigations done from outside. That's what he showed us. The CBC was normal. Urine was normal. ESR, CRP was within normal limits. And they've done the uh, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCB, HLA-B trends were normal. Uh, I couldn't figure out ANA has been done, which is normal. ANA profile was negative. Serum membrane was normal. The couple lambda micro, beta 2 microglobin levels are normal. Then they did the X-ray chest, hands, normal. MRI showed only mild septicemia edema on the palmar aspect. MRI spine, MRI pelvis, CCT thorax. You can see the extensive uh, investigation that he has been subjected to. And uh, most of them had normal results. Then he went through another series of investigations. Vitamin B12, 105 picograms. He was given vitamin B12. His prostate-specific antigen was done. Serum cortisol, morning samples were normal. The CT scan of the whole abdomen has been done. DEXA scan has been done. Apogee endoscopy showed fundal erosion because he had been taking anti-inflammatory drugs for a long time. Eco was normal. And most people came to their wits end and one of the rheumatologists advised that you need to have a flexor tendon biopsy and MDP bone scan. That is where he, almost like the last straw on the camel's back, he ran away and came to us. He came to a rheumatology OPD on 22nd December, 2022. We examined the way we do for all patients who come with rheumatological problems. A simple test that we did was what's called a prayer sign. It demonstrated a classical prayer sign there was no tenderness of the joints. And this is one of the classical presentation of what is called a, a diabetic chiroarthropathy, stiffness of the joints, stiffness of the skin, uh, otherwise called uh, limited joint mobility syndrome. He was counseled. He was extremely relieved and advised to have physiotherapy and perhaps analgesic and nothing more because there was no other drug to control his diabetes as far as practicable and do physiotherapy. Now, this case I presented to show that he has gone around multiple places from Pune, he went to Delhi, Delhi he went to Calcutta, then he came to uh, Odessa, Bhuvaneshwar, and has been seen by so many people. People have thought of so many things, have been investigated said widely, but the link between diabetes and this condition has escaped because uh, sometimes it is told what the uh, mind doesn't know, the eyes cannot see. As an example of that, and by simple counseling, he was so relieved that he blessed us a lot and went back. This is just to suggest that uh, we have very important uh, kind of uh, musculoskeletal manifestation of diabetes. If you group them into four groups, like soft tissue involvement, joint, bone, muscle involvement, the first group, that's the soft tissue, are the most predominant. We see limited joint mobility syndrome, which I showed, chiroarthropathy or diabetic refined syndrome. And the other one is the last which we see, adhesive capsulitis of frozen shoulder. And carpal tunnel syndrome is pretty common. Stenosing, tenosynovitis of trigger fingers is equally common. Dupitrous contractions is not that common. But we do see, but on most of them, they are treated by orthopedicians and other specialities, and they rarely come to us. In the joint, uh, the diabetic uh, neuroarthropathy, that's the Charcot's arthropathy, is not very common. Recently, we published a series of uh, four or five cases of Charcot's arthropathy of the elbows, which is very, very uncommon. And some of them had uh, um, a syringomyelia. Gouty arthritis, it's supposed to be an association with diabetes because of the metabolic syndrome, hyperuricemia. And the other two conditions, the bone osteoporosis and fracture, very important because a diabetic having fracture can lead to big problems in management because of multiple complications. And it's been seen that fracture rates, fragility fracture rates are very high in diabetes. A very interesting uh, disease, what is called diffuse idiopathic skeletal hypostosis. I'll show you a picture how they are misdiagnosed as cases of ankylosing spondylitis, but they're very well linked or associated with uh, diabetes mellitus. And lastly, the muscles are involved. A diabetic amyotrophy previously was supposed to be a neuropathy. It is neuropathy. Now we talk about diabetic sarcopenia, extensive loss of muscle in diabetics for reasons not known. 
And last uh, but not the least, uh, again, very rare, diabetic muscle infarction or diabetic myonecrosis. I've hardly seen, I've seen most of these cases. I've not seen a case of diabetic muscle infarction or diabetic myonecrosis. So this is to suggest that if we have uh, in the mind that diabetes can give rise to this condition, I'm sure we can help a lot of people before they come in a very advanced stage. Uh, very important because we have to understand the pathophysiology of this condition, then we can target the, the pathophysiology by which we can prevent progression of this disease. Uh, as usual, since most of us understand it's presumed in the multifactorial, uh, you have a genetic predisposition. Some people develop these conditions faster than the others. Some people don't even develop. So obviously there is genetic, we do not know. Even the GWAS studies hasn't shown much. There's a microvascular impairment and there's most important, the accumulation of advanced glycation end product. This is supposed to be the most important aspect of the pathophysiology of musculoskeletal disorders. I think it's true for most of the complications that we see in diabetes. The oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species, which is generated, causes damage to the cells. And of course, diabetic neuropathy, which contributes to Charcot's arthropathy. Uh, the fibroblastic proliferative disorder, the soft tissue, which I was showing as the most common in diabetes mellitus, has been uh, worked up a little more than the other uh, conditions. The abnormal accumulation of AGE, which I showed, is one of the most important factors. And this uh, collagen tissue, especially with which uh, fibroblastic proliferation is associated with, uh, is very susceptible to glycation. And tendon AGE cross-linking reduces sensitivity to collagenase, so there is less turnover, remodeling capacity is reduced, and it increases stiffness. Interestingly, AGE enhances transcription factor NF-kappa B, resulting in high TNF-alpha analysis. So this is where the immunologist is perhaps linked to the diabetologist uh, in regard to the um, uh, musculoskeletal conditions. Otherwise, we know uh, immunology has a big role to play. Inflammation has a big role to play in uh, diabetes. So the cooperation between immunologists uh, and a diabetologist uh, will be uh, something that we'll see in the near future. And last, increased loss triggers inflammatory response and induces cell damage. So all of them, the soft tissue component that we see in the majority of musculoskeletal disorders associated with diabetes is related to AGE and its uh, downward cascades. Now, the prevalence, as you can see, uh, this is something that we have, this is uh, people have been done by epidemiological studies. All that I wanted to say that these disorders are much more in diabetics compared to non-diabetics. That is adhesive capsulitis, frozen shoulder, limited joint mobility, 25 to 76%. This diabetic cardiopathy is invariably misdiagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma. That's where people make a mistake. Dupuytren's contracture for there are many other conditions, but here the rates are very high. Carpal tunnel syndrome we see in many conditions. Of course, diabetes is one of the more important factors. Flexor tenosynovitis. This slide suggests that we do see large number of musculoskeletal problems with diabetes. Uh, this is uh, this is the first one that is the adhesive capsulitis, which we see. Uh, it has a progressive painful restriction of shoulder joints. Lots of people come to us with this after they have shown the orthopedician and nothing has happened. And we say, Are you a diabetic? Yes, sir. Did you tell this history? No, sir. You should have told the history and it would have been very easy to make a diagnosis. And uh, here, the, especially the abduction and external rotations are pretty limited. Sometimes you can make, uh, make a mistake or just a rotor cuff tendinitis. Uh, the cause is proliferation of fibroblast, myoblast, collagen. It has three phases. Initially, painful phase. This is where you should cast them, find out their sugar levels, see whether they are controlled or not. As Dr. Manisha was telling, the control is so vital. So, so vital. And that, if you don't control it, you have the... Uh, downward cascade going on. Then you have the adhesive phase, then it becomes very difficult to treat them because they are so stiff, you have to inject or you have to do surgery. Then the resolution phase, some of the patients do resolve over time by just physiotherapy and uh, analgesics or NSAIDs. The other one is the chiroarthropathy, which I showed. These are the typical two signs that we can do in the clinic to see one is the prayer sign on the left side, right side is called a tabletop sign. The fingers cannot be opposed to the, uh, to the table. These are mostly painless progressive stiffness. Fixed flexion. That patient which I showed had this exactly. Fixed flexion contracture. Decreased grip strength. And the skin of the hand is waxy. And sometimes it can be stiff. So you make a diagnosis of scler scleroderma, which is, which is wrong, actually. The diagnostic tips are prayer table sign. Very simple signs. You don't need great investigations for this. Treatment, controlled diabetes, physiotherapy, and this. In fact, as you see, most of this condition requires simple uh, interventions. 
Control of diabetes is primary, physiotherapy, analgesics, sometimes analgesics and steroid injections. Uh, very common, we see trigger fingers and then we realize that he's diabetic, dramatic response, just inject the tendons, they have dramatic response. But again, they come back, the diabetes is not controlled. It is caused by inflammation attributable to repeated friction between flexor tendon and sheath. Interestingly, one has to remember, it affects the thumb index and middle, not the other two fingers. If you keep that in mind, you can pick them up. Bilateral, most common in women. Physiotherapy, local steroid injections. And Dupuytren's contracture, they come at this stage pretty, pretty late. Uh, they are slowly fib uh, progressive fibroproliferative disorder of the palma fascia, joint stiffness, loss of uh, full extension, palma digital thickening, tethering, contracture, third, fourth. There you saw first, second, third year, third, fourth, and it is mostly progressive and very difficult to treat this patient. Very difficult. At this stage, one has to do a fasciotomy or fasciectomy uh, in surgery. Again, they come back. Now, when you come to the joint involvement, Charcot's, as I told you, related to the neuropathy. Gouty is more like an association because of her metabolic syndrome. And recently, I saw a couple of papers that showed high incidence of osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis in diabetes. And they are mostly uh, associational rather than cause and effect. You can explain by many ways, but cause and effect relationship has never been shown. And Charcot, this is how they come. These are one of our patients. A progressive painless joint disruption. So there are multiple factors involved in this, the mechanical factor, vascular factor, neuropathic factor, and of course, the inflammatory cytokines uh, add to that. Because of repeated trauma, increased laxity, there is fragmentation of articular cartilage and collapse of the bones. Weight-bearing joints like foot, ankle, knees are very important. We got elbow joints because he had syringomyelia. X-rays, very quickly you can catch MRI of the affected joints. Rarely we need and you have to uh, do a differential diagnosis of so septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. Now, the simple X-ray uh -huh. shows you fragmentation and collapse of the bone in sharp cords. Diagnosis becomes very, very simple. Now, this is uh, gout. Most of us must have seen. Now, we are seeing increasing number of gout. Perhaps diabetes associated with them. A lot of people with diabetes have gout now. Uh, part of the metabolic syndrome, hyperuricemia. Uh, more than nine we treat. Unless it's symptomatic, we don't treat. Asymptomatic, more than nine we treat. And uh, the concept that diabetes increases risk of gout still remains controversial. However, a three-year community-based study revealed that 16% of patients with diabetes develop gout compared to 2.7%. So there's definite interlinking between them, but again, cause and effect relationship has not been established. Uh, bone involvement, this is very interesting. Osteoporosis and fragility factors is something we should be aware of in diabetes. And the other one is called DISH, that is the diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperosteosis, something where the diagnostic uh, uh, skills are tested of many of the physicians. So osteoporosis, most studies are reported uh, increased fragility fractures in diabetes, but the BMD on which we base is low in type one diabetes, but very high in type two diabetes mellitus. Normally you see a high uh, BMD and still they have fractures. So we know uh, fractures are, uh, have two components. One is a BMD, other one is a microarchitecture. It is believed that in type 2 diabetes, even if the BMD is high, the microarchitecture is defective. Therefore, you get more fragility fractures. And most of the community-based observations have shown that fracture risk was 24 to 63% higher in patients with poor glycemic control. Again, we come back to the same topic of glycemic control. The uh, risk uh, of hip fracture in patients with more than 10 years of diabetes is almost 1.19. And diabetes-related complications increases risk of fracture. Very, very important because I know most elderly people live for long years. They become old. We have a huge uh, elderly population. A lot of them have diabetes. And they get a fracture. And it is horrible treating them. And they're very, very difficult to treat. And since I told you type 2 diabetes, uh, have high BMD, what is the method by which you can say these guys have a, they have a risk of fracture? Now, how do we test for fracture? How do we test? And now, uh, this, uh, sorry, I forgot this. Uh, sodium glucose co-transporter, which uh, now the previous speaker was talking about a very important uh, drug which is being used. This was shown that uh, what the relationship between the uh, HGLT and uh, type 2 diabetes and, uh, and fractures. A meta-analysis and randomized control trials have shown there is about 78 RCTs, 85,000 patients showed that canagliflozone seems to increase the risk of fracture, while other SGLTs do not result in higher incidence of fractures. Uh, this is a new drug people are using. This they have to understand and remember. Now, what's the mechanism of fractures in diabetes mellitus? Again, same thing, 
based on multiple factors, bone intrinsic factors like accumulation of AGE, low bone turnover, changes in bone microstructure, which I believe is type 2 diabetes, other extrinsic factors, uh, other complications like peripheral neuropathy, hypoglycemia at the patient on an insulin, muscle weakness because of sarcopenia or weakness, and visual impairment, the trip and fall. So fall is a very, very important concept in, the, in fractures. Uh, assessment of diabetes type 2, most of the other ones you can make very clearly. Dexa and FRAX are very good, but here is a problem. The Dexa is high, FRAX cannot tell you without the normal Dexa. So the assessment is difficult. So the two other things have come in, what is called a trabecular bone score, it's based on a Dexa, but on the lumbar spine, and it's based on some calculations where you can do what is called a trabecular bone score. There's no porosity uh, of the trabecular bones. The other one is called a quantitative CT. This again deals with the peripheral bones and uh, they can suggest uh, possibility of poor microarchitecture in the bones. Otherwise, these two are really done in India. Microindentation, you see what is the resistance of periosteal bone when you put a probe in uh, that suggests uh, poor microarchitecture. And of course, biomarkers, there are several, but very, very expensive. We rarely use biomarkers in our uh, uh, practice because of its cost. So these are things, but two things, the history of diabetes type 2, and then if you can do a trabecular bone score or a quantitative CT, which is available, you can suggest. And so what we need now is a better uh, stratification criteria for diabetes fracture in type 2 diabetes, and also uh, how to deal with these patients when they do not have a low, dexa, low bone density. This is called DISH. And uh, as you can see, those bones protruding out, they look exactly like uh, ankylosing spondylitis. The patient comes with very, very stiff back, cannot bend forward. But the beauty is it is very thick. These are osteophytes, actually, calcification and ossification of anterolateral ligament spine. Prevalence is very high in diabetes, 5 to 50% higher than general population. Patients have stiff uh, spinal stiffness, low backache. So easily, I've seen hundreds of patients, they come with us x-ray like this and say they have been diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis. Although there's no feature, it doesn't fit into the classification criteria. All they need is, again, control of diabetes, good physiotherapy, rarely NSAIDs, and sometimes surgery if there is a compression of the roots or the cord. Finally, the muscle involvement. Diabetic sarcopenia is something that we see nowadays, uh, poorly controlled and diabetic myonecrosis. Now, sarcopenia has now been related as a chronic complication of type 2 diabetes mellitus, and uh, its reduction in muscle mass there are quite a few patients who have very quickly, they lose the muscle mass and associated with decrease in muscle strength. It is three times more common in diabetes compared to general population. Associated with higher hospitalization, cardiovascular events and mortality, uh, it could be reversible through musculoskeletal rehabilitation, but I'm not sure it does uh, the kind of rehabilitation that we do here. Uh, uh, yesterday, I think there was a talk on this. They talk on sarcopenia. Type 1 diabetes, spontaneous infarction, acute sub. Hardik, what is the problem? Sir, I think internet problem for uh, Vidyut sir sign. Okay, okay. Then Vidyut, uh, I, I would suggest uh, Professor Choudhury, uh, if there's a problem, Vidyut, how many slides are left? Vidyut, are you listening? Vidyut, uh, can you ask uh, on phone, Jayant or Surender? I don't have Vidyut's number. So can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, now we're clear. Yes, Vidut, we are clear. I was trying to reach you, Vidut. Yeah, how many slides are left? You can continue, no problem. Last continue. Slide. Last slide. Yes. Last slide. Uh, can you see this slide? No, not no. yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Just start sharing. I think it was disconnected, yeah. 
Yeah. Now, now, now it has come, Bidut. Now it is very clear. You can, you can go for the previous slide to that because that was very new thing which I also saw in Calcutta. But put the uh, put no previous slide also kindly put with you. Previous slide. Be, previous slide. That is a new entity, and uh, I happen to see one in Calcutta. I'll show you. Sarcopenia. Sarcopenia. No micro micro my, my, my necrosis. My necrosis. Fantastic, fantastic entity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Please start with this, and then we'll finish. So sorry, there was some problem, and I believe in Murphy's law. If something has to go wrong, it will go wrong. You <laughs> can't <laughs> do anything about it. That is Murphy's law. Absolutely. Uh, even if I sit in telemedicine hall and with all facilities, gadgets, if something has to go wrong, it will go wrong. Uh, so diabetic myonecrosis is this is a case I've never seen. I've seen all other cases, and this is something I've never seen. And they come acutely. You know, with swelling of the calf and uh, thigh muscles because of infarction. And invariably, they are treated as uh, DVT or myositis uh, because of the acute onset. There is increased CPK, ESR, CRP, MRI can help, but it's self-limiting. Uh, I have no experience on this, so I'll not be able to go further on this. Next. So what's the take-home message that we have? Uh, I, I, I have es es established from the very first case that I showed that we can miss these cases if you do not think about that diabetes and MSK can be closely linked. So there's widespread MSK affection in diabetes. And I just uh, went through the different aspects, the soft tissue, the joint, the bone, and the muscles. Subclinical, if you pick them up at very early stages associated with long duration of disease and poor glycemic control. That's the bottom line. And some of these people, if you help them, they can get very good quality of life. A majority of problems are soft tissue related uh, and non-inflammatory. The first case had no inflammation. And I don't know why people still stuck to looking at inflammatory diseases and multiple myeloma, et cetera. A diagnosis is obviously based on good clinical assessment, not on all the investigations. I'm, I'm really amazed. I was amazed to see the kind of investigation that has been done on that patient. Uh, you just need good clinical assessment and a correlation that diabetes can present like this. These are the diseases that can occur. And good glycemic control, early diagnosis, that's all you need. And when they come to us, analgesics, uh, partially they get relieved, the NSAIDs, sometimes their inflammation because diabetes and inflammations are almost linked now. Physiotherapy is mandatory, which nobody does. No matter how much you induce them, they'll do it for five days, seven days, and then they lose interest. They want dramatic results with medications. Local steroid injection in some of the conditions like trigger finger and all dramatic, they get response, very good response. And of course, if they come so late, sometimes surgery is what they require. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Das, for uh, enlightening us about the new things, if and uh, diabetic myonecrosis. Uh, diabetic myonecrosis, uh, is it resolved after uh, diabetes is controlled? In fact, uh, basically you have an infarction. So following an infarction, it gets resolved. Uh, the way we have strokes and they get resolved in good time. But with diabetes control, they do not recur. It's a very rare entity. They, you don't yeah. see too many. Don't see too many of them. Yeah. yeah. I, I think Vidit, you were correct. It is very, very rare. And uh, Calcutta has reported two cases. Once I happened to see when I went for examination, and it is it is it is to control diabetes. That's the only thing you can do. Nothing much. You're absolutely very very rare. Very excellent information, sir, and uh, good presentation and guidelines for the people uh, dealing with diabetes. They have to keep an eye and should not unnecessarily medicate people. Uh, because the majority of the problems related to soft tissue, not uh, inflammatory, or and then uh, the time they have to detect physiotherapy and the local uh, interlegional uh, therapy may help. My, uh, my, actually, I wanted to tell one simple thing: as most of these patients actually come by orthopedician. By the time they come to us, it's pretty late, uh, so we miss them. The bottom okay. line. Second thing is other than good control is physiotherapy. I don't know why people are not uh, sticking to physiotherapy. It's a very wonderful thing. A lot of things can be resolved with uh, good physiotherapy, uh, but 
patients don't stick don't stick to physiotherapy for a long time and therefore they yeah, come very back. true sir very true sir actually oh. in india people think that the only medications will help not the physiotherapy they listen to doctors only i think alok alok has a point yeah. alok yes uh, thank you vidyut for excellent talk excellent. one thing is the way you have presented the job of diabetologist is now increased and physicians they are the prime referring physicians who should do the basic test and then decide whether it will go to orthopedician or to immunologist so i think the, the role for diabetologist and endocrinologist is the, and physicians is much more now thank you for the excellent talk thank you uh, you are right sir and uh, uh, we have very interesting panel discussion i am sure uh, it will be very informative with uh, faculties like professor das and uh, banisha and pk shau sir we'll go to the next session and uh, we welcome uh, dr rajiv chawla uh, welcome sir uh, after the uh, third talk we'll go and i request professor das uh, uh, we have a very interesting session on autoimmune uh, and no, we, diabetes autoimmune we, we, and diabetes pk shau has not arrived pk shau has not arrived yeah. Yes, I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. At PK South, that will be very informative. Yes, sir. At PK South, sir, they arrived, sir. Yeah. So we can have his talk, Jan. Then we'll have. Yeah. The... I request uh, Manoj Shah to introduce uh, Dr. PK South, sir, and he'll share his slides. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. PK South. Dr. PK South, the head of the department of Apollo Hospital. Sir, Namaskar. And uh, uh, we have uh, heard him many times, and he's very precise in his uh, subject. he will be talking on heart failure prevention and diabetic people the diabetic patients uh, silently they die due to myocardial infarction and our heart failure and many times we are we miss the, those things and he will be enlightening us with the few points it is seen that 9 to 20% of the diabetic they suffer from heart failure so how to prevent it dr sahu will enlighten us dr sahu please a uh, mind please see the is coming from some uh, attendee kindly mute him yes dr sahu yes are the slides visible yes sir Achoo, visible uh, thank you screen. thank you nucd for inviting me to give a talk in fact uh, i was a little puzzled about when i was supposed to talk on heart failure prevention because this is a very important aspect that we all should know and why is heart failure prevention necessary uh, in 1933 lewis had said that the very essence of cardiovascular practice is the early recognition of heart failure i highlight the words early recognition of heart failure this is what we as physicians as endocrinologists as diabetologists and as cardiologists first somehow have to recognize heart failure now if it's if you try to see the cardiovascular continuum which you are all all aware of these are the major four risk factors whether it is diabetes hypertension atherosclerosis smoking this all ultimately lead to atherosclerosis just a minute this all lead to atherosclerosis and when atherosclerosis sets in it all is coordinated to this ischemia thrombosis and i reduce contractility disease modeling finally heart failure my job is today to see that where we can stop this continuum so that we can prevent heart failure and our patients do not go to heart failure to discuss these issues i'll be bringing some luminaries who will be asking certain questions this gentleman is always in the news for no reason or some specific reason if you ask a question is heart failure an area of concern in diabetics yes it's an area of concern because if you'll see heart failure increases almost two to five fold when diabetes is there but the other conditions you see where the stroke coronary artery disease deaths are also equally high but heart failure is something which goes unrecognized and if you try to see which is the first manifestation of type 2 di- diabetes related cv uh, manifest disease after per- peripheral artery disease it is heart failure and type 2 diabetes trials have shown that heart failure is prevalent in almost 10 to 30% of the patients and chronic heart failure trials have shown almost 30% of patients so each four patients you see at least there will be 30% of your patients 100 patients 30% of patients who must have already gone or are due to go to heart failure now 
what we as physicians do or as uh, diabetologists or endocrinologists or cardiologists do, we treat it is as a two entities. Either we treat heart failure or we treat uh, diabetes. But we have to realize that diabetes ultimately one or the other day will go into a chronic heart failure. And this is where my topic comes. How can we prevent this? Because all these factors, you know, hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, all these things lead to chronic heart failure in the long run. Now, what is the prevalence for each 1% increase in HbA1c, the risk of incident heart failure increases by 8% to 36%. So four to eight times higher versus non-diabetic patients. So this highlights a problem that this is really a big issue and we have to recognize this earlier. What happens when these patients go to this thing, heart failure? Usually after they're diagnosed, gradually within first heart failure hospitalization, you'll see the time span goes decreasing and soon within four hospitalizations, they ultimately lead to death. So this highlights the importance that heart failure has to be detected early. The next question this person would like to ask, why is it important to detect heart failure in diabetics? Let us see. Now, we have four stages of heart failure. These are the two stages, that is stage A and B, where we can do prevention. But when the patient goes to stage C and D, nothing can be done because already the patient has had signs and symptoms and has affected heart failure. So just to highlight that as the patient starts sliding down, the patient's quality of life decreases and the mortality does increase. A great criteria, he talked. If you ask you, why do we mean by early detection of diabetes? Early detection of diabetes, as per the ACC AHA, clearly states that it is stage A, stage B, or stage C1. There is no limitation of physical activity, no symptoms. These are the patients who, who are at risk of developing heart failure. Of course, when the person comes to stage 2, stage 3, stage 4, these patients are easy to detect and are, have existing heart failure. Now, these first two stages of A and B are very important, and it suggests that for well, these patients who are at risk of developing heart failure, we can have therapeutic interventions introduced even before the appearance of LV dysfunction or symptoms can reduce the population morbidity and mortality. Now, if you try to see what are the various types of heart failure, it can be reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction. This is an entity which we have started recognizing more and more. And as we go through this entity, we have the mid-range ejection fraction or the recovery ejection fraction. Now, anything less than 40% ejection fraction on an echo, this is the echo diagnostic criteria, is reduced ejection fraction. Anything more than 50% is preserved. Between 40 to 50%, we have this mid-range or recovering because the reduced ejection fraction can gradually improve with therapy and can go to preserved ejection fraction. Now, this gap between preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction is very little because these patients of preserved ejection fraction have an equal bad mortality and morbidity as compared to reduced ejection fraction. So here comes the issue that we have to recognize this. We don't just recognize this entity. We have to recognize also those with preserved ejection fraction. This young, beautiful lady, actress, uh, daughter of a very uh, senior actor, how do we detect heart failure in early diabetes? Signs and symptoms by doing certain biochemical tests, electrocardiography, echocardiography. Now, what are the signs and symptoms? A diabetic may first come to you telling, I'm short of breath, tired, some swollen ankles, loss of appetite, coughing, dizziness, abdominal bloating, sleep disturbance. These symptoms are usually means uh, confused with other diseases and we ignore them. But in any diabetic, we have to be sure that possibly is my patient going into heart failure. And that is where we start with an ECG. If you see a normal ECG and a patient with congestive heart failure, where you, the patient starts having widening of the QRS, the various parameters which are source, LA low, overload, LV hypertrophy, bundle branch blocks. And of course, these all indicate and gives us an idea. Suppose the patient has gone to atrial fibrillation. From ECG, we can pick up a lot of things. And the value of ECG is especially in identifying systolic dysfunction. Then let us come to the biochemical parameters. We have the ANPs, the BNPs, and the CNPs. And among them, the most important is the BNP, because what happens whenever there's a myocardial stretch, there is a cardiac cells to start releasing the pre-pro-BNP, they become the pro-BNP, and they divide into the anti-pro-BNP and BNP. Our now labs, mostly they 
do all antiprobi and proBNP, and we have to identify if the patient has complaints whether the antiprobi and proBNP is higher. And based on that, we have to give therapy that is the and nephrisin inhibitors, and these biomarkers are very important. And we have targets for these biomarkers. If these biomarkers are raised, we can target the drugs. Now, the European Society of Cardiology and the American College of Cardiology have a class one in, I mean, recommendation for doing anti pro BNP, and there's more than 300 possibly a patient has gone into heart failure. But one thing of caution is that anti pro BNP may be raised in various situations. For example, in CKD and strokes, one has to be careful. But please don't go by the report that uh, if it is more than 300, it is always uh, this thing that is heart failure. It, there is the age variation also. For example, less than 50, it should be more than 450. 50 to 75, more than 900. More than 75, more than 1800. Then only you think of heart failure. So please analyze the anti pro BNP reports very carefully. Now, it has been shown that the, if the anti pro BNP is high, then the chances of mortality and the recurrent heart failure hospitalization is also high. So after ECG, the biochemical parameter is very important. There have been various newer biochemical parameters that the ST2, galactin, microRNA, prokaxoning, MMP, but we don't have an access to all this except in the ST2. The soluble supplement tuberous ST2 has shown to be associated with adverse outcomes in heart failure and predict mortality risk. In fact, the PRIDE study showed that if the ST2 values are more than 0.2, there were increased risk of death at one year. And please remember that inferior to NP pro bm 3 for diagnosis of heart failure, it only suggests that what is the mortality or the outcome. And this ST2 is now available in many labs and it can be done. ECHO in 1972 is just when ECHO started, it was just the M mode. And in 2023, you have to spend almost 30, 40 minutes on ECHO because you do the M mode, a 2D, a 3D, a diastolic, a strain, a contrast, a Doppler. And there are various factors which can be seen and which can detect. I won't go into the, all these details because these markers that are ECHO markers, so you can do a phenotyping and a prognostic assessment, and also we can know the additional marker for the prognosis. Now, ECHO has advanced a lot and has, uh, in evaluation of heart failure patient, it picks up early heart failure patients. Besides that, the scoring system, the HEFPEF system, in which we have various parameters, which is the body mass index, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, elder, and filling pressure. So you have a score of nine, and if the patient has a score more than four, the chances of heart failure is very high. So clinically also with ECHO, you can also know whether the patient has got heart failure or not. These are the various parameters, let them be clinical, the laboratory parameters, the ECG parameters, the chest X-ray, the ECHO parameters, which all if compounded can show very sensitive indices for detecting heart failure early. Now, this was in 2022 when an update came that if the patient is stage A, try to see for the risk factors, Go for a pro BNP. If the pro BNP is normal, again ask the patient to come after one year. Stage B already when dysfunction has started, either the earliest of the diastolic dysfunction, then again you go for a PN, pro BNP. If it is elevated, go for various imaging, especially echo. And if it is yes, your patient is in heart failure and needs to be treated because anytime your patient of stage B can go to a stage C or a stage D. Now, what are why managing heart failure is a challenge in diabetics because picking them up is very important and then also managing them. Now, it is seen that what we as physicians do, we treat both of these as different entities. We have to think about each diabetic possibly having heart failure. And this is one of the most dangerous disease combination in modern medicine, making the treatment more difficult because you have to be very uh, prudent in choosing the drugs. The next important thing, we have very limited drugs which can prevent heart failure. And many hyperglycine drugs have been found to have a potential CV risk, which are not conducive to heart failure. So we have to be very selective in drugs and therefore it's necessary to further explore the treatment plan of diabetes mellitus combined with heart failure. Now, how do we prevent heart failure diabetes? If Tamla Hashan would ask, definitely we have to remember that this is rich or the poor, all hearts are equal. And the first basic concept that should go that lifestyle modifications are very important. No smoking, a proper diet, could give, go away with stress, do exercise, do yoga, do meditation, and this will 
possibly help more than 50% of a patient. And as Professor Das was telling, no one wants physiotherapy, no one wants also lifestyle modification. They just want drug. And as you see, the 2022 uh, stratification first was stated that there's a lifestyle modifying diabetes, and then we have to have glycemic control, blood pressure management, lipid management, and agents with cardiovascular and kidney benefit are very important. Now, great personality. We all went all at him. Are there drugs that can prevent heart failure? Yes, there are drugs. And when HGLT2 came, it was a big step forward because we started you know, thinking that possibly with this HGLT2 inhibitors can work on this cardiovascular continuum and it was it can prevent atherosclerosis. Now, how does it prevent atherosclerosis? This is a narrative review from Nature which showed that a host of mechanisms and all this help uh, in having prevention of atherosclerosis and these drugs do modify atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis is the first stage where the heart failure begins. And if you can start this drug early, these are definitely prevented drugs. Moreover, these are animal models which showed that you can see the interval thickness when they're put on SGL2 inhibitors versus non-SGL2 inhibitors, the interval media thickness decreased when they were put on SGL2 inhibitors. And this was something very interesting that appeared last year, giving us more uh, means, uh, confidence that these drugs could prevent atherosclerosis. Intimal media thickness is prevented by DAPA. Now, diabetes induced myocardial injury markers, the increment was also halted by DAPA. So these were the new evidence that we're getting. And more importantly, recently we've got evidence that DAPA can stabilize diabetes-induced atherosclerosis plaque instability. This is very important. This so is in the mouse model, which was done, and histopathological studies has shown that if you start DAPA early, you can do a plaque stabilization. So the next question comes, can it prevent myocardial infarction? Yes, it has been shown that it can prevent myocardial infarction. And this was on the rabbit models. You see the control tissues of the heart. What happens in a diabetic, the myocardium? And if you put DAPA, it is almost comparable to the control. So it gives us more evidence. Of course, these are on animal models. These are new studies that are coming up and also highlights the fact that in the diabetes, if you use SGL2 inhibitors, definitely it does not become fibrotic. So it is the anti-fibrotic drug which has to be started early. Next, can it prevent heart failure? Of course. The first trial to do was the declared TME58, which showed that if you use DAPA, it did uh, prevent uh, this thing, uh, renal composite burns, the deaths, the major adverse cardiac events, and cardiovascular death and hospitalization from heart failure. And it all results in a lower rate of cardiovascular death and hospitalization from heart failure, highlighting the fact that DAPA is started early can prevent heart failure. So the ACCHA came with the guidelines that three randomized controlled trials have shown that SGL2 inhibitors can reduce heart failure and can be extended to primary prevention. This was something very important and gave us insight that in 2019, we have taken a big step ahead in having the SGL2 inhibitors in preventing heart failure. Then came the guidelines from 2018 to 2016. All guidelines started stating and upgrading the use of HGL2 inhibitors in prevention of heart failure and in treating heart failure. The other trial, which you're all aware, is the DAPA heart failure study, which clearly showed that if the patient has gone into heart failure, if you put these patients on diabetes DAPA, they do well. Then came a big leap forward. And this was ARNI or the sacubitral valsartal combination. And the 2022 Heart Failure Society of USA and the uh, ACC AHA clearly stated in patients with heart failure, class two to three symptoms, use of ARNI is a class one recommendation for morbidity and mortality reduction. And you have to use ACRB where ARNI is not feasible or patients with intolerance to ACI because of cough and angioedema, but ARNI is a class one indication in patients. So use these two drugs, which were previously used as a class one drugs. They have been replaced by RD as the first drug. And it has been shown that when you use RD, there is a significant decrement in the anti-proBNP levels, almost 25% reduction in anti-proBNP levels in SACVAL combination compared to NLFL diabetes and heart failure. So if you detect a patient who having a high proBNP, you have to put them on the SGL2 inhibitors and have to put them on the SACVAL combination. And let us see which scores best. This was a mortality benefit of ARP, AC inhibitors, and you see ARNI. ARNI has the maximum mortality benefit so far as this thing that is heart failure is concerned. So we have to take evidence which is before us and go ahead with the treatment. These two gentlemen could never make a ministry. 
So with the question comes, can we have HCL2 inhibitors army to prevent heart failure and diabetics? Yes, the AC 2021 guidelines clearly states that HCL2 inhibitor has to be added with SAC12 for patients who are prone to diabetes or have a heart failure. And also this has been endorsed by the ACC 2022 guidelines. And it was seen that when there was a comprehensive therapy of both these drugs, the cardiovascular death, the hospitalization, and the all-cause mortality was significantly reduced. So comprehensive therapy halt or delay clinical progression or heart failure of the reduced disease fraction patients compared to conventional therapy. The thing again went further that these studies like the DAPA heart failure, the emperor heart failure clearly stated that this combination is much better than giving single drug. So as practicing patients, we have to move with science and possibly think of this combination. And the pooled meta-analysis clearly indicates that there's a 32% lower occurrence of CV death or heart failure hospitalization, heart failure with reduced digestion fraction when SGL2 inhibitors are combined with a sac combination. A very famous personality because she married one of our famous actors, Priyanka Chopra, Nick Jones. What is the pharmacotherapy to prevent heart failure and diabetes? These were the fantastic four for which I have been proposed now as the great things. And these three drugs have shown that these are the interventions which has to be given to prevent heart failure and in patients with diabetes. A person who ruled a good economic uh, thing, a politician who will ask what are the tips and tricks to prevent heart failure, definitely this is what we've done. In stage A, the primary care patient, the dietitian and endocrinologist have to see that they assess it, and they have to start the patient on HGLT2 inhibitors with RNA, of course. And in stage B, we have to be very careful in medical management. You have to try to avoid DPP-4, thiazolidins, and sulfonylurea, and try to stick to HGLT2 inhibitors as the most important thing. And most importantly, do a biochemical test and an echo to diagnose your patients. Now, why was I showing all these personalities? They have something in common, and that was diabetes. All these big personalities, whether politicians, film actors, musicians, all have diabetes in common, and they had to fight and are leading a good life in spite of their diabetes. So if you ask me the question, can heart failure and diabetes prevent? The answer from my side is a big yes. Detect early, treat early with appropriate drugs, and you'll definitely see heart failure can be prevented. Thank you very much for the patient hearing. Thank you, Professor Dr. Sahu, for that lucid presentation. Only thing is that uh, diabetics, when they are presented to ICU as a sepsis case, they are many times we see that NT and pro BNP is much higher. In those, yes. what do we do? See, NT pro BNP can be high in many cases. Even you see in kidney failure, in a stroke, all these things you have to be very careful in interpreting the NT pro BNP levels. So just don't go by NT pro BNP. Try to take uh, resort to other investigations like your uh, this thing that is echo, your ECG, your chest X ray, and your clinical acumen, of course. So if you tell me that we should not be guided directly only with investigations, we have to think the patient, see the patient clinically, and also resort to especially echo in diagnosis. I think uh, Professor Chutra now will pass on to Dr. Bharat Panigrai, who is the, yeah, who yeah. Is the moderator for the question answer, and you all join him. Uh, Bharat, yes, the... We had a very, very impressive session. All three speakers have done very well in uh, passing on the message in a very limited time. Uh, so now the uh, panel discussion will be very interesting and I request uh, uh, Professor Ashokdas also to uh, be there during the panel yeah. and uh, request Dr. Bharat Panigrahi and invite Dr. Rajiv Chawla. Uh, so please Rajiv, please join. Me. Rajiv, please yeah. join. Thank you. Thank yeah, Dr. You, Bharat Panigrahi is a, uh, he's a MD medicine and a, a fellowship in multiple uh, fields, rheumatology and a pediatric dermatology also. He is a consultant in internal me medicine and dermatology at Care LP Prashad I Institute and Amri Hospitals Bhavaneshwar at present. He is the uh, immediate past president uh, of uh, API Odisha, and uh, he will be moderating this uh, interesting session of uh, uh, nephrology, uh, rheumatology, and cardiology together. Uh, so let us start with, and uh, before that, I invite Dr. Rajiv Chawla to the uh, panel. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Chawla, uh, who is uh, a known figure uh, in uh, national level, is the past president of 
RSS DI and uh, he has multiple uh, good uh, good. <laughs> thank yeah, you yeah. we can thank we can so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. just a request to professor Bharat Panigrahi we are running 40 minutes late kindly ask the speakers panelists to be very brief and specific thank you thank you thank you Alo. Bharat please start so, yeah so thank you professor Das um, and all the three speakers who have done excellent job. Good and, job. Uh, yeah, yeah. So let me start with uh, Dr. Manish Sahai. Manisha Sahai. Man Manisha, right? sir. Manisha. Uh, so, Dr. Manisha, you have shown in your slides regarding albuminuric and non albuminuric disease. Fine. And of late, during the last decade or so, we are, we are coming across with a lot of cases of non-albuminaric disease. Okay, so the pathophysiology, the line of treatment, I think everything is different in case of non-albuminaric disease than the albuminaric disease. So will you please highlight how to manage a case of non-albuminaric kidney disease? Yeah, so thank you for that question. So this is an emerging entity. 20% of all patients with diabetic kidney disease have non-albuminuric diabetic kidney disease. So it's a huge number. And as you said, the pathophysiology is different. It is more, more relation, uh, related to inflammation and macrovascular disease rather than microvascular disease. Therefore, microalbuminuria is not there. Retinopathy is not there. Mostly you have associations with coronary artery disease, strokes, so macrovascular disease. So as of now, uh, it's difficult to diagnose. We, you have to only look at the GFR. GFR will be low, but albuminuria will, will not be there. So that's the only way of early diagnosis. It progresses slowly as compared to the albuminuric variety. And most of the drugs we have, uh, for example, RAS blockade, should we use them in albuminuric or non-albuminuric? Albuminuric, definitely we use them. What about non-albuminuric? Evidence is not very clear, but you can use for other uh, pure mod but pleiotropic effects of RAS blockade. So we still continue to use them. SGLT2, uh, also we use the drug because they again have multiple mechanisms of action, not only control of albuminuria. So as of now, the evidence supporting the use of these drugs, what we use in albuminuric diabetic nephropathy is not that strong for non-albuminuric diabetic nephropathy. We will get more and more evidence later on. Nowadays, we have finrenone, which acts on the inflammation part of it, aldosterone part of it, so diabetic nephropathy has many pathogenesis. One of them is through the albuminuria route. So we still continue to use all these drugs. And again, the lifestyle measures are important for non-albuminuric disease as well. So the whole important thing is that we check the albumin and do not check the GFR. Then what will happen is we will miss the non-albuminuric uh, nephropathy. So do both and treat them as of now similarly. But uh, uh, regarding the RAS blockers, RAS has... A uh, little role in case of non albuminic disease, number one. Number yes, two, the role, we, it is, we, it is not RAS is, to say that RAS they is, don't have any role. They, they, yeah. We cannot say that there is no role of RAS blockade. That statement is wrong. They, the albuminuria part role is not there, but RAS have other benefits also. They also have anti-inflammatory effects. We all know the pleiotropic effects of RAS blockade, so they can still be used. But as you rightly said, the evidence for their benefit in non-albuminuric is less, far less than in albuminuric. But you, you should still use them. It's not that you diagnose that and stop it. That's not the correct thing to do because RAS also reduces the intraglomerular pressure, the hyperfiltration, all those is also reduced by RAS, which is a component of non-albuminuric diaptic nephropathy as well. So as of now, the evidence is evolving. So much highlight is there on non-albuminuric nephropathy to point out to the physicians and general practitioners that do not think of, there is no albuminuria, there is no diaptic nephropathy. There, is, there still might be diaptic nephropathy. So check for albuminuria as well as GFR both. So that is the importance. And all the uh, treatments we use for albuminuric, use for non-albuminuric. But yeah, we, can go to, we, can, we can go to second question. No, no, even in case of albuminuric kidney disease, the range from 30 to 299, the role of RAS blockers, again, is modest. It is Absolutely. only it that's is what I said. Yeah. So that's why that I'm is, yes. Yeah. Yes. Is there any absolute indication for renal biopsy in this setting? So if you are sure that there is 
many of these patients, that's an excellent question. They don't have retinopathy. So as far as yeah. the yeah. evidence goes now, such patients where we have a low GFR absence of retinopathy, we tend to do a biopsy. So uh, many of them, though it's not diagnostic, but still, at least uh, you can find out if you are missing out on other non-diabetic kidney diseases. Nothing else is there. The biopsy still shows diabetic nephropathy. You are doubly sure that it is probably non-albuminuric diabetic nephropathy. Okay. So last question to you. You have shown in one of your slides the upcoming drugs because now everything we are target oriented. Okay. So you have shown regarding the PCSK inhibitors, regarding the age inhibitors, regarding the uh, TFG beta in inhibitors. So what is the uh, status? What is the future of these drugs in two, three lines? Can you tell me? So as of now, they are all under trial and many of them are under randomized control trials. They are not in clinical use. The latest entrant has been the finrenone, which we already know. So apart from SGLT2 and the GLP1 RA, the other uh, drugs, so many of them are there. You have the PKC inhibitors, you have anti-endothelin drugs as well. As of now, they are not a part of the guideline so far. So probably another two, three years down the line, you may have some of these drugs which will be an addition to our armamentarium for management of diabetic nephropathy. Thank you. Thank you. But you Bharat, you... Bharat, Bharat, I have one question, if you kindly yeah. allow me. If, yeah. that question, Manisha. I, you know that we had, uh, I mean, I'll ask a very pointed question, Manisha. If it is wrong question, then you change the question to your to what should be a correct question. You know, we start Finrenon at what level of GFR? Or we can't start for what? 26? Minimum 26? What, what's your take on that, Manisha? Yeah. 25. Uh, so, uh, 25 25 yeah. Finrenone is available in two doses, uh, 10 mg and 20 mg in India. Yeah. And GFR is more than 60, you can start with 20 mg. GFR between 30 to 60, generally 10 mg. And between 25 to 30, be mindful of potassium and all that, then still you can start with a dose of 10 mg. And so my question, second question is SGLT2. What is your GFR level at which you will take, uh, I mean, what was your take on GFR versus SGLT2 prescription in DKD? Question again, sir. So now initially when we started the SGLT2 whole thing, credence trial and all, the cutoff was 30. Then later on, after the DAPA CKD, the GFR came down to 25. Yeah, and that. now after, after you have okay. the recent trials, now it's 20. So 20 GFR and above, you can start the SGLT2 inhibitor. Good. Thank you, Manisha. One thing, just to uh, continue that, that once you've started it, you can continue it even if the GFR falls. So GFR 15, 18, you can still use it till the patient goes on dialysis. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, one, one thing, Dr. Manisha, one thing uh, you have shown a case. So after AGL2 neuter, you added uh, GL1 agonist. Then you added phenylone. You are a treated case of CKD. Why did you add GLP-1 agonist, not phenylone directly? Because GLP-1 agonist is only indicated if there is poor glycemic control even after agile tunitor. So here is a case of only CKD. So why not after agile tunitor direct phenylone without adding GLP-1 agonist? Excellent question again, sir. So GLP-1 uh, agonist, as you know, are renoprotective. And we have multiple trials to I mean, support that. You have Pioneer, Sustain. So many trials are there. So GLP-1 act through the sodium hydrogen exchanger pathway, and they are also renoprotective. So as per the KDGO consensus guidelines, SGLT2, if not tolerant, GLP-1 RA, both for cardio and reno, and then pinrenone. So as of now, pinrenone, it's up to you. You want to add pinrenone directly after the SGLT2, it's fine. But remember, pinrenone benefits more for the proteinuria aspect, not regarding the stabilization of GFR. GLP-1 RA do both. What ADA guidelines say, after um, this uh, AC neutron ARB, add HL2 neutron, then go to phenylon. Then not, not uh, GLP-1 against in between. KDGO okay, guidelines, so, yes. yes. So KDGO guidelines put it a little bit differently. They say GLP-1 and then I mean, phenylon. So probably it's a matter of time. We'll have a consensus among all guidelines as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So next stage, our... Um, Bidut. Bidut Babu. So welcome. Vidut Babu, so you have really described so nicely that I don't uh, dare to ask you any question now, but I will ask, definitely I will ask, I will not leave you. So, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so 
Uh, you see, we are dealing with diabetes here. Diabetes and its complications, musculoskeletal complications. So all these complications are diabetes related. So do you feel that only glycemic control will, def will in these complications, will like, give a good uh, uh, out outlook of these di uh, diabetes complications or it doesn't have any role? I said right from the beginning that there are multifactorial causes. And uh, I also said, stressed that uh, controlling diabetes is very, very important. Uh, controlling glycemic control is very, very important. Most epidemiological studies have shown that if you have a good control of diabetes, these uh, musculoskeletal disorders may be retarded. They may not be stopped, but they may be retarded. The progress may be retarded. So basically, the first... Yeah. And when we talk about control of any complication, I, I think the top order is the control of sugar and control of glycemic control. That's very, very important. So why I'm asking this question too? Because but most of the, not all, most of these complications are the duration-related uh, complications. More the duration, these complications are added. As you have already shown, that the, these are all age-related. Because what is the pathogenesis? Pathogenesis is, that is the advanced glycosin and, and, and products and linking collagen that in the early part of the disease, if you control the diabetes, then there will be reversible. But in the latter part of the disease, these are not, not reversible. So even if you control the hyperglycemia, this uh, link is not reversible. That's mm -hmm. why many studies show that even if you control the, the diabetes, it doesn't have any effect on the outcome of the disease. That's why I wanted to give your expert opinion because yes, in the early part of the disease, that has some um, uh, effect, but in the latter part of the disease, disease complication, these are not the um, glycemic control doesn't uh, give a good uh, outcome. Bharat, yeah. Bharat, can I, Bharat, can I come in for a minute? Yeah, you know, yes. the, the, the thing that he described beautifully, Bidut, uh, that uh, spontaneous uh, myonecrosis Vidut uh, and I would like to take my friends that I had a chance to see one case. It's a spontaneous myonecrosis that occurs usually in the calf muscle or thigh muscle. It is not related to, to the, to the uh, acute thromboembolism nor related to the, any vehicle, any, any vessel block. So it occurs spontaneously. It is the death of the muscles as Vidut really said and the, it presents with acute or subacute pain with swelling. And, and, and also tenderness. So it's present like a mass. And the diagnosis we made was by biopsy. And the biopsy classically will show the closing of the capillaries and closing of the arterioles. And uh, this is a very rare entity, as Vidhitu rightly pointed out. One has to be aware of this. And I also saw another case in the... Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Thank you very much. The last question to you is the relationship between the diabetes, musculoskeletal system and inflammation. Because, you know, diabetes, everything is inflammation. And Vidyut, you are otoproto. You are, you are, you are buried in, in, in throughout in inflammation. So, you know, what is your take on that? You know, diabetes, musculoskeletal disease, inflammation. Uh, sir, uh, I did tell you that uh, very shortly we are going to have a very good interaction between immunologists and diabetologists. Uh, this is coming very soon. And uh, what I see, the number of uh, um, immunological factors that have come in, inflammation is going up. So there's a very close relationship. Now we say diabetes is an inflammatory disease. And I would not be wrong. We say exactly. Same thing. Same thing I'm coming to. So Absolutely. So much of inflammation, so many immunological in, inflammatory markers. I'm very sure it has a very big role to play in muscular. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much. And 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 Vidyut, be in your gang and also join our gang. <laughs> Ajib, any comments? Rajiv? I think my uh, last question. Uh, uh, Dr. Vidyut Das presentation was wonderful. I mean, you very Great. rightly said my necrosis and certain new things. We already knew that there is an advanced glycation and products and inflammatory disease of the tendons and fascia leading on to all those uh, duplicate contractures and everything. But certain things were unique in his presentation. We haven't seen honestly. So we have heard about it, read in literature, but certain of his uh, uh, presentations were very, very good. I think it was wonderful. Okay, my last question to Vidut Babu. 
Uh, you have um, very nicely described regarding the adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. So one question in doubt because NSAIDs are being used rampantly for pain relief in these cases. But there are many studies which say that the role of NSAIDs is uh, not that robust. So what is your opinion? What is your comment on that? Uh, I had shown there are three phases. The initial phase is painful phase and then you have a restrictive phase. Then gradually it goes into a fibrotic phase. The initial stages, there is inflammation. And that is the stage, if you give anti-inflammatory, if you can inject the shoulder also, you get good result. And we know inflammation is there in a lot of these uh, conditions. And shoulder joint especially, people don't come. They come very late. They come only fibro state and then they say, do something. That At that point of time, NSAIDs and uh, steroid, local steroid doesn't have much effect. Their physiotherapy has a vital effect. And again, I must reiterate, I do not know why Indians are so wary about physiotherapy. This concept of physiotherapy has to be drilled into the uh, minds of the patients. Very, very important uh, for all, all of in, in our field, especially we know physiotherapy is so vital, but unfortunately, uh, people don't accept it. So that is the stage. Professor, okay. Professor Das, there is a general uh, feeling among diabetologists and physicians that why did that orthopedic surgeon give injection in your joint? It will cause sepsis, this, that. So that prevents many diabetologists and physicians to advise for injections. What is your message? Uh, which conditions? Frozen uh, shoulder, 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 adhesive capsulitis. Adhesive capsulitis. Frozen shoulder. Initial, frozen shoulder. initial stages, uh, it, is, it is nice to give an injection and that actually works very well. In my experience, people who come, they come very late. But people who have come early and we have injected, they have done fantastically well. And especially associated with physiotherapy. The sugar levels may go up a little bit, I'm sure. But it comes down after a certain period of time. Absolutely. But agent, patient has a right shoulder affection. He cannot even eat his food. He cannot lift his hand. He becomes a cripple. And then you ask him to, at a later stage to do a surgery. And that is still worse in a diabetic. I think so, subsequent physiotherapy really helps. Subsequently, yeah. after an injection, we, we had a physiotherapy graduate did a thesis on this, comparing physiotherapy and the and the and you know it, it is excellent. He had actually forty cases. Okay. On Mohan Krishnan, he has published that also. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Prasant. I thought we were excellent talk by P.K. Sahu. Please ask yeah. him questions, Bharat. One yeah, or two yeah. questions. Dr. Prasant, you have shown yes. this prevention of uh, we are we are talking of prevention. Maybe primary prevention, maybe secondary prevention. Okay. So primary prevention of heart failure, they have shown the lifestyle modification, lifestyle modification, lifestyle modification. Fine. But the landmark trial, look ahead trial, that it, which was a completely supervised, supervised trial, but that didn't show any benefit of any cardiovascular disease benefit or heart failure benefit. So what's your comment on that? Nice question, sir, because Luca Head trial was in fact uh, funded by the National Institute of Health. They had two arms, the intensive arm and the diabetes support and education arm. But if you try to go deep into the study, you'll try, you'll definitely see there are some flaws in the study. Most of the patients who were enrolled had a choice whether they would go for diet or physical activity. And this physical activity was not done under supervision. They were allowed to do at home. Next thing is that only if you see the amount of patients who were enrolled were hardly around, I think, 15% cardiovascular patients. Others did not have any disease. But as a result, in the nine years follow-up or nine plus, in between nine to 10 years follow-up, they clearly showed that there was definitely uh, means, uh, some improvement in so far as the weight reduction was considered, uh, so far as the uh, glycemic levels or as the lipid levels all were improved. So let us not go by the fact that the Lukai trial shows that even if you put physical activity, etc., you will not do harm to the patient. So those are a wrong concept because the trial design was wrong. In fact, if you try to analyze and you read the criticisms about this trial, they have clearly stated that uh, these patients, those who are above 65 years, they, in fact, they were more effective because they were more stringent to this uh, this thing that is physical activity diet that was uh, proposed. But the younger population did not do well because they were not, not caring about the diet, etc. So just please don't be misguided by the fact that the Lukahed says that no, it is not uh, 
uh, that is lifestyle modules don't work. In fact, lifestyle modules do work. If you go between the lines of the look ahead, it showed that there was definitely good glycemic control, lipid control, and in the long run, the patient did well. Thank you. So far as HLT2 inhibitors are um, concerned, yes, HLT2 inhibitors are a part of treatment of heart failure. There is no doubt any. But what, so far as the prevention, okay, once heart failure is there and if, if you give HLT2 inhibitor, it will retard the progression. But what about the primary prevention? Do you feel that all the patients should be given HLT2 inhibitors, all the diabetes patients should be given HLT2 inhibitor to prevent heart failure? What is, the, what is your role as a primary prevention? Uh, if you ask me this question as a cardiologist, I'll tell yes, because it has been shown that we have to know what is the mechanism by which SGL2 inhibitors work. Basically, it is not the diabetes control that I am interested about. It is the fact that it prevents atherosclerosis, it works as a diuresis, it decreases LV mass volume, and all, of course, improves the endothelial dysfunction. And this is what a cardiologist wants. Ultimately, Diabetic patients will land up in atherosclerosis. So you must have even seen that nowadays it is said that SGL2 inhibitors were the first line drugs along with metformin. So as cardiologists, we do, I will definitely agree that it has to be put in the primary prevention drug. And you'll see the guidelines are changing. And our AHA, ACC heart failure guidelines have already put it much higher up and assert that SGL2 inhibitors have to be used once a patient is detected as a diabetic, and moreover, it's a very cheap drug now with less of side effects. So why yeah. not put them early? But the guidelines before any it is now the all the panelists have to comment on that. I think Bharat will close. We are forty minutes late uh, because with you know your, yeah, because with, with, your, with your comment only with your yours. I think I Dr. Think Dr. Rajiv, Dr. I let Rajiv Shant, comment. Doctor Prashant has beautifully shown the management of heart failure, the pathogenesis, how it goes about. And he very rightly said, today guidelines, whether you talk about ACC or our own RSSG 22 guidelines, we have a much higher hierarchy for SGLT2 after metformin. Almost in every patient who has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or multiple risk factor or reduced ejection fraction. Other than that, of course, beta blocker, ARNI, and even now MRA and with the availability of phenylalanine. I think we have multiple tools to handle not only the prevention of heart failure, but subsequent progression of heart failure in setting of type 2 diabetes. I think, Rajiv, you said all. I think I think we, I asked a question to John Buse last week in a virtual meeting. I think you were there. I asked him why, but Prasant, full marks to you. I said why ESC, European Social Cardiology, said SGLT2 number one in diabetics and non-diabetics. Why ADA took so much time? EAD is so tough. He said, because we are very conservative. Thank you very much. But I think it the message is 2019. Anybody above 55 years having two risk factors should be given a genius. So I, think, I think that includes almost 80 to 90 percent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. true. Thank you very much. I think, I think to interest of time, Bharat, thank you very much for conducting so well. Thanks to Rajiv. Rajiv, thank, thank you very you. much for joining. I understand. I mean, I, I'm extremely happy you could join. And the three excellence, we give a big round of applause for all the three talks to Manisha. Wonderful with, presentation and by all three Shant. speakers. Great, yeah. great, Dr. great. Dr. Manisha, Prashant, Dr. Das and Dr. 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 Time to talk, we will discuss about your topic, but it was great, Prashant. And you made a real, real difference. Dear friends, now I'll, I'll be in favor of saving time. I, I'll invite right away the chairperson of the next next uh, session, Sishir Babu. And Rebunna Jenner took the and to the, Dr. D. Jenner to kindly join and Devarchan uh, Jenner. And over to you. Uh, please be conscious about the time, sir. Sishir Babu, let us start. Yes, sir. Three wonderful. So, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Asad Kumar Das. Now, this is uh, session eight. It is definitely a continuation of session seven. And also, the topic continues to be complications in diabetes. But at the outset, I express my respect and also I congratulate Professor Asok Kumar Das and Dr. Jayant Kumar Panda in the association with Chairman NUCD for conducting this NUCD from year to year gracefully. Sir, I feel and everybody feels because of your high profile stature and high profile stature others that invites the entire national faculty as well as the delegates of the entire country and the state. Thank you very much. And please continue to maintain it. 
and uh, just because this contest setting you given for five minutes, I will not take more time. Within that time, my contest setting will complete. So diabetes complications is well known to everybody. Now we have uh, this uh, diabetes related complications almost affects all the organ systems. And it is responsible for majority of morbidity and mortality associated with the disease. We have acute complications, we have chronic complications, acute is very vulnerable to everyone. That is decay and uh, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Now hyperglycemia as a part of it, it is a side effect or a reaction to insulin and sulfonylurea. Chronic complex, well-known microvascular, macrovascular. But what is more important is non-vascular. Non-vascular complications of diabetes. That is infection, skin diseases, and very less, Professor Das, we are discussing on hearing loss. And the disease is associated with the increased risk of dementia and Alzheimer's. And the most important is the diabetic hepatopathy and this oral cavity in diabetes. So these are the various complications that, uh, that includes acute, chronic, then vascular, non-vascular, in vascular again, micro and microvascular complications. With this, we will come to the topic. In the section eight, we have three speakers. One speaker, Professor J.B. Kanwar, he will be speaking on hypoglycemia. The other one, Dr. Ghanusam Goel, he will be speaking on diabetic neuropathy and diabetic food syndrome. And the third one is a national famous Dr. Deepak Jam, Deepak Jumani. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jayavanu Kanwar. I tell you, Professor Das, there is no diabetes meeting or symposium, seminar, or conference without Professor J.V. Kanwar. He is a perfect academician, a very magnetic and attractive speaker. And in the recent uh, Odisha Endocrine Society conference, he was the chairman scientific committee with his humble, untiring effort. It attracted all the categories of delegates. So he is now the professor, Department of Endocrinology, IMS Sam Hospital. He has done his DM from Sanjay Gandhi, he posted his into Lucknow. He is working as a professor of IMS and Sam Hospital. He has published many articles, reviewer of many journals, past secretary of Odisha Endocrine Society, and organized many national state conferences. With this, I take immense pleasure to invite you, you Professor <laughs> Kanwar, on the topic hypoglycemia. This is a very important thing. We really neglect, we do not understand, particularly hypoglycemia unawareness. So with this, I hand over the mic to you, hypoglycemia, neurocognitive and cardiometabolic and beyond. Over to you, Professor Kanwar. Thank you. Thank you, Sissi, sir. At the outset, uh, I'm very thankful for this nice introduction. Uh, very good noon to all of you. It's almost 12 o'clock. Uh, a good noon to Asuk, sir, and Professor Jain Panda and all the delegates and uh, of our panelists uh, sitting over here. Uh, today, I will be speaking on hypoglycemia and its consequences. And, uh, you know, this, there are many consequences of hypoglycemia, most importantly, neurocognitive and cardiometabolic. I will also speak about the, what, what are the long-term consequences of hypoglycemia, like what are the effect on dementia, what are the effect on the memory, and what are the effect on the brain volume about that. So uh, I, I would start with the history of uh, uh, hypoglycemia. We all knew that hypoglycemia could be fatal from the very beginning with the discovery of insulin. And, uh, and you can see that the small ch child, she is Elizabeth Hughes. She was fortunate to receive insulin uh, in 1999 when the, the, she was one of the among all the patients who received insulin and she continued to survive. Uh, for 60 years after receiving insulin. But the, the interesting aspect is that, that Thea Cooper and Arthur Eisenberg and published this uh, book called Breakthrough, uh, Elizabeth Hughes in the Discovery of Insulin and Making of a Medical Miracle, uh, she clearly mentioned uh, there's, there's a sister, there's a nurse called Blanche who's, who used to share a bed in the hope of that Blanche could better detect and respond to a nighttime attack. 
and Blanche saved Elizabeth's life dozens of times with orange juices or molasses of kids. So we all do understand what she was referring to. She was referring to hypoglycemia. So uh, well, well, how do you classify hypoglycemia? This is a classification of ADA. There's a severe hypoglycemia where there are typical symptoms of hypoglycemia, which requires some other person to supplement glucose or carbohydrate or inject with glucagon level. At that time, the plasma glucose concentration may not be available, but if you supplement with glucose, then the symptoms of hypoglycemia that recovers, that's, uh, that satisfies the Whipple's criteria, that's called severe hypoglycemia. And documented severe hypoglycemia is where there is typical symptoms of hypoglycemia and, and it's documented to have plasma glucose concentration of less than 70 milligram per deciliter. In asymptomatic hypoglycemia, there is no typical symptoms of hypoglycemia and patient tends to check the blood sugar and the plasma glucose concentration is less than 70, then you said this is asymptomatic hypoglycemia. And in probable symptomatic hypoglycemia event where there are typical symptoms of hypoglycemia, however, there was no documented plasma glucose concentration. However, probably this is induced by the blood sugar level of less than 70 milligram per deciliter. And there's another term is pseudo hypoglycemia. Many of the times patient presents with typical symptoms of hypoglycemia and they check their blood sugar and blood sugar they found it's more than 70 milligram per deciliter. And ADA, why ADA took this cutoff of 70? Uh, that that's actually the normal low normal limit of uh, uh, blood sugar level in a non-diabetic person. If the blood sugar goes below seventy, there is secretion of the counter-regulatory hormone. So that that's why the cutoff is about seventy milligram per deciliter. However, the international hypoglycemia study group, where the experts from the both ADA and endocrine society, they had a conference to look into the what blood sugar should be level should be mentioned uh, uh, should should be reported in clinical trials, and they said that they about fifty four milligram per deciliter, which is a serious and clinically important biochemical hypoglycemia that should be reported in the clinical uh, uh, studies instead of the seventy milligram per deciliter. And the glycemic test role, I, as I mentioned, with what time, the, uh, what blood sugar level there will be uh, symptoms and uh, signs of hypoglycemia would develop. That is the uh, dynamic. If the blood sugar, someone is having recurrent hypoglycemia, then the, uh, the, the glycemic threshold for developing the symptoms that becomes lower. And if someone is having high blood sugar, blood sugar level, a poorly controlled blood sugar level, and suddenly blood sugar becomes normal with treatment and the patient feels hypoglycemic. So the threshold can be dynamic. And if you look at the physiological and behavioral defense against hypoglycemia, when there is blood sugar is uh, reduced uh, or there's hypoglycemia, the pancreatic beta cell that decrease insulin secretion, that is the primary first defense against hypoglycemia. And once the insulin secretion is decreased, that activate the alpha cell which increased secretion of the glucagon level. And there is also increased sympathoadrenal output, uh, increased epinephrine secretion from the adrenal medulla, and the sympathoneural outflow is also increased with increased norepinephrine and acetylcholine secretion. And you can see uh, the right side picture, which shows the, uh, what blood sugar level, these counter-regulatory hormone secretion occurs when the blood sugar level goes below the glucagon level and uh, the level increases and adrenal level increases. And when the blood sugar goes below about three millimol per liter, about 54 uh, milligram per deciliter, there would be cognitive dysfunction. If it still goes further below to less than 2.8 uh, millimol per liter, that is about 50 milligram per deciliter, the patient will have neuroglycopenic symptoms. Why are these neurogenic symptoms are important? The patient will have the subjective symptoms of hypoglycemia because of these neurogenic symptoms. So, and what are these neurogenic symptoms? The patient may have uh, sweating, increased hunger, and tingling sensation. Uh, the, uh, these are predominantly chronic symptoms, and the predominant adrenaline symptoms are patients will have tremor, palpitation, and patient may feel anxious. And if the sugar still goes below, then patient will have neuroglycopenic uh, symptoms. And you can see from the picture, the, these are all these bars are the uh, the symptoms of neurogenic symptoms of uh, hypoglycemia. And there is euglycemia, that is EU, there is no symptoms of. Uh, um, hypoglycemia. And in the violet bar, you can see these are the typical uh, uh, neurogenic uh, 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 symptoms of hypoglycemia. 
but you can see when there is a, a adrenaline receptor blocked with with a, with with the medication then the the symptoms uh, they are not that florid as compared to when there is no blockage and when there is further blockage with the post alpha and beta adrenergic and cholinergic receptor then there is the awareness symptoms as much reduced that 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 picture clearly shows the primary awareness symptoms are by the cholinergic block uh, cholinergic symptoms these are so increased sweating hunger and tingling sensation now coming to the another important aspect of hypo, hypoglycemia is hypoglycemia associated autonomic failure this typically occurs in patients with type 1 diabetes and long standing type 2 diabetes who are frequent hypoglycemia they do not experience the symptoms of hypoglycemia unless the blood sugar has much lower level uh, these are uh, because of uh, attenuated sympathetic activity and uh, this attenuated sympathetic adrenal activity is actually functional functional means uh, these are not absolute deficits in the sympathetic adrenal activity if you scrupulously avoid hypoglycemia for maybe 2 to 3 weeks of time there may be uh, they, there may be preservation of this adrenal adrenal sympathetic adrenal activity and why this hap is important because if someone is having hap then there is 25 Hold higher risk of developing hypoglycemia in the patient who are, who are trying to have intensive glycemic control. This, this is a schematic diagram of uh, HAP. Why this is happening? What is the mechanism of the HAP? As you can see on the left hand side, is in early type two diabetes. There is some preservation of the beta cell. If there is marked absolute therapeutic hyperinsulinemia, means if you give large doses of insulin, then only there will be a for hypoglycemia isolated episodes of hypoglycemia but on the contrary if you see on the right hand side when there is advanced type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes where there is absolute beta cell failure there is no beta cell there is no uh, endogenous insulin secretion is there so if you give exogenous insulin is maybe in the mild or moderate amount of therapeutic hyperinsulinemia which normally doesn't cause hypoglycemia but if there is hap so if you give a small amount of insulin that will lead to hypoglycemia this is primarily because of the beta cell failure if, as beta cell is not working so even there is hypoglycemia the, there is no further decrease in insulin as we all know normally if the insulin goes down that stimulate glucagon level in during hypoglycemia if there is hap there is no beta cell there is no decrease in insulin that would obviously there is no increase in the glucagon the the initial counter regulatory hormone systems are lost then comes the attenuated sympathetic adrenal response to hypoglycemia and uh, there is decrease uh, adrenal secretion of epinephrine and there is a decrease adrenergic and cholinergic manifestation uh, leading to impaired awareness and further leading to recurrent hypoglycemia and this recurrent hypoglycemia further precipitated this auto uh, uh, this hypoglycemia associated uh, uh, autonomic failure and and recently this has also been seen with exercise if somebody is doing exercise after few hours of uh, excessive exercise Uh, in a type one or long standing type two diabetes patient, they can have also hap like symptoms, and the patient is also uh, asleep. They can also induce the hap like symptoms. Uh, the mechanism is not known, but these are also found to have not only recurrent hypoglycemia, exercise, sleep that that precipitated hypoglycemia associated autonomic failure. And why there is sympathetic adrenal deficiency uh, in uh how hap this is primarily the we do not know exactly what is the mechanism however there is brain fuel hypothesis uh, brain metabolism hypothesis the many hypotheses have been proposed particularly by cryer who was a pioneer member of one of the international hypoglycemic uh, study group and they found that the, there is increased glut1 activity in the brain vasculature to increase the glucose uptake Uh, uh during hypoglycemia also there is increased gaba levels in ventromedial hypothalamus and that causes altered ventromedial hypothalamus sensing of glucose so these are the probable mechanism uh this glut1 activity and the altered dmh sensing that reduces the adrenal uh, sympathetic output and that reduces these symptoms of hypoglycemia So now coming to the potential consequences of hypoglycemia, we already have discussed uh, about the loss of awareness. They can have impaired memory, like particularly uh, consolidation of recent memory, in particularly in type one diabetes patient, and they can have uh, confusion, dizziness, have uh, 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 they can end up in coma. 
So the, these are the symptoms of hypoglycemia, but the problem is there are lots of psychological impacts. Not many times has been discussed about the psychological impact of hypoglycemia. The, the, these hypoglycemia attacks are actually very distressing. They find it's very problematic for the patient uh, developing hypoglycemia. They have the poor quality of life. And uh, many of the times uh, they feel very bad about this thing. They can have some uh, uh, social embarrassment. If, if somebody is like somebody, if I am presenting and if I develop hypoglycemia, my thought process would be different. So that that may sometimes cause psychological uh, 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 this uh, disembarrassment uh, uh, in public. And another important aspect is a fear of hypoglycemia. About 50% of type 1 and type 2 diabetes patients, as well as their relatives also, also also have this fear of hypoglycemia. Patient may develop a hypoglycemia. That fear, many of the times, patients are not able to achieve the good glycemic control. And they, many of the times we see in clinical practice reducing the insulin dose or oral anti-diabetic dose prescribed by the physician. There may be many societal impact, maybe loss of uh, uh, dri driving privilege, there may be uh, restricted employment, there may be breakdown in the family relationship. We need to understand all these aspects of hypoglycemia. but there may be increased risk of death, and particularly in the type 1 diabetes, uh, uh, the death may, may not be that uh, acute or may not be that uh, common, but it's very rare, but as been described, the type about 10% of type 1 diabetes have increased risk of mortality. Now, coming to the another important aspect of cardiovascular consequence of hypoglycemia. And we all know what is the mechanism of hypo, hypoglycemia leading to cardiovascular uh, damage that hypoglycemia increases the creatinine secretion per adrenaline, which increases the hemodynamic changes, increases cardiac output, increases ca cardiac contractility, and increases heart uh, uh, workload. And that also has uh, rheumological factors, right? Increase in the platelet activation, decreases the fibrinolytic activity. And hypoglycemia also activates renin angiotensin syndrome system that increases the aldosterone level, causing hypokalemia. So hypokalemia can have, have reparation defect and uh, leading to arrhythmias in patients with hypoglycemia. So multiple factors with hemodynamic changes, hemorrheological changes, inflammatory changes all lead to endothelial dysfunction leading to cardiovascular outcomes. Just present one case of uh, uh, actually the hypoglycemia causing death. So this is a continuous glucose monitoring of a patient who died of hypoglycemia. You can see the blood sugar level the previous day the previous night and the morning though, when the patient died, the blood sugar levels are low, the hypoglycemia and the patient underwent the, and the patient died and uh, autopsy was done, no cause was found. So probably it was attributed to the hypoglycemia induced arrhythmia. So why this is arrhythmia is happening? This is probably because of the increased QT interval. You can see from this ECG that left hand side is, uh, is the normal QT interval. And on the right hand side, this is a, 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 actually the experimentally induced hypoglycemia has shown there is prolongation of the QT interval. And you can clearly see the U wave here uh, uh, in the ECG. Uh, and this uh, uh, leads to repolarize and defect and causes some multiple arrhythmias in this patient, causing immediate death with hypoglycemia. Now, what is the effect on the long-term effect of a uh, cardiovascular event with a hypoglycemia? So what is the effect of severe hypoglycemia on the cardiovascular event or the, what is the effect of the cardiovascular event on the severe hypoglycemia? This is a data from the exenatide uh, outcome study that is Excel study. This is a post-hoc analysis. And after doing all kind of adjustment with the, all kind of uh, uh, factors like the duration of diabetes, people taking uh, anti-diabetic agents, HbA1c, these all factors are adjusted and they clearly found, as you can see in the, uh, in the panel A, there, uh, there is severe uh, uh, increase in the, uh, uh, with the severe hypoglycemia, the all-cause death, cardiovascular death, myocardial infraction, hospitalization for uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome, hospitalization for heart failure, all increased by about 1.8 to 2 times those with hypoglycemia. Similarly, on the B panel, you see with the preceding events, even those who had cardiac uh, manifestation like uh, fatal or non fatal myocardial infarction, stroke, hospitalization, there is increased risk of hypoglyc severe hypoglycemia. How long it persists actually? And I mentioned one case where there is a death with the immediate hypoglycemia, 
what is happening to the long term outcome of severe hypoglycemia that this this uh, this time bound time dependent hr plot clearly shows this hazard ratio continues to be remain higher even after 5 years of high severe hypoglycemia that with the persistent hazard ratio is persistent over the time both uh, uh, hypoglycemia and the patient who develop myocardial infarction or cardiac event the risk of hypoglycemia uh, is also persistent over the five years duration. This is clearly shown in this graph. Now coming to the long term outcome of hypoglycemia. What is the effect of hypoglycemia on the cognitive impairment? What is the effect on the dementia and brain volume? So this is a study pop study population taken from the atherosclerotic risk community uh, in the U U.S. community study, uh, and they took this data. In 87 and 1989, and they in each visit they assessed these uh, parameters like cognitive assessment, brain volume, changes in cognitive the dementia assessment, and uh, they started doing this uh, uh, assessment since very beginning. And some assessment was done in from 96 uh, that is change in cognitive test score. And they continue to follow for 15 years. And in 2013, they, when they finally looked into the data. The out of this 15,000 odd patient who developed diabetes, about 2,000 odd patients developed di had diabetes at fa final visit in 2013, they had severe hypoglycemia in about 3% of the cases. And those who had severe hypoglycemia, they found that the risk of dementia is much higher versus the normal cognitive status. And the hypoglycemia was associated with smaller total volume uh, of brain volume. And hypoglycemia is strongly associated with incident hypo uh, dementia. So not only those patients who had some dementia problem that further precipitated uh, about by 2 to 2.5 times. And there is uh, those who didn't have uh, dementia, they found that they are those patients that have severe hypoglycemia after 15 years. They can have also, uh, they can develop incident dem uh, dementia. So to come to my end of my presentation, the counter-regulatory response to hypoglycemia are gradually lost as the duration of diabetes increases. And the key feature of uh, hypoglycemia-associated autonomic failure in diabetes is, is there is attenuated sympathoadrenal response to hypoglycemia, uh, the most often caused by recent hypoglycemia, or also sometimes with the exercise. And there is increased risk of cardiovascular and all-cause mortality, as, a, as I saw a few of the studies with severe hypoglycemia. And uh, hypoglycemia, of course, affect neurocognition and memory acute, acutely. And it, it can have uh, a long-term impact on the brain function and the brain volume at long term. There's much, not much data available, but few the studies, as I shown the direct study, the follow-up data clearly shown that there is an increase in the dementia risk patient developing hypoglycemia. Thank you, thank you. I come to end of my presentation. Thank you, Professor Kanwar. As usual, it's an excellent talk. And today it is still more excellent plus because all the mechanisms you have described, which is very, very important, the, particularly the mechanism of hypoglycemia unawareness. We will be discussing at the later time. So without that, I are not putting any doubts or questions. Thank you so much. Now I hand over the mic to my co-chairperson, Dr. Devar Chanjanda, to conduct the rest of the session, inviting two other speakers with the giving a little bit introductory introduction about the subject. Over to you, Dr. Jana. Thank you, Professor Kanwar. Please, we wait. We will Thank be discussing. So, uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jan, sir. Thank you, Alok, sir. And uh, thank you, Asuk, sir, for giving me an opportunity to chair this session. So, as usual, um, Sarah has conducted one program in Mumbai three, four years ago uh, on foot ulcer. I was uh, one attendee and uh, it created a lot of interest in management of diabetes. So nicely, Sarah, has, uh, uh, the whole day, he has discussed about foot ulcer. So the program was just after my completion of her DM course in ACV. So I, I always remember that uh, program. So nice program, sir. So uh, diabetic foot ulcer and amputation, they are associated uh, with high mortality rate. And uh, these, are, these can be prevented. These can be prevented. So to talk on the subject, we have this stalwart on this field, uh, Dr. 
Ghanasyam Goel. Uh, Sahar is a consultant, a diabetologist, and a diabetic food specialist. He is the director and a head of uh, diabetologist. He is working in Kolkata, started the first diabetic food clinic in Eastern India. He is the organizing secretary of IDACON. He is honorable secretary of, uh, and he is the past vice president diabetic food society, and uh, many more. Uh, publication and uh, accolades he has uh, to start the deliberation. I uh, invite Professor Goel, Dr. Ghanasyam Goel. Sir, please. I think you, you have to unmute, uh, Ghanasyam. You have to unmute yourself. Unmute. I think you are muted. You have to unmute, uh, Ghanasyam. Very good morning, yeah. friends, colleagues. At the outset, thanks to the team NUCD for inviting me. So I'm going to discuss diabetic neuropathy and diabetic foot syndrome. Diabetic foot syndrome is defined by WHO as an ulceration of the feet above the malleoli associated with neuropathy and different grades of ischemia and infection. As you all are aware, cost of diabetic foot ulcer is greater than that of the five most costly forms of cancer. Every 20 seconds, someone is amputated. Lifetime risk of people with diabetes to develop a foot ulcer is 34%. More than 50% diabetic foot ulcers become infected. As we all know, medium time to healing a DFU without surgery is approximately 12 weeks. And it is associated with a high risk of limb loss through the amputations. Five year survival following presentation with a new DFU is of the order of only 50 to 60 percent and worse than that of many common cancers. They were a very important paper which has been published by Professor Bolton and David Armstrong in 2017 in New England Journal of Medicine. And what they have shown <laughs> that the incidence of diabetic foot ulcers lifetime incidence is around 34 percent not 15 or 25 percent and simultaneously if a person's ulcer is healed the recurrence rate within one year is 40 percent and it increases by 60 percent after three years so what they have suggested instead of telling our patients that your ulcer is healed that we should use the term your ulcer is in remission who is at the risk of foot ulceration? Patients who are in neuropathy, peripheral vascular disease, posterior foot ulceration, microvascular complications, poor glycemic control, smoking, foot deformity, and amputation. These are the patients who will be at the high risk. Then how to define neuropathy? I think this is the simplest definition. You all have known to this definition. Presence of symptoms and or signs of peripheral nerve dysfunction in people with diabetes after other causes has been excluded. So diabetic neuropathy agonizes when it's painful and damages, damages when it's painless. <clears throat> Among diabetes complication, damage to the peripheral and autonomic nervous system is the most prevalent. And effect of DPN on patient morbidity and quality of life are substantial. It predisposes to false and superficial injuries, which can lead and amputations. Painless diabetes not aware of minor foot injuries that can become major problems. Cause of alopecia is believed to be related to the blockage of small arteries that affected nerves. And patient is not any that is there. Then way patient is not feeling any problem with it. There is a motor nerve damage on what a motor neuropathy there is a bursting uh, of the small muscles of feet and there is a, a clawing of the uh, feet you can see. And the autonomic nerve damage you can see dryness of feet, loss of hairs and cracks which are suggestive of autonomic nerve damage. Localized callus it is a precursor ulcer we all know that's there. Then this is the patient which came to us <laughs> 
long standing diabetes and having a non healing ulcer since more than one year and you see what is there that the staplers were inside and patient were not aware of it and patient was not having uncontrolled loss of productive sensation then the monument sites for testing you see these are the three sites now the, the five great toy first empty head and fifth empty head out of these three if two or more than two places patient is unable to feel it means patient is having loss of protective sensation or patient is having sensory neuropathy so in the international working group on diabetic 2019 guidelines then this is the how you will categorize the high risk feet <coughs> if patient who is having no LOPS, no PAD, no deformity in the risk category zero and patient should be examined by a journalist or a specialist every year a patient with alopecia plus minus deformities every three to six months, grade two PAD peripheral arterial disease plus minus alopecia loss of protective sensation every two to three months, and if a patient is using history of ulceration, over amputation, or sharp foot every one to or whenever patient comes to you. So a stepwise approach for primary care. All individuals should be assessed for diabetic peripheral neuropathy starting at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and five years after the diagnosis of type 1. And after that, at least once in a year. This is the <clears throat> how you we'll diagnose the painful diabetic neuropathy. Take a targeted history, assess for diabetic peripheral neuropathy symptoms, test for clinical signs, develop a differential diagnosis, and perform a confirmatory testing if needed so history you have to go for if poor glycemic control long duration of diabetes older age tall stature as the neuropathy is length dependent hypertension obesity and metabolic syndrome these are the patients who are at high risk of diabetic neuropathy then about the large fiber or myelinated fiber neuropathy and the small nerve fiber or unmyelinated C fibers neuropathy. Symptoms, numbness, tingling, poor balance and how you examine? You do a ankle reflex, vibration perception threshold, 10 gram monofilament or you can go for proprioception. But about the small nerve fibers, you can have thermal or cold or hot discrimination or pin prick sensation which is absent or reduced or patient may have pain burning electric shock stabbing hyperglycia or anodylia a small fiber neuropathy burning glancinating tingling shooting electric shock like sensation occurring in varying combinations and typically worse at night pain may be accompanied by dysesthesia such as exaggerated response to painful stimuli then pain may be directly or indirectly interfere with daily activities or lead to loss of balance, disability, psychosocial impairment, sleep disturbances, and reduced health-related quality of life. Thus, there should be a strong suspicion of DPN in individuals presenting with any of these complications. About the large fiber neuropathy, numbness, tingling without pain, loss of productive sensation, in more advanced stages, more balanced weakness and unsteadiness that means to fall some individuals may also present with completely insensitive numb feet asymptomatic diabetic neuropathy half of the people with diabetic peripheral neuropathy may be either asymptomatic or reluctant to report some symptoms so to summarize periodic flexible assessment for diabetic peripheral neuropathy risk factors and symptoms and their trajectories of time should be part of standard care for all people with diabetes. What are the tests? <clears throat> One is for the small fiber damage, pinprick sensation using sharp objects such as safety pin, temperature threshold sensation, which will be mostly performed with a cold metal such as tuning fork, or for the large fiber neuropathy, you can use a 128 hertz tuning fork, or you can touch light touch pressure with a 10 gram monofilament or you can use a biotissue meter or bilateral ankle reflex. <clears throat> so how to manage DPN? Management remains suboptimal. In type 1 diabetes, glucose control slows DPN progression. In type 2 diabetes, glucose control only marginally affects DPN progression, especially when patients have metabolic syndrome. Therefore, managing DPN in people with type 2 diabetes currently revolves around weight loss and exercise to mitigate the metabolic syndrome. About the peripheral neuropathy that is painful, 
30% of all individuals with DPN will experience painful symptoms that will require pharmacological and other treatments. A role of glycemic control, it's an important point. Early studies suggested that stable glycemic control with few excursions into hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia was associated with reduced pain scores as assessed on a VAS letter with the advent of continuous glucose monitoring. A small study confirmed people with painful DPN have greater fluctuations in glucose and poorer overall glycemic control than mass subject with painless neuropathy. Acute painful diabetic neuropathy as in the past we used to use it as an insulin neuritis by recent review by Gibson have suggested we should call it a treatment induced neuropathy of diabetes as insulin is not the only cause to cause the neuropathic pain or insulin neuritis. Chronic diabetic neuropathy common among all ages in both type 1 or type 2 and what a therapeutic approach. There are no pathogenetically oriented pharmacological treatment approved by US FDA. So there are three FDA approved therapies for painful DPN pregabalin, duloxetine, and dependadol. So how will approach? First, identify person with painful neuropathy. Other causes of the neuropathy should be excluded. Non-pharmacological therapies. Then pharmacologic therapies, which is anticonvulsant, pregabalin, and gabapentin, SNSRIs, duloxetine, tricyclic antidepressant. If not, then it's a combination therapy, multiple drug combination therapy, isn't listed in this figure means you can use a combination of pregabalin plus duloxetine or you can use a nutraceutical just like vitamin uh, uh, vitamin b12 and others and uh, even local treatment the capsicum patch is also there so pharmacological therapy should be individualized depends on comorbidities cost potential drug drug interaction potential for adverse effects and uh, <clears throat> Uh, all the factors to be taken together. Different drugs for the treatment of painful diabetic neuropathy. There was a meta-analysis which have shown pregabalin and duloxetine shows good therapeutic effect on painful TPN, but adverse effects were also significant. So always remember. Topical therapy. Now 8% long-acting capsicum patch has been developed is now approved by FDA for painful diabetic neuropathy. Duration of treatment this is very important. It is recommended that after six months of symptom relief, a slow and gradual reduction of drug treatment should be attempted. If symptoms reappear during this gradual reduction, a lower dose may be required for the next few months when further review and attempted reduction should take place. This is a typical presentation of the <clears throat> diabetic foot syndrome in clinics. We also neuropathic food, infected food, uh, the uh, food with the maggots and neuropathic foot we all know a lot of callus around the uh, ulcer it is on the plantar surface and the bad infected gangrene plantar callus and there is a loss of protective sensation while neurosemic foot <clears throat> this called not pink it's black pulseless or it's not painful it's very painful marginated ulcers so what are the modern day management of dfu we all know it is the deprivement and infection control then the offloading and vascular assessment. And nowadays, in, in addition to this simple multidisciplinary diabetic foot care, uh, the simple principles, multidisciplinary diabetic foot care is now becoming a mainstay of the therapy. So I'm just going to have a two, three cases discussion regarding this particular thing. One is the neuropathic foot, bilateral, great toy and uh, uh, First, uh, second MT had ulcers, multiple ulcers, history of barefoot walking, and since last five months, uh, uh, this uh, monofilament test was severely impaired or not able to feel. ABI was normal, X ray doesn't show any osteomyelitis. And you see, patient debridement was done at the clinic, and offloading was provided by the most modified posterior slab. One is this, and second, then it has been given the offloading by the foam dressing or SK offloading based on principles of Samadhan system. Then outcome after 15 weeks, <clears throat> you see these ulcers which were there, it has been healed after 15 weeks. So only problem in these ulcers, why they were not healing, was the lack of offloading. These are the offloading ways, how you will check it. <clears throat> so gold standard is. Uh, 
uh, uh, the total contact cost, then posterior slab, and all these bed rest is not practically possible. The different ways of offloading. There's a fatal form dressing, total contact cost, there's a modified footwear, posterior slab, and the air cost. <clears throat> This is the infected diabetic foot, extensive gangrene of lower one third of the foot, hemoglobin was less than seven, creatinine was high, and patient was in very sepsis, and patient required below knee amputation. Discuss with the family member and life threatening situation. And you see, uh, to save the life, the, uh, the major amputation, below knee amputation has been done. So below knee amputation is a life challenging event. It is a last resort when all options of saving the limb have failed. Sometimes BKs are performed in order to save the life of the patient. Advances in surgical procedures and improved and advanced processes have enabled patient to return to almost near normal life post amputation. This is an ischemic case presented with severe pain in the right foot. Two weeks, a smoker, pedal pulses were not palpable, even see poorly controlled, creatinine 1.54. Right low limb artery shows occlusion of SFA and popliteal artery. Angioplasty has been done. And you see, after angioplasty, after one week, this amputation of the great toe has been done and it has been healed. And you can see this is the result. So it, it's a multidisciplinary approach. So that's why nowadays multidisciplinary approach is mandatory. You require diabetologist, endocrinologist, or physician who is the captain of the team, then surgeon, plastic surgeon, vascular surgeons, podiatrist, orthopedic surgeon, all these are required, and the orthotist or podiatrist. So dear friends, to conclude, diabetic peripheral neuropathy is one of the commonest complications of diabetes. Peripheral neuropathy agonizes when painful and damages when painless. Diabetic neuropathy can be nightmare for both, for the patient suffering from it, and for the clinicians trying to manage it. <clears throat> Fit have to be at the major bond of damage done by painless peripheral neuropathy. Protective and preventive measures are the most important aspect of fighting painless neuropathy. So, dear friends, pay attention to the basic tenets of wound care. Nothing supplants the role of good blessing wound care. Offloading, deprivement, infection control, management of ischemia if necessary. Keep Indian scenario in mind availability and affordability thank you very much for giving patience here thank you so thank you sir for your nice and informative talk on dfu so as usual it is a teamwork uh, taking the surgeon the diabetologist and the radiologist so sir be present for the panel discussion i will go for the next talk uh, that is about uh, erectile dysfunction, which is a bothersome and a distasteful complication in diabetes patient affecting quality of life. And uh, with more number of diabetes patients, those who are diagnosed early, and uh, some of them, they go to auto mode, they don't hear uh, the physician. Uh, and uh, there is more chance of uh, increase in number of this uh, devastating erectile dysfunction in the near future. So to talk about this topic, I uh, request Dr. Deepak Jumani. He is a sen senior sexual health and physician, uh, diplomat, uh, diplomat American board certified fellow of American College of Sexologist, ASC CT certified sex therapist and a uh, many more. He is the editor of the International Journal of uh, Psychology and Counseling, co-chairman of uh, IMS Initiative for Sexual uh, Study. And uh, uh, I request uh, Professor Deepak Jumani to deliver his talk. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, very sexy introduction. Um, at the outset, I thank Dr. Alok Kanugo and all my friends in uh, Bhubaneswar, my teacher and mentor, Dr. Professor E.K. Das, for inviting me here and giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts, views, concepts, and passion. With pranams to God and thanks to my teachers, Dr. O.P. Kapoor, Prakash Kothari, and my mentor, teacher, Dr. Sashank Joshi, I beseech them to bless me always. I have no conflict of interest. 
Prime Minister offered us lockdown and GST. Look at his hands are down. Then he told me, Deepak. Then I said, I'll also, my, I, what I will offer is, I will say unlockdown and I'll offer my GST. And my GST to all of you is great sex therapy. When you're married, wonders happen. But when you get diabetes, you wonder what happened. 80% of men struggle with erectile dysfunction in silence today. When I googled, I find Viagra had 196 million web pages and aspirin had only 53 million web pages. Diabetes is the sexual health tsunami of our century. Every diabetic male or female today have some bedroom woes. 62% of women admitted that they were not satisfied with their sex lives. And 40 I to ask you, Deepak, have you started your staring or slides? Yeah, I have. You can't hear? It is not coming at all. Okay. That's why I can't. Because I have seen the, the way you were speaking is superb, but slides will... Hey, slides, uh, Deepak... Uh, not... Okay, okay. I'll just 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 share my slide. One second. Yeah, but we're all interested. We're waiting for it. So take your time. Yeah, and... yeah. I want to see that snack charmer slide. <laughs> Is it visible now? Yes. Make it full screen. Yes. Is it visible okay now? now? Yeah. Old enough, it is full screen yes. and changing also. Please continue. With pranams to God and thanks to my teachers, uh, I beseech them to bless me always. I have no conflict of interest. Prime Minister Padma uh, Narendra Modi ji gave us lockdown and GST. Look at his hands are down. He was helpless. Then he told me Deepak. So I told him, sir, I will also give something to my to my friends and I'll give, I'll make them unlock down and I'll give them my GST and my GST is great sex therapy. When you get married, wonders happened. But when you get diabetes, you wonder what happened. 80% of men struggle with erectile dysfunction in silence. They don't talk about it. When I googled, I found 196 million web pages for Viagra and 53 million web pages for aspirin. Diabetes, friends, is a sexual health tsunami of our century. 40% of men above the age of 40 do have issues in the bedroom and 62% of women admitted in a survey that they were not satisfied with their sex lives. Importance has been the main cause of divorces in India. Is sex a secret? Who doesn't know what is sex? Every Tom, Dick and every child even knows today what is a secret. So, but let us know what we should know. That sex is not a secret, but it is a sacred thing. And how do we physicians learn about the sexual dysfunction is by asking four questions to our patients. That do you have desire in having sex or do you have desire? or no desire or low desire. And then comes the arousal. Do you get erections? Do you don't get erections? Are you able to penetrate? Are you able to ejaculate? And same with the women. So erectile dysfunction, friends, is a focal point of men's health initiative today. And the basic issue of uh, erectile dysfunction in India is that there is a rising trend. India has the largest population of males in the world also has the largest number of men in the sexually active and reproductive age group. India has a rising prevalence also of the lifestyle diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, which are the common risk factors for erectile dysfunction. And the sad thing is erectile dysfunction remains underdiagnosed with several men never coming to medical attention because of the sensitivity of the issues. There is definitely a rise in erectile dysfunction, especially in the younger age group. Men with metabolic syndrome have impaired endothelial dysfunction. We'll come to a little later. What is endothelium and how does the endothelium get dysfunction? But remember, friends, every person who has a meta one or the other issue of metabolic syndrome has got endothelial dysfunction. And the prevalence of metabolic syndrome in men is always with organic erectile dysfunction. And the four type of patients, diabetic, obese, dyslipidemic, and hypertensive, are the deadly portrait for patients having erectile dysfunction. Let me give you a newer perspective of it. What is the current perspective? That diabetes is an established risk factor for sexual dysfunction in men as 
threefold increased risk of erectile dysfunction was documented in diabetic men compared to non-diabetic. As, as among women, evidence regarding this is very less. But yes, there is definitely a higher prevalence of female sexual dysfunctions in diabetic women. And most commonly, we see depression in them. When you look at the sexuality and diabetes, so why this happened is they have studied that erectile dysfunction occurs as the first one of the first problems. And along with that, there is also a decrease in the testosterone level. So diabetes definitely has a detrimental effect on the sexual functions of our patients. So diabetologists who primarily care for their patients should just not look for glycemic control, but also take help from urologists, psychologists, sexologists, and try to improve the quality of life by taking into the holistic aspect of it. Now, many, for many, it becomes a tragedy in their bedroom. You know, this problem becomes a tragedy. So can we turn the tragedy into bliss? Yes, we can today. And what is the prevalence? In diabetes is more prevalent in India and China. And I call Chindia the diabetes capital of the world. Erectile dysfunction is the commonest complication of diabetes. So Chindia are the erectile dysfunction capital of the world. Our first huge data, 56,000 patients, all men diabetics had ED, premature ejaculation and hypoactive sexual desire disorders. Women all had low desire and depression was the most common thing which we saw. So we need to break all barriers. Patients don't come and tell us. We need to talk to our patients. We need to break the ice. We need to come out of clinical inertia and ask our patients that do you have problems in making love? Friends, if you ask this question to your patients who are 30 years and above, and having a family history of metabolic syndrome, you will be surprised that they will be, they, these patients are waiting for you to initiate a dialogue on this. So the tip of a man is nothing but a tip of an iceberg. How and why this happened? Men with erectile dysfunction have been studied in European male aging studies as having higher risk of death. Erectile dysfunction, poor morning erections and low libido had a higher mortality risk compared to men with no sexual symptoms. This has been studied. So it's a huge problem to the man and to the partner. And there is definitely a dent in the relationship between. So this needs to be it, it is nothing but emotional dysfunction. So the onus of sexual health of our patients lies with we physicians. And we are all going to live more. How are we going to spend the 60 plus gifted years? Are we going to spend in autonomy, dignity, gracefully age or be sexually happy? Or do we want to be diseased, depressed, dependent, unhappy or emotionally crippled? So we need to take care of our own selves and our own patients. So there's definitely a link between diabetes and sexual dysfunctions. Obesity, hypertension, sleep apnea and depression are common conditions that occur along with diabetes. The time and energy spent on managing diabetes and related conditions can take a toll on emotional health. Changes in testosterone or estrogen because of diabetes, menopause or co-occurring conditions can impact the libido, lubrication and ability to become sexually aroused. Diabetes impacts blood flow, which could affect blood reaching the penis or vagina. For a man to achieve and sustain erection, he needs blood to flow in the penis. In women, decreased blood flow can play a role in vaginal dryness. High, high levels of glucose can also cause damage to the nerves. And the tip of the penis and clitoris are loaded with now. So these get affected and there is decreased sexual sensations. So let us understand what exactly happens. This is the vascular endothelium. And this is the corpora cavernosa smooth muscle cell. Normal endothelium produces endothelial nitric oxide synthetase, which diffuses the nitric oxide, which is the main chemical signaling molecule or the currency of the cell which enters into the corpora cavernosa smooth muscle cell of the penis, converts GTP into cyclic GMP with the help of this enzyme gonadal cyclase. This cyclic GMP through various mechanisms relaxes the smooth muscle of the penile corpora cavernosa muscle cell and allows the blood to flow in and the penis becomes erect. But sadly, this cyclic GMP hydrolyzes into 5-GMP with the help of an enzyme called phosphodiesterase 5. So, what do we understand from this? We understand that for an erection, you need a normal endothelium, which produces normal endothelial nitric oxide synthetase and nitric oxide. Okay. So hence, anything which happens to a man like erectile dysfunction is nothing else but an endothelial dysfunction. So hyperglycemia and diabetes, increased advanced glycated end products, which we all know, there is definitely an oxidative stress. These alter the molecular things in the, in the 
endothelium like endothelial nitric oxide synthetase and nitric oxide there are macromolecular damage protein oxidation modification endothelial gets apoptotic and there is vascular endothelial signaling inhibition which happens all these ultimately lead to cavernosal endothelial dysfunction and there are functional alteration between the endothelium so this results in erectile dysfunction so definitely erectile and endothelial dysfunction in type 2 diabetes there is definitely a link it decreases the nitric oxide it thickens the basement membrane of the capillaries and when we look at the diabetic corpora cavernosa because of glucose overload advanced glycated end products increase ros they reduce the nitric oxide and there is apoptosis simultaneously we have also seen in diabetics reduction of testosterone and through these mechanism there is corpora cavernosa smooth muscle cell dysfunction and this leads to erectile failure in this patients there are a lot of mechanisms which we know advanced glycated end products increased levels of oxygen free radicals impaired nitric oxide synthesis increased endothelin b which is a vasoconstrictor a regulation of rho a rho kinase which produces generalized vasoconstriction in the penile and uh, penile vasculature neuropathic damage and impaired cyclic gmp during covid we found the corona virus present in the corpora cavernosa friends covid is not a sexually transmitted disease but definitely they spotted this and it had causes it had caused erectile dysfunction in the later stages so sars2 receptor is enzyme 2 is expressed in the human pancreatic islet beta cells and this was up regulated in during inflammatory stage like covid so covid and 19 and diabetes have a complex bidirectional relationship so what we physicians need to know about erectile dysfunction today we need to get educated our own selves to treat our patients john manlal gave a very beautiful algorithm first ask your patient then legitimize the problem of erectile dysfunction tell them that these problems are very very common in every diabetic every hypertensive so he doesn't feel that he is alone and if you don't cannot go ahead send them to or refer them to a good sexologist otherwise open up a discussion and evaluate and work together and give, give a comprehensive treatment plan erectile dysfunction has got multiple causes vascular neurogenic penile trauma hormonal imbalance drug induced psychogenic so many causes are there but what i say is that what actually happens in erectile dysfunction is the nerves stimulate vessels circulate muscles facilitate and hormones regulate so if your nerves vessels muscles and hormones are normal your sex life is always rocking why should we be worried about erectile dysfunction is it something to be panicked about yes because erectile dysfunction is nothing else but subclinical cardiovascular disease and we know cardiovascular diseases are the global mortality uh, in, uh, global cause of increased mortality across the world and erectile dysfunction friends is the earliest marker of myocardial infarction because the penile arteries are the smallest smaller than the coronary artery coronary arteries are bigger so if atherosclerosis sets in in the penile artery to 50% these patients get erectile dysfunction but the same amount of atherosclerosis doesn't occlude the other arteries which are high larger in diameter and hence ed appears the much much before than the coronary artery disease appeared so you are only as old as our endothelium my teacher paul when not beautifully said this long time back let me give you a deeper perspective of all this today's concept is that penis can become a diagnostic tool of your endothelium health by asking a simple question about erections and we know that hypertension diabetes smoking raised lipids homocysteine estrogen deficiency all cause increase in the endothelial cell damage and vascular smooth muscle injury leading to endothelial dysfunction and once endothelial dysfunction leads it happens you see all these complications of apoptosis like leukocyte addition lipid deposition vasoconstriction vascular smooth muscle cell growth and thrombosis if you have an healthy endothelium endothelium derived nitric oxide is anti thrombotic and anti atherosclerotic endothelium dysfunction leads to lots of abnormal and the pathogenesis of erectile dysfunction in metabolic syndrome is visceral obesity genetic predisposition increased food take decreased activity produces visceral obesity also produces insulin resistance visceral obesity is proven to reduce the androgens and insulin resistance lead to dyslipidemia and hyperglycemia again leading to oxidative stress and leading to endothelial dysfunction 
And once you have insulin resistance and obesity, there is definitely retention of sodium and increased sympathetic activity, also leading to hypertension and endothelial dysfunction. And androgens, friends, please understand in diabetics are all less, testosterone is less. So androgens are important for every function of the endothelium, in especially maintaining of tunica, albuginea, matrix, fibroelastic properties, and also the trabecular smooth muscle, smooth muscle structure and functions, and also the nerve conduction. Everything is dependent on the earth. So we, when we look at our patients of heart disease, till the time they get any clinical disease or right from beginning of the risk factors, all these patients had erectile dysfunction as one of the common symptoms. So there is a wealth of compelling evidence to prove that ED is a risk factor for, and today we have metformin. There are two, three beautiful drugs in diabetes. One is metformin, another is alpha uh, uh, acarbose, and the third is SGLT2 inhibitors. These three drugs are so beautiful to treat our patients with diabetics and erectile dysfunction that they cover up all the causes of erectile dysfunction, vasculogenic causes. We know that uh, acarbose is also improving the endothelial health. And metformin has also been studied to improve the endothelial health. And SGLT2 reduce the weight and reduce uh, the hypoglycemia, reduce uh, uh, even uh, other, th other things in, in, in every diabetic which are causing harmful things. So these three things can, these three drugs can be given to every diabetic and these patients will start getting normal erections because these three are taking care of all the causes of uh, vasculogenic erectile dysfunction. And these patients don't need any PD-5 inhibitors in their whole life. So how do we manage patients of erectile dysfunction? Rule out the organic and the psychogenic cause. If you rule out the psychogenic cause, which is the main component in every patient of erectile dysfunction, you ask one simple question that in last eight days or 15 days, did you get up in the morning with an erection? If he says yes, he is absolutely normal. He does not have an organic ED. He is either psychogenic or situational erectile dysfunction. Please ask the couple to come together. Don't ask only the man or the woman to come together. They both should come together because solution always lies in the couple. And we treat, there are a lot of beautiful markers. Look at the gum of your patients. Chronic periodontile disease is a marker of erectile dysfunction. Salivary tumor necrosis factor, just take a swab from the gums and see it is indication of severe erectile. Low vitamin D has been associated with Raised uric acid is again a predictor of erectile dysfunction and that there is a relationship between platelet and lymphocyte. So just do a CBC of your patient and do total platelets and total lymphocyte. And if the ratio is more than 105, he does have mild erectile dysfunction. If it is 116, it is moderate. If it is more than 136, it's got severe erect. So by just looking at a CBC, you can tell your patient that having you are having erectile dysfunction and you can then con uh, confront with him and he'll call you Sai Baba, sir, how did you know about it? Neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, which he used to do in COVID, if it is more than three, Definitely, he has got a severe erectile dysfunction. So how do we treat? We have three modalities, oral drugs, injection of papaverin, vacuum therapy, intraurethral drugs. These are the first two. And if these fail, we send our patient to urologist for implants and the other anastomosis. But all these things do not work unless you counsel your patient and advise them on lifestyle measures. Friends, these two things are the mainstay of treatment of every sexual dysfunction. 2018 revision of process of care also mentioned that lifestyle changes should be the first line of treatment. We have four PD-5 inhibitors, various onset of actions, various doses. Amongst them, Tadalafil has the highest uh, onset of action for 45 to 120 minutes and its duration is 36 hours. So they all have side effects of headache, dizziness, visual disturbances, and the contraindications are nitrates and any uh, cardiovascular event in the recent past. Of course, pen anat anatomical penile defects, etc. We have treated patients for last 17 years, but they don't form the cutting edge solutions for the treatment of patients. We need to give them something more because they don't adhere to this. And PD-5 inhibitors, if they are given for a long time, they are definitely beneficial as they increase the dilatation and increase the CGMP, which is responsible for relaxation of smooth muscle. They inhibit the smooth muscle contraction, etc. And Beautiful studies have been shown that in diabetics, if you give 12 weeks treatment with low dose tadalafil, 5 mg or 10 mg, irrespective of whatever be the HbA1c, hypertension, prostatic hypertrophy or dyslipidia, they definitely there is improvement in their sexual dysfunctions. My friend, Dr. Jyoti, they put these patients on insulin pump and there was a beautiful control of hypoglycemia and he found improvement in 
sexual functions to the tune of 84 to 85 percent. Metformin, as we all know, SGLT2 inhibitors, we have already discussed. Buried penis syndrome is very common in diabetics. Give them one gram of metformin, apply sesame seed oil on the shaft, the shaft of, the, of the penis and L-arginine gel. Beautiful result in six weeks you will find. Now we have glycerol trinitrate also can be tried and has been studied, but there is less robust evidence in, in our country. But yes, in United States, they have tried and this is very, very effective. We have newer therapies like low intensity extra corporal shock therapy, platelet rich plasma, bariatric surgery improves the cavernosal neuronal vasorelaxation. And thus, we have been treating erectile dysfunction, but none of these therapies reverse the pathophysiology of erection. So, how do we look about so many newer targets have been now come and, and still in the pipeline? So, we need to have some more tools to improve or cure erectile dysfunction. And the role of regenerative medicine is very, very useful in this. Stem cell therapy uh, in patients who are having stubborn, uh, stubborn erectile dysfunction, not responding to any medical line of treatment, and they didn't want to go for surgery. They were tried by human umbilical cord stem cells, and most of them improved in their sex life within three months. And so we have pharmac new phytoneutraceuticals like L-arginine and fenugreek, which is very, very useful and very beneficial. Fenugreek, the mechanism is Fenugreek in a saponized form have a structure of like similar to testosterone. Hence, are easily bound to globulin uh, part of the testosterone, and so the free testosterone is released, and the and the patients start getting good desire back. We have new drugs called Evanafil. The onset of action is 15 minutes, less side effects, and the half life is just five hours. And this is the only PD5 inhibitors which you can give it to patients who are on nitrates. All you got to do is skip the nitrates on that day. Give him Avana fill. He can have good enough sex. This Avana fill will be washed out in his body from for, after five hours. Next day, again, he can start taking uh, his nitrates as soon as. Beautiful study done on Avana fill. A double blind uh, study was done for diabetic. And they found that these patients in 360 minutes had three encounters. They could have sex three times, which is wonderful. So that's important. We have melanocotton receptor agonists. We have newer peripheral active agents like MaxK channel activator, guanylate, cyclase activator, nitric oxide donor, and regenerative therapy trends has been shown to be a great promise in a, and low intensity ox, or shock wave therapy also. So let us see what is ethical perspective of, of the whole problem. We know that the risk factor of all risk factor is endothelial dysfunction. So we need to understand how do we restore endothelium. There are a lot of pharmacological remedies ACE inhibitors, statins, insulin, L-arginine, tetrahydrobiotin, inhibitors of rho kinase, and these pharmacological intervention can restore the endothelial function and improve all the things which are happening and the complications because of that. So we need to focus on these particular therapies. My teacher, Dr. R.D. Lele, long time published successful strategies for reversal of endothelial dysfunction, PPAR alpha, gamma, agonist, Increased nitric oxide production, vitamin E, C supplement, L-arginine, tetrahydrobiotin, CPA print, SOD temples, statins, so many things which we have to give to our patients. We can reverse their endothelial dysfunction and give them a normal sex life for it. So, and my teacher, Dr. Paresh Dandona, my friend from uh, Buffalo, he gave diabetics long-term testosterone therapy. And he found remission in diabetes. He also found insulin resistance improvement and also their sexual life increase because most of them were hypogonad. And Dean Ornish long time back proved that with intensive lifestyle changes, you can reverse the coronary artery disease. So we need to focus more on lifestyle and nutrition. Cleveland Clinic's original research said, though bypass surgery and angioplasty do exist, but nutritional intervention in their study not only halted but even reverse the coronary artery. Huge plaque you can see has been opened up just by nutrition. So this is the most prompt, powerful and persistent result which we can see. My new definition of erectile dysfunction that it is diabetes type 5, which is with hypogonadism, prolonged hypoglycemia, and CV risk. Lifestyle measures have been studied to improve the pro-inflammatory milieu, insulin resistance, oxidative stress and endothelial dysfunction. All these with healthy lifestyle can improve your well-being and wellness and also reduce the burden of sexual dysfunctions. Two times Nobel Prize winner Dr. Linus Pauling declared that 
when he was receiving his second Nobel Prize, such a brilliant man. What did he say? He said, nearly all disease can be traced to a nutritional deficiency. What else do we want? We have brilliant people talking about nutrition and this is possible for us to counsel our patients and improve their quality of life. So my take home message is, take a detailed history. The secret of sexual fitness is love yourself. You are unique. And the blanket uh, advice you can give to all your patients about 30s, try and avoid excess of salt, oil and sugars. Give a U-turn up to your metabolic imbalance. Have a regular rhythm of sex life. Keep it happening regularly and increase your romance and touch to your partners. One of the biggest challenges in India is dole. D is diabetes, H is hypertension, O is obesity and L is lipid, which increase in us. So what do we do when the dole is playing in, in a man's body? Well, the answer is simple. We do bhangra. Now, what is bhangra? Is behavior change. Make them happy, stress-free, have an active lifestyle, do exercise, take care of your nutrition, control your hyperglycemia and all the risk reductions and abstain from other substance of abuse. Counsel your patients on realistic expectations. Tell them at 70, 80, you can't be like 6, 20 or 30. Increase your romance, which is, we have all PD-5 inhibitors which are there, but they don't increase the desire. There are 40% patients who are not responding to it. So we give our patients testosterone, but we need to give it with caution. We can't give it to patients who are younger, they will develop azuspermia. We can't develop, we can't give it to older okay. patients with morbid conditions. So what do we have? The Raja of all is L-arginine, penugreek, lifestyle modification and regenerative medicine. This is the take-home message for every diabetic. If you give them this advice, friends, they will definitely improve in their sexual life. So be fearless, passionate and focused even in the bedroom. So erectile dysfunction due to any cause can be managed today. It's not an option for anyone. It is how gracefully we handle the process and how lucky we are as the process handles us. So today we have so many things to give to our patient that this is a symptom which we can easily manage. And the ideal prescription for diabetic with ED should be counseling lifestyle measures to be adopted. First thing, OHA or insulin, whatever you want to give. But if you give OHA, prefer metformin, SGLT2 inhibitors and NA carbos. Statins, if he has got dyslipidemia. Antihypertensives, prefer ACE inhibitors and ARBs. If at all you want to give beta blockers, give them nebulol. If at all you want to give diuretic, give interpermite. Low-dose PD-5 inhibitors if there are no contraindications. Low-dose short course of testosterone if no contraindication. But monitor PSA. L-arginine supplement with fenugreek and zinc. Nutritional intervention and definitely mental health checkup. What a physician misses is he doesn't have time. He doesn't take a detailed history. He doesn't have the art of counseling. Educating the patient on realistic expectation is must. And you need to give an emphatic two year, year to your patients. Friends, this is triple ED. Erectile dysfunction is endothelial dysfunction and emotional dysfunction. Early diagnosis can prevent early death. Feminism, you need to love your partner. Your partner has given you a lot in your life. So you need to trust, adore, admire and respect her. Unless we love and love our love each of us, alone and each one of us. You need to love each other unconditionally because love is a flow. It's creative. It's not sex what you want. It is why it flows because it and that gives you contentment. This contentment is much more deeper and valuable than contentment after sex. One who knows that contentment will never look for any substitute. Children who should be taught to love from infancy. The myth that teaching of love will lead the child to the world of sex is bullshit. This fear is groundless. The more love grows in a person, the more sex energy is transformed into sex. The less love filled a person, there are lots of problems. So Voltaire beautifully said, be monogamous. Being monogamous is like a garden. Being polygamous is like a jungle. Both are beautiful. Now you have to decide what you want to be, a gardener or a jungle. But if you want to, if you want to make your life beautiful and being monogamous and make your garden beautiful, you need to devote time. You need to cut the right type of trees, grass, put water, fertilizers, etc. So Voltaire beautifully said, try and cultivate your own garden. If you have patients of erectile dysfunction, don't send them to quacks. Send them to a good sexologist. So now you treat yourself, you can do it and see that he gets a good sex, a good erection and this thing. This is my book, Sex Has No Expiry Date. My last slide. Friends, diabetes, the sexual health tsunami of our country, century, is very, is, is very, very common and earliest marker of coronary artery disease. Low-dose PD-5 inhibitor statins can be ideal choice for diabetics. L-arginine supplement and fenugreek is a boon. Diabetes remission is a fact and not a myth anymore. 
testosterone therapy with caution can improve erectile dysfunction and even insulin resistance erectile dysfunction hence is a correctile dysfunctions detail history counseling empathy education are the key so don't let your diabetics die in bits every day if you do so sex really has no expiry date thank you all for your love i'll be happy to answer any questions you all have and i'll be there a part in the panel discussion Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jumani. As usual, you have hypnotized the entire audience looking and listening to your talk. It's a type 5 diabetes from Dhol to Bhangra. <laughs> ED is 3D and the erectile dysfunction is a correctile dysfunction as well. So it has no expiry date. <laughs> so to anybody who is a centenarian also, he must take your advice. It must live a very juvenile, enthusiastic, and energetic life under energetic life under the advice of our great sexologist. All your slides are so sexual from Dr. Deepak Jumani. Thank you very much. Anytime we invite from your NUCD, never say no to it. Please and join it's, us. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's always an honor and pleasure to come to NUCD anytime. <laughs> anytime. <laughs> Over to I, I am Dr. in a conference Dwarton, and we are missing Dr. Das to also. Say, otherwise, uh, over to Professor Das. <laughs> yeah, I think we had a wonderful session. And you know, it, it is something which is, uh, which is absolutely amazing session. Now, we have a very, very short yeah. interactive, program, interactive program. So first, I will, I will just have the questions for Dr. Convar. First, any, any question anybody want to ask Dr. Convar? We can have one or two questions. Let us if ask. You allow uh, me, I have a question to Professor yeah. Anwar. Huh? Yeah. Let, let us ask JB how do you see the risk of common complication of diabetes like hypoglycemia? He has already highlighted, and uh, it goes without saying that it's a very, it has very dreaded implications. But let him summarize the how is common complications can have multi organ involvement and can be fatal. Dr. JB. Yeah, uh, as you as I, I presented in my talk that hypoglycemia can be very fertile and this is a, a primary reason that uh, the blood so many of the times we find the blood sugars are we are not able to achieve the target HP one C because sometimes the physician thinks there is a risk of hypoglycemia and sometimes the patient thinks there is a risk of hypoglycemia and they tend to take a low doses of insulin or low doses of oral anti diabetic agent. So, uh, and uh, obviously, as I meant, as I presented in my talk, it uh, immediately affects uh, the psychosocial affects uh, affects. And I presented as well as uh, I also discuss about the cardiovascular mortality and long term neurological aspect. So it can affect both neurological and cardiovascular outcome. I think what you said, Kanwar, is very correct. You know, when we join as a resident in any of the institutes where we go for training abroad. They give us a test of hypoglycemia. It is important that every resident should get a test of hypoglycemia because it's the number one malady. Uh, uh, I must tell you, sir, is the number one thing which has to be known. They must experience what happens in front of the eyes. They will give a glass which is a little bit of a uh, little bit of clouded. These people see like this, like that. They will give all sorts of things. That that underlines that underscores the importance that hypoglycemia is a very, very important symptom. And you know, from the HAT study, HAT study, you know, the HAT study, hypoglycemia. Uh, so it has been shown that hypoglycemia, everybody has to know everything about hypoglycemia because one can make a distinct change and change the destiny of the patient. My my question to uh, what were two, number one, is that, uh, you know, <clears throat> there, is a, there is a feeling that type 2 diabetics who are on oral drugs do not have hypoglycemia, but there are plenty of instances of hypoglycemia even in the oral drugs. And when we are going to treat to target and having going to establish rigid control, there is also there is there is there is evidences that the hypoglycemia is little more. So I just wanted to ask you, what is your take on the type two diabetics who are on orals alone about hypoglycemia in them? <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, this is a very pertinent and practical question. We always think that insulin would uh, lead to hypoglycemia. I would try to explain to the patient what are the symptoms of hypoglycemia, how to treat hypoglycemia. But we all know that insulin secretor drugs like sulfonylurea, which is very commonly used, as I was listening yesterday also, very commonly prescri prescribed uh, anti-diabetic agents and megalitinides, they all increase the risk of hypoglycemia. And many of the times also we see that it's like DP4 inhibitor, AGLT2 inhibitor, the, 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 the have uh, the very less risk of hypoglycemia and many of the times we do tend to use these medications with along with sulfonylureas or with megalitinides. So there is also there is risk of hypoglycemia. So it's not that not only do the insulin but uh, uh, with the sulfonylureas, megalitinides, uh, there is a much increased risk of hypoglycemia is there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I, think, I think also Jevi, <clears throat> one thing has to be emphasized to every patient it is not the drugs alone. They're only 40%. 60% is the timing of the food and missing a meal. You know, that people do not understand. So that has to be emphasized that the about the timing of the food and not missing a meal is very important to avoid hypoglycemia in type 2 diabetes. Thank you very much. Now, I have so, a question. Dr. Kanwar, sir, I have a question. Sir. So Please. Patients do have hypoglycemia and there is a recurrent hypoglycemia. To that situation, they get suitable to that. As a result, on a recurrent hypoglycemia, at a point, it comes to be hypoglycemia unawareness. <clears throat> but they somehow or other carry out their activities. But how clinically you will suspect, oh, here is a gentleman who is developing hypoglycemia unawareness. Correct. Uh, 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 many of the times, I, as I mentioned, is uh, because of recurrent hypoglycemia and long-standing type 2 diabetes. If you discuss about type 2 diabetes, uh, because of uh, long-standing uh, uh, diabetes, uh, beta cell failure is there. So they are more likely to develop hypoglycemia-associated autonomic failure. So they won't have many of these symptoms, as I mentioned, the uh, adrenergic and cholinergic symptoms, uh, and they directly go into the neuroglycopenic uh, confusion state, or maybe sometimes into the coma. So if someone is, someone is a long-standing diabetic and frequently have history of hypoglycemic, we should be very careful about that. And you keep on monitoring the blood sugar. The, there comes the, the importance of the self-monitoring glycemic control. That would give an idea of the, if the sugars are going down and, and that would give an idea that many of the times patient comes with the blood sugar level of 50 and 60. If you ask, uh, do you have any problem? They say, I didn't have any problem, but I just checked it and it is found to be something like 60, 62 or 58. So uh, and we should be very careful in those patients and also educate them that because of this recurrent hypoglycemia, you can have, cannot have these awareness symptoms even if the blood sugars are low. And uh, the only way to do it to, to avoid this recurrent hypoglycemia and keep on monitoring the blood sugar level in, in a long-standing uh, diabetes. But what's the cutoff level of blood sugar above which we should maintain it? Is it above 70? Yeah, absolutely. It should be above 70. Is there in any laser spray of glucagon? In, 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 in recently, uh, in 2019, FDA approved uh, nasal spray. Uh, it is similarly effective to the injectable one, but injectable one is available with one milligram dose. And the FDA approved nasal glucagon that is available as three milligram doses and it is found to be equally effective. Thank you. We'll go to the next speaker, uh, Ghansham. It was a wonderful talk. Ghansham, are you here with us? Gansam is here. If Gansam is not here, we'll come back to him a little later. Now let us, uh, but, but I liked one sentence he said, I would like to emphasize it again. He said that agonizing when the neuropathy is painful, very, very true. But pain is the gift of God to us. And so a painful neuropathy has no bearing on the life expectancy. It's a nuisance. It is a painful situation with nuisance, but no, no, no bearing on the uh, on the on the further complications, nor on the uh, on the on the uh, I mean the longevity of the diabetic. Whereas he said that uh, that 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 uh, it is it is devastating when it is painless. That is important to diagnose a diabetic foot which is painless 
is a paramount importance. And that's what he said, which is very important. Very important. I think he will, he will join back in time. Now, let me let us ask a question to Dr. Dr. Uh, Dumani, Dumani, which, is, which, which is very important. And uh, the first question, most of our diabetics have sexual dysfunction. Do you think in India's Indian setting, uh, can we detect it in time? Can we correct it in time? Absolutely, yes. Why we cannot? Because, uh, see, the whole thing is we as physicians should come out of our clinical inertia and, and the embarrassment to talk about these things to our patients. We should believe that we are all born out of it. You know, we talk about cancer, we talk about piles, we talk about fissures, etc. So if you have, a, if you are, say, a GP, take a GP who's seeing family from, uh, you know, generations. So he knows that this patient's father had diabetes, hypertension, also had heart disease. So his children, if they come at the age of 30, he should start asking these patients that, do you have problems in making love? And you can make out, you know, from, from the way they talk to you or way they behave, you can really get a suspicion that he surely must be having some issues in the bedroom. And once you start asking them, which is the main thing, and, and when he tells you, yes, he has some problem, so legitimize it by telling them this is very normal and there are definitely more uh, very good treatments available for it and you can become all right. If you don't treat it, it can become worse. So he feels that he doesn't feel alone. So we need to break the ice and we as physician should come out of uh, this inertia and learn the art of talking about this to our patients. We ourselves, there are so many doctors who don't even want to ask because they feel embarrassed to talk about it. I think, I think, uh, I think Deepak, I'll more other example, my own example. On my first day at King's, I had a uh, black female patient and uh, she had uh, about uh, four or five abortions. The questionnaire said, uh, you have to ask them many, many questions. I just got the history of multiple abortion. I went to Peter, Peter Watkins. Uh, he said, did you ask him? Were they all from the same partner? I said, didn't. He said, that is the problem all of you have. You said, very frank in your questioning. When I went back, I asked her, she said, of course not. Of course not. Different partners. You know, <laughs> you know, you know open my eyes. You know, there are three things in life which are important. Food, wealth, and sex. I'll repeat again. Three things are very important for us. Food, wealth, and sex. If you do not ask you would, you would lose a lot of patients' uh, symptoms. You, you can help. I just wanted to ask you three important questions which will be very beneficial for the audience. There are many of my friends, my students, have put up the shockwave therapy. And, you know, uh, I have no... Uh, but it works well. So my patients have said it works. What's your opinion on that shockwave therapy? And which patient do you recommend? It is one of, the, one of the therapies which is definitely recommended. But what we have found in our country that it, it's same as lithotripsy, you know, what used to be used for crushing the stones. So here, the uh, the trabeculae of the penile corpora cavernosum, uh, you know, architecture is little bit. Different. But this therapy works only in patients who have got mild to moderate erectile. It doesn't work in severe ED. And many of the patients, when they have mild, moderate, they don't come to us only. So they come at the advanced stage. And when we send these patients to for this low intensity extra corporal shockwave therapy, they don't respond. And there are a lot of centers in Kerala who have got these machines and they have take, they have selected the right kind of cases, but they have seen no improvement in these patients. So if you have mild to moderate uh, erectile dysfunction, we can easily treat with pharmacotherapy. Why do we send our patients for expensive treatments with this thing? The, ex the treatment is around 75,000 rupees. So, and where you get PD-5 inhibitors and you can advise them how to take it and counsel them on nutrition, etc. And you can make them better in much better way. So it is a proven therapy, definitely. In Australia, US, everywhere, they, uh, there are studies which show that there is definitely improvement in this. The intra, uh, the uh, erections hardness is much better. The penile blood flow is improving. Everything is there. But in our country, we are not having good results. I don't know why. Maybe there is something wrong with the penile arteries in our, or the Asian arteries are different. So something I also like that. the same note with Mithun, Mithun, you know, Gohati, and he was also having similar results which was helpful in some, not helpful in others. The last but one question, Deepak, is, is, is very important. 
have you encountered the questioner wants to know have you encountered any accidents may not be fatal may be not fatal by use of wrong use of the pd5 inhibitor like like if by chance they have given a person who already had a cardiac ischemia have you found and and, and i mean in your you have used so many uh, lakhs of patients you know the deepak also runs the course of a diploma in sexual health in in in, in grant medical college so you, you or your students have any 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 history or any case to recount uh well no deaths have been reported up till now for mm -hmm. patients who are, but whenever we give pd5 inhibitors we make sure that he is not on any nitrates yeah that's true that's true that is what we take sure because only fear is the lethal fear is that he shouldn't get severe hypotension okay pd5 inhibitors they are vasodilators per se they when they were brought when they were studied they were studied for angina and hypertension okay these patients did not improve in their and and hyper they did not improve in their hypertension but they started getting good erections you know and they came for the trials continuously in spite of the fact that their blood pressure did not reduce so dr louis ignaro who was doing this study felt that why are they coming when they are not getting any improvement in their blood pressure so these patients told them that we are getting good erections and we are very happy with it we want to continue the trial and so some 20 years later this drugs have now been used only for erectile dysfunction so sure. this is the only thing these are all dilators they they are in fact like like nitrates you know for the penis so they cannot cause any gangrene or any thrombosis or embolism or infarct or anything like that so they are very useful last last question was important <laughs> question we'll end with that uh, the the questioner uh, I'll, I'll ask yeah after that you can you, you want me to call going to sir yeah yeah going to ramesh would like to ask question now i'll just finish in one second now you know oh, there is yeah, you have raised your hand so it is yours actually you ask first please okay. ask first sir, ramesh, I, i was I, there was one statement that uh, sex has no expiry date no yes it is when we are in the voluminous book ha huh. that uh, that on that i just wanted to comment that uh, if we are breaking our head with glycemic control in spite of all our efforts we are unable to achieve glycemia we are increasing the com complications of uh, vascular disease as well as the nerve, nerve damage then how how can we improve all all category of patient any extent of damage caused by glycemia see you are a very brilliant physician very brief and brief and you are a very brilliant physician with all your clinical acumen all your wisdom on various uh, drugs which are available as oral hypoglycemic drugs or oral you know drugs insulin or whatever you can give to your patients i am sure that out of the 100 pay diabetics you are seeing at least 90 patients you are you will be able to control their blood sugars and i have yet to come across a family in whose family there is no patient of hypertension and we all can manage metabolic syndrome if the onus is with us we need to understand the patient's problem we need to understand what right drug to give him what type of insulin to give him and we can bring down this metabol metabolic syndrome reversal is not a myth it's a reality it has been proven beyond doubt so if we are controlling the metabolic syndrome okay then what are the other causes of if he doesn't have any neurological causes if he does not have any hormonal issues everything we can manage it and we can give them a good quality of life and it is written it has been studied that you can have sex from 9 years to 90 years what else you want so no no sir just I just think... i would like to interrupt a patient comes to you who has never controlled who has never controlled and he was having a hbnc of 13 Uh, since last say couple of years and then the extent of damage you can imagine in ah, such so, patient how do you think that you can improve his sexual health so he, so his doctor is responsible for his hbavc going to 13 he yes, is yes. but his doctor is also responsible he has not given but him, help him guidance help so him. the onus lies with the pb physicians not with him i think i think we will we'll stop with him it for the other session uh, ramesh kindly excuse me because people are waiting but okay. your point Well taken. I just want to say the last sentence that uh, Comtap India has started.
sir ramesh is a panelist he sir ramesh is a panelist he deserves a question yeah yeah so the <laughs> i wanted to mention is that you know it is it is said like this that government of india was only doing whi women health initiative but now we have started one male health initiative yes that centered around erectile dysfunction and the ankle brachial ratio if somebody yes. has a, a, a lower lip artery calcified i do not know whether whether uh, deepak is doing now or not the penile uh, we do it sir we do it in the issue api we do it yeah penile blood flow that is a excellent sign for the male health initiative it is associated with coronary disease so we have taken that so i think uh, i think deepak i'll invite you to one of the next meeting where you should speak about the how sure. this Sure. Yes, my pleasure and my honor, sir. I will yeah. definitely. Now, oh, Ramesh, I'm very sorry. Ramesh, please ask your question. Okay. Make it brief. Sir. I was just uh, just telling that that a patient who is already devastated, he comes to you and expects that you will do miracles for his sexual health. Uh, after a such an extent of damage, how can you help that patient? I Because like we, it, we, we 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 discuss like a ton, but but treatment is in grams. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no we I, need to we need to give him some time to improve you know we need to give him all the right kind of advices and we should motivate him to follow the advices and if he does so see we have patients at 92 also having sex it's not that it's not possible it is possible why it should not be possible if you have a good if you do not have any if you have control over your metabolic syndrome yes. if your blood flow is okay we can help you with pd5 inhibitors to increase more blood flow and also give you all the things which you need so it it's it's not that it is not possible the onus is with the physician we need to be proactive we need to be more committed to our patients we need to see that their life is our lives you know so we should be empathetic and try and treat them in the best possible way Yes, sir. With with the limited resources, we are facing this challenge every day. That uh, patient when I, I, I think I think we should go to Dr. Goenka yes. for the last question of the panel. And uh, okay. uh, my, my question for Dr. Goenka is, uh, what are the situations you have hypoglycemia in a non-diabetic setting? Because uh, we had recently few uh, cases and we lost a case also. So uh, in the uh, discussion of hypoglycemia, it's important. that we, we must tell people uh, in a non diabetic setting what are the situations we can have hypoglycemia and how will proceed in them one to one you know then that it, insulin secreting tumors yeah that is number one mm -hmm. uh, that's a, that's a first thing yeah. and others are categorized as pseudo hypoglycemia i don't think there are uh, uh, the there are should they are also reactive uh, So, so there are there are hypoglycemia which are not uh, uh, pseudo means dropping from say two hundred two hundred pseudo. I and think uh, what Jayadev is meaning hypoglycemia. hypoglycemia. Yes, yes, uh, JB. Ah, uh, because of uh, time shortage, I obviously I didn't attend that part of uh, uh, hypoglycemia in a non-diabetic. It's a big uh, presentation itself. Uh, other than those having acidiopastosis or insulin or other typical non-diabetic hypoglycemia, but what we should worry about in a diabetic, we should always, uh, in particular in elderly uh, and uh, female patients, uh, also can have a hypoglycemia. Uh, with mild diabetes or non-diabetic patient who is having adrenal insufficiency, maybe secondary adrenal insufficiency or cardiac. That is the number one cause that we encounter. Adrenal. Yeah. So, in practically many of the times we see even a good control of diabetic suddenly having hypoglycemia, then it's a cl clinical clue to look at the adrenal insufficiency. So that's that's always you should keep in mind while even treating with the patient or like. <laughs> So, dear friends, I think I think we should close it now. We are well behind yes. it. Uh, we when we when we started, we had uh, one forty minutes. Now one hour. Now it is one hour five minutes. Without without taking yes. now people are waiting. Uh, Ramesh, uh, Jyoti yes. is waiting. Of course, yes, uh, Sambit is our own. Yeah, Sambit is here. Sambit is waiting. So without without uh, wasting time, may I invite the chairpersons of the next session, please. Next person, chairperson. Yes, we have uh, Sandeep Devasis Mishra. We have Mahesh. Both are very young and very energetic, very dynamic people. Over to them. I will request both of you. We are not going for lunch, so we have got half an hour plus half an hour. You have to save from this session. So now we have got three very important talks. This is called technology in diabetes. 
and we have three people talking on the three important aspects i will not repeat them we have we have we have dr uh, shambit we have dr jyoti and we have dr bansi sabu so may i hand over the session to both of you to invite dr shambit for the first talk on the automated insulin delivery devices I, I, you, Babu, I thank uh, Dr. Jena, uh, Dr. Jena for your kind. Sir, I, I, I closed it unceremoniously, but you are closest to my heart because just to save time, sir. But you conducted this as very well. Very big hand for Sishir and Sishir Babu and Dr. Jena, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, team MECD, especially uh, Dr. Alokanan Gosha, Professor Dr. Asok Das, and Professor Dr. Jan Panda for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to chair a scientific session of uh, this ninth edition of NUCD. So this session is going to be the interesting one. Since the discovery of uh, diabetes, uh, which literally means Madhumeha, that is sugar in urine, science and technology has advanced a lot. And urine sugar is now a blessing rather than a curse to manage the diabetes mellitus with SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, <clears throat> then the diagnosis and management is based on blood sugar rather than the urine sugar. And now it is technology blessed us with CGMS and uh, AGP, which further eased the management of diabetes mellitus for persons with diabetes and the diabetologists. So now we'll discuss about the technology in diabetes for which you have three eminent speakers having national as well as the international repute. And uh, the first session is going to be on uh, the automating insulin delivery for better patient outcomes. And uh, I would like to uh, ask Dr. Uh, Mahesh Rath to invite uh, my younger brother, Sambit Das. Thank you, sir. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Kananda sir, Jayant sir, and uh, Ashok Das sir for giving me this opportunity to be a chairperson in this prestigious uh, conference. Now I'd like to invite my guru, my mentor, Professor Dr. Sambit Das. Sir is a MD, DM endocrinology. Currently, sir is a senior endocrinologist at Apollo Sugar Clinic, Kim Super Speciality, Kim's Cancer Hospital, and Professor Endocrinology at Kim's Medical College, Bhubaneswar. Sir has got more than uh, 70 publications. Uh, he is an author in the API textbook of medicine, RSSI textbook of medicine, diabetes, ESI textbook of endocrinology, and Sadiqo uh, textbook of uh, diabetes also. Sir has been the PI in several uh, research and clinical trials. He is also the national EC member of Endocrine Society of India, Secretary Aero Risa Chapter, Joint Secretary RSSDI Risa Chapter, and has been uh, office bearers of um, uh, ESI uh, in the past. So, without taking much time, I would like to request also Dr. Sambit Das to carry on with his um, presentation. Sambit has started his uh, has started his slide sharing. Sambit. Uh, my slides are visible and I'm audible. I hope. Visible. Wonderful. Yeah. Red and white, red and black. <laughs> thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Thank you, Asak, sir, Kanango, sir, Jan, sir, for giving this opportunity. So, I'll be talking on a uh, subject uh, that is uh, that's very important and new uh, to this generation. So, that is automating insulin therapy for better patient outcomes. And in fact, I'm very eagerly waiting for uh, comments and discussion where uh, Dr. Jyoti Dev is there because while going through the review of the literature, almost all the data from India were actually coming from his center on automating insulin therapy. So I'll be discussing on automating insulin therapy for uh, patient, better patient outcomes. So I must acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Devasis Das from Mumbai, the medical team of Medtronix and Dr. Nagis, my friend, for uh, providing me some of the slides and the PPT which I have quoted in this. So we have come a long way. So if we see 100 years back, then uh, when insulin was discovered by Banding and Best and 100 years down uh, to, to 2022 and 2023, we have come a long way. Uh, 
So uh, initially, uh, type 1 diabetes, the longevity was only 1.4 years after the diagnosis. And now you can see how uh, good their uh, quality of life is. And throughout their life, they can have a good uh, uh, and proper normal life for type 1 diabetes. And a intensive insulin therapy, we have known from DCT and other trials that uh, it reduces the uh, microvascular complication and also the macrovascular complications. So insulin has definitely uh, changed the game of uh, type 1 diabetes and to some extent to type 2 diabetes. But it has come uh, with some risk factors also. So it's, it's not entirely a very safe thing from the very beginning. So insulin could save life and lower the risk of glucose toxic diabetes complication. But then there was risk of hypoglycemia. And initially there were problems with the batches of the insulin where uh, some batches were producing more hypoglycemia, the other batches were having lower and then the porcine bovine came and now we are at the human insulin and more advanced or designer insulins currently are available. So the, uh, the, we have come a long way, but the type 1 diabetes management has not reached the proper target. If we see the Swedish registry and Swedish management of type 1 diabetes is supposed to be one of the best management. So they've also an average A1C of 8%. The type 1 diabetes exchange from US, the DPB, the UK, uh, the UK data, the Belgium data have all shown that the HB1C average is definitely higher than the targeted HB1C for type 1 diabetes, even with the best of the care. So the holy grail has, uh, the, uh, the finding for holy grail or the search for holy grail has always been there for a good glycemic control. And a quest has been there for two uh, important points. One is for quest for an ideal insulin, which I'm not discussing in this current slide because uh, insulin also we are uh, searching for more and more advanced insulin. But for what we are discussing today is an ideal insulin delivery. And that too, I'm not discussing about the ideal pen devices, which my uh, subsequent speakers will tell. I'll be sp uh, speaking on how we are doing a more automation of the insulin delivery devices. So the insulin pump, one of the thing which gives uh, an automation of the insulin therapy has have also come a long way. So we have the initial manual insulin pumps and then the sensor augmented pumps, we call it as the VO pump. And uh, the first, there was a threshold suspend so, suspend. so it was a CGM assisted pump where the blood glucose, once it is down, it will suspend that insulin or the insulin delivery. Then there are predictive uh, suspend. So whenever the blood, uh, blood sugar is going down, that uh, the downturn itself will automatically switch up the pump and then it will again restart. The first hybrid closed loop was 670G and the advanced hybrid closed loop, which uh, uh, six, uh, the, the newer advanced uh, hybrid loop is the uh, uh, 670G. So that uh, gives an automated correction bolus and uh, the target is uh, 100, 110, and 120, and the active insulin time is two to eight hours. So it's a more advanced hybrid closed loop system. And then uh, probably the uh, recent future will find a completely automatic uh, pump that is known as the closed loop uh, device. So the sensor will give the data and then there would be an automatic insulin delivery. So that's how the insulin pump will progress. And we are in a very advanced stage of advanced hybrid closed loop. So this is one of the earliest uh, insulin pump where uh, the sensor was not attached. Only the doctor has to uh, have to calculate the basal doses and the bolus doses, and the patient has to just uh, continue with that infusion pump. Then the CGM was added. We call it as the view pump minimate paradigm with insulin pump with CGM, and the CGM gives the data. And whenever the hypoglycemia happens, the insulin infusion is stopped. So that is one step advanced. And then there was a pump that thinks, so the next generation pump where there were, when there is a trend toward lowering of the blood glucose, the insulin automatically, insulin delivery automatically suspends and then it again restarts. But wh what has happened with the newer advanced hybrid system is that it has got uh, important three components. One is the advanced sensor enabled insulin pump. And there is a CGM sensor that sends information about the glucose to a controller. The controller can be an algorithm or AI and calculates how to automatically adjust the insulin and the insulin pump executes the command of controller to change how much insulin is being delivered. So this is the new 780G uh, insulin pump and uh, you can see that uh, uh, this is the pump where it is connected to a guardian 
connect link three transmitter that is a CGM that gives uh, values or give, that sends sensor uh, messages of the sensor glucose to the pump. And you can calibrate with the AccuCheck guide link glucometer, which you need to monitor and calibrate the pump. And then there is a Minimed mobile app in the smartphone. So in the smartphone itself, you can see that how the insulin is uh, being delivered and how the blood glucose is, whether the basal and bolus, how much it is being continued. And uh, uh, it, it gives all the data over the smartphone and there is a computer and finally it all the data is transferred to a care link server so there is a server which actually sees uh, time to time how the sugar is there and uh, by its algorithm you can actually manage the insulin delivery 780g pump has been recently launched i have only two uh, patients who are on 780g and uh, it, it's actually uh, it's almost like a closed loop system so automation of insulin delivery is an important concept because once we started with an open loop uh, where we uh, it's more of a user's intervention. So patient has to check the blood glucose, uh, calculate the dose and give the bolus or uh, titrate the basal dose. So that is more of a user intervention, but gradually it has gone up to a automate, automation of the insulin uh, delivery. So the AID system where it is more of a mechanized thing or a system of workload is more compared to the user's intervention. So basically the uh, patient's job or the doctor's job is relatively less compared to the machine job. The 780G or the advanced hybrid pump adjusts and corrects the glucose level every five minutes as needed, help prevents highs or lows with less effort, lower default target of 100 milligram per deciliter, we can keep it, and with options to select higher target like 110 and 120. So this is the, uh, you can see on the right side, the pump, and if there is a shield mark which comes, that, that means the patient is in automation mode. So the algorithm is giving the proper insulin delivery continuously. Offers connectivity and upgradability. Patients can check their glucose level and receive notification on smartphones, share data with care partners. So the doctor can also get the report if needed or the patient's attendance. Suppose the child is wearing this uh, 780G, the mother or the father can in their office can see how the blood glucose is fluctuating in their smartphone. So that, that does the software upgrades and upgrades are also available. So Minimate 780G adjusts and corrects glucose level automatically 24-7. Smart guard technology helps prevent high and lows. And this is how the insulin is getting delivered. So there is a selection between the basal target of 100 milligram to uh, you can set it as 120 milligram per deciliter also. So whenever the blood glucose goes above a particular level, the basal insulin secretion also goes uh, to that level to control the blood glucose. But up to a certain point, if the blood glucose is still higher, the basal insulin adjusts every five minutes based on the, uh, the sensor glucose value. But if it is still higher, then autocorrection delivers in the algorithm determines the need for as frequent as every five minutes, a bolus can also be, autocorrection bolus can also be delivered. So the basal is from in the green line and the blue is like the autobolus corrections. And finally, it tries to maintain the blood glucose in a very narrow range. It, it, it uh, runs in a smart guard technology. So advanced hybrid closed loop system or the 780G system has got an auto basal uh, by the sensor glucose and also it uh, auto corrections by the sensor glucose. It uh, runs with an algorithm known as a PID algorithm. So what is a PID algorithm? So it's a proportional integral and derivative algorithm. So proportional means how far the sensor glucose is from the target, we call it as proportional. How long the sensor glucose has been away from the target, that is the integral. And how rapidly the sensor glucose has been changing, that is known as the derivative. And the total active insulin, both basal and bolus. So this is the uh, PID algorithm by which it runs. So there would be continuous basal changes every five minutes and also if the sugar is high, it will give a autocorrected uh, bolus dose also. The indications and limitations, currently there are some uh, uh, indications and there are contraindications. So the Minimed currently 780G has been currently approved for type 1 diabetic patients only who are requiring insulin and the age uh, at which uh, the type 1 diabetes can take the approval dose is 7 to 80 years. Uh, 
The smart card feature cannot be used for people who require less than eight units or more than 250 units of total daily insulin per dose. The, the newer uh, uh, pump has got this much uh, of uh, limitations and indications. And the system has not been studied in pregnant women, persons with type 2 diabetes, or in person using other antihyperglycemic therapies that do not include insulin therapy. Use of clinical judgment is always recommended in cases where patients cannot read instruction on the pump screen, refuse to routinely check glucose, or are unwilling to announce meals before the eating. So there are some drawbacks. So the physician has to be alert that these are the conditions where the patient may not uh, be correctly taking the pump. So what are the clinical evidences? Uh, the real-world data, the, it's from the in silico to pivotal study to real-world data and uh, there are uh, there are good number of patients on this uh, type of pump and we have, and in all these trials it has been shown that the time in range has been to the tune of 75 to 77 percent and the time below range has been always very low so that means the hypoglycemia chances are low and the time in range were quite high these are results as per the country. I think India also, they have gathered a good number of population and uh, in 780G and they are going to publish that. And the time in range across different countries is to the tune of 75 to 80%. And we know that's quite good, uh, 75 to 80%. And the time below range has been minimized. So these are some of the randomized control trial where transition of people with type 1 diabetes on SMBG and multiple dose insulin when they were converted to Minimate 70, 780G system and uh, continued for an extended period of nine months, they found that the, uh, the time in range has improved by 21.5% in three months and the uh, significant time below range reduction has been there to the tune of 4.4%. So time in range has increased, time below range has been reduced if you are changing from uh, the conventional MDI to the 780G system. There is another study known as the ADAPT study. The, they have taken type 1 diabetes uh, on MDI for more than two years using CGM and uh, they've changed over to the newer insulin delivery system or the automation of the insulin with uh, the newer hybrid closed loop system of 780G. And what they found was that in the six months and continuation period of six months, where they've compared the 780G versus the multiple dose insulin with CGM, there was a significant reduction in the HbA1c to the tune of 1.4% and the hypoglycemia incidences have also come down. So with this much of data, the global recommendation of uh, Automation of insulin de delivery has been there and youth and adults with type 1 diabetes to improve glycemic control should use uh, uh, this type of devices. Strongly recommended for people with type 1 diabetes as their use has been shown to increase uh, improvement in TIR and reduction in the hypoglycemia. This method of insulin delivery is preferred over other modalities. These are some of the, uh, some of the uh, not the data, but like uh, the use of this newer devices in India and probably the first one is by Dr. Mohan and uh, also by Dr. Jyotidev et al. in their center, they've used this as first time in India. And uh, there are some other newer automation of insulin devices like the uh, LibrePro associated with my life with so pump. And uh, there is also a Omnipod patch, Dexcom and controller devices, which are not there in India, but uh, it has got some unique features also and can be used in type two diabetes and also in kids. There are some active players and many, uh, many players are actually planning for closing the loop. And uh, there are different uh, uh, organizations we are coming with the more closing the loop or more automation of the insulin devices. So these are the names uh, um, uh, among them, the JDRF, uh, Dexcom, FDA, Diabetes, Mind, D Data Exchange, the CGM in the cloud or the open source data are some of them. But there are some issues with uh, insulin pumps with more automation also. So there is an editorial like the do-it-yourself type 1 diabetes dilemma for medical practitioners. So we need to know about the safety and efficacy. We still need more data about the other devices. I think we have good data of 780G, but how the other closed loop are working, we have to see that. There are some legal implications whether we can completely uh, uh, 
or the completely tra trans transit the management of type 1 diabetes to the patient itself or how how we can manage those patients who are completely in automated system support infrastructure availability is also another issue like uh, uh, for pump malfunction and all those things we need good support infrastructure so these are some of the problems that may arise from automation of the insulin uh, delivery system so with that i lend thank you for the patient hearing Yeah, uh, thank you, Sambit, uh, for uh, such a nice presentation on the automating insulin delivery systems. And uh, now uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Jyotidar Keshavde from Kerala, uh, who will be talking on the smart insulin pens. Dr. Jyotidar? Are you there? Yeah. Hi, uh, Dr. Sandhi, yeah. I am here, but my uh, uh, presentation already recorded and sent. So, should I present now? Yes, sir. It's already recorded. Sorry, yes, so then I let me, because I was not prepared for a presentation now. So, let me pull out. Uh, Sambit, well done. Thank you, thank you, sir. Actually, I was. Uh, it's all your uh, publications, actually. So uh, anything from Indian Pump, it is from Dr. Jyoti Dev. So I wanted to hear uh, comments at the end, actually. So we'll have a good panel discussion. Even okay. I have some sure, 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 sure. <laughs> Hardik, uh, introduction slides, please. For uh, Jyoti sir. Introduction slide, I will show. Let me see. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I think they must be having the recorded thing. Uh, Rx event, are you there? Any any person from Rx? <clears throat> Am I visible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. So this is my introduction. Please go ahead. <laughs> sir. Uh, so uh, uh, as such, Dr. Jyoti Dev and uh, Jyoti Dev Keshav Dev needs uh, no introduction, but uh, still I'd like to uh, introduce him uh, for this August gathering. He is the chairman of the Jyoti Dev uh, Diabetes Research Center at uh, Trivandrum, Kochi. And uh, he is the Central Executive Committee member of the RSSJ. He is the Vice President of Kerala RSSJ, Managing Trustee of uh, PK Samadha Trust and engaged in charity and literal, uh, literary activities. He is the Editor-in-Chief of... Uh, uh, yeah, he is the Editor-in-Chief of the uh, International Journal of uh, Diabetes and Technology. He conducts the monthly diabetes education via two YouTube channels and uh, publishes a monthly internet-based free diabetes newsletter for the first 15 years. I'm also getting it. <laughs> uh, he's the first author for Indian guidelines on vaccination, insulin funds, and glucose monitoring. He's the pioneer in cost-effective treatment of diabetes with use of telemedicine and technology. So uh, Jyotidev Diabetes Center is an IDF recognized center for, of excellence in diabetes care and uh, center of education. And JDC is accredited for RSSJ certified course in diabetology for doctors. Over to Jyoti Dev, sir. Thank you. Sir, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandhi, for the kind introduction. And uh, let me, first of all, extend my respect and gratitude to uh, Dr. A.K. Das, sir, Dr. Alok, sir, and my dear friend, Jayanta Panda, uh, Dr. Sambit Das, and Ben, she is going to be the speaker uh, for the next uh, lecture. So thank you very much, dear friends, for giving me an opportunity. So I am given a very uh, different topic this time, a very unique topic, and uh, this topic is on <clears throat> uh, connected insulin pens. So we have been listening to the brilliant lecture by Dr. Sambit Das on uh, insulin pumps and uh, automated insulin delivery systems, and this is somewhat connected to the first topic. So why you require a connected insulin? I would say that a good majority, more than 30 to 40 percent of those patients using an insulin pump, or whenever a doctor is suggesting an insulin pump delivery device to the patients, majority of them are not comfortable. And this level of convenience and comfort is probably more important than the affordability, because uh, they need to change the tubings, they need to change the infusion set once in every three days, they need to change the <coughs> They need to change the sensor once in every seven days or 10 days. And in addition, 
lot of training and retraining is required when they are using the insulin pumps and the delivery devices. So the question here is, are the connected insulin pumps an alternative to this? So the, the answer is, it is a convenient and a cheap alternative. But the next question is, is it going to be a replacement? Are the connected insulin pumps going to be a replacement for the popular insulin pumps? And my answer to this question is, it is never ever going to be a complete replacement. But of course, the connected insulin pens are superior to the conventional syringes and insulin pens. That we need to agree. <clears throat> and how do you classify the connected insulin pens? The insulin connected pens can be classified into number one, TAP. And these are the tracking insulin pens. And the number two, the SIP or smart insulin pens. And then you have the smart insulin caps. I will very, very briefly in the next 10 or 12 minutes go through the history and also the details. And what is the history? When did we first have the insulin pens in the global market? And this was way back in 1985 when Novo pen was launched and many followed. And in 2007, the pen with the memory function was marketed. So just showing the memory of the insulin which is delivered. In 2014, there is another version of the same pen and there is enhanced insulin pen cap. And the caps are still developed by many others. And this is the third component of the connected insulin pen. And then you have in 2017, another remarkable innovation, the US FDA approved the reusable smart insulin pen. So the smart insulin pen is quite different from the conventional connected insulin pen. So what are these smart insulin pens? So they have the connectivity and the connectivity is via the Bluetooth and usually it is a Bluetooth low energy so that you can save the battery life or it can be in addition to via the NFC that is near field communication. The picture you can see a Nova Pen 6 getting manually connected to your mobile phone which is NFC enabled. The pen is also NFC enabled and the data is transferred via this application to the mobile phone application and it can be digitally stored. It can be stored in the cloud, for example, in the glucose. And uh, similar to what we have listened to Dr. Sambitha, similar to the stages of evolution of an automated insulin delivery system with an insulin pump, we do have a similar staging with connected insulin pens. And the stage zero, Unfortunately, we are still at stage zero in India, and these are the usual pens. And in stage one, we have the tracking insulin pen. Retrospectively, the dose is documented in the pen. And in stage two of a tracking insulin pen, it is a real time. In addition, you have the insulin on board data. The data is stored in the cloud. In stage three, and that is the final stage with tracking insulin pen, it is integrated with diabetes management systems. You can retrieve the information. You have the insulin doses, the carb, and then you have the CTM data against this. And in stage four, four and five, remember, these are the smart insulin pens. And this comes with the dose calculator. It can even detect the priming of the dose so that it is abstracted from the insulin on board or the, it can prevent the insulin stacking, it can prevent, efficiently prevent hypoglycemia. And then you can have different settings such as ICR, the insulin sensitivity factor. And, and these are all very similar to what is happening with an insulin pen for more than 50 years. And in the final stage where we are now, it comes with an additional setting for the weight of the person. And then you can even provide you with customized coaching and education, can deliver the modules, and this is probably one of those examples of an advanced decision support system. So the smart insulin pens are also rapidly advancing. So this is from Novo. There are two insulin pens. These are not available in the Indian market. One for adults, that is Novo Pen 6, and the other one, the colored one, is the next version of Echo, that is a Novo Pen Echo Plus, meant for children, the pediatric population, which has got the ability for 0.5 dosing, that is half unit dosing, but in addition, you can see that over the pen cap, you have the memory of the last delivered bolus. 
or even the basal, we can use the same for even Prasiba or for long acting insulins. And then the duration from the last injection, it stores 800 injection memory. And the battery, it has got a life of five years. And it is also NFC enabled. So another one which is approved by the US FDA, cleared by the US FDA is Bigfoot Unity. So we have been listening to Bigfoot for more than 20 years now. And this is an integrated diabetes management system. It can be used along with either a basal or a borer. So what is special about Bigfoot Unity? This is again uh, an example of how an insulin cap can be integrated with other pens. And the cap can be used as a reader on an NFC enabled phone. You can scan the Libre reader with this and the data is captured by the insulin pen over there and it will automatically suggest you. It is there on the display over the insulin pen cap itself, the dose which need to be delivered. So that is quite amazing. The cap in the pen itself is suggesting you the dose of the insulin to be delivered. So what are the uh, clinical features or the merits of a connected insulin pen? If you are a believer of precision diabetology, this is again an example of how precision can be ensured when you are using a delivery system for insulin. And another one, delivering the right dose at the right time. There is no question of missing a bonus. It will remind you if a bonus is missed or if it is, mismatched. And it is also having the provision to integrate with other diabetes related data and also capable of informing you with therapy decisions and for the doctor as well as for the physician and for the patient. It helps you overcome the, uh, the major challenge. I would say that the major challenge in diabetes is overcoming the therapeutic inertia. And some of these connected pens are also enabled for sensing the temperature of insulin. It will give an alert if it is exceeding the uh, temperature, it can also provide you with an alert if the insulin is expired or the cartridge need to be replaced. And if you're unsure whether you have bonus or not, then you can check in the mobile phone application and the data will be there. And uh, this is how it is transforming from diacin to glucose, not available in India, but popular all over the world, a data management system where you can download the information from a insulin pump or from a glucometer or a CGM device and including from the smart insulin pens. And this is also helping patients for a long time and also the hospitals to uh, probably increase the time in range. So now uh, diabetes management is all about percentage time in range and the DR metrics. So let us now have a glance on how the connected insulin pens are improving the DR. And this is a study among 94 patients, this is with Novo uh, Echo Plus and with Novo Weapon 6, a type 1 diabetes subjects using a CGM and a basal borus insulin regimen and with connected insulin pens. The TAR increased by around 1.9 hours per day. And the level 2 hyperglycemia, that is below 54 milligrams per deciliter, again, reduced by 0.3 hours per day. And that is significant, very, very significant, both statistically and clinically. And there is a significant reduction even for the time spent in hyperglycemia. And what is it? MPD, very important. Very important in a basal bonus regimen in type 1 as well as in type 2 diabetes, missed bonus doses. And that is very, very common. And with the use of connected insulin pens with the remainder functions, the missed bonus doses were reduced by 43%. So with the use of advanced user-friendly technology, such as with the smart insulin pens, there is significantly more time spent in range, and there is a significant reduction in the missed meal boluses. And this is how it has evolved. For those of you interested in going through the history of evolution, and this is the history for the last 100 years, Ever since the discovery of insulin, the insulin delivery devices are also advancing. And this review from India, this has been referred to by the ADA, by the AS in their clinical practice guidelines as well. And moving on to a detailed discussion, smart insulin pen. And this is in pen. Originally, uh, it was uh, actually a property of uh, another company which is now occurred by Medtronic. And this is a reusable pen automatically capturing the meal dosing. So you need not manually put anything. 
and the, the data is automatically logged in. It prevents insulin stacking. But what is special? You can see that it is giving a remainder function. Did you miss your breakfast dose? And this can appear on your Apple Watch or on a smartwatch so that you will never miss a dose. And this is connecting via Bluetooth. And you can see that there is uh, CGM at the bottom and the insulin kinetics at the top. It helps take some of the mental math out of the diabetes management. So it, did, it can itself automatically suggest the dosages of insulin to be delivered and considers insulin on board. It, but you have to manually, but that is important for in-pen. With in-pen users, you have to manually log in the data pertaining to the long-acting insulin. And it currently works with all the rapid-acting insulins. So the SIPs, so again, this is what which is shown on the picture is in-pen, originally from Companion, and now with Medtronic connects to Guardian sensors as well. The SIP dose calculator offers support for those on simpler but less precise fixed mealtime dosing regimens and counting the carbohydrates using the insulin carb ratio. And it is precise to even a decimal point. Over four time periods, we can change your insulin carb ratio, the insulin sensitivity factor, the, vari the variations related to the eating habits, menstruation, physical activity, and so on. So many of these are similar to the settings in an advanced smart insulin pump. And this has to go through the ISO standard. So what is the ISO standard for the connected insulin pen? So 15187 is the standard for the glucose meters. And here it is ISO 116081. And this is considering the accuracy for extremes of temperature, for extremes of humidity, for extremes of vibration, exposure to dust, and even to the moisture. It needs to be stable. So, when will you recommend connected insulin pens? You can recommend connected insulin pens for those with recurrent episodes of hypo, repeated hospital admissions for uncontrolled diabetes, a glycemic variability which is sufficient enough to result in mood swings, psychological distress or depression, very common. Those who are repeatedly forgetting the bonus before a meal, those who are having difficulty in mathematics, carb counting, because the pen is helping you, the app is helping you a little bit with the mathematics, and elderly who are living alone, and of course, children with type 1 diabetes, a large population who cannot afford or who are not comfortable with use of insulin pump therapies, and women who are pregnant with diabetes, and these are also useful for those who are caregivers for people with diabetes, because it is much more convenient, and also for in-hospital use. And look at the global market. The global market for smart insulin pens, it is steadily growing. And if you look at the segment, it is in uh, 2021, it has got a market size of US dollars 97.6 million against 306 million dollars in 2030. And in 2021, the home care settings, that is a home care setting segment has actually contributed to 25% of the market share. So it is steadily growing globally. And the US FDA has also started approving some of the smart pen caps in addition to the smart insulin pens. And this is the Malia medical device, a smart sensor which can be attached to either an insulin pen delivering a long acting insulin or a rapid acting insulin. But very recently, this is also getting approved for use with GLP-1 based pens. So that is amazing. So in conclusion, my dear friends, the future of diabetes will be heavily dependent on the use of technologies. And this is because of the reason that most of the patients are finding it very useful with better outcomes, much, much, much better outcomes. And number two, the clinicians like us cannot shy away because the use of technologies is going to be very, very useful. And this probably will be the one which is benefiting those below the age of 40 years. Because below the age of 40 years, most of the patients consider the use of technologies and a mobile health application, a user-friendly mHealth application as a loving, caring companion. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So I can see Dasar over there.
So I'm there. The and, and their talk, uh, the uh, Jyoti, and it's a fabulous talk. You know, from the very beginning, from the word go, when you started thanking Sandeep and started this talk, I'm there, and I must tell you that it is. It is. It will have some questions after Bansi's presentation. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. Can, sure. Wait. Yeah. Can, can we invite Bansi now to present? <clears throat> but yeah. I it is fabulous. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jyoti Dev sir. So it was a very nice presentation. Now I invite uh, Dr. Bansi Sabu uh, for his uh, topic on uh, CGMS. And uh, to introduce him, he needs no introduction. He was the uh, See, I think you meet Bansi is every every everything. So he is a polymac, poly, <laughs> yeah. polymac in diabetes. Yeah. And uh, during his tenure of uh, president in RSS Day, RSS Day has seen a lot of change in technologies. So uh, hats off to Bansi Sabu sir, and I invite uh, Dr. Bansi Sabu sir to start the session on CGMS. Over to Bansi Sabu sir. Thank you, Dr. Kanugo and Dr. A.K. Das for giving me an opportunity to talk on a continuous glucose monitoring. It's a very, very important topic. And in the next 15 minutes, I'll be finishing my talk to understand where we have to use the CGM. I have no financial disclosure for making this talk. This is very important statement. Somebody had talked that continuous glucose monitoring have a future because a intermittent monitoring is not up to the task. Neither it can avoid the hypoglycemia nor it can get a target range by using insulin. And at the same time, by doing a multiple times monitoring, you are not able to uh, control the glucose variability too. So CGM is a future and this has been talked in 2013. And after 10 years, we are feeling that yes, it is a really a future. And probably in another 10 years, we all will be using continuous glucose. Let me give an example. If I do a SMB on diabetes, actually it is not normal. Person is hypoglycemia too. So you can understand how CGM is more useful to know where person is getting hypo and hyperglycemia. It's like a difference between a photography and videography. You know that with a photograph, you can know the random blood glucose level. But when you do the videography, you will know that how the person is actually moving, where the glucose is going up and down. The similar way, the difference between halter monitoring or a, uh, just getting a ECG for a routine physician just to tell, tell them that how they are different, they're getting uh, continuous glucose monitoring or a random blood glucose monitoring. We know that HbA1c, which we are doing since last 30 years for our patients to know the average glucose but you may have two different type of patients one with the same a1c but you will find if you will do the continuous glucose monitoring on left side you can find that that sugar variability is not very high while other side you will find there is a lot of glucose variability there is a hypo and hyperglycemia but still person is achieving hb1c of 7.8 so whether we have to just see 7.8 a1c and further titration of the patient is to be done on 7.8 on right side a patient will develop more hypoglycemia but on the left side with 7.8 with less glycemic variability probably he is doing well so there is a rationale for using continuous glucose monitoring in the persons who are not meeting with a1c have frequent low blood glucose level they are unaware of low blood sugar level or those who want to reduce their a1c target without increasing the hypoglycemic events they are the one who need continuous glucose monitoring the limitations for currently what available monitoring method is a1c which is the give you average sugar and does not uh, count for hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia in between and it does not give you any information as far as glucose variability is concerned if i talk about the smbg it gives you the information of that point of time and when hypoglycemia hypoglycemia there or the overnight data is impractical low books are really difficult difficult to interpret too the continuous glucose monitoring again in india we have both available 
professional CGM and real time CGM. Professional CGM is with iPro, with more commonly we are using with Libre Pro, but there is a iPro also of a Medtronic, but real time we have with Libre, we have with Medtronic, and we have with Dexcom 2. The classification can be done with a real time, which is as I told you, like Dexcom. Intermittently scanned CGM, which is a Libre, which is the person has to do the multiple time flashing that we also call flash glucose monitoring, then blinded one or a professional CGM, which is like Libre Pro or iPro. And there is an integrated CGM, which is also available in our country when it is integrated along with the insulin pump. So person is can see his sugar report in the pump itself only while the CGM sensor is separately placed but the sugar monitoring can be done in, in the pump itself so there are different type of cgm luckily in india we have all varieties of continuous glucose monitoring which are available if you see over the time of evolution of continuous glucose monitoring it started almost in 1970 but in india we started using more after 2000 but Primarily in last 5-10 years, 5-6 years, particularly when Libre had come in India with professional one, the uses of continuous glucose monitoring in our country also increased. But all over the world, the Dexcom, Medtronic and Libre, we are very, very popular. And probably in coming near future, we will be having a continuous glucose monitoring, not for 10 days, 14 days, but it will be months together or maybe uh, with the eye lens with one company is working, probably it will be come once you put it maybe lifelong you can see your sugar report continuously on your mobile like you are seeing the temperature of your city or the pulse rate which you can measure uh, through the app or by different way there are challenges which we used to use the metronic one which was having a real challenges because seven days in a seven different colors the continuous glucose monitoring reports used to come so interpretation of that was real difficult and then this a, a software had come that is ambulatory glucose profile we just put all the seven days report in such a way that you can see the median of it you can see that how much time the person is having another 50 percent of the time moving in hypo and hyperglycemic what is the level and the last 10 percent even the uh this 10 percent also in a slowly in dotted form also which you can see that if it is not causing severe hypoglycemia for 10 percent even you can omit that if occasionally it is going in that way you can omit it also so this is what ambulatory glucose profile is compressing all the data of those seven days 10 days 14 days in a format in such a way that you can see that in a median glucose level and how it is moving up or down so i mean it becomes much easier for a clinician to interpret that data now the question comes what's the utility of continuous glucose monitoring is it really going to give you the information in 1983 it was showing that when we have done a dcc trial with a self-monitoring of blood glucose level the persons could achieve the a1c from 9 to 7.2 which was the average a1c from 9 to 7.2 but severe hypoglycemia rate was 62 per 100 patient year this is in dcct trial in 1983 after 25 years these patients were put on a continuous glucose monitoring and this was a jdr of cm cgm data after 25 years what we could see it is decreased significantly the hypo risk by 20 percent instead of 62 yes the newer insulin analogs also we started using but still the risk of hypoglycemia is significantly reduced by putting the patients on a continuous glucose monitoring and that's a scientific evidence which we have but if you put them on cgm along with pump probably you are almost omitting the hypoglycemia and this is a data of a pivotal trial in 2016 which is the median a1c they could get from 7.7 .7 to 6.9 without a single episode of a hypoglycemia so this is the uh, utility of CGM or you can say the scientific evidence behind the using CGM that it not only significantly reduce the A1C but at the same time significantly reduce the risk of hypoglycemia too. Now do we have other study for that? There is a gold study which is compared with CGM versus SMBG is the lower risk of hypoglycemia and better quality of life there is a one silver study which is talking of beneficial long-term hmc control in a patient who have treatment satisfaction with cgm versus smbg again it had shown a significant improvement in a1c as well as risk of hypoglycemia significantly decreased and then there is a diamond study which is talking of better glycemic efficacy and safety of CGM versus usual care and these were the type 1 diabetic patients 158 randomly assigned for self-monitoring for 24 weeks it had shown in its conclusion that significant reduction in A1C with lesser duration of hypoglycemia the patients who are on CGM 
So real time CGM is superior to flash glucose monitoring for glucose control in type 1 diabetes. Coridia randomized control trial. This trial had talked about the uh, evidence of grade 1 evidence, which is published in type 1 diabetes. That yes, it is having a grade 1 evidence, particularly in type 1 diabetic patients who are using real time continuous glucose monitoring. In India, we have published one paper with Unni and Shashang and Jyotidev on consensus statement of using continuous glucose monitoring in type 2 diabetes. And these were the patients who are on oral antidiabetic agent, which we had also talked that how it can be useful for the patients who are on oral antidiabetic agents and they are type 2. So we have a lot of data from type 1 from the Western world, but we try to do some data from India also. This is a paper which is published in Journal of Diabetologist with Dr. V. Mohan, again with Jyoti, Sunil, Manoj, uh, myself, Rajiv, many more persons for talking of retrospective continuous glucose monitoring, which is Libre Pro, for optimizing the management of type 2 diabetes in India. This one more paper, which I published, time in range is a target in type 2 diabetes. This is an urgent need. We need for our type 2 diabetic patients also a time in range. That has been a concept primarily been designed for type 1 diabetes when they are using CGM. But, but if our type 2 diabetic patients also do CGM, probably time in range will give us more idea about the what is the target. CGM is an additional asset in current pandemic because the patients who are not able to come to the clinic or face-to-face -face meeting even uh, distantly, they can also contact with their doctors too. And even in the hospitals, even in, in hospital, we don't have the data more from the ICU, but we have the data, those who are getting hospitalized and in the room, the real-time continuous glucose monitoring can be done. And even their data can be also transferred to the diabetologist if diabetologist is not coming to see them face to face too. So they can be used, even the patients who are distantly, they can be treated and they don't need a face to face consultation too. Do we have any guideline which is talking about it? Yes, international consensus is talking use of continuous glucose monitoring. Luckily, I was part of this expert group. It has been endorsed by American Association of Clinical Endocrinology. It has been endorsed as a clinical endocrine in uh, as by showing that even in 2020, that immediately after the guideline which was consensus was released in 2020, they are saying that using CGM whenever it is indicated in assisting patient in reaching glycemic goal. And this is for type 2 diabetes. So they were the first one in 2020 that use of continuous glucose monitoring in type 2 diabetes too. ASN talking very clearly that CGM has been recommended for type 2 diabetes patients uh, in the algorithm in executive summary. This is one more paper which we had published in JAPI using ambulatory glucose profile for improving monitoring and management for type 2 diabetes and also one more paper as a consensus guideline for glycemic monitoring in type 1 and type 2 diabetes uh, from India too. And one more paper which has recently been published how frequently they should do the continuous glucose monitoring but that's a very important question most of the time asked by the physician that how frequently they should do the CGM too and this was uh, endorsed by multiple society across the world including diabetes India from India that using CGM uh, is not only for type 1 but also for type 2 diabetes who are on insulin or who are on multiple daily insulin injection. The frequency should be those patients who are very well controlled even once in a year is fine but those who are not very good controlled once in a month relatively controlled once in a three month and relatively well controlled even once in six months a, a a professional CGM or a blinded CGM can be done with this. At this point of time, I can't say that we can replace A1C or SMBZ. I will say all three are complementary and essential to each other. A person who is doing CGM also should have A1C as well as the random blood glucose monitoring. Let me give you one example of a patient to whom we have started after seeing the CGM, the GLP-1, this is the patient who was already with 9.5 H9 HP1C and had was already on a triple drag with a glyptin with metformin and with uh she was very uncontrolled he had gone with two doctors i just put the patient on CGM and we asked them instead of building glyptin let us be on glp1 and every alternate day patient sugar was getting down and we stop her glimmy pride from 4 million.
milligram to two to to one milligram, and then it was zero GLP one metformin and SGLT two combination, and you can see here it is very well controlled. So you can see how continuous glucose monitoring have given us the guideline or guide uh, guided us to achieve a tight glycemic control without getting hypoglycemia and without using even the insulin and patient is losing weight, recovering, and you can say almost like a getting reversal with HBNC of line 5.8, the patient is maintaining less than 6. So to summarize my talk, continuous glucose monitoring is assisting us for discovering unknown hyper and hypoglycemia. It also gives us the idea about the glycemic variability, assessing the percentage of I'm in range and out of range. It gives you the severity also of hypo and hyperglycemia. It gives actionable information which we get from CGM. It gives impact of behavioral variances. It analyzes glycemic effect of new intervention effectively and efficiently. And it also gives care of diabetes which is getting digitalized. So CGM enhances patient health management, adherence, and confidence of diabetes. With this, I thank once again, thank you very much for all the listeners and thank you very much. Dr. Kanungo, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Bansi, very much. Uh, at this point, uh, I will invite Dr. Kanwar, Jebi Kanwar, who will be moderating uh, the question answer session. Uh, and uh, is away, away has come. Away has joined. Uh, I will request Dr. Kanwar to start. Uh, uh, this uh, session has been excellent with uh, three excellent talk on automated insulin delivery and uh, smart pain and cesium. Uh, the gist of the three excellent talks and the, the take-home message from these three talks would be we are probably reaching to the target hb one without hypoglycemia using these three, three talks. So uh, all uh, did fabulous job and uh, we should use more newer technology for achieving the glycemic control and uh, without hypoglycemia. So my first uh, question would be to Dr. Sambit Das. Uh, Sambit uh, presented about uh, automated insulin delivery, starting from the discovery of insulin to still the uh, 870Z of insulin pump. So my question to be Sambit is, uh, this is being normally being used in type 1 diabetes. How do you place the use of this automated insulin uh, uh, delivery system in type 2 diabetes? And uh, there have been studies with uh, uh, 670Z or 770Z with a uh, few number of patients with type 2 diabetes, and uh, they have been doing well. So how do you place uh, uh, this automated insulin uh, delivery system in, in type 2 diabetes? And which subpopulation of type 2 diabetes would be more helpful of using this uh, automated insulin delivery system? Yeah, I think that's a very important question. Uh, the newer hybrid uh, closed loop system that is the 780G, the indication is only for type 1 diabetes actually. So whenever you are using type 2 diabetes, so probably that would be an off level. But uh, nevertheless, many times uh, to type 2 diabetic patients have also been put on insulin pumps. So those who are having high fluctuation, mostly brittle diabetes with frequent hypoglycemia, hypoglycemic unawareness, requiring large doses of basal bolus therapy. So probably in those uh, patients with type 2 diabetes, we can use, but again, it is not indicated as per the data by the new hybrid system. Uh, why, why, why do you think uh, the pace, insulin pumps are named as 670Z, 770Z, 870Z? Uh, what is the idea behind that? I think these are the different generation of insulin pump. Uh, Dr. Jyotidev, uh, sir, uh, should make a comment on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you are right. You are right. This is to indicate the generation of the pump and generation of the sensor. Yeah. Uh, so we started with uh, 715, 722. So those were the partly closed loop systems. And uh, now we have uh, hybrid and then advanced hybrid closed loop system is 780G. And the 780G, the algorithm, so you know, uh, Dr. J.B. Kanbar <coughs> was asking the question on type 2. So this is uh, widely used in type 2 as well. Uh, so there are three, three algorithms, that is proportional integral derivative, model predictive control, and fuzzy logic. And uh, some hybrid closed systems are using a PAD, some others are using MPAC. But they have seen that the algorithms are so difficult in type 1 diabetes. So they are having all those clinical trials in type 1 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is so easy to use these pumps. So it works. Uh, probably the TAR is much better when you are using in type 2 diabetes. 
So it is recommended, and there were earlier insulin pump therapy uh, tested in type 2 diabetes, and those were the standalone pumps. And Medtronic themselves initiated a, uh, uh, I think, three, four countries were involved in the clinical trial with type 2 diabetes. And they have established that this therapy is useful in anybody who requires a bonus, basal bonus therapy. That's it. The, the, I the to problem, ask, uh, you know, in, I mean, Converse have asked you uh, any special patient population and uh, uh, some bit referred to brittle diabetes. Do you think it has a use, brittle type 2 diabetes? But do you, do, you, do you think that it has a use in diabetic kidney disease? Morning we discussed that Manisha mentioned about diabetic kidney disease at once where it can give a lot of benefit. GDM, where in India, GDM, we have got, uh, you, you know it, rental, uh, rental uh, available, this type of monitoring devices on rental available, and uh, maybe maybe difficult type 2 diabetes in the adolescent, which are now we term it malignant type 2 diabetes. Uh, JB, I wanted to ask this question to Jyoti and Sambit, because I think these are also the areas where type 2, uh, this will be of great benefit. Absolutely. What do you think, Jyoti? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, in the situations where the uh, pain of a neuropathy is intractable. Yeah, that, that is your first, the your first yeah. paper where you showed a lot of benefit of the pump in the neuropathy. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, still uh, we are using it in neuropathy pain. It you, you, you usually disappears very fast. And in uh, uh, and the same case with uh, erectile dysfunction. It improves the erectile dysfunction in uh, CKD uh, not only in early CKD, even in late CKD, when the requirement is changing, when somebody is undergoing dialysis, and then the patient can be on two different uh, profiles, because there are different patterns which can be programmed in the pump. So the patterns can be different. So Dr. Sambit has discussed about the AAD. So the AAD, uh, the pattern will be automated. So the basin is automated, the bolus is automated, and this is once in every uh, five minutes it keeps on changing. So it's it, it's so different from all the other insulin pumps which have been used till now in India. Mm -hmm. And there are patients, uh, Dr. Sambit, in India who are using Omnipod 5, uh, not only Omnipod dash. So uh, these, these are the insulin pumps which doesn't have any uh, strings or tubes attached. Uh, and and uh, anybody who is an, uh, using an insulin pump, the biggest challenge, especially in children, is because of the tubes. tubes. And uh, uh, the Dexcom and uh, the attached to Omnipod that comes with the unit. Dexcom, uh, the generation six of uh, Dexcom, uh, and along with the pump, uh, the, the the algorithm when compared to Medtronic 780 is inferior. It's very important. So the timing range will be three to four percent less when you are using uh, the Dexcom devices. But for those who are using, the convenience is much more. But we probably will not have Dexcom in Indian market very soon. And again, we'll be happy, but the number of people using DIY are increasing uh, in yeah. India. You, you mentioned about DIY, it is very much increasing. There are more than 50 people currently using DIY in India. How is your opinion? How is your experience with DIY, sir? I think DIY is excellent because we have shown the 715 and the 722. So these are the older generation of the standalone insulin pumps from Medtronic, uh, which can connect with the sensor because now they have actually closed everything. So the uh, API is closed and it cannot connect with the other sensors. So the old insulin pumps, uh, it can be re-engineered and people are using it along with the li even Libre Pro. So Libre Pro, you know, it is not a real time. Even Libre is not a real time. So they are using a night rider or a Mio Mio attached over the sensor and it will function as a, a transmitter and it will transmit once in every minute or once in every five minutes. And then uh, there are open source algorithms available in the internet. So you can download the algorithm and you can use an intermediate device called a Riley link. And the Riley link will be uh, connecting wirelessly the insulin pump with the sensor. So there are many people, but uh, the recommendation is DIY shouldn't be used in small children because we have to have so many uh, changes, modifications. Uh, so it is preferred that it can be, and we cannot recommend anybody to use a DIY. The ADA says that if somebody, your patient is using a do-it-yourself artificial pancreas and coming to you with a question, you should be ready with the answers. You should be capable of assisting them. But okay. since it is not regulated, you cannot recommend. But, so, the, but the TAR with the DIY is almost 95 to 100%. But with all commercial devices, it is only up to 75%. 
So what would what would you advise if if you put someone on an automated insulin? My, my question to Dr. Sambit and Dr. Jyoti Dev: If you are putting someone on uh, automated insulin uh, delivery system, what are the things uh, they should be careful about? I think Dr. Sambit. Yeah, I think uh, the, it, it is almost like an algorithm-based uh, thing. So uh, definitely for first two days, it is mostly manual. And after that, a uh, shield-like thing appears in the screen so that it's it has gone into algorithm uh, mode. So that will give a auto basal, auto this thing. So you need to just to uh, uh, just to find out the active insulin or you have to write the active insulin time and... Uh, nothing more and the bolus what you were giving or the bolus uh, time or the food timing so these are the two important thing that has to be observed and the tubing has to be changed properly so that is as per the norm and uh, uh, i think that's it so so it's okay. it's it's actually a very good system and i could find that one of my patient was on earlier uh, insulin pump or uh, the vo then uh, transferred to this 780g the tir has actually increased up to 90 percent so i was Correct. so happy to see that actually yeah, more number of people would achieve the glycemic control yeah, right. uh, my question is to dr jyoti dev uh, if you are using uh, smart pain uh you uh, you the, there is a, it's a, actually a smart pen which would adjust everything weight of the patient what is the temperature what is the dose uh, left in the insulin uh, in the pump in the insulin pen but can that uh, uh, replace the carbohydrate count the smart yeah. insulin pen can that replace <laughs> the carbohydrate count you don't need to uh, carb count the carbohydrate amount you are taking uh, dr kanwar that is a very good question okay because uh, you are going through the stages of insulin uh, pump uh, and that was demonstrated by Dr. Sambit. And I discussed about the stages in the development of a smart insulin pen, which was previously a TAP, a tracking insulin pen, and now it is an SIP. And if you look at the stage of automation of insulin uh, pumps, now we are entering the stage four of automation. That is advanced hybrid closed loop and previous it was hybrid closed loop. And uh, even though uh, the completely closed loop systems are existing uh, in the clinical trials. The only difference is it doesn't require a carb counting. So <laughs> that is the biggest hurdle. Okay. So even now, when you're using a, a, a hybrid closed loop system or an advanced hybrid closed loop system, because I have uh, this WhatsApp group of patients uh, where you, you can see that the patients are in the WhatsApp group. Yeah, yeah, correct. Uh, and this is an omnipod. This is one of my patients using an omnipod. And here it is almost 95% diamond range. And almost same as this, but everybody has to enter the carb manual. And the, the elimination of carb counting and with the use of a camera in the mobile phone automatically capture not only the carb counting, carb counting, fat counting, and protein counting will be the right. stage five, final stage of automation. Our dream, our dream. <laughs> <laughs> can can these smart frames be connected to the real-time CZM? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Because uh, the smart insulin pen, the Novo pen can connect with the Libre. Libre is not a real-time CDM. Uh, Libre is an intermittently scanned CDM. The only real-time CDM available in India is Guardian Connect. And the Guardian Connect connects to InPen. In, InPen is now uh, marketed by Medtronic. InPen used to be <laughs> with somebody else. So it actually connects with real-time. And then in real-time, it suggests the dose of insulin. Jyoti, yeah, I mean... You said smart pen is ordinary insulin pen, which has got the up. Am I correct? Uh, sir, a smart pen is not an ordinary insulin pen. No, it's a very expensive insulin pen. Novo uh, 6. Is a, Novo uh, 6, Echo Novo. The, the two pens yeah, you saw. Yeah, two pens. No, no pen 6 and no pen Echo Plus. And these are very expensive. So these are very expensive because it has got near-field communication enabled. The cap is Bluetooth enabled. And uh, the cap connects with a sensor such as Libre or Guardian Connect or even with Dexcom and then collects the data and that data is transferred to the mobile phone application and manually you can transfer the entire data to a uh, cloud-based application. So it's, it is simplified. Uh, it can be used along with the long acting, along with the rapid acting. And since it is prohibitively expensive, no one always has decided not to actually launch it in India. But Guardian uh, will launch along with the uh, uh, in pen, Medtronic is planning to launch in pen in India, and in pen can be used along with other cartridges. It can be used with 
hemolog with the lower rapid with PS, all the cartridges can be used along with impact. Sort acting, all sort of okay. Uh, my next question would be to Dr. Bansi Sabu. Uh, what is the role of CZM in, in hospitalized patient? That we do CZM in outpatient basis, but uh, is there any role of CZM in, uh, in hospitalized patient? I think Jyoti will answer, uh, JB, because Bansi has just left. Jyoti? Yeah, uh, yeah. During, during the COVID pandemic, uh, the Priestia Libre. Abbott, Metronic, they were all providing uh, free CGM in the United States yes, to hospitalized patients. We are all aware. And in hospitalized, it has got a very a pivotal role. But you should be aware of the fact that some of these CGMs, it differs from CGM to CGM, it will be interfered. The, the results, there are interfering substances such as uh, high doses of vitamin C. For example, if it is more than 500 milligrams per day, or if the paracetamol dose is more than 2 grams per day, so in patients who are having fever, if, you are, if they are using flu medication, some antibodies can interfere with the accuracy of the results. And uh, in the presence of hypothermia, in the presence of septicemia. Otherwise, in general, in hospitalized patients, it will have a very, very important role. And uh, in some countries, there is a hospital version for this area. And uh, that version is not marketed in India. Even freestyle is having a hospital version in countries such as Japan and China. So since CGM is not that very popular in the hospitals in India, they are waiting. So the answer is in the ICU settings, in the hospital, it will have a role. But we need to train the doctors and nurses. <coughs> Am I audible, sir? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very well. yeah, 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 yeah. Why you had doubt about hospital patients? Because there is no not much change in the daily activities. That's why you asked why it can can or cannot be used in hospitalized patients. Was, what was the idea behind the question, Jamie? <clears throat> because contrary to the people who are in outpatient, inpatient has a monotonous or same type of lifestyle, so one doesn't need that. What was the reason behind this question, Jamie? You are muted. You, you are muted. Yeah. Please unmute. Sir, uh, we know that uh, the glycemic parameter, diabetic patient with good glycemic control, they have a lesser in the hospitalization days, the, the lesser uh, admission to the ICUs. So That's just right. I wanted to do a study, if you can control the blood sugar, this patient with CZM, do they have uh, less hospital stay, less hospitalization to the I ICU, less admission to the ICU? Uh, so that, that's the reason I wanted to ask this question. Good question. Now about the connected meters. It was not the part of the discussion today, but uh, Jyoti, Sambit, uh, what's your take on that? As a, as, a, as, a, as a not a replacement, it can't replace, but as rising to uh, the occasion to a certain extent. Sir, uh, yeah, Jyoti, sir. Sambit, yes, yeah, I yeah. Yeah. So Sambit, the connected meters, uh, which are Bluetooth enabled and connected to a, a, a smartphone or to the computer are definitely going to be helpful because they will give it data like that of the CGM. At least uh, they're not that expensive, but they will give it data like CGM and uh, many memories are there. So you, we can capture the data at different type. So maybe it will look like a flash glucometer. Yes. So if you have not seen this meter, I will show you a meter. This is also a connected meter. <laughs> and uh, I don't know whether you have seen this meter. It's a uh, e-touches with two sensors in the front and two sensors at the back. And uh, this is an upcoming non-invasive glucose meter. So it doesn't have any needle or any pricks. And uh, th this is the first version, a prototype. So you will probably in the near future, we'll have non-invasive glucose meters and also totally non-invasive continuous glucose monitor. So no needles at all. Correct, but correct. How, how they do it from the sweat or from the band or how they do it, uh, Jyoti? Uh, that's sir, uh, you remember that there were a lot of uh, clinical trials with the sweat, with other body fluids, with the yeah. TS, yeah. uh, and uh, all of them miserably failed. Which and one? Even, uh, yeah, Google and Novartis was behind this for more than 10 years. Apple also failed. And uh, these, these are with some new technologies called bio impedometry, then to tonicity, uh, measuring the uh, level of fluid and electrolytes inside the RBC. So when the glucose is increasing and reducing, uh, the fluid shift will happen within the RBC from inside and outside. So they are measuring it from the surface of the skin, but not from the fluids. 
So it is actually measuring not from the fluids, it will be measuring non-invasively from the blood itself. So some young people are involved in this. <laughs> so many young people. <laughs> and what, and all of, most, of, most of these are in the form of a watch or in the form of a wristband. A glucose watch like. Yeah, yeah. And I am also involved in one of these uh, yes. uh, studies along with some boys in uh, Bangalore and Chennai. <laughs> I, I, I was told the Indian Institute of Science, they are trying to develop one such thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they had asked me, and you remember, you were, were you there in that meeting where we were giving money to startups? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't remember, sir. Yeah, very much. Yeah, I would take JB and the audience which here, Sambit is here. The boy wants to develop a develop a pump for 1,000 rupees. Yes. Remember? Yeah. It, was, it was great. We are so delighted. And I don't know what has happened. So, but but he got the sanction to take it forward. Thank you very much. I think all good things have to end, Jyoti. We would like to have endless conversation with you and Sambit, but all good things have to end because I can see Alok getting little said that we have late for the next session. So, so dear friends, give a big round of applause for Dr. Kanwar, who conducted the questions very well, and round of applause for Jyoti, Sambit, and Bansi. And my appreciation for for mahesh and 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 sandeep thank you very much for a wonderful session technology thank you very much you thank, thank you sir thank, thank you sir mahesh. thank you mahesh so we will pass on to the next session and that is a session on a very important topic <clears throat> called autoimmunity in diabetes so i i have great pleasure in inviting uh, you to the to the to the session on the autoimmunity in diabetes and you know we have we have very important uh, discussion in this session. The <clears throat> we we will be uh, will be discussing autoimmunity and diabetes. Mm -hmm. I have a chairperson, Dr. Archana Sarda. Archana Sarda, queen of type one diabetics. And uh, those of you who do not know her, I don't know you, Sarda, but I must tell you that through her dedication, tenacity of purpose. Mother-like attitude for type 1 children in, in and around Aurangabad. Uh, she has made a difference to the care of the type 1 diabetic patients and acclaimed not only in India, but also abroad. And uh, any of any one of you can detail discuss with her how she has taken the type 1 diabetes care to the next level. And uh, I hand over the session to her. Uh, Sarda, uh, Archana, we have um, we have three speakers, as you know. And, uh, and, and without... Uh, I, I, I request you to kindly, uh, I, I must tell you that uh, Alok had her PhD on the like, autoimmune diabetes in adults. So he's going to speak about that. Sanjeevi is an authority. He was also uh, done extremely well. And, and he is from Karolinska. Uh, he will be joining. He's already joined us. And then we have Rishi, who is a great uh, one protagonist from the city of Kanpur. And uh, he, he has a large patient base in the entire North India Belt. Over to Sarda. Archana, please take over. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for that lovely introduction. And thank you for having me here as a chair person for this very, very important session. Very thrilling. And with such a beautiful uh, array of speakers who are actually doing that work. It's always a pleasure to hear someone who has done research, innovation, and experience in that topic. Autoimmunity and diabetes is something that is more and more coming into our picture when we are seeing children all the way from neonatal diabetes, monogenic type 1, LADA, young adults, all kinds of phenotypes, and we are all almost confused. Earlier, these used to go to specialists. Now they're coming into everyday clinics and it's time we know more about them, even as a physician who is not specializing in these fields only. So today we have wonderful three topics and the first speaker for us is none other than Dr. Alok Kanugo himself. Can I have his introductory slide, please? Right, and I think... Uh, he really, really no, needs no introduction. He is the person behind this wonderful program that we are seeing today. And yeah. as Dr. Das mentioned that he has done his research in this topic itself. So I'm going to hand over directly to Alok, sir, to talk about LADA and autoimmunity. Over to you, sir. Sir, you're on the mute, sir. Alok, just unmute and start. Alok, sir, you're muted. Yes. Thank you, Archana. 
for your wonderful uh, talk and uh, introduction thank you dr lija das for being there as a moderator professor ashok das and everybody so i'll just take one second to present my talk Dr. Alok, you are visible. You can start. <clears throat> Slide is not moving at all. Present. Hello. Yes. Can you see slides? You can nah. see, and you are also audible. Hello. Okay. Sorry for the technical hitch. Uh, this is an important topic, and very less discussed in clinical practice. And our physicians do not give much importance to this. Latent autoimmune diabetes in adult. In a recent review. we found that chinese population has more than 1 crore of lada patients so the problem is really big and more than almost 10% of our population are lada patients as you know the classification is uh, type 1 type 2 gestational and other types of diabetes yes, lada is was not on button it is yes, not moving are, no slides are not moving I think maybe unshare and then share. Stop sharing. Next, sir. next. Now you share. Right click and next. Do right click and next. Now. No. No. So you have to share the slides first. Saurabh. Uh, if you don't mind can you go back to sanjeevi and then i will present uh, sure dr sanjeevi is that all right with you it is uh, that is all right with me session. i already recorded my talk and that okay. talk is already there with rx events they can play it okay yes, we have we have i am here joining just to ensure that the question and answer session is clearly uh, Uh, you, something where i can join and answer so my talk is there it can go on uh, sure. online no problem thank you thank you so much can we have uh, dr sanjeev's introduction please yes so i think it's very important that we introduce dr sanjeev we are actually privileged to have him here uh, professor cp sanjeev is a professor and senior scientist at the department of medicine at the karnataka institute of St at stockholm he is also the senior advisor in the innovation office in the institute he has a diabetes immunology research group at the center in stockholm itself and uh, the reason we really want to know all this is because we are speaking to a scientist an innovator a researcher 
and a clinician. And when it comes directly from you, it is uh, definitely uh, valuable and a learning point and a privilege for us. One award among so many of the ones that sir has won is something I would like to share that the recent one was the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman Award, which is something is truly a Samman for all of us, for him to have received in 2017, which he received from the president of India, Sri Pranab Mukherjee. It is the highest award given by the government of India to NRIs for his excellence in the field of medicine. It is indeed a privilege to have you, sir, here. And uh, could I ask the organizers to please play his talk on autoimmunity? Thank you. The topic that has been given to me today is autoimmunity and diabetes. I've been very kind. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely thankful to Dr. Alok Kanungo for giving me this opportunity to talk. And it has been my privilege to talk at the NUCD right from the time the first NUCD started to happen nearly nine years ago. Why did I choose autoimmunity and diabetes and not type 1 diabetes? Diabetes, as you know, can occur in any age group. An autoimmunity in diabetes can also occur in any age group. If people think that it occurs only in the younger individual, they are wrong. Autoimmunity predominantly occurs in younger individual, but, but more and more research tells us that autoimmunity can occur in older individuals also in larger frequencies. There are quite a lot of advances that have taken place in the last one year that tries to tell us how the disease starts and how the disease progresses. Some of the top class studies that are going on in the field of autoimmunity and diabetes have been coming out with some extraordinarily fine, extraordinary findings. One of them is trial net that is exceedingly good. Another is type 1 diabetes genetics consortium which is financing a study that involves following children from birth until they develop uh, diabetes. You might hear from Alok Kanungo, the diabetes that occurs in older individuals with autoimmunity called as LADA. So there are different stages of type 1 diabetes since LADA is going to be covered by Alok. And these are the stages that are depicted in this particular cartoon. So everybody should have a genetic risk for developing type 1 diabetes. So genetic risk is the important starting point. And there are a variety of risk factors that you will see whether you are in a family with somebody having type 1 diabetes or you have no relatives with type 1 diabetes. So there is an immune activation and this immune activation usually triggered by environmental agents or viruses or some other stressful events in the life of the child. So this immune activation starts by destroying the beta cells slowly. And over a period of time, lots of beta cells die. When many beta cells die, what happens is that you develop autoimmunity with the result, autoantibodies, which are the markers of the disease, start appearing in the serum, leading to identification of these autoimmune markers and diagnosis of autoimmune diabetes. So there are several stages in which these autoimmune diabetes uh, can be picked up in stage have normal glucose tolerance, but you have two or more autoantibody positivity. In the next stage, if there is a continuous destruction of the beta cells, you have two or more autoantibody positivity, but in addition, you have abnormal glucose tolerance test. This could be identified by intravenous glucose tolerance test or with more uh, loss of beta cells, oral glucose tolerance test. So when there is some kind of an event that happens that could even be an infectious disease or a stressful event, the clinical diagnosis of diabetes can be made when the patients appear to the clinic or the hospital with symptoms. This is when it all happens in terms of what you can do to these patients. When you have these patients coming to you with clinical symptoms, you can assume that 90% of the beta cells are gone. What one can do in terms of arresting the beta cell damage is to try and prevent further damage and retain this 10% of beta cells so that you do not develop ketoacidosis or ketonuria. This is a very uh, important complication that can kill the patient. So what are these stages that a clinician should know so that he can pick up these stages much earlier 
before the clinical onset because the trial net is one important aspect that will help identify including the type 1 diabetes genetics consortium that tells us how to pick them up if you pick them up early there are a variety of things that you can do to help them delay the onset so when you look at the stages in type 1 diabetes there are multiple antibodies in stage 1 not blood glucose pre symptomatic no symptoms then in the stage 2 as you saw in the previous cartoon multiple islet antibodies raised blood glucose pre symptomatic this signifies there is considerable loss of beta cells then in stage 3 you have islet autoimmunity you have raised blood glucose and the patients becomes symptomatic the stage 4 is those patients who have long standing diabetes and the question will come whether there is anything you can do to reverse the long standing type 1 diabetes which is possible with some of the advances that are being made but we still haven't got any approval for some of these things that can reverse the type 1 diabetes either it could be due to vaccine strategy or it could be beta cell replacement therapy so in stage 1 individual test positive for one or two uh, or more auto antibodies the immune system has started attacking the insulin producing beta cells when we say immune system the predominant cell in the immune system that attacks the beta cell is t cells and the blood glucose levels remain normal and no symptoms are present whereas in stage 2 the auto antibodies develop due to an autoimmune reaction after the t cells attacking the beta cells releasing the contents of the beta cells the gad is actually intracellular it's not extracellular so the, the contents of the beta cells will have to be released for your immune system to react to the gad or to the insulin so that there are antibodies that are developing to these things but these antibodies are only markers for the disease which is very important for us to measure them in order to identify who are likely to develop type 1 diabetes stage 3 is important type 1 diabetes symptoms symptoms are present and it is due to the significant loss of beta cells. Almost 90% of the beta cells are lost at this stage. The common symptoms include increased thirst, urination, unexplained weight loss, blurred vision and fatigue. These are a little bit non-specific. What will happen is that in a poor or middle class or lower middle class families, they may not be able to identify these symptoms as specific for diabetes, seek medical advice. Sometimes they will ignore. And when that happens, these patients lose all the beta cells and then develop ketonuria or ketoacidosis and present to the hospitals with these symptoms that are a little bit more acute than you would normally when these symptoms show up. So there are three stages, stage one, stage two and stage three, which are the stages that progresses the type 1 diabetes uh, from genetic uh, risk to the exposure to the virus and to the development of clinical symptoms. And these are the clinical symptoms that I enumerated in my previous slide as well. And these clinical symptoms is the time when the doctor sees these patients in the hospital. But it would be very important for us to know whether it's possible to identify these patients little early. The most important aspect here is the genetic risk. Without genetic risk, development of type 1 diabetes is very, very, very low. It can happen, but it's very low. So, the genetic risk is determined predominantly by the HLA molecules, which are called as HLA class 2 molecules. And in the class 2 variety, DR3DQ2 and DR4DQ8 are the predominant high risk HLA that confer susceptibility to diabetes. Many patients have both DR3DQ2 and DR4DQ8 that increases the risk substantially. But in Indian context, it's more important to know that DR3DQ2 is much more important for risk for development of autoimmune diabetes compared to DR4DQ8. So type 1 diabetes starts with the genetic risk, genes that put you at high risk for the disease. The risk for people in general population with nobody in the family having type 1 diabetes is about 1 in 300. But for those who have a family member with type 1 diabetes, the risk substantially increases at least 15 times where the risk is there in 1 in 20 individuals. So it's important to know that for the physicians, the relatives of people with type 1 diabetes are 15 times more likely to develop type 1 diabetes, the disease than the general population. 
So if there is a family that comes and tells you that they have a child with type 1 diabetes, it's important for you to ask them whether there are any other children, especially children younger to the patient who have developed type 1 diabetes, so that you can start screening them and trying to see whether there are any markers that they are, that develop. And some of the tools that you will see might be very interesting to implement at this particular stage. There have been a lot of debate whether the beta cells actually express the HLA class 2 molecule. Many of the people felt that the beta cells do not express. But now in the December 2022 in Diabetologia, a paper from Matthias von Herod's group have clearly shown that there is an upregulation of HLA class 2 molecule in the pancreatic beta cells from organ donors with type 1 diabetes. This is a very important finding where a direct infection of the beta cells can cause upregulation of the HLA class 2 molecule that are high risk for susceptibility. And this could actually trigger the T cell immune response, leading to the destruction of the beta cells over a period of time. If the risk is higher, if it is DR3, DQ2 and DR4, DQ8, the chances of losing all the beta cells is much, much faster compared to one of them, either DR3, DQ2 or DR4, DQ8. It's also important to know in the recent paper, again, published in the last one year, <clears throat> it is clear that a particular DR called DR15, DQ6 <clears throat> remains dominantly protective against type 1 diabetes. What does this paper clearly show is those people who carry DR15, DQ6, previously we knew that it can protect only children up to the age of 10. But now this evidence shows that it protects individuals from developing type 1 diabetes until the age of 550 or 5 decades. So this is a considerably important finding and this finding is possible only because the sample size is really large and you are screening patients right from birth. It is the T cells that cause the disease and you can see in the recent paper published in Nature, a subset of T cells branded as the seeds for type 1 diabetes and this paper was uh, the first author of the paper for GRT and it's a very very interesting paper how the T cells drive autoimmunity leading to the development of type 1 diabetes and this cartoon you can see in a normal situation with the chronic viral infection. It is the viral antigen that gets expressed on the HLA. And this is what leads to the cells exhibiting the HLA to die by the effect of T cells. Whereas in a type 1 diabetic scenario, if the pancreatic antigens bind to the uh, molecule, the HLA molecule, then it leads to the destruction of the pancreatic beta cell. And this becomes important in the light of the finding that the HLA molecule gets expressed in the beta cells directly which is a very important step for us to know that the destruction starts with the T cells. So autoantibodies are the markers of the disease. They are the result of the disease. They are not cause of the disease. And these are the important autoantibody markers that needs to be measured in order to identify the risk. Some will have only GAD antibodies. Some will have islet antigen 2. Islet cell antibody is a measurement of antibody using immunostaining where anybody who is positive for ICA could be positive for GAD. You also have another assay, insulin autoantibody, which has got an assay, microinsulin autoantibody assay, which is what was formerly called as IAA and a zinc transporter. So these are the antibodies that are measured and presence of two or more antibodies signifies clearly the existing autoimmunity and the loss of beta cells that is happening in these individuals. So where are we with type 1 diabetes in terms of prediction and in terms of prevention? There has been much progress in this field. One of them is the pancreas transplantation or biological replacement of islet cell functions achieved by pancreas transplantation with islet transplantation. So the islet transplantation is a very interesting area. Either you can harvest islets from cadaver donors from their pancreases or we can have stem cells developing into insulin producing beta cells. These stem cells could come from human embryonic stem cells or it could come from cells that have been stimulated, the pluripotent stem cells that can offer uh, through a technique called inducible form of pluripotent stem cells. 
So another potential strategy is to introduce robust beta cell replication so that regeneration of ILEVs can be achieved. Maybe there is a drug candidate that will allow this to happen. And there are some interesting publications to tell us how this can happen, the regeneration of ILEVs. The interesting part is the immune interventions are being studied with the hope of arresting the type 1 diabetes. And most of the immune intervention strategies have approached only one immune intervention. Either it could be GAD vaccine or it could be a vaccine for one of the auto or one of the viruses. But now it is possible to have a combination of these in order to increase the protection that could be given to the beta cells from these immune cells attacking them. The interesting part simultaneously what is happening is the mechanical replacement of islet function is happening with the use of glucose sensor controlled insulin infusion system. So what your pancreas does, you can have a machine do it and have the machine outside the body connected to the uh, body with uh, some kind of uh, micro tubing that will allow continuous estimation of blood glucose and infusion of insulin. All these avenues are pursued. Headlines often overstate the case. So when somebody comes up with one particular approach being successful, there's a whole lot of newspaper articles that claim, oh, we have found a cure, we have found a cure. But it is not actually the case because we are still making a lot of progress. And some of the cures does not apply to everybody. So this is the paper published by Jay Schuyler in Diabetes Care, where he is showing variety of approaches and he is emphasizing that a combination therapy using these agents with complementary effects will have a great uh, value in terms of delaying the destruction of the beta cells or even prevention of beta cell destruction taking place. It's all the question of the timing. When do you time this? And this will ensure the how much of beta cells you can save. So with these approaches that are being done, what had happened in the last one year is there has been an exciting development with the monoclonal antibody called tepluzumab. Tepluzumab has been tested, which is an anti-CD3 antibody in the first degree relatives of patients with uh, type 1 diabetes. So these are at risk patients. And this paper was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And tepluzumab delayed the progression of clinical type 1 diabetes in high risk participants in trial net cohort. Trial net is a cohort where they have a lot of patients with type 1 uh, type diabetes markers who are relatives of patients with type 1 diabetes who are being followed up regularly and these are the candidates who are being taken for these clinical trial. So tepluzumab is delaying the onset at least by two years in this follow-up study. And what had happened was that US FDA has already approved tepluzumab for patients with antibody markers who haven't developed type 1 diabetes, who can receive tepluzumab. And American Diabetes Association has given a very nice uh, note on this, that tepluzumab So there are some more clinical trials that are going on, uh, which if could be complemented with tepluzumab, it could probably delay the onset of type 1 diabetes even further. Some of the interesting things that we may have to know outside the area of medicine, outside the area of drugs, is can diet cure or can diet be the cause of type 1 diabetes? So there has been a study where it was published in one of the prestigious journals called Cell. A low calorie, low protein, low carbohydrate by high fat uh, fasting mimicking diet was given to mouse. And these fasting has resulted in regeneration of pancreatic beta cells. So these regeneration in the diabetic mouse has resulted in the reversal of diabetes. So fasting has been one of the important things that we had been practicing over the centuries in India. And it's important that we continue to do this fasting. And uh, it's a clear evidence now that fasting helps in beta cell regeneration and reverses of diabetes in individuals who may have diabetes. So fasting in a diabetic individual needs to be done, of course, with the dietary uh, supervision by the nutritionist as well as by the doctor. 
it cannot be taken by the patients by themselves uh, as a way to reverse. But this is something that is very interesting. And it's important that we uh, follow this carefully. And those people who are at risk for diabetes, they might find it beneficial uh, to prolong their uh, disease-free state for a considerable amount of time. You know, uh, celiac disease and diabetes are relatives. Patients with celiac disease, one third of them develop type 1 diabetes, and nearly 10% of the type 1 diabetic patients develop celiac disease. Both have a similar etiology. Both have HLA-DR3, DQ2 as the high-risk HLA. When you look at these uh, features of celiac disease and type 1 diabetes, sharing with this, gluten is a diet induced celiac disease. So if you prevent intake of gluten, you can reverse celiac disease. This is known fact. But what has now come out with animal studies, which is now being followed up in the humans also, is a gluten free diet reduces autoimmune diabetes in mice across multiple generations. And right now, in the type 1 diabetes cohort in Sweden, they have tested gluten-free diet in high-risk individuals, meaning that those individuals who have high-risk HLA plus autoantibody markers. And the early results show that gluten-free diet is extremely beneficial in individuals who have high-risk HLA as well as high-risk autoantibody markers in delaying their diabetes. We do not know how much delay it had happened. We can expect a publication in this very soon in the next couple of months. So the conclusion is gluten-free diet reduces autoimmune inflammation in salivary glands and pancreas in not mice in a microbiota dependent and independent manner respectively and has preventive effect in type 1 diabetes. So this is a very important change that the clinicians might find it very interesting. Hopefully we will have this results available in the human beings that should throw a light on how a gluten-free diet which is anyway being practiced by patients who have celiac disease could also be used in either patients with type 1 diabetes or patients or individuals who have high-risk diabetes, high-risk markers for diabetes. So these are some of the very interesting developments. Tepluzumab is one, gluten-free diet is another and fasting of course is very important and all these things help us understand that the diabetes is something that we can really take control of. So tissue transglutaminase is the antigen and in the celiac disease and antibodies to tissue transglutaminase clearly identify celiac disease. So we need to document celiac disease in a type 1 diabetic patients by doing this test. Or if there is a celiac disease patients who are tissue transglutaminase antibody positive, then you need to have GAD antibody and IA2 antibody tested to establish diabetes. If somebody has both, then of course, gluten-free diet is going to be extremely beneficial in decreasing the manifestation of both these diseases. So this is a very important finding that I would like you to have it as a take-home message. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer these during the panel discussion. Thank you very much and bye. Thank you so much for that, that sir. And uh, over to you, Konko, sir. Are you ready? Hello, uh, it's coming now? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Sir, please unmute yourself. Sir, hello, sir. We can see your screen, sir. Look, we can't hear you, look. 
Hardik, is is Alok speaking and voice is not coming or uh, something wrong in the projection? Hardik, Nilam, what is the actual problem? Why Alok is not audible? I'll just call him. I think sir is rejoining again. So, uh, voice was not coming. Rejoining will be better. Oh. Oh. Can you hear me, Archana? Yes, 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 sir. We can hear okay, you. One second. I'll share. Video. Yeah, yes. your slides has to come and change. That's all. Yeah, so go for lunch. <laughs> oh, who is going for lunch? No, you should go so for lunch. No. <laughs> Look, you unmuted again. Uh, you left unmuted again. You're muted. I think it's happening. The moment he puts on his slides, it's automating he automatically. Yes. Can now you're unmuted. Next. Go ahead and talk, Alok. Yes. Can you hear? See my slides? Yes. yes. Perfect. Yes. Yes. Very much visible. Sorry, sorry for all the technical defects. So, dear friends. After listening to Sanjeevi with such uh, high rich, uh, high tech uh, scientific uh, data, my talk becomes much easier now. And I will be talking on di uh, latent autoimmune diabetes in adult and what are the newer concepts. Classification need not be discussed. LADA this year ADA includes it in type 1 diabetes, but the, it is not type 1 diabetes. It is a part of that. Latent autoimmune diabetes in adult is a form of autoimmune diabetes, which is diagnosed in individuals who are older than the usual age of onset of type 1 diabetes. Alternative names like late onset autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, slow onset type 1 diabetes, and type 1.5. Often patients with LADA are mistakenly thought to have type 2 diabetes. So, Immunology Society of the Diabetes, they classify that it should be 30 years of age, positive for at least one of the four antibodies, as Sanjeevi has told, commonly found in type 1 diabetes, not treated with insulin within the first six months after diagnosis. This is very, very important. And some patients do not require insulin even up to sixth year. ADA recognizes LADA as a variation of type 2, 1 diabetes, but there are a lot of changes into that. So, as UKPDS first found out in 2008, that 10 to 12 percent of our type 2 population are in fact LADA. So, they showed that in any given community across the world, there is a 10, 2 to 10 percent or 2 to 12 percent population are having that are LADA in fact. And the features are patiently usually aged 30 plus, clinical presence, presence 
uh, or presentation must cure during as non obese type 2 diabetes initial control achieved with diet alone or diet and oral hypoglycemic agents insulin dependency occurs within months but can take even 10 years or more other features are low fasting and post glucagon stimulated c peptide hla susceptibility alleles ia ica2 gad and other antibodies present in type 1 diabetes and about 80% of adults apparently with recently diagnosed type 2 diabetes but with gad auto antibodies progress to insulin requirement within 6 years the potential value of identifying this group at high risk of progression to insulin dependence that includes that early introduction of insulin therapy we can see the visualization of the overlap in type 1 in children type 1 in adults lada and type 2 diabetes on the parameters of immunity age genesis genes bmi insulin therapy and we as we all know immunity is very strong in type 1 less in type 1 in adult still present in lada but very weak in type 2 diabetes and so also hla hla plus and sanjeev has already told about the genetic things and the insulin therapy is immediate in type 1 diabetes in adults it is also immediate and in lada it is variable and in type 2 it is infrequent so if you look at these next things that type 1 diabetes and lada and type 2 lada comes in between in between these two and even if we say it is type 1 but it has a different definite difference from type 1 per se or the original type 1s in the obesity hla dq beta 1 auto antibodies t cells insulin treatment age metabolic syndrome tcf7 l2 and systemic inflammation and c peptide presence so if you look at that insulin secretion in type 1 is low lada it varies type 2 it varies and they have also compared with modi islet inflammation is present in both type 1 lada and type 2 and tcf7 l2 link there is no in type 1 greater than type 1 in lada and almost 5% in type 2 diabetes if you look in a prospective study the presence of at least two of these distinguished clinical features for lada clinical risk score to had a 90% sensitivity and 71% specificity for identifying lada and a negative predictive value for lada clinical risk score is less than 1 for 99% the epidemiology is uh, varied as we saw in the ukpda study it needs on uh, it depends on geography genetic susceptibility environmental factors gender age or diagnosis in india even our population our lada data sanjeevis uh, or the chennai data professor das data and s bhatia's data and uh, bansi sabu's data are very do 2 to 10% are like that in studies in white population the prevalence has been reported to be almost 10% a lower prevalence of lada has been described in studies from southern europe in other racial groups such as african americans and hispanics the prevalence of lada is lower than in white population genetic studies have been done by professor sanjeevi and our group and some other uh, population across the globe at karolinska and we studied sumo 4 gene and type 1 diabetes is associated with asians only and lada no association in asian indians hla and lada 
Lada in Asian Indians is associated in more with DR3 DQ2 than with DR4 DQ8. Negative association with DQ6 is not observed. The most important genetic risk factor for Lada in Swedish patients and equipedias is heterozygote zygosity for DR3 DQ2 and DR4 DQ8. DR15 DQ6 is negatively associated in Lada patients. HLA class 1 alleles are not associated with Lada, so which is very much present in type 1. In India, as I told you, we have 2 to 12 percent of population having data. Many, uh, there is a surprisingly high prevalence of IA2 antibodies in patients with type 2 diabetes has been reported from Eastern India, our center, and uh, with uh, Caroline's collaboration. And uh, type 2 diabetes patients from Katak with GAD65 antibodies were present in 7 percent, whereas IA2 was 31 to 36 percent of patients. So this has been published. IA2 antibodies, autoantibodies are predominant in latent autoimmune diabetes in adult patients from Eastern India. And we found there are two peaks. One is at 20 to 30 years of age and the other is in 51 to 60 years of age in type 2 diabetes. So genetics of latent autoimmune diabetes was studied by Sanjeevi and our group. And we found that IDDM is positively associated with HLA DR4 DQ8 and or DR3 DQ2. In GAT65 antibody positive NIDDM patients from Katak in Eastern India, DR3 DQ2 was significantly increased compared to that of GAD antibody negative patients. So one of the most important, which has been referred in many recent uh, papers, that Mike gene and LADA. In a study on IDDM, NIDDM, and healthy controls from the Eastern India city of Katak, Mike allele 5 was significantly increased in IDD patients compared to controls and allele 5.1 was increased in antibody positive NIDDM patients compared to controls and antibody negative NIDDM patients. We also studied KIR gene. Confers, its KIR genes confer susceptibility and protection to adults with latent autoimmune diabetes in Latvian and Asian Indian population. KIRs or killer Ig-like receptors expressed on natural killer cells might play an important role in conferring susceptibility to or protection against the disease. In Asian Indians, LADA patients, KIRs 2DL5 and 3DL1 were associated with susceptibility and KIRs 2DS1 and 2DS3 with protection. So KIRs are important in conferring susceptibility or protection to adult patients with LADA in study population. So if you look at the comparison, type 1 is purely KIR 2DL2 to DS4 and 2DS5, whereas LADA is clearly 3DL1, 2DS1 and 2DS3, whereas there is a common sharing of 2DL5 and HLSC1 in type 1 diabetes and LADA. So when we come to LADA susceptibility and genetics of LADA, genetic features like HLA, MIKE, INNs, BNTR, PTPN22, CTL4, and TCF7L2 play an important role in specific triggers that causes insulitis at with the presence of GAD and leads to insulin deficiency and LADA onset. So also visceral adiposity with a genetic background leads to low grade inflammation, insulitis in the presence of IA2 and impaired insulin secretion is caused and causes LADA. So these are very important findings. So what is the algorithmic approach for diagnosis of latent autoimmune diabetes in adult? There are risk assessments, clinical risk assessment, in a newly diagnosed diabetes, age less than 50, 
BMI less than 25, acute symptoms of hyperglycemia at onset, history of autoimmune disease, and familiarity of autoimmune disease. If it is there, high risk of LADA if there are two of these points are positive. Mild risk is only one clinical feature is positive. And there is no risk or low risk if there is none of these above points are positive. If it is high risk, major GAD. If it is negative, it is type 2. If it is positive, it is LADA. I want to add here, it can measure IA2 also. If it is <coughs> the mild, <coughs> sorry, in the mild risk group, measure C peptide. Normal value, consider type 2. If it is low value, measure GAD. And if it is negative, it can be type 2 diabetes. And if it is positive, it can be LADA. So, what is the diagnostic pathway based on autoantibody screening and C peptide levels at diagnosis? GAD screening, negative, type 2 diabetes. Positive, major C peptide. If it is less than 3 or if it is less than 3 nanomoles or more than 3 to 7 nanomoles or more than 7 nanomoles, depending on that C peptide value, LADA algorithm is applied if it is below 0 0.7. And if it is zero, more than 0 0.7, type 2 diabetes ADA ESD guideline will be followed. You can, in type 2 diabetes, you can suspect LADA if there is any of the factors and screen for IA2 and you know that the person will require insulin in six months time. And you can always repeat C peptide value at six months intervals. So the diagnosis or the treatment is based on C peptide value. Less than three, you can go for insulin. More than three, you can use metformin, no sulfonylurea, and apply ADA and ESD guidelines. And if there is a high risk, establish atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or heart failure or CKD. If it is ASCVD predominates, then GLP-1 receptor agonist can be tried. SGLT2 with proven CVD benefits if EGFR adequate and BMI is more than 27, we can try that. And if HbA1c is above target, insulin basal bolus can be added to that. And if it's a heart failure or CKD predominates, SGLT2 with proven CVD benefits if EJ, as Dr. Prasant was uh, mentioning today, and if it is HB1C remains still high, we can keep the guidelines and without sulfonylurea, other drugs can be used. And the medications in LADA are C peptide level more than 0 0.3, less than 7. 0 0.7 without established SCBD, we can try for DPP4, GL21 receptor agonist, SGLT21 and thiazolidones, and ultimately insulin will be required. There are differences between LADA and classical type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes in genetic background, autoimmune response, rate of islet function decline, and clinical metabolic characteristics. And the prevention and treatment, as Sanjeevi was telling, Previous studies reported that adaptive immunity and innate immunity play a critical role in the etiology of LADA. Recent studies have shown that the intestinal microbiota, which improves impacts host immunity hugely, participates in the pathogenesis of LADA. Therapies including anti-diabetic drugs with immune regulation effects and immunomodulators could contribute to promising interventions of LADA. We also, the group, uh, they have also seen that potential interventions targeting the gut microbiota and gut associated immunity, which may be envisaged to halt or delay the process of autoimmunity in LADA is also going on. And we are collaborating with Professor uh, uh, Palak Aich of uh, NICER and started some work on this got associated immunity, innate immunity, and adaptive immunity. And immunomodulator therapies have been developed in this. Here, 
probiotics and prebiotics play an important role in preventing the inflammation and changing the course of patients getting inflammations and pancreatic beta cell damage so therapy is tar targeting adaptive immunity tripterygium polyglycoside and you are also teplizumab was in type 1 rosiglitazone has been extensively studied in lada and it is helping but unfortunately that has been taken out from the diabetic scenario and we can study the pavoglitazone in this case preventing immune destruction of beta cells linagliptin sitagliptin and saxagliptin have shown promising roles in treatment and prevention of inflammation in pancreatic beta cells in lada patients in phase 2 clinical trial two subcutaneous injections of recombinant human gad 65 formulated with aluminum hydroxide or gad alum at four weeks interval were safe in patients with lada and that has been tried in the future antigen specific treatment strategies should be individualized and more in line with precision medicine vitamin d is a very important factor and in a swedish based case control study found that taking vitamin d rich fatty fish more than one time per week may reduce risk of lada the general goal of lada treatment is metabolic control and preservation of residual insulin secretion function and the development of new treatment method is urgently needed previously we thought the type 1 diabetes or lada do not have insulin resistance but now increasingly studies have come with finding that insulin resistance is also there in these two groups my last slide dulaglutide treatment results in effective glycemic control in latent autoimmune diabetes in adults a post hoc analysis of the award 2 4 and 5 trials this is a new hope and a reason for widely differing prevalence of ia2 antibodies in different regions of india remains to be determined early insulin therapy should be initiated rather than waiting till conventional weight is felt in type 2 diabetes patient who are previously thought as sulfonyl secondary sulfonylurea failure but they are in fact lada patients role of newer therapies like sglt2 inhibitor and all other uh, molecules that i suggested are needed to be tried in these lada patients thank you dear and thank you everybody thank you sir thank you alok sir that was definitely worth the wait and you have given us the entire practical aspects of lada in our consulting practices itself but we will be having a lot of questions in the panel discussion and uh, we uh, i invite dr rishi shukla for the next talk which is the clinical uh, difficulties when it comes to working with type 1 diabetes may i have his introduction please yes and i think everyone here knows rishi shukla sir as one of the pioneers working in the country from kanpur in type 1 diabetes he all his awards and publications i just want to mention that we have seen him live working with his pad group creating mentors creating teachers encouraging people uh other doctors to come up and do that work and i am also very grateful to have him as my mentor as well so over to you sir for a topic very close to your heart the clinical difficulties in type 1 diabetes lights are visible yeah yes rishi visible moving it is moving also you have not moved move move once let's see go to next slide moving no not yet start moving not moving no so you just we made full screen make full screen and also click on this slide rishi click on this slide not on the uh, if not moving with the uh, computer no, it is moving in my screen not moving uh, with you so i'm i'm just resharing once again please reshare i'll do that
Try moving now. Visible, sir. Just a minute. It is moving. No. Ah, uh, yeah, yes, moving yes. now. Perfect. Moving. Perfect. Moving. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arshina, for good words. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashok Das, sir, and a big thanks to um, Dr. Aglo Kanungo for this opportunity. And it was a dual benefit for me. I learned whatever I am telling you people, and I have learned from these two wonderful speakers, and, and I'll be further learning from the panel discussion. So my topic is a very basic topic, which is, I think, required in a day-to-day -day practice. So clinical issues in management of type 1 diabetes. And what am I going to talk with basic insulin monitoring technologies and social issues? Technology, I was looking at there as a full session, so I'll briefly touch and move. The hard facts of type 1 DM is... It was 2017 data that life expectancy is less than 12 years than of general population and the risk of cardiovascular event is 10 times than of general population. So uh, a very humble request to those who are treating type 1 diabetes, adult type 1 should be protected by statins. India is the second largest country to have type 1 diabetes, first being US. And a word of basic advancements. advancements. We have analog and rapid acting insulin. So I'll request everyone to use, if possible and affordable. We have designers insulin also available from Glazine to U300 to Ditmer to Degludex. So you have full choice. Let's find insulin are available. Much better quality pens, disposable pens. Some of my type 1 patients have started using disposable and then they stopped using regular uh, pens. Much better glucometers, advanced glucose monitoring system. We have been discussing artificial pancreas. So there is another, there was a talk on pump and everything, a session prior to us. I think what is the important thing about type 1 is, and that what we have learned in last 30 years. It was 1993, 94 when I started endocrinology. People used to ask what is new. And that point of time, the understanding was, once complications come, they are progressive. And Professor Dash and all my senior Dr. Alok would agree, even Archana would agree that that point, the understanding was once it comes, they will progress not in type 1, but in type 2 also. So that was the first study that showed that good control not only arrests the complication, but also reverses. So now we have more than 30 years of follow-up diabetes control and complication trial. The follow-up of diabetes study is known as edX summary, epidemiology of diabetes intervention and complication. It showed categorically that, that microvascular complications are reversible, long-term benefits in macrovascular events. Initial control is the success. Any, any, it is a key. So whenever a diabetes comes younger, First time detected, go for best control, no change in cognitive function. What was observed that in intensive arm of DCCT that because of very nice control, 7.6 we were discussing, the more chances of hypoglycemia, was there any cognitive dysfunction? No, it there was like no. The slides are not moving. All right, all right. Is it not seen moving? Okay. I'll just reach here. Uh, is this moving? This uh, oh. full screen is visible? Lights this are visible. moving? Yes, now it's moving. Yes. It is moving. All right. Sorry. So this is plan of the talk. I've discussed about heart pack. Yes, Advanced still here. Pack. It was visible. Huh. Next, right. So DCCT, I think... Uh, and this is a trial that showed us the way, not only type 1, because the UK PDS trial came, I think, five years later. So this was the trial that showed a way to type 2 diabetes as well. And what was observed that in intensive arm, we had a suspicion that in long-term follow-up, because of more frequent hypoglycemia, the cognitive function could be disturbed in active arm. But Long-term follow-up, there is no cognitive change in adults with type 1 diabetes. So the 
barrier was tough to keep low A1C with lesser frequency of hyperglycemia, which I shared. And the golden rule is take advantage of metabolic memory. Whenever best control in beginning plays the best role and gives you a long-term best results. Uh, uh, yes. Now I'll be talking about a very basic thing, understanding to use insulin. What insulin should we use? Anyone? Because a lot is happening. Many of type 1 patients are mixtures and some of them are doing well. And I'll say very minority of my patients are there on mixtures and in spite of telling them they are not shifting. But if you look CGM and do frequent monitoring, there are gaps. So it is better say no to mixtures, one. MDI multi-dose insulin is a preferred choice. One long acting and three short acting or four short acting in children. Then MDI plus CGM or flash CGM is always encourage using monitoring because if these two things are used together, the results are best. Talk about pump. First, first patient should be on MDI plus sensor. Then if patients agree, pump and pump with sensor. So this is the order which we are using. The different types of pumps which have, we have been discussed. Now we have latest 680G pump. Again, it has been discussed. And the, the problem is pump should be talked about with type 1. And I was listening to the discussion. This is the latest Meditronic pump 680G and it is recommended with patients with type 1 diabetes, not with type 2. Some of my type 2 patients are also on this pump, but it is recommended with type 1. There is a hybrid loop system in the pump. The basal system is automated. Bolus is to be given based on meals and carb counting. Ultra rapid insulin needs better results. So technologies, um, those who are listening to this, the SPED guidelines are insulin pump, especially since augmented pump is a useful therapy. And barriers in pump therapy are unnatural attachment, stress. I think I will, Rishi, it has not moved beyond, uh, beyond the things you said just now for the SPED guideline is not coming. It is with the EDIC summary slide. Uh, Rishi, uh, sir, could you try right click and doing next? Click or, or just uh, click over the slide on your system. Okay. Is it moving? I'm clicking. No, not yet. Oh, no. Right click and then press the next on top of yes. that. Right click and then? Is next comes on top of that. Then. Actually, it is moving in my screen. Just a minute. It is moving now. Your slide is seen no, to be very choosy for you only, Rishi. Right, right. Jagar, sir, not it will work. I'm just quickly sure. stop share. And I'll just. <laughs> Hello, I'm following you. <laughs> is it coming full screen? The screen is there? Yes, is there. No. Is it moving? Just a minute. I'm moving. It is moving now? Yes, yes. Just like that, on top of that, press that next. It is moving? Yes, yes, it's moving. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the help. So, where was I? This is mixed. Uh, everybody seeing understanding to use insulin? This top heading, is, is that all right? What heading is, what is the? Understanding to use insulin. Uh, right, 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 right. So I move faster. So I have discussed this. I think only message is avoid using mixtures. Three dose, four dose insulin, one long acting and three short acting is the answer. Pump therapy is a very useful therapy. I think it should be encouraged. And the sole reason is it makes patients almost like non-diabetic. But there are barriers. 
and I was reading the SPAD guidelines. The barriers in insulin pump therapy are unnatural attachment, distress, lipohypertrophy, lipohypertrophy, DK, financial. I think more than financial constraint is the mental barrier. Many of my well of patients, they are not using. I mean, money is not the issue. Um, understanding is not the issue, but the mental barrier of something putting in body is the biggest issue. And the, now we talk in terms of glycemic variability in time in range. CGM and flash glucose monitoring are truly useful and safe. Uh, now, uh, metformin in type 1 diabetes, this slide is visible, sir? Yeah, yeah, bilkul. All right. So, a word about metformin in type 1 diabetes. It is helpful in weight reduction, insulin dose reduction, but as the uh, number of trials, we have not found much change in HbA1c. Type 1 diabetes in dapagliflozin, there was there have been a trial and Compared to placebo, significant reduction in any HbA1c was seen, weight loss, in insulin doses, 8.8%, no change in hypoglycemia, no difference in diabetic ketosis doses. But latest recommendations are that this is not recommended. So my understanding is the adult diabetics who are controlled, who understand they're a bit overweight, why not they should be provided cardiovascular and renal protection because this salt, the DP, the SGL22 inhibitor is our protective event to non-diabetic. So that is my point. Then considering educating individuals with type 1 on matching prandial insulin doses to carb. So what is most important is a carb counting. I'll talk. And the psychological counseling is is, is, is a very, very important. I think we have had two, three sessions with a clinical psychologist with some of our patients. I thought the moral boost up, the understanding, many of the questions we are not able to answer, they answered. That is very, very important. Those who are dealing with type one, even with type two, it is required, but type one, it is very, very much required. The psychological counseling, counseling and if individual counseling somehow because of roses is not, possible, go for group counseling. Maybe you, uh, one counseling very recently we did, we did, we had, I think around 40 children above 18 years and um, a clinical psychologist spoke for them and it was out of the world talk. The carb counting, protein, fat counting, this is by and large in clinical practice is not encouraged. So make our children understand that carb counting is very important. <coughs> and lastly, a systemic review recommends the 30% increment in bolus insulin doses for the meals containing high fat and protein. Because proteins and, carb, uh, and fat we seldom include. So now this is also included. But basic thing is every child with type 1 diabetes or even type 2 who are dominantly on insulin, they should know the carb counting. Monitoring is very important. Self-monitoring of blood sugar to be measured six to eight times a day for aggressive management. Real-time CGM data is very, very important, but they should, they should be made acquainted. They should understand and they should use it. Intermittent self-monitoring, again, those who are not using these technological things, they can use basic monitoring. Diabetes center personnel should advocate to, this is again very important, that if you can provide regular strips, and sometimes even we are providing, patients are not doing so CGM, this is all about CGM. This is Guardian Connect. Once I put to myself, I think it gives a very nice thing. I mean, look at the data and this is, this is a very full. The AGP metabolic glucose profile is approved up to the age of about four years. Hypoglycemia should also be, be discussed. Uh, very important. And most important thing is hypoglycemia awareness for long-standing uh, uh, type 1 diabetes patients. And another important thing is whenever hypoglycemia occurs, whenever it occurs, people go for sweets or chocolates or something sweet. But what is most important thing is at that point of time, give pure uh, carbohydrate in form of glucose or sucrose. So the answer is either glucose or fruit juice or cold drink. Because these are the things that contain pure 
pure carbohydrate because if you are giving sweets the chocolates or the ras gulab jamun they contain fat and um, complex carbohydrate too this is i think very important diabetes to be managed with brain this is a science and type 1 diabetes to be managed with brain and heart arjun is sitting professor das is sitting hello is sitting they can understand and clinician truly dealing with type 1 diabetes need to handle them with love and compassion i think i wrote long back on this india today unknown face of type 1 diabetes so discuss these issues a very brief about social issues i'll be finishing in this 2 3 minutes there is a school and education food choices whether to reveal diabetes or not that is another big issue i mean i was discussing with dr leja das if we can discuss one or two questions on social issues social gathering whether they should tell diabetes or not what is happening in employment and job what is the legal status and relationships in marriages school and diabetes teachers and support staff behavior is variable many schools are not aware of hypoglycemia and snacks before games meal in class is not allowed sometimes so that is uh, the status i think very recently we published a paper in pediatric endocrinology journal of pediatric endocrinology it was the multi center study and i was part of it type 1 diabetes self care in urban schools and what it tells refuse permission to check blood sugar prohibited child from sports excursion did not allow pre sport snacks private schools had a better infrastructure but equal frequency of non supportive behavior so healthcare professional may need to focus on lesser educated parents and children in government schools to improve diabetes care college and diabetes whether reveal or not healthy and healthy moving with flow of life same time managing diabetes is a challenging but if at the back diabetes is in the mind they can do marriage and diabetes is i think is still a big issue people with type 1 diabetes are as normal as anybody we talk we say but in reality it is not and they are full right and can handle the responsibility of marriage what is happening people hide their diabetes males more females also but creating problem they undergo number of refusals even if they declare that they have diabetes if asked for opinion many times i mean this is again request family doctors that type 1 diabetes is control a1c is normal no complication e or c is as normal so they should not so say no to the marriage so that is another part i think professor jargas is there he witnessed one of our meeting uh, 13 14 years back and the solution to this is encourage them to be independent smarter and carry themselves nicely team management involving patients parents social works and doctors team and society equilibrium that is again the society should know what these type of diabetics are there convince family doctors and society that they are normal as normal as anybody else and finally i am giving you today's thought why most of affordable pump uh, type 1 are not on pumps so this is my thought i just wanted to share with you and to conclude dcct addict trial showed the path that good control from beginning is very useful in terms of long term out it is more than 30 years of follow monitoring evolved as key component of complication free life because until this we know we can't do it awareness of individual family and society continues to be important lots of social issues need to address especially relationships and marriage and this is one of our big i think for the first time in kindry we did a fashion so with type 1 diabetes so i lived with type 1 diabetes for last i think 28 29 years thank you so much for your kind attention and apologies for interruption great rishi great talk yes sada you can conclude then i will invite dr lee jadas sada you can contribute you were the pioneer in the social aspects as 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 rishi showed one or two words then we'll pass on to the panel, panel discussion sada one yes, or two sir. words right sir thank you so much and i think this marrying the two topics the social aspect the clinical care and the science and advances all are have to come hand in hand and the technology and the latest science has to reach the last mile and that is why it takes all of us if they say it takes a village to raise a child here it's taking the entire world to bring our children a better life and also adults as dr sanjeev mentioned so thank you so much for having this panel and having me here over to you 
uh, that's uh, to introduce all of, for, uh, all of you are in the panel uh, sanjeevi um, um, alok uh, rishi of course uh, archana everybody is in the panel this is my great honor and now to please invite dr lija das uh, to for the for the moderation can i can i can i have the uh, can i have uh, uh, can i have yeah can i yeah, okay uh, the we we have uh, dr lija das uh, who is md medicine and uh, dm endocrinology she is the, uh, she's the one fortunate lady to be associate fellow of the academic medical science this we introduced this year this was sips uh, brain idea and uh, people with dm uh, at a very young age to become the uh, fellow of the academic medical science we call him associate but they're almost equal to full fellowship thank you lija for joining us consultant uh, department of telemedicine and technology uh, in, in in pg mar chandigarh uh, without uh, taking much time i'll pass on the panel discussion to you lija please take over and conduct it thank you very much sir for those kind words and uh, at, at the outset i'd like to thank you and dr alok for organizing this wonderful uh, conference and for having me here it is a matter of not only pleasure but also privilege for me so good afternoon one and all and good afternoon to all the respected panelists dr alok dr sanjeevi dr rishi professor das of course and dr archana ma'am so uh, without after these excellent talks i would just like to carry on the momentum so i think uh, uh, i'll address the first question to dr alok and uh, i would like to start by asking what is the role of autoimmunity in diabetes and uh, do we uh, just to uh, improve our understanding better are the auto antibodies really pathogenic or are they merely an epiphenomenon of the disease Alok, uh, it is just a bystander or the disease, uh, disease uh, initiator, perpetrator. Alok, are you there? Uh, maybe I can take this uh, question, uh, Doctor Das. Yes, sir. Yes, um, see, the auto antibodies are markers for the disease. They do not cause the disease. They are the result of the disease. So the damage to beta cells is not done by the auto antibodies. The damage to beta cells are done by the T cells. This there is an abundant evidence to the. so it is uh, antibodies are basically markers they do not cause the disease that's the answer right well yes. uh, thank you sir for setting the ball rolling and uh, we have time can you supplement a question to sanjeevi who is the father of autoimmune diabetes you know sanjeevi i just like to know i, I think you beautifully said that uh, it is not a it is it is it's not pathogenic but 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 you said something they 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 not they do not damage beta cells something you said sanjeevi i couldn't follow that you said they do not cause the disease that means they do not cause the damage to the beta cells they are the result of the disease because gad is intracellular okay yeah. gad has to come out and mm. the gad has to be taken by the macrophages and this happens in the local lymph nodes and these mm. macrophages present the gad to their t cells and this right. happens again in the local uh, lymph nodes so for these things to happen <laughs> the antibodies develop for the antibodies to develop gad if they cannot develop if the gad is still inside the beta cell so something causes the destruction of the beta cell that releases the contents of the beta cell and the antibody autoimmunity is developing to the contents of the beta cell so the basic trigger is the t cells or the viruses that result in the destruction and the damage by it being done by the t cells so t cells is the culprit they cause the disease so this is how uh, the facts are and uh, we just use the antibodies to measure the disease intensity disease severity as well as for making diagnosis and prediction and they are excellent tools for uh, these aspects yeah. thank you i think i think they i rightly said we i mean you have said in multiple writing same thing there are excellent tools for the prediction and also 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 the disease prediction diagnosis yeah yeah but alok when we but sanjeevi when you give the uh, the tuber i mean say gad antibody with potatoes we try you were trying that i know for inducing tolerance uh, does it present to the b cells or how does it help uh, no see basically uh, the amount of gad that is available to induce tolerance uh, has to be substantial and yes. when you give gad in terms of uh, putting it into tobacco or potatoes or whatever the bioavailability becomes very small so that approach has really not worked at all uh, because amount of gad i mean whatever you consume in this form gad is a protein 
it gets digested uh, by your stomach acids and uh, nothing is available beyond uh, the passage of the stomach so this approach uh, was tried but you have to eat kilos yeah. of potatoes that is oh. got gad in it in order to get the effect so this is an experimental study but not meant for use for people uh, yet thank you i think the dr lija please take over yes sir thank you so just uh, continuing with the momentum so now that we are discussing about antibodies and uh, so dr rishi if i may pose this question to you what are the types of antibodies that one should commonly look for but more importantly are these assays qualitative or do they really have a bearing on in terms of their titers or their quantitativeness i think the antibody that we usually measure the most common one is the gad1 and insulin antibodies these are the very common antibodies then ica islet cell antibodies then uh, zinc t8 antibodies and finally macrosomal five antibodies are there that are responsible of the two gad and ia2 are very important and gad uh, as allopocing not frequently seen in the eastern population but i think in this northern part it is seen in more than 60% of population so more frequently we see so at least these two antibodies are very important so this is one quantitative value is there if the titer is more they are more harmful most likely this is the way i perceive at end up sanjeev is there can you answer this see uh, the titer actually reflects the amount of antigen that is available one of the conditions where you have autoimmune diabetes uh, in addition to a neurological condition called stiffman syndrome or stiff yeah. person syndrome as it is called That's where true. there is a serious cerebellar damage okay and gad is also expressed in cerebellum so this is the result of gad antibodies being formed in patients with stiff person syndrome okay in this situation nearly 40 50% of patients who are diagnosed with stiff person syndrome have type 1 diabetes also this is the only condition where the gad titers is through the roof if you have a, a titer say uh, 10% in type 1 diabetic patients it's 1000% stiff man syndrome so the titer is uh, not something that you would use but you will use the interpretation of gad index in terms of uh, the severity or the positivity that you would find uh, so gad is very important tool for making diagnosis 80 to 85% of patients newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes are gad positive that doesn't mean the rest of the 15% uh, do not have autoimmune diabetes if you look at the combination of antibodies whether it is either gad or ia2 or zinc transporter antibodies then you will arrive at 96% of patients have either of these antibodies or more than one of these antibodies that still leaves you with 4% of patients who are not antibody positive to these known antigens but there is something else that could probably be the reason for them to develop uh, autoimmunity so these antibodies are very important the titers are very important titers denote what kind of subset <coughs> of diabetes that you might have so there are several conditions as i just uh, discussed about the stiffness syndrome where the type 1 diabetes is seen in association with some other disease and celiac disease is another example where type 1 diabetes is seen in association with some other disease so in these situations the titer becomes uh, important for you to identify could it be something else is it just pure uh, type 1 diabetes is there something else also there that we are not detecting if you are looking for newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes many of them are positive for thyroiditis and they will have development of thyroid immunity also people don't check all that so gad is also a part of type 1 diabetes also a part of polyendocrine autoimmunity in those situations we ignore the possibility that other endocrine organs are involved in terms of autoimmune process so one needs to be little careful in terms of uh, uh, identifying is it one or antibodies to other antigens say for instance in celiac disease or for instance in thyroid autoimmunity to so just distinguish is it pure type 1 or is it pure uh, is a mixture thank you i think the second part uh, dr lija you can ask yes uh, so uh, like sir dr sanjeevi you told about the prevalence of nearly 80 to 85% of these antibodies especially gad 
in an autoimmune diabetes population on the other hand can gad antibodies be positive in a non diabetic individual or in a person who is clinically uh, type 2 and continues to be type 2 see gad antibody in a general population 2% of the general population have gad antibodies okay gad is 585 amino acids long and there is something called gad 1 and gad 2 Uh, so there is something called GAD sixty five and GAD sixty seven. If you would look between GAD sixty five and GAD sixty seven, the sequence homology between them is more than eighty percent. Okay, so when you are developing an assay or when you are using an assay that measures GAD antibodies, the assay is targeting certain part of GAD protein that is common to GAD sixty five as well as GAD sixty seven. You have a tendency to identify GAD sixty seven positivity. and interpret it as gad uh, 65 so these are all things that might come out in relation to the assay methods and what kind of antigenic fragments that assay go and determine uh, so the quick answer to your question is that 2% of the general population have gad antibodies it's possible to have gad antibodies and not develop type 2 diabetes because gad antibodies is the first antibody that occurs in pre diabetic individuals when we are following children from birth we are following 44000 newborn babies all the way from birth until they develop type 1 diabetes nearly 300 or 400 of these children have developed diabetes and we have all the samples well so gad antibody positive type 1 diabetes is different from ia2 positive antibody type 1 diabetes so these are two different diabetes basically where the etiology is different the, the destruction of pancreatic beta cell is different so we tend to generalize the use of the word type 1 diabetes and assume that everything is common under that uh, title it is not the case so you have patients who have zinc transporter antibodies developing type 1 diabetes who are gad negative and ia2 negative and zinc transporter antibodies develop first and they also uh, stop first they are present as long as the Uh, honeymoon phase is uh, present so we are now mixing a lot of uh, things and calling it under the name of type 1 diabetes and assume that that terminology encompasses everybody which is not the case and our new screening of newborns uh, and following them up is giving them giving us a lot of clues so gad type 1 diabetes is different ia2 type 1 diabetes so if you want to treat gad type 1 diabetes in terms of intervention uh, the same approach will not work for ia2 but in certain severe cases if you are dr3 dr4 positive then you might have both types of autoimmunity occurring gan antibody being positive ia2 antibody being positive so these are two type 1 diabetes etiologically different under the clinical umbrella of one uh, type 1 diabetes so we need to have these distinctions so that our data does not get a confused picture so this is my answer to you uh, lija dr lija i have yes. uh, in our study in uh, gad antibody in normal controls from qatar 20 of uh, national sports academy students were included and four of them had gad antibody positive national players of football i have been studying them for last 25 years and none of them have developed any diabetes so gad can stay for as ia2 and other antibodies will disappear as zinc transporter sanjeev was telling they disappear quickly gad remains even in normal population so that is one thing we all should know just by getting a gad report the great not... question with your own experience hello for you for the uh, follow up this question I, i i have a query sir oh, sir yes sir yes sir uh, yeah. uh, if someone is uh, non diabetic and uh, the uh, siblings, all of his siblings are type 2 diabetic and parents are also diabetic and uh, and the, the the patient is very conscious about his future and he did uh, antibody and gat 65 is positive but he is not diabetic uh, siblings and parents are diabetic uh, my question to dr sanjeevi that uh, in this scenario how do you interpret in this uh, how do you approach this person who is not diabetic and all the siblings are diabetic and the parents are diabetic and he is gad 65 positive and what's the role of teplizumab uh, in this particular scenario 
when you say diabetic, I assume you are referring to autoimmune type diabetes. Two. The relatives are you diabetes. talking about type two diabetes. Type two diabetes. So you type are talking diabetes. about type two diabetes in the family, and one of the member have developed GAD antibody positivity, and GAD Correct. antibody positivity can become positive and over a period of time. Maybe even one or two months later can become negative. Okay, these are the low titer GAD antibodies. And these low titer of GAD antibodies, which was very clearly shown by Paolo Pazzilli and his wife, Raffaella Buzzetti, show that uh, these are not to be taken into consideration as they are uh, unstable in their positivity uh, over a period of time. So in this case, if the GAD index as it is measured in terms of JDF union, JDR of units, clearly shows certain percentage of positivity or certain cutoff value is something that is going to be very relevant. In terms of teplozumab, for somebody to use teplozumab, you need to have at least two or more autoantibody positivity, and there should be a family with type one diabetes in the family. Okay, so there is a clear indication that the sibling of the type one diabetic patient, who is autoantibody positive, would greatly benefit from teplozumab in terms of delaying the onset. So the uh, teplozumab follow-up has happened something like uh, two and a half years only. So we cannot say it will be protective for five years. With the date available for teplozumab, we can confidently say there is a delay by two and a half years. Maybe one year later, if you are going to ask the question, now the people with teplozumab still don't develop uh, type 1 diabetes, we can clearly say three and a half year follow-up is going to. So until the follow-up data is clearly available, we cannot predict the length of the protection to plusimab is given. Uh, right now, it is delaying the onset in first degree relatives of patients with type 1 diabetes. But in terms of type 2 diabetic patients, uh, where uh, one of the relative happens to have GAD antibodies, we need to measure the titer of the GAD antibodies and the risk for them developing type 1 diabetes is really, really low. You need to okay. these patients periodically. That's also very important. Yes, uh, uh, Hi, Dr. Sanjeev, this, this is Devjit. Uh, uh, just just to comment on the GAD antibody titers. Uh, so when I was in Sweden, worked with the Leif Group and Tina Maya Tuomi, we published a paper in which actually, and she has published several, and she has shown, okay. and actually we also noticed that even in non-diabetic subjects, you have the GAD antibody titer correlated with the disease severity in non-diabetic. Yes. Like if you have a higher, very high titers, they have lower insulin secretion and um, more insulin sensitive also. The guard and they're in general in between type two and type one. And those are high titers, their insulin secretion was slightly lower than those are low titers. So just a comment. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you, Devjit. It's really a fantastic observation that Leaf Group had made when you were there, where you also indicated that it is possible for somebody to be both type one and type two diabetes because right. the etiology, the genes associated are so different. What prevents you from having both the disease in the same individual? And that is realistic. And in that situation, you will tend to think it's is it type one or is it type two? Because it could possibly be both. Uh, we are not uh, taking that part of the argument into consideration. But it was Sleep Group who pointed out that quite a number of patients can be both positive. Actually, both he, I think it was he, he who coined the term ladder. I think he was the first one, right? <laughs> uh, no, no, the Australian no? groups did, the, did it for the first time. Okay. But he did some pioneering studies to show oh. that TCLFLA. The, right. uh, the the marker for type 2 diabetes is significantly increased in larder patients in his cohort, which is the Botnia cohort. So that is clearly an indication where type 2 diabetes genes are present. Type 1 diabetes genes are present. And he argued that it is a separate disease, not type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. That was his argument in his diabetes. But very interesting uh, observation, very interesting findings. Thank you. Uh, you have to go a little yes. far because yes. I can see that Jit has come. Dr. Jargar also has arrived. But but we should yes. go to questions quickly. Very yes, important. sir. So I'm doing exactly that. So just a quick follow up on that question, sir. Dr. Sanjeevi, is there a cutoff that we can use uh, to say high and low title? And uh, the second question, immediate follow up to, I think uh, I can address it to Professor Das. So, sir, we know that the incidence of type 1 diabetes is increasing. And uh, despite the fact that the autoimmunity levels really haven't changed. So okay. how would you address this discrepancy? Answer the easy question first. Difficult one for Sanjeevi, with whom I worked for one year. Uh, I must tell you that uh, 
the 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 type one diabetes uh, is 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 increasing by three percent per year. I mean that that's what you're referring to, and that's yes. why type one diabetes is increasing. And uh, and 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 also uh, your question is that is the auto antibody appearance increasing or not? Is that the question? Type one uh, diabetes. So uh, from whatever has about been the reported, titer, she yeah. is talking about the titer and the titer. See, how do you arrive at the positivity? You arrive at the positivity by measuring antibodies in healthy individuals of certain number, and then correct the mean value. And that mean value has to have mean plus two or three standard deviation, depending on whether you are looking at 95th percentile or 99th percentile. So, if you take uh, say thousand healthy individuals in India and measure antibodies, your GAD index is going to look different. If you take thousand Europeans and measure healthy people and measure the GAD index, is so you cannot use a control of one country to compare the positivity for the control of another country. When you are using GAD kits, the GAD kits are all created with control population. Say, for for instance, in Europe, if you buy this European kits and use it in India, your cutoff for positivity cannot be. What the Europeans are using for cutoff for positivity, you need to have develop your own cutoff on your own healthy control. So the cutoff for positivity will differ with the different population, and uh, that needs to be measured with uh, healthy individuals tested in the local population. We have not established. We don't do. I think Sanjeev is absolutely correct that we don't have yet to measure the standard uh, testing in our country. We don't have the standard. What is the exact prevalence of the GAD antibody positivity? We can pass to next question, Dija, or the which one? Yes. So the next question, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Allo. Uh, so, sir, is LADA? Would you consider it as a single disease entity, or would you consider it to be a really a cluster of phenotypes? And are there any therapeutic implications if we identify a phenotype of LADA? Uh, it's very important. Allo, Allo, yes, yes. Yeah. This is very important. We need not say it is a cluster of phenotypes, but progressive changes in different stages of uh, LADA. And initially, you find the same person with certain presentation, and gradually it changes over time. And uh, as per the antibody markers, genetic markers, and other aspects, so many aspects are playing important role in LADA. So LADA is not one single disease or one single type phenotype. It is a progressive disorder. Fine, Lija, you can take up question number six. That is very interesting. Yes, yes, sir, and that's exactly what I wanted to ask you about. So if, if we discuss about micro and macro angiopathy in LADA. Versus type one vis-a-vis -vis type two diabetes. So, is there a difference in the degree in the types of involvement of complications? Professor Das, sir. Yeah, I think I think um, uh, the 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 complications in type one and type two diabetes have been studied, and uh, to my mind, the complications of the microvascular disease uh, and the microvascular disease are different between type one and type two. Because there are two different kettle of fish, and there are a lot of factors which affect the type two microvascular disease. The risk factors which possibly are not so in type one diabetes. I mean that that's my feeling, and uh, and that's and, uh, that's absolutely right, sir. Sorry to interrupt there. I just wanted to know about LADA com complications in LADA versus type two and type one. LADA, LADA, LADA is basically type one. You know, LADA is basically type one, little elderly as group. But when you if you take question number six. It is. It says that recently there is also association of LADA, which occurs around 30 years of age, obesity, smoking, and the lifestyle, and and therefore I think they are also predisposed to environmental factors, risk factors as any type two. So they one has to study them. I don't have the data here to describe, but there there it may be. Different. But type one diabetes and this the first. I just want to ask one question to Sanjeevi and Alok. Uh, Sanjeev, we discussed about the autoimmunity data, but we have to also discuss a little bit about autoimmunity in, in the other diabetes implications. Sanjeev, you remember? Uh, yeah, one of the uh, one of the landmark papers uh, is talking about is type one diabetes induced by diet. 
Yeah. We are all thinking about variety of factors that induce type 1 diabetes, the trigger for type 2 diabetes. We commonly presume viruses as one of the causes. If you follow some of the recent results, and we don't have the published the uh, uh, T1DGC uh, follow-up results uh, on children followed from birth in Sweden, gluten is a clear cut dietary marker or dietary component that causes celiac disease. And gluten also is probably responsible in some way for type 1 diabetes. Since gluten has been studied and it has been clearly established as an important dietary component, it is a clear-cut case. But we still do not know what other dietary components are relevant for etiology or development of type 1 diabetes. The current studies, again, coming from the Malmo group, where Devjit had uh, spent some time, Okal and Mark is following all these Swedish children from birth, clearly show that depriving gluten in children with who have developed type 1 diabetes Depriving gluten in children who are autoantibody positive, high-risk HLA positive, not yet developed diabetes, there's a great contribution by uh, keeping gluten away from their diet. So this is something one needs to ponder in terms of how diet plays an important role in development of type 1 diabetes and also in its reversal. So I would like uh, to leave this thought in the minds of the physician and you, and somebody uh, in India need to study this in the follow-up basis. Exactly. I was uh, and come out with it. Yeah. Coming to the point of the bovine serum albumin, you know, India some time back, ICMR took up a project to look into whether I think Lija would remember camel's milk. You remember Dr. Pierre Agrawal's project we gave him about the camel's milk. I mean, Sanjeev might not have seen that paper, which was negative. But you know, do you feel that uh, apart from gluten, you Beautifully pointed out, I, I, I think that was the title you had given earlier. So I, I looked up the literature, it was great. Thank you very much for the new, new fact you put before us. What is the status of milk? Do you have any idea about the camel's milk? Well, I do not have the idea because even with regards to the milk story and the etiology of type 1 diabetes, the data is predominantly coming from Finland. Finland. Then you start talking about type A cow and type B cow. Okay, now I do not know where does the camel fit into this picture. <laughs> Are they similar to type A cow or type B cow or is it a separate camel type A, camel type B, we do not know. So we need to really figure out where does this come into the picture if we want to describe. Maybe there is something that is totally different etiology in terms of what camel milk does to the gut microbiota and how it influences uh, the diabetes development or diabetes control. So we need to study more. If the Finns have studied a great detail about cow's milk, we need to study a great detail about camel milk and decide what is there in the camel milk that causes the uh, remission or whatever. I think uh, Lija will stop your interest of time because uh, you know we have two more sessions left. That is six plus uh, one seven lectures left. So I, if you want to take a one or two questions more, Lija, most welcome. Maybe two quick questions you can take. Uh, we will not have time for all the questions. You can take up your uh, choice. Two more questions. Okay, right. I got it, sir. Thank you. So I was uh, just uh, moving on <clears throat> to the immunomodulation and type 1 diabetes. Yes. Would we really say it is more of a bench uh, issue now or has it moved to the bedside, especially in the wake of the approval of teplizumab? So I think it is addressed to all the panelists. So, sirs, please. I think it still remains in the bench. No, but, but, not the bedside at Sanjeevi has clearly mentioned who are the probable candidates for teplizumab use, two antibody markers, siblings, many other things. So it is still in the research stage. It will take maybe 10 years or any number of years to come to the... It happened to two, two, two pediatric endocrinologists from England and they said uh, they had got good results, but maybe they have to use again up to two years to prolong the uh, prolong the uh, what should I say uh, the dormant phase, they, they may have to use. So things are not yet clear. But uh, Sanjeev, I want to ask you one more thing, which is which is very important for our uh, purposes. Uh, Sanjeev, don't you believe that the BCG we uh, wrote about BCG? Does it not produce some degree of immune modulation? Yes, it does. Actually, it is in phase three clinical trial right now. Really good. Dennis Fossman from Harvard University is doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to wait for these phase three results and we need to get uh, the FDA approval for it. The first approval from FDA has come only for teplizumab, okay, the yeah. first ever intervention. 
Thank you. Uh, thank so, you. if BCG comes in with a very good results in the phase three trial, maybe that is something we may have to consider. There again, we we'll have to be very careful on what we mean by BCG. It is actually the Danish strain of BCG that is relevant, not the Russian strain or a Tokyo strain. That's the most immunogenic form, and that is what is being tried in the clinical trial right now in US. And the same trial net cohort is what is being used uh, for that study. Thank you, Sanjeev, for giving the concept. You know, it was it was in the New York Academy of Annals of Academy of Medical Science that you probably published that. And you know, thank you very much for. I mean, it's it's a great thing. And I I also had one or two enquiries after that paper you wrote. Thank you very much, Sanjeev. I think thank you, know, you very much. Thank you. Now, Lija, one more question. Because you know, I cannot no to young ladies. So, Lija, one more question, please. That's all. Ah, uh, <clears throat> right, okay. sir. So, if we can just briefly talk about the importance of time in range in the clinical management of type one diabetes, the its association with the complications, its association with overall control. A question for Rishi. Rishi. Rishi, yeah. Yeah. Time one range. Time in range is very very important. and only thing that we can address to our indian audience is uh, we should start using more and more cgm even if cgm is not being used i i simply say use more frequent blood sugar monitoring one question that lisa raised is what are the barriers of poor control i think the basic thing is monitoring once our type 1 patients need to understand the monitoring i think Uh, more than half the task is done because then they act upon that and basic monitoring then cgm monitoring then time in range and time in range i think we have shown bansi has shown that uh, the hypoglycemia has has gone down drastically the a1c has gone down drastically without hypoglycemia so this is these are the advantages and i think in one of my slide i have shown that yeah you showed every that every patient we should encourage pump and to every patient we should encourage CGM. So this is what my take is because we are lagging behind somewhere, um, not because of financial reason, but because of maybe we are not able to make our uh, type one population understand. So Dr. Lija, can... thank you very much. Kindly conclude the session, yeah, dear friends. I must tell you that Lija, you were wonderful. Your questions were fantastic and superb. Thank you, Alok, Sanjeev. I have no words to express my thanks to you. Sanjeev, thank you very much for being here, and uh, Devjit for your for your very brief comment. Rishi, I mean, I mean, I, I I always hold you in very high esteem because of your work as as Sarda, who both of you have made the made a great contribution. Uh, because lack of time uh, in silence get us respect. I'll keep silent to my great regards to Alok, Sanjeev, to you, Rishi, of course to Sarda and to Lija. Thank you very much. uh but you have been wonderful bye. session bye 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 thank you next thank you sir and thank you to all the panelists thank, thank you. you thank you thank you sir thank you thank you thank you thank you a lot to sanjeev so thank you i leave uh, thank you i leave the meeting thank you yeah thank you sanjeev i'll catch up with you sometime on email yeah, definitely thank definitely so now dear friends it's time for to start the next session you know heavy weight session heavy because uh, debjit is there but my friend you can see him photographed now is dr jargar is here and dr jargar is the is 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 from the kashmir and you know head of the sere kashmir institute i don't believe in calling ex wife former head of the department former secretary to the government i mean you are for me the director of sere kashmir for this year to that year that year and also in the in the in the institute boards of all the all indian suits aims Uh, SGPGI and all that, and selection committee member is a lot of original work he has done. One such work will present today. Yes, Finally, Nikhil, Nikhil, are you there? Nikhil, 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 join us subsequently. Uh, Nikhil, can you? So I am there, but I am uh, actually there was a little conflict, so I am here, but I have recorded my lecture, so I'll be keeping quiet while the lecture is played whenever the time comes on. Sir. Okay, Nikhil, sorry, sorry. I, thank you very much. Thank you very Not much. Not at all, sir, but I am very much there, sir. Thank you. Did, did, did you enjoy the previous session, Nikhil? Sorry, yes. sir. Nikhil, Nikhil also is the is the top in the diabetes in the young group. Did you enjoy the previous deliberation? Some time. Yes, ago? yes. Yeah, very much so, sir. Very much so. Okay, I'm very happy that you were there. Now, dear friends, at this stage, it's my great pleasure. Uh, I don't have anything to uh, in the context setting. Is Kalpana here? Kalpana Dash. Good afternoon, sir. Very good, good afternoon, afternoon, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon. Kalpana is a is 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 a top endocrinologist of the country. 
practicing in Raipur. I will I will make it very short to save time. And it is Alpana Dash. We invite Devjit. Devjit is uh, very close to us. And the Kalpana, please invite. Important role, emerging role of dual GLP GIP uh, agonist in management of diabetes obesity is going to come to our country next year. So, Tijapitai. So, Kalpana, please take forward quickly. Uh, sir, thank you very much, uh, organizer, for having me here. It's uh, actually yes, most yes, Kalpana. You can read the one or two words from the. My, can I'm sharing my chair with slide? you, sir. Hello, hello. Oh, thank, you much, sir. Yeah. thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'm very much proud to share the chair with you, sir. You had been my mentor in the past, and also my examiner. <laughs> So, the so we have uh, with us speakers. You have already you have already introduced them. So we'll be talking on three topics. First is the emerging role of dual GLP and GIP agonist in the management of diabetes and obesity. And that will be uh, delivered by good friend Dr. Devzit Tripathi, who is from US. And the second talk will be on PCOS. That will be spoken by Dr. Professor uh, H. Jargar, and third will be by. GDM, the long-term outcome by Professor Nikhil Tandan. So we are already using the GLP-1 RAS in the form of injectable once daily and once, uh, once weekly and also oral also we have. But now we are having the use of this GLP-1 and the GIP-1 dual agonist with us. And uh, we are having this injectable form once weekly we use it and uh, we'll be discussing regarding this and the Debsit will deliver the talk, what is the efficacy and what are the head-to-head -head analysis with semaglutide and all the things. And uh, so I call upon Dr. Devjit Tripathi to please deliver the lecture. Okay, uh, so thank you, Kalpana. And thank you, Dr. Kanungo, for the opportunity here. It's, it's indeed a great uh, feeling to be here amongst our former uh, teachers and colleagues, uh, Dr. Professor Das, uh, Kanungo, Dr. Sanjeevi, Nick, Dr. Tandon. So uh, today, okay, let me share my slides. Um, okay, just give me a minute. Um, okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, okay. yes, we can. Okay. Okay, so. Let me see if it is a full screen. Okay, so uh, there's a slight change in the title of my talk. Uh, initially, it was uh, uh, GLP GI, uh, GIP dual agonist, but I will briefly mention about uh, the triple agonist. So I think the appropriate title will be uh, unimolecular polyagonist in management of diabetes and obesity. So I start with the case. Can you see the slide changing? Yeah. Yeah. There. Uh, okay. So I started the case, which I see in my clinic, uh, and he's a middle-aged uh, male, which is obese male, has a long-standing history of uh, type 2 diabetes, is on high dose of insulin, and uh, is also on SGLT2 inhibitor, and has an extensive history of cardiovascular disease, and has multiple stains. And his A1C, current A1C is 8.2%, as he has chronic kidney disease, and he wants to achieve better glycemic control, but he's very concerned about weight gain. So what will be the appropriate choice uh, in therapeutic option in this case? So we can increase the dose of insulin, but um, it will lead to weight gain. And DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, these eight class of drugs have very modest improvement on glycemic control and have no effect on weight. And pioglitazone can lead to weight gain. So obviously the choice will be a GLP-1 agonist. And he was in fact started on a GLP-1 agonist. I'll tell you which one. And eight months later, when I see him in the clinic, uh, his current A1C is 5.9%, that is in the pre-diabetes range. And he no longer is on insulin. And he is, uh, has lost 50 pounds of weight, um, which is more than 20 kilos, uh, about 20 kilos. And his EGFR is stable. So, and this kind of efficacy with the anti-diabetic agent, we have not seen before. And, um, he was in fact started on a drug called Tizepatide, which is GLP and GIP agonist. And this is this class of drugs, I don't, is comparable, the efficacy is kind of comparable to that you see following a bariatric surgery. So 
Uh, you know, as for guidelines, patients with pre-existing heart disease, uh, I think other previous uh, speakers have mentioned that pre-existing heart disease, you start with the GLP-1 agonist, particularly those of atherosclerotic heart, with heart disease, or those of heart failure, you start with a SGLT2 inhibitor. So we currently have several GLP-1 agonists available in the market, uh, including the oral GLP-1 agonist, uh, Dr. Das mentioned. But the limiting factor of GLP-1 agonists is that uh, the IR4 segments, um, they're very potent. They're lower A1C by 1 to 1.5%, and semaglutide on higher dose can lead to weight loss about 15%. But the limiting factor, again, is the you know, GI side, mainly the GI side effects. So- Slides, slides are not moving, I think. Okay. Slides not moving. Hmm. Okay. It's moving now? Is it moving? No, no. Hmm. Okay, it's moving on my end. <laughs> okay, let me just uh, restart it. Reshare will be better. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you see it now? No, oh, yeah, now, now it has come. Okay. Yes. It's moving? Yeah, moving, yes. Yeah, it's, moving. It's, moving. Okay. it's moving very well, the object. Okay, okay. So, so that's the limiting side effect, the, uh, limiting factor in uh, GLP-1 agonist uh, treatment is the GI side effect. So one strategy is that if you could add- Can you make it full screen, full screen? Uh, Okay, is it done now? No. No? Oh. No. And why is that? Okay. Okay. Is it okay now? No, it's done, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the one strategy is to combine with uh, another agent which will, with the GLP-1 as a foundation and then start with other pathways like uh, lipid metabolism or insulin sensitivity. The GLP-1 agonists do not have a direct effect on insulin sensitivity or do not affect the lipids much. So, and how about the GIP? No, GIP is a glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide and it's a uh, another intratin, and in fact, uh, the endogenous GIP accounts for majority of the endogenous intratin effect. It's more important than GLP, the endogenous GIP. However, the GIP secretion is found to be normal in patient type two diabetes. And early studies shown that if you infuse GIP to patient type two diabetes, you do not see any effect on um, insulin secretion or improvement of glycemia. And the animal studies and earlier animal studies are controversial. Like if you knock out GIP receptor, there were some studies that shown actual weight gain, some studies show weight loss. So that, therefore, the GIP agonists are not pursued for management of type 2 diabetes. All the studies were mostly on GLP-1 agonists because GLP-1 agonists are very potent in weight loss and improving glycemic control. However, recently, it has been shown that in animal models, if you overexpress GIP, it leads to weight loss and uh, improved glycemic control. And uh, if you infuse combined GLP and GIP to patient type two diabetes, it's shown to be an additive effect on in terms of insulin secretion, and uh, but not on weight loss, just insulin secretion. However, it's not practical. You cannot combine and give two separate infusions or injections of GLP and GIP. So there's the possibility of a single molecule which has both GIP and GLP was being explored, and uh, here it shows the compare and the contrast, the effects of GLP and GIP. And uh, on the left is the GLP. And um, here, they both uh, decrease, increase satiety or decrease food intake. That's how they cause weight loss. The difference is that GLP-1 actually increases nausea, whereas GIP actually decreases nausea. So if you combine GNP and GIP, then you expect that uh, this will uh, attenuate the adverse events of GLP-1. The other major difference is that uh, GLP-1 reduces glucagon, whereas GIP increases glucagon, particularly in hypoglycemia and euglycemic settings. 
And another major difference, the effect on adipose tissue, because there's no GLP-1 receptors in the adipose tissue. So GIP has the effect, it kind of mimics that of a thiazolid in dial. It improves adipose tissue insulin sensitivity, storage capacity, and the inflammation in the adipose tissue. That's why it can improve both the adipose tissue and skeletal muscle in, in insulin sensitivity. So therefore, if you combine, so the, the newer strategy is to combine uh, two molecules because uh, instead of giving two in different injections, if you combine one molecule, which is effect which can act on both receptors, that'll be much beneficial. And it's called unimolecular multi agon So single molecule act on different receptors, or it's called a hybrid molecules. So the hybrid molecule that is being uh, now developed, or some of them are already in clinical trials, for diabetes, uh, this is one combined of GLP and GIP, there's another one, glucagon. And uh, glucagon and GLP-1, they're combined because they're both derived from the same pre-proglucagon. And that the homology is amino acid between GIP, GLP, and glucagon. That's why it's easier to develop molecule which acts on all three receptors. And the benefit of hybrid molecules is that they, they confer the beneficial effect to each, like GLP and GIP, and they can counteract uh, the, the offset, the negative effects of GL, so for example, in GLP causes increased nausea, GIP causes less nausea, so that's why you can increase the therapeutic windows for the uh, GLP-1. So you can give higher dose without any side effect. And the other benefit is the pharmaco single pharmacokinetic profile because this is just a single molecule. And this is particularly important in patients who have chronic kidney disease and those of liver and hepatic disease also. And they have single molecules which acts on multiple uh, uh, multiple effects on the single target order. For example, in the pancreatic beta cells, both GLP and GIP increase insulin secretion from glucose dependent insulin secretion from the beta cells. So that's how they can increase insulin secretion, uh, have a complementary effect or additive effect on insulin secretion. So these are the, the schematics showing the polyagonist uh, that being now pursued for treatment in type 2 diabetes and obesity, GLP and glucagon. And I will not talk much about it because there's one drug developed by AstraZeneca. It's called Codatutai. And they went to phase two trials and somehow for some reason they decided not to pursue. So there's no, currently right now, there's no drug being developed, but there's some drugs by Novo. They're pursuing it for treatment of NASH. And I will show it is about the trisepatite, which is the GLP GIP, the only approved GLP GIP coagonist. And then I'll show some data of the triple agonist, GLP GIP, and glucagon tri triple agonist. So, these are the structures of uh, native uh, GLP 1, and this is GIP. GLP 1 has about 30 amino acids, GIP has 42, and this is trisepatite, which is 39 amino acids. And trisepatite is a peptide, which is uh, basically has the backbone of GIP. It's mainly acts like a native GIP. And uh, in, the, if you, in vitro studies have shown that this is sim more similar to native GIP in terms of efficacy in animal models and binding affinity in the uh, cyclic MP generation and is less th than native GLP-1. And the half-life is five days. So you can eat, that's why you can have a once a week dosing. The structure of trisepatite, the top one is GLP-1, then the GIP, and then this is exenatide, uh, the first GLP-1 agonist approved for the use in humans. And this is trisepatite. So you can see those in light blue. These are the amino acids shared from um, GLP and GIP. So trisepatite contains nine amino acids derived from similar to that in GIP, about four amino acids derived, which is common to GLP-1, and about 10, which are common to both GLP-1 and GIP. So it has a lot of amino acids which is similar to GLP and GIP, and there's some from it's similar to exantin. And it's bind to fatty acid, which binds to albumin, that's it prolongs its half-life. So this structure has a lot of similarity between GLP and GIP, but mainly more close to GIP than GLP-1. And in vitro studies have shown that it's equivalent to native GIP in terms of cyclic AMP generation, because both GLP, GIP, and GL glucagon, this class of uh, drugs, they act on the G protein, this called uh, G protein coupled receptors, which generate cyclic AMP. And you measure the amount of cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP to measure the activity of these compounds. So it is equivalent to native GIP, but much less than native GLP-1, 24 lower cyclic AMP than native GLP-1, and five for lower binding affinity than native GLP-1. Uh, again, but these were animal studies and in vitro studies. In human, what happens, we do not know. 
So this is the first in human studies. Uh, it was published as early as 2018 and showing that type two patients treated for six months with this compound. That time it was known as LY32981 and showing that the red one is dulaglutide as compared to GLP-1. And over a period of six months, while dulaglutide causes uh, lowering for A1C by 1.1%, the high dose of tuzepatide led to uh, hemoglobin A1C lowering 2.4%. And the weight loss was similar over a period of six months, 11 kilogram weight loss with a higher dose compared to 2.7 kilograms with uh, dulaglutide. So as of all available anti-diabetic agents, as of now, this appears to be the most potent agent in terms of lowering uh, hemoglobin A1C and uh, body weight. So I'm not going to go through individual uh, studies. There are like five uh, surpass trials, surpass one, two, three, four, and five. And most of them have kind of similar design, just the comparator is different. Uh, also a summary slide, um, which shows, so this is the phase two studies compared with, um, and then this is the surpass one with placebo, and then surpass two compared with uh, semaglutide, surpass three compared with insulin degludec, surpass four compli compared with uh, glargin and patient with cardiohydrus, cardiovascular disease, and surplus five, again, with, compared with insulin glargin. So as you can see, compared to placebo, this is the baseline A1C so slightly low. There's reduction of 1.5 to 2%, but all of the studies consistently shown that there's A1C lowering in high dose ranges from 2 to 2.4%. And it is greater than semaglutide. This is semaglutide, but this is not the high dose semaglutide. This is semaglutide one milligram, where, which leads with hemoglobin A1C lowering about 1.7%. On this, tuzepatide showed a greater A1C improvement compared to uh, semaglutide. Not only that, in about 40% of patients with uh, high dose uh, tuzepatide, it leads to A1C lowering in the non diabetic range, that is between 5.7 to 6.5. As we discussed a little bit earlier about metabolic memory, see so if you can induce metabolic euglycemia in a patient with type 2 diabetes, that will have a long term effect in terms of reducing complications, although those data are not available yet. And it is more beneficial, more effective than patients on insulin. This is insulin degludate, and this is insulin glargin. Again, both are insulin glargin. So consistently shown A1C lowering 2 to 2.4%. The bottom panel shows the effect on body weight and show, again, showing the 8 to 10 kilogram of weight loss, which is about to 10 to 15% weight loss. Again, no other drug lets that weight loss except semaglutide high dose 2.4 milligram can lead to 15% weight loss. And again, consistently shown about 10 to 15, 10 kilogram of weight loss, which is about 10% of uh, 15, 10 to 15% percent weight loss. So overall, this 30, um, same uh, tils appetite causes about 2% lowering of A1C and 10 to 15% weight loss in this type 2 diabetes. And how about adverse events? Um, you know, the, the basic premise was that if you combine GIP, you will not, should not see much side effects. However, that was not seen, but um, as with any GLP-1 agonist, the, initial, the adverse event are seen initially in the first four to eight weeks of treatment. Um, and here, this is compared with the semag this is the semaglutide, this is tuzepatide uh, 5, 10, and 15 milligram. You can see that first, uh, the higher dose, so there's a dose-dependent increase in adverse events, particularly nausea and vomiting. And however, it's seen earlier in the first four to eight weeks. So the plan is, or the, the recommendation is to start low and go slow. So you start with 2.5 milligram and go by four mill uh, every four weeks, you increase by 2.5 milligram. If you go slow, you can, uh, you can, the risk of side effect is slightly lower. But what was disappointing was that um, this was not really different than semaglutide. So although we show that this drug causes greater weight loss and uh, A1C lowering, but you still see the similar kind of nausea and vomiting as you see with semaglutide. And here, the bottom panel showing the vomiting, you see the similar data. So, summary um, the TIS appetite uh, is uh, this is sur uh, surpassed too, but it's similar to all other studies, lots to about 10 kilogram weight loss and improved A1C and also improves the triglycerides, lowering about 25 to 30 percent. It does not affect much the LDL, and the HDL goes up by about seven percent, seven points. And um, the adverse events are comparable, not less or not higher, but it's comparable to other GLP-1 agonists. Now, um, this is a study um, on patients with non-diabetic obese patients. And this drug is not yet approved for obesity, but a lot of people are using US as off-level use for obesity. 
And uh, so in non-diabetic obesity, it shows a greater weight loss. But this is consistent across all studies. You see greater weight loss in non-diabetic subjects than diabetics. And one theory is that uh, you look for each one person loading for A1C, you gain about 2.2 kilograms because you reduce the glucosuria. And that's a theory by Aki Arvinen. And but with now the onset of uh, with concomitant treatment to SGLT2, we don't know how true that is. But that is one theory that you see always see a greater weight loss in non-diabetic compared to diabetics, any, any drug. And uh, about 90% uh, individual lost more than 5% of body weight, which is the requirement for approval of any anti-obesity drug by the FDA if you lose more than 5%. And based on this data, more, every, almost 80 to 90 percent lost more than 5 percent body weight. So cardiovascular events, this study was not powered to look at the cardiovascular benefits or just to, but for the FDA requirement, you have to show that it does not increase cardiovascular risk. So from this, you can conclude that it does not increase cardiovascular risk. Only in the higher dose, 15 milligram, there's a trend. But again, the event rate was very low, so you cannot conclude whether this cardiovascular benefit or not. One can conclude that there is not increased cardiovascular risk both in surface 4 as well as other surface trials. So how does uh, this GIP, this drug work? Why, how why is it so potent compared to other GLP-1? There's several theories. Nothing has been tested in humans yet. The mechanism acts on this drug. Now, animal models do not always translate to that in humans. And one theory is that possibly GIP agonism acts to GIP. So there's an additive effect of GIP. Another theory is GIP enhances the effective of GLP-1 or GLP, if you start with the treatment of GLP-1, you achieve euglycemia. Several studies have shown in humans that once you achieve euglycemia, the GIP can be effective. So possibly that initially you see the GLP-1 effect, then subsequently the GIP effect is observed. And there's, there's some, there's, we believe that this drug is nothing but just a very potent GLP-1 receptor agonist. So, but, the human studies are not done yet. We are proposing to do one so that you can block in one receptor, see if you can still see the effects. Another theory is that GIP enhances the lipid buffering capacity. That is a thiazolidine-like effect, which is not seen in GLP-1 agonist. And possibly there's an increased weight loss seen with trisepatide. Again, it's seen most weight loss not because of energy expenditure, but because of decreased caloric intake. And that is one theory that there's increased effect of both GIP and GLP at the both receptors in hypothalamus. You see increased effect on satiety on the combined GLP and GIP versus single, only GLP-1. And again, there's a weight loss intermittent insulin sensitizing effect of this drug, uh, likely to the adipose tissue. So there's one study look at the mechanism of action, but again, this was obese mice. And it showed that uh, there's a weight independent insulin sensitization by tizapatide. Again, we discussed it could be like a uh, like thiazolidine dine like effect of uh, GIP. And this is the only study which looked at the mechanism of action in humans. Uh, what they did was in Germany, they performed euglycemic clamps followed by hypoglycemic clamps in patients randomized to placebo, then one group randomized to semaglutide, one is tizapatide. This is the effect on the clamp induced uh, disposition index, which is a marker of beta cell function, showing that patient on the green column, showing that they are higher, uh, greater improvement in beta cell function, those were not appetite for six months. And it shows the clamp insulin data at baseline that is similar. This is a hyperglycemic clamp. Here is the first phase insulin response. This is the insulin response following arginine. In a hyperglycemic clamp, this is the second phase insulin response. And showing that uh, uh, the red is the one with semaglutide, the green one was its um, trisipatide. At baseline, there was no difference in insulin response. However, uh, after six months of treatment with semaglutide or trisipatide, you see a greater effect on first phase insulin response, second phase insulin response to trisipatide. And there is a greater, here again, confirming that the first phase insulin response was higher with semaglutide. The second phase trended to be slightly higher. Again, the insulin sensitivity was higher with uh, tilzepatide. But again, there was a greater weight loss with tilzepatide than semaglutide, so the weight loss could be contributing to the improved insulin sensitivity. Uh, so to summarize that tilzepatide is superior to semaglutide in terms of improving insulin sensitivity, but they have looked at the change in insulin sensitivity in the weight loss. So with the similar weight loss, semaglutide uh, tilzepatide is led to a greater improvement in insulin sensitivity than that of semaglutide. It improved better improvement in uh, beta cell function. And also, 
Even though there's a GIP component here, there's a greater suppressant plasma glucagon, which is hepatite than with uh, semaglutide. That could also be contributing to improve glycemic control. And uh, the side effects are comparable to GLP or agonist. So overall, tisapatide is very effective in terms of lowering glycemic uh, body weight and improving glycemic control. The mechanism it does by improving both insulin sensitivity and beta cell function. And, uh, and the synergistic effect of GLP and GIP that it increases insulin sensitivity, insulin secretion, improves triglyceride clearance. And uh, that's why plasma triglyceride is markedly reduced and possibly decreasing lipolysis and uh, increased fatty oxid and decreasing lipolysis. And uh, here, the possibly by decreasing postprandial glucagon and decreasing hepatic glucose production. Again, not, not all of them has been yet proven in humans. This is, this is a hypothesis. So now changing gear to glucagon. So we all know that glucagon is a drug which is the primary effect of increasing hepatic glucose production. So we use it for treatment of hypoglycemia. So it's counterintuitive to see that how glucagon can be used for treatment of type two diabetes. Now, glucagon has also effect on beta cell. If you give a glucagon, we do that called glucagon stimulation test to see uh, insulin secretion. If you give acutely, glucagon increases insulin secretion. It has effect on the hypothalamus, decreasing appetite, increases energy expenditure, which is uh, different than that of uh, other uh, GLP-1 agonists. They decrease, increase satiety and have no effect on energy expenditure. They increase fatty acid oxidation. That's why it's effective. That being been pursued for treatment of non-alcoholic student hepatitis or NAFLD. And they also decrease gastric uh, motility and they increase postprandial amino acid uptake. So the rationale for combining glucagon is because of these effects. So if you can increase energy expenditure, increase insulin secretion, and by combining a slightly glucagon-like activity in turn with GLP and GIP, you may see an additive effect. So, and of note, both glucagon antagonists and agonists are being, being developed for treatment of type 2 diabetes. In fact, we did a study on glucagon antagonists, but that drug is now being um, no longer being developed because it has some side effects, hepatic side effects. But the other glucagon antagonists are being tried also. So again, I'll just show you GIP has effect on in adipose tissue, improving some sensitivity and regular some lipid metabolism, which effect on appetite. It has no effect on energy expenditure, increasing some secretion and increase glucagon. And GLP-1 mainly acts on the CNS because appetite, insulin secretion, and delayed gastric emptying. And glucagon has energy expenditure delayed, uh, decreases appetite, uh, increases appetite. So, and also cause increased fatty acid oxidation. So, so these are the two uh, triple agonists that has been pursued in clinical trials. The both were published in Cell Metabolism in 2022. This is a compound developed by Sanofi, and this is a compound by Lilly. And this drug, both these drugs in animal models showed that it improved uh, weight loss and improved insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion. However, for the Sanofi compound was once a day compound, whereas Lily compound is at once a week. So some, for some reason, this compound is stopped for the development, we don't know why. But the Lily compound, they're being pursuing phase two and phase three data. I'll just show you some phase one B data. This is the data on triple agonist GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon, and from the, it was published last year in Lancet. And this is a study, a small study, phase 1b study on patient and dose escalating compared to placebo. There are six different doses of, uh, uh, five different doses of this triple agonist compared to dual agglutide. Patient with type 2 diabetes and 10 years uh, duration of diabetes were randomized to receive five different doses. And as you can see, the bottom line, the, the dual agglutide is on the blue and the others are different doses of the triple agonist. This was only a 12 week study that is for three months. And over three months, you can see that there's a decline in A1C by 1.5% with the highest dose of this uh, triple agonist, but other doses shown between one to 1.5%. And this suggests that this is not a plateau. If you increase further, maybe for six months, you can see a further lowering of A1C. So they are currently doing the six month studies. And this is the weight adjusted uh, body weight loss again showing that nine to nine kilogram weight, weight loss in the work only in three months. But the most remarkable effect was seen in lipids. And um, here it shows that HDL on the left panel, the HDL actually went down, which is not good, but it was slightly went down, whereas uh, tisipatide and other GLP-1 agonists increased the HDL slightly. 
In the LDL, there was a 30% decrease in LDL, highest dose. There's a 40% decrease in BLDL and triglycerides. So that's why these drugs are being pursued now with, with the compound by Novo for treatment of NASH. And the other beneficial effect just seen in a short study, this is like small number in short studies, so we don't know so whether this will be replicated in bigger trials. They showed it uh, 12 to 15 milligram, 12 millimeter of mercury decrease in systolic blood pressure. Usually all of the drugs like GLP-1, SGLT-2 inhibitor, you see a single digit drop in blood pressure, maybe four to five you know, millimeter of mercury, whereas this drug, it's a significant uh, lowering of systolic blood pressure. So overall, this uh, compound over 12 weeks shown a similar safety profile as in agonist, improvement in glycemic control and body weight, and showed improved lipid profile. So, and the rationale for development of this drug that even if the highly potent drug like tirzepatide, about 12% patients in all the surpassed trials did not achieve control. So there is room for development of the drugs. Um, not all, the drugs will not be good for everyone. So that, that, that's the rationale for developing other drugs because 10 to 12% not respond to even the potent drug like tirzepatide. Although tirzepatide, they showed us effective regardless of the duration of diabetes, the baseline A1C or the baseline C-peptide level. But still, there are patients who will not respond to tirzepatide. Maybe in those patients, one may try this triple agonist. So to summarize, JLP-1 agonist improved glycemic control, reduced body weight of hypoglycemia. And, um, and again, tirzepatide does not cause hypoglycemia per se. And so promising results in both glycemic control weight loss and has potential for use in Napoli and NASH. And actually, uh, we saw the type 1 diabetes uh, studies earlier. They have been, they are actually doing some study in type 1 diabetes too. We do not know the results. And um, they're superior to other type, other uh, GLP-1 agonists. And the adverse effects of tirzepatide are the dual agonists comparable to GLP-1 agonist. And long-term data for tirzepatide, particularly in the cardiovascular outcome data is still pending. It will be published in the called surpass CVOT trial. That will be published in 2024, October, um, when that progress ends. And the triple agonists, GLP, glucagon, and uh, GIP, they are show a very promising role in terms of improving uh, glycemic control as well as for weight loss. They may be approved for treatment of diabetes and obesity in future. I think that was the last slide. And, um, and as I showed that there are several trials undergoing now under but there's no the GLP and GIP in pipeline now, but uh, GLP and glucagon being pursued for treatment of type two diabetes and NASH and GLP, GIP and glucagon again pursued for treatment of type NASH as well as type, type two diabetes. I think that was the last slide and thank you. I think we'll wait for the panel discussion for the questions. Yeah, Devjit, it was, it was an excellent exposition of the dual agonist and also you alluded to the uh, triple agonist. It was very clear. And, and we'll get back to the other two lectures. And after that, we will have panel discussion. I welcome Professor Rakesh Shahai, Professor Head of Endocrology at the, at the Osmania Medical College, who has joined us now. He will be moderating this session. Rakesh, welcome. And uh, I, 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 at this moment, hand over to Kalpana again to invite Professor Jargar for his talk. Debjit, it was wonderful. And you educated us on the new molecules on which you had very, very initial ideas. Thank you, Debjit. Over to Kalpana to invite Thank you, sir. I request uh, Professor H. Jargar to uh, give his deliberation on PCOD. And sir has already given his introduction. He needs uh, actually no introduction. He's the don in the Sr Srinagar and the Jammu and Kashmir. And he's the boss in endocrinology in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Sir, over to you, sir, please. Are my slides visible? Yeah, visible sir. and moving, moving also. Visible, sir. Ah, wonderful. Yes. Thank yes. you, Kalpanna, and uh, yes. thank you, Lok and Ashok. Thank and you. particularly, thank you, Ashok, for upgrading me to the stats of heavyweights today. <laughs> but I think you, <laughs> I think you ditched a lightweight in the middle of two heavyweights. <laughs> Nikhil on the one side and Dr. Tripathi on the other side. Uh, it's a pleasure, a real pleasure. Uh, talking to friends, colleagues on a uh, problem uh, that I have seen evolving in front of me in the last four decades. You know, when I <clears throat> was doing my endocrinology, uh, hardly any data was coming on 
so called polycystic ovarian disease and we do not even have a definition for it we do not have even a proper understanding for it so it's a real pleasure as <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Tripathi was just now talking about looking at molecules not only from the point of view of taking care of the metabolic components of diabetes, but also simultaneously addressing the weight, uh, which, you know, some of the worst obesity we have seen uh, is in the area where uh, Dr. Tripathi is living, San Antonio and Texas. Um, there was a, you know, just look at it. <clears throat> In 1980, when you know, uh, when I was a postgraduate, and 2011, when I left Skims, this uh, write-up in Writers in New York uh, published. Hardly anything was known in the 80s about uh, this particular disease process, and hardly anything was talked about. And then you know, steadily, steadily, the problem became to a status where today. The commonest endocrinopathy, endocrinopathy in women is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And this whole gamut started with the same expansion of those metabolic diseases, non communicable disease. The root cause in most being that obesity that we have been alluding to for quite a few years, that has been eluding us uh, for quite a few decades now. Not that all patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome have necessarily obesity, but quite few have and most have. This is a paper that we published more than two decades back where we showed, yes, a significant number of people are becoming obese uh, in Kashmir. But what surprised us that <clears throat> women were three times more obese than men. And that really surprised us because we thought, you know, uh, women in the Indian subcontinent are not being taken care of. The magnitude of uh, nutrition is not that good. And so we were surprised that against uh, 7.1% uh, Kashmir adult being obese, males, 23% uh, of the females were obese. And much later, uh, a group known as Non-Communicable Diseases Collaboration Group, which, have, which we have been a part of for more than a decade, published how obesity has been globally behaving in the last half a century. <clears throat> uh, this paper that <clears throat> this group uh, published in uh, Lancet in May issue 2016. We have been a part of this uh, collaboration group uh, for more than a decade, and this is being monitored from Harvard Medical School and Imperial College London. And it showed some uh, fascinating things. You know, uh, we are interested predominantly for India. If you just look at this slide, on your left side, look at the magnitude of obesity in men. In the whole uh, trajectory of different nations on this globe, India was at position number 19, which literally would mean that if you look in terms of absolute obese individuals, in 1975, even uh, Germany had more obese people than us. Ukraine had more obese people than us. And now Indian men are at position number five means the nation we are getting obese is not that rest of the nation world is not getting obese but we seem to be getting our bit now with vengeance in the last half a century and if this was the situation in females males what happened to females look at it today if you look at 1975 <clears throat> indian women also were at position number 19 meaning that if you look at different nations in terms of absolute number of obese women we had the 19th position in that trajectory. But today, after China and the United States, we have the highest number of obese women. And that's why today every gynecologist, every physician is looking at all those ultrasounds with polycystic ovarian syndromes, getting referred to people right, left, and center. <laughs> this is a paper that we published a decade after the last one, <clears throat> where we looked at relatively youngish people. Again, we saw that this obesity is taking off early and there's a difference in this obesity between boys and girls. And later we published a paper where we studied children from five to 15 years. This trend was not as marked in them, in boys and girls, but the trend was there on the higher side in the females. Then in that global data that I alluded to, we looked at obesity globally in children, adolescents, and young adults. 
situation globally exactly same. Much worse, uh, obesity getting worse and much worse in females. When we look at how we make a diagnosis of a polycystic ovarian syndrome, it has eluded for a long time clarity and I believe still continues to elude. NIH made an attempt in 1990 and very grossly underlined some uh, clinical features, investigative features. Then a group of guys met in Rotterdam in 2003 in Holland. And today, predominantly one uh, definition that we hold today, Androgen Access Society 2007 and guidelines. But what does it in real terms mean? You have a suggestion of hyperandrogenemia and hyperandrogenism and anovulation. A very broad thing and not a very precise thing. Oligo or anovulation and clinical or biochemical suggestion of hyperandrogenism may or may not have an polycystic ovaries invariably would have on an imaging tool. But also it says that we have to exclude other conditions that are likely to give a scenario like that. Cushing syndrome, hyperprolactinemia, hypothyroidism, non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, androgen screening lesions. But if you look at those exclusions and look at the level at which we diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome today, these numbers for these disorders would be extremely minuscule. So many times, you know, now today, the first thing that attracts this attention is this thatch of hair on the face. And um, the criteria that have been given by the Androgen Access Society, which again emphasized you need to have a clinical or biochemical suggestion of hyperandrogenism, ovarian dysfunction uh, in the form of anovulation or oligoevulation, and then polycystic ovarian morphology, and exclude those clinical or pathological disorders that are likely to lead to a similar situation. Epidemiologically, depending on what subset of population uh, you are studying and which criteria you are using, you will get different figures. Understandably, when you look at amenorrhea, when you look at uh, oligomenorrhea, different percentages would come. But by and large, uh, if you look at Rotorum criteria or androgen exosociety society criteria, 10 to 12 percent of the people were said to have a possible diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I do believe ever since this paper was published in Human Reproduction, probably the numbers have increased, the percentage has increased because the obesity has uh, worsened. Very complex disorder, uh, not uh, obesity alone. Yes, a lot of data shows that this particular pathological process is associated with insulin resistance, which will come down to very soon. Is it a generalized insulin resistance? Some people have been believing that it's a more sectoral insulin resistance in the ovarian tissue. Uh, is this fundamentally an ovarian defect, which ends up in creating more sex steroids, androgens and estrogens that start the vicious circle or a peripheral cortisol metabolism? But there's a significant thought and very relevant thought that it fundamentally is a neuroendocrine defect. You know, when you look at GNRH from hypothalamus and the response of the gonadotropins to this GNRH and the response of the ovary to this LH and FSH uh, in the ovaries is aberrant. Now, today, there appear to be very differently two classes of people. Why do you know? Insulin resistance is predominant because of obesity. It is emerging a much bigger class. And there's a class where neuroendocrine defects may be predominant. It's a relatively smaller class. But again, the, there is no clear-cut demarcation between these two. Just look at it. Almost 100 years back, uh, Gist published in a journal of, uh, American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, 
Bilateral polycystic ovarian syndrome is most probably a result of some hormonal stimulation and very likely relates to the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And much later, about 40 years later, study showed yes, in a big chunk of these people who had this polycystic disease of the ovaries, uh, there was an excess LH activity in the plasma. Again, if you just recap, this, this is what I said. You have a GNRH, it acts on the pituitary, either the pituitary is hyper-responsive to the GNRH and causes more LH, or there is a defect in the feedback from the sex hormones, androgens and estrogens into the hypothalamus that responds aberrantly to GNRH secretion. But this may still be debatable, the precise mechanism, even though a lot is known today, than was known four decades later, three decades later, two decades later. But what is unquestioned is that this is a clinical stage which is characterized by hyperandrogenemia, but also hyperestrogenemia, because that's the main source of estrogens uh, is androgens. And that's why, you know, uh, you get endometrial proliferation and possibility of an endometrial malignancies and excessive bleeding, all that. Whatever the reasons for insulin resistance, whether they are genetic, autoimmune, some defects, hyperinsulinemia through different routes has been shown to cause a decrease in sex hormone binding proteins. So free testosterone is on the high side, gives a hyperandrogen state. This also decreases in IGF binding proteins. So IGF is on the high side, can cause ovarian stimulation. And this differentiation of a ratio between LH and FSH drives it more towards an excessive production of androgens. <clears throat> a lot of data right from um, 80s uh, has shown that almost half to two thirds of women with polycystic ovarian syndrome demonstrate clinically measurable insulin resistance above and beyond as determined by their body weight. So there's something more than the body weight alone uh, that uh, does cause hyperinsulinemia. A lot of data has come up uh, for the last half a decade, for the last half a century now. Firstly, those crude uh, urinary assumptions of LH. And <clears throat> now, ever since this radio menace came to the fore, particularly from 80s, PCOD, yes, in, is characterized by hyperinsulinemia at least in most of the individuals. But presence of uh, insulin resistance necessarily is not diagnostic because it's so common otherwise also, you know. Central to polycystic ovarian disease, as I said, is hyperandrogenism. From diagnostic point of view, not hyperinsulinemia. And this barrage of uh, <clears throat> Androgens uh, have been studied, dehydroepiandrostron, dehydroepiandrostron sulfate, androstenedone, testosterone, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> but probably one of the best to look at would be a free testosterone. These data suggest is, are there any racial differences? This data published about a half a decade back in American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, between different races. Yes, it was shown that in the United States, Hispanic women uh, with polycystic ovarian syndrome have the more severe phenotype. Maybe Tripathi would be seeing Professor Tripathi more of it. Uh, a lot of uh, Hispanic, almost a Hispanic population in San Antonio, uh, both in terms of hyperandrogenemia and metabolic criteria. Non-Hispanic black women have an overall milder polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, than Hispanics, and in some respects, than non-Hispanic whites. From clinical presentation, probably one of the first things that drives our attention is this thatch of hair on the face. And uh, this is a data that we published long back in fertility and sterility. Second commonest cause of uh, herstism in that young age was polycystic ovarian syndrome. And quite few had a, would, would, characterized, would be characterized for idiopathic herstism, 
but PCOD was one treatable disease there. And then when a person comes out of that juvenile uh, concern for cosmetics, uh, fertility becomes an issue. And in this study published in fertility, we found out that uh, this was the most annovulation because that time when we published the data, only NHS criteria were available and uh, tools for making a more refined diagnosis were not there. But we correct, we've uh, documented annovulation and one third of uh, total uh, infertility was uh, associated with infertility, uh, which was not uh, um, associated with any form of ovarian failure, uh, but LHFS characteristics of uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And when that fertility issue is settled, uh, insulin resistance is there, gestation diabetes many times more in these women. So that issue needs to be handled with a different thought process. And once that gestation issue is taken care of, overall, now diabetes is much worse in these people. As I told you, data shows that firstly, a good chunk of them are obese. So obesity-related insulin There are a lot of studies have shown creating an equipoise in body weight or body mass index. Women with polycystic ovarian syndrome have a much worse insulin resistance than women who do not have a polycystic ovarian syndrome, but have a similar uh, body profile in terms of waist tip ratio and body mass index. And there's almost 40% people will be developing diabetes by 40th birthday. Now, this is a data that, again, you know, sort of concerns me uh, in my own uh, country that now this epidemic, uh, this is a paper that our group published in Nature and uh, a year before this COVID epidemic. We showed that now urban and semi-urban areas are saturated with obesity. Whoever has to get obese is already obese. Now the juggernaut is moving to the rural area. McDonald's is moving to rural area. KFC is moving to rural area. Biryani is moving to rural area. And now that will in future drive the obesity. And now when that happens in India, because still most of the India is rural, we will have a much worse problem at our hand than we have been seeing uh, for the last couple of decades. And not only that, you know, now it's not the only consequence that we look at it from annulation, we look at it from diabetes, we look at fertility, gestation diabetes, permanent diabetes, the associated epidemic of coronary arteries in the country, which has doubled up in the last two decades. Consequence of the same metabolic disorder, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes. So in conclusion, if you look at this polycystic ovarian syndrome, it is an insulin resistance syndrome that is characterized by hyperandrogenemia, but simultaneously also has significant components of metabolic dysfunction. It might incidentally be associated with reproductive dysfunction, but also has dyslipidemia when their body mass starts increasing. In those youngsters, you know, you certainly find out a TG of 250 at 15, 16 years and and 18, 350, at 21, 400. And we have seen it, and I'm sure many of you have observed it in the hypertension very early. Now, gone are the days when you say essential hypertension beyond 30, almost starts occurring a decade or a half decade earlier. Uh, central adiposity has become so common. Uh, it was already in the Western world assuming huge proportions, but is now assuming big proportions in our country also. So in totality, if you look at the total lifespan of a patient with the polycystic ovarian syndrome or tendency, right from the beginning, youngsters, you know, in that sixth, seventh class, menstrual irregularities, and then that uh, thatch of fear on the face, predominantly, you know, looking at uh, dermatological, uh, that cosmetic, and then those menstrual irregularities and going from gynecologist to gynecologist, getting different hormones and then someday getting to an endocrinologist and, and then suddenly you know some form of a dyslipidemia or dysglycemia and then the consequences as the age goes by decade by decade huge problem in conclusion i must tell you emerging problem 
but the, unfortunately when we have the time to reverse or control or treat many of these components most of us lose these components because we are, we spend a decade on that hair growth and electrolysis we spend another decade only on that annulation and proper menstrual cycles but never give a consolidated concept either to ourselves or to our colleagues and more importantly to our patients thank you so much it has been excellent uh, dr jagar i know you have developed this story beautifully and you know your storytelling style is always unique mm -hmm. and given a wealth of data and also given a lot of original data now uh, in interest of time uh, we'll just stop here and we'll have the panel discussion professor rakesh is getting some clinical questions for you he told me just now and uh, at this moment uh, on my own behalf on we are for dr kalpana dash it's my great pleasure and honor to invite uh, professor dr nikhil tandan the professor and head of endocrinology and metabolism diabetes at the aims delhi to deliberate on 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 a very important issue you know gdm the long term outcome dear friends uh, nikhil does not need any introduction i'll just say that he is one of the person i adore you know his tenacity of purpose academics research patient care opd care patient care is 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 something great and you know he has been uh, involved in the ncds for a very long time in the in the in his own department in the clinics in the in the outreach programs also in the ministry and the phfi and icmr he has more than 500 publications and has been cited more than 40000 times i'm telling this nikhil just to inspire lot of young audiences there the h index is about 65 and you know i will not go further he has been decorated as the uh, as the with padam shri and many other honors and and uh, he has been the fellow of the uh, academy of medical science fams he has been the fellow of the indian academy of science which is great and and national academy of science the, and uh, the bc roy award winner and the padam shri uh, decorated dear friends uh, i present you uh, dr nikhil tandan to speak to us regarding the uh, the gdm its long term outcome nikhil all is yours can you hear the greetings from a freezing delhi and uh, let me first start by thanking the organizers especially my very old friend dr alok kanungo for having invited me for this uh, this year's meeting and to make a presentation on gestational diabetes left right post delivery outcomes please mute yourself except the speaker others please be uh, the plan of my presentation today will be talking briefly about postpartum hyperglycemia conversion to diabetes depending on how the gdm was diagnosed whether we use carpenter kusten criteria or the iadpsg criteria and then taking you directly to uh, results from our study called living in which we looked at a, a sort of a real life implementation of a lifestyle intervention uh, to see if we can retard or prevent this progression to type 2 diabetes. Now, the audience would be very familiar with the fact that the overall risk for type 2 diabetes is about 10 times higher in women with previous gestational diabetes as compared to healthy controls. And this is a, a systematic review which was published a couple of years ago. Um, these are data from a multi-ethnic study done in Canada. And you can see that the conversion of GDM to postpartum diabetes uh, was compared between South Asians, Chinese, and whites. And not only was the prevalence of, of, of GDM higher in South Asians, the likelihood of progressing to type 2 diabetes was also the highest among South Asians when compared to the other ethnic groups. What about data from India? Now, these are data in which the carpenter kusten criteria was used. Uh, the first couple of studies, one from uh, Dr. Kale and colleagues in Pune, uh, showed that over a mean postpartum follow-up of about four and a half years, 50% of the women who had GDM had moved on to develop diabetes. And another st a smaller study from Mysore, again, showing that a five-year period, about one in three of these women moved on to diabetes. We went on to do a similar study in which we evaluated the conversion of GDM to future A1C and the predictive value of HbA1c in an Indian cohort. This was published in 2016, and we'd use the carpenter kusten criteria to diagnose GDM. 
And the data from this study is the, is the largest study done in India from this on just more than 350 people at a median follow up of 1.6 years, one in three had already progressed to diabetes. And in the group which had been followed up between two and four years, 50% had already gone on to develop diabetes. So again, showing that this is an extremely high risk group for disease progression. This is, again, uh, to give you a sense that if you looked at these 366 women, uh, at the end of the, of the follow-up period, 32% had diabetes and another 40% had prediabetes. So actually only one in four women stayed in normal glucose tolerance if they had GDM when it was diagnosed using uh, the carpenters Gustin criteria. I've already mentioned to you that about 50% had diabetes after two to four years. And compared to an age-matched general population, these were data taken from the INDIAP study, if you had a woman between 20 and 29 years of age, there was an 18-fold excess risk. And when it was between 30 and 39 years, there was nearly a 10-fold excess risk. So clearly, this is a category of individuals who nearly look to be looked after. So a summary of this part, these were the highest reports ever reported in literature. Postpartum screening rates, unfortunately, were about 35%, suggesting that not all the women turn up for uh, postpartum evaluation. Overweight and obesity became a significant part. If you compare the pre-pregnancy BMIs to the postpartum BMIs, there was a change of four kilograms per square meter at this point in time. And therefore, given the early conversion, any efforts to reduce development diabetes should become early. Subsequent to this study, the criteria all over the world started changing to IADPSG in our cohort when we use the Carpenter and Kustin criteria, 70% of women were on insulin, whereas in the IADPSG diagnosed women, especially when you remove overt diabetes, only 20 or 30% of women require insulin. So there were a handful of studies again done from India using uh, the IADPSG criteria and again showed one thing that now because you possibly ended up having a milder cohort of individuals, the diabetes conversion rates at a short term were lower, though dysglycemia rates were again between 20 and 30%. And except for one study from Chennai, which went up to one year, the rest of them were really very short duration studies. So this was another piece of work which we did into the long term, which is more than one year postpartum glucose tolerance status amongst women who'd been diagnosed with GDM using the IADPSG criteria. And you can see the difference out here, as opposed to about 28% women who were normal glycemic, this number increased to about 42%. Diabetes, which is about 32%, came down to 10%, but prediabetes was 47%. So overall dysglycemia was about 60%, despite identifying a cohort of women which perhaps had less severe disease than those identified by the carpenter kusum criteria because with IADPSG, anybody with a fasting more than 126 and a post load of more than 200 would be called overt diabetes and not called gestational diabetes and again the not surprising predictors of dysglycemia were insulin or oral agent use during pregnancy first degree relative having diabetes the older the person the longer the duration since the index delivery the heavier the individual and features of insulin resistance. Now, the important thing to understand is compared to the HAPO study, which led to the creation of the IADPCC criteria, our women were younger. And the median follow up was much, much less, despite which the diabetes rates were very similar, suggesting that if we had longer follow ups, I mean, this was 11 years from the HAPO study compared to under two years in our study the conversion rate would be even higher. So we went on in to evaluate the way we could try and prevent this progression by looking at a lifestyle intervention. I will not go into the details of the uh, pilot study, which we did, which was looking at the feasibility of this lifestyle intervention, which encouraged us to proceed. This is a protocol from the study, which was published in Diabetic Medicine. And the study was funded by the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease, a combination in our instance of the ICMR and the NHMRC Australia. So this is really the design of the study. It was an open label, parallel group, pragmatic, individually randomized control trial with a blinded endpoint adjudication. It was a very low intensity lifestyle modification program because we wanted to see whether such a low touch intervention, which could be easily adaptable to routine care, especially in low resource settings, would make a difference. 
We calculated that about 1,400 women would be required. We looked at 19 hospitals across three South Asian countries. And the primary outcome was a proportion of women with a change of glycemic category. That is from normal glucose tolerance to either prediabetes or diabetes and normal uh, and prediabetes to diabetes. Secondary outcomes were changes in body weight, waist circumference, blood pressure, fasting, glucose, physical activity level and diet. And the inclusion criteria are very straightforward. Anybody who did not have diabetes between three and 18 months in their postpartum GTT after having been diagnosed as GDM during pregnancy using the IADPSG criteria were invited to participate. Anybody who had diabetes was clearly out. Anybody who lived far from the hospital did not have a mobile telephone and was likely to move residence in the next three years because we wanted a follow up were not included in the study. Now, this is a flow. Women were identified between 24 and 34 weeks of gestation, nearly three and a half thousand women, which is a large, large study. Eventually, only half of them, a little bit more than half of them, ended up coming for the postpartum uh, GTT, which was three to 18 months later, again suggesting that there is a significant drop off, despite the fact that we had contacted these women during pregnancy and they had agreed that they will come back to us during the postpartum period. This then led to uh, certain conditions which caused us to exclude them. And then they were randomized to intervention and control arm, six monthly follow ups using a 75 gram GTT at the end of the study to categorize individual. We'd planned on 1400 people, eventually ended up doing 1600, which is the largest ever study done anywhere in the world. 70% of our patients came from public hospital and the follow up range from one to three years. So this was the intervention, very simple, very marginal and very light touch. Group sessions, the four group sessions initially at three weekly intervals, the so first, second and third were done by six weeks. This was then supplemented by two SMSs, either text or voice, depending on the preference of the of the participant every week to reinforce the intervention and a monthly phone call from the care coordinators and a fourth session at 26 weeks. At the end of six months, we would then take a decision based on weight change, whether or not the trajectory we expected was being followed. And if it was not being followed, that is, if there had been no weight loss or there was weight gain, those individuals then converted into a intensification category in which two more individual sessions were done while for the remainder you continued with the two sms's or voice messages and the monthly phone call so this entire intervention lasted for one year and the follow-up continued thereafter so these are the baseline characteristics and i just wanted to point out out here that they were very well matched in terms of gravida time since delivery the prior history of gdm insulin use family history of diabetes their bmis the waist circumferences the hemoglobin a1c the fasting glucose and their glycemic status. As I mentioned, uh, by the time they underwent the postpartum uh, uh, OGTT, and 9% of women already had diabetes, again, suggesting this is a very rapid conversion happening, and therefore all interventions should really happen soon. 37% were prediabetes and 62% and normal glucose tolerance. The other thing which is important to understand, is despite this being from South Asia and 70% of the population coming from public hospitals, 40% of women were overweight and 23% were obese. So two out of every three women was either overweight or obese. That's a very important finding. The results, unfortunately, were not encouraging. 1,308 participants, 81% had an end of study visit. And if you included women in whom we had an A1C on follow-up, that became 90%. Remember, the study was done right during the COVID epidemic, which led to problems. A, a lot of the sessions which were supposed to be face-to-face -face could not be done face-to-face, -face, and we had to convert that into video sessions. And also the ability of the participants to, in, to, to you know, participate in lifestyle modification, including physical activity, was significantly impacted, as was our ability to actually you know, monitor things as much as we'd done. So worsening of glycemic status happened in about 25% of the lifestyle intervention group and 27% in the usual care group. There was a trend towards benefit in the intervention arm, but this clearly did not meet statistical significance. So if you see the, the, uh, the uh, error, the, the, the confidence intervals, you see that they were clearly shifted towards a trend towards benefit. 
pre-diabetes at baseline led to a 20% of them developing type 2 diabetes during the short follow-up period, suggesting that if in the postpartum GTT you have pre-diabetes, this would be an even more important subgroup to follow. This is again showing the same thing on a Kaplan-Meier uh, plot, and you can see that there is no significant difference. And there was a significant follow-up, which is available till about 18 months after the study was initiated. So this and the secondary outcomes, whether it was development of diabetes, change in fasting glucose, change in body weight, waist circumference, blood pressure, et cetera, were again not different. So overall, there were trends towards benefit, but there was no clear benefit. So a summary of this, 1,600 women in, in, uh, randomized to either usual care or lifestyle intervention. There was no significant difference in the proportion of study participants with change in glycemic category. Though we are encouraged to see the direction in which this response was happening, and um, we look forward to be able to strengthen this, but we feel that there may be a reason or requirement to add oral agents in this form. So let me just wind up and say that the strength was this is the largest study ever conducted globally, very broad inclusion and limited exclusion criteria, which mirrors real life. So it was replicable in the real life, extremely difficult study design and recruitment. And then unfortunately, like many things which happened in the last two years, the COVID-19 impacted. So let me conclude by saying, Number one, that the risk of type 2 diabetes in women with prior GDM is nearly 10 times higher compared to healthy controls, even in our population. Very high conversion rates in Indian women, and that's happening even extremely soon after delivery. So any intervention, if you plan, must start very soon after delivery. There are multiple cardiometabolic abnormalities which are coexisting in this population, which I did not talk about. We need an intervention strategy to prevent or delay this. A light touch intervention alone may not be adequate. We may need to think of involving the family as a unit so that it's not just the woman who's participating in the intervention, but the entire family and or use preventive drug therapies to facilitate that. Let me thank you. But before I do that, I'd like to put on record that this work was done in collaboration with several people for the interest of time. I've not been able to name all my collaborators, both within the department, within AIMS, but outside the department and a whole bunch of principal investigators across 19 trial sites across three countries and members of the steering committee. Thank you so much. And I'll stop here. I think, uh, Nikhil, it was uh, fabulous. Excellent. You know, so much of original data <clears throat> and so beautiful presented. You know, the, the I think it's the only study which has such a large number of GDM mothers being followed up. And 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 and, and I have no time to uh, to, to, to put my words uh, properly, but I must tell you that it has given a wealth of data to the country. I, I, I Nikhil, I agree with you. GDM is a pre-diabetic condition and GDM, government of India has approved a DCGI. Both of us are there in the member. We have approved use of metformin that we'll discuss in the detailed discussion, panel discussion. But, but Nikhil, on behalf of all of us, I congratulate you for an wonderful study and giving us a wealth of data on a topic which is we do not have any data. Thank you very much. Over to over to uh, Professor Rakesh Nair to yeah. carry the, the 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 panel discussion. We have about you, 20, yeah. 20, minutes, 20 minutes time. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I think uh, you have put it very rightly that uh, we had a very illust uh, I mean, excellent mm -hmm. session by three illustrious speakers. I think uh, all of them uh, did an excellent job. And uh, we'll, uh, I mean, I would like to uh, take up a few questions to each of them. Uh, uh, I mean, more, I mean, very clinically relevant questions I would like to ask them. So I think uh, the first talk by Dr. Devji, actually, he showed us that tetraptide is actually becoming a blockbuster molecule in the US. I mean, from what I hear from many of my friends and others there is that it's it's likely to become a blockbuster molecule. And, and he has also highlighted the fact that, uh, you know, uh, in the coming years, I think the, the molecules are going to be the the polyagonists are going to be the molecules of future. So I think, uh, uh, but I would like to ask him a few couple of quick questions. One is that, uh, you know, you spoke about uh, uh, tirzeptide itself. I would like to know about, I mean, you, when you look at GLP-1 agonists, we are a little worried about uh, using it in people with uh, pancreatitis and um, uh, previous history of pancreatitis and all the, it has uh, not been shown to be directly causing this. But uh, what is the status with, with these polyagonists? Uh, particularly tirzeptide and the other agonists that we're going to uh, see in the future. 
So uh, answering the question, uh, so that is a relative contraindication patient with prior history of pancreatitis because you know GLP and GI receptor are present in the pancreatic duct. So there is a dose dependent increase in amylase lipase. If you see, because part of the research trial, we see that there is rise in lipase in pancreatic amylase. But I have not seen any. So far, the data has not shown that this drug causes increase or increase the risk of pancreatitis. But it's safer to be not to prescribe these drugs in patients with prior history of pancreatitis. Yeah, another clinical paradox that we commonly see is you spoke about the glucagon agonists being used along with the along with the GLP agonist uh, agonism to to sort of get great, greater benefits. But uh, glucagon, you know, if you look at it, we are using it for management of hypoglycemia. So, right. uh, I mean, how do you explain this paradox? Because uh, the current uh, use of glucagon is mainly for uh, for uh, for management of hypoglycemia. Yeah, so actually I showed in my slides. So there's both glucagon agonists and antagonists are being developed for treatment of diabetes. As I told, we did a trial in glucagon antagonists that improved glycemic control, but uh, had a hepatotoxicity. That's why it is withdrawn. But um, the glucagon activity of this agonist that I showed, triple agonist, there's primarily actually, if you do in vitro study, that is nine times more potent than the native GIP. So it's more like GIP. It's three, uh, it's three four less potent than glucagon and GLP-1. So although it has a glucagon-like activity, it's very mild activity. And that is the hyperglycemic effect of glucagon is counteracted by the GLP and GIP. So you see the beneficial effect of glucagon, that is the weight loss energy expenditure and effect on fat oxidation and increase on the decrease, uh, increase appetite satiety, or decrease appetite, increase satiety. So those are, and if you combine the glucagon are also receptors on the hypothalamus. So, so that's the rationale for combining glucagon with, uh, you cannot give glucagon alone. Like if you give the glucagon dose that we use for treatment hypoglycemia much higher. If you give glucagon alone, of course, you'll see hypoglycemia. But if low dose glucagon combined with GLP and GIP, it may potentially, because glucagon is also insulin secretagogue. That's why glucagon is not used for treatment hypoglycemia and type 2 diabetes. It can increase insulin secretion too. So that's the rationale for insulin secretion and effect on weight loss and energy expenditure. That's, that's why it combined with glucagon with GLP and GIP. Rakesh, can I have one question? Yeah. Okay, yes, I ask you, Devjit, uh, wonderful presentation, and you made clear many doubts. Uh, uh, this drug is supposed to come to India. Uh, it will take two years, I'm told. Now, you know, we have only two drugs. We have uh, uh, Rebelsus oral semaglutide 3714, and we, we don't have even one milligram for diabetes treatment. We will be getting 2.4 sema next year. Sometime March, April, we are supposed to get it. So, any comparison has been done. I saw the comparison 15 milligram uh, of this dual agonist with one milligram uh, injectable that we have. Oh. We having any say that. So, any comparison to oral sema or to 2.4 injectable sema weekly? Uh, right now, there is no data available on uh, comparison to 2.4 milligram sema or with oral semaglutide. But uh, with one milligram, this drug appears superior. But 2.4 milligram, I mean, based on the data that is available, the, it causes 15, it can lead to weight loss of 15% so for 2.4 milligram. And the highest dose of uh, trizepatide will also lead to weight loss of about uh, 15 to 20%, 15 percent in diabetes. So I would say it's comparable, but I think the glycemic effect on A1C, uh, the trizepatide appears to be more potent. And there's no data yet compared between uh, oral semaglutide versus uh, trizepatide. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, your uh, one quick question about your uh, your thoughts about uh, uh, the effects of FGF twenty one and amylin agonists are they also going to be added to these? Yeah, actually, Novo actually has a compound. We will be doing a trial on that. They added uh, as amylin derivative, Lorcas, and something combined with uh, semaglutide. There, so there, Novo has a drug which amylin combined with uh, sema. So that's being studied now. And FGF21 is used mainly, have been looked at for mainly for liver head, NASH, and not for diabetes. It's a, so I don't think there's any trials going on for FGF21 diabetes, but mainly for uh, not, uh, NASH. Thank you, sir. Shall we move to Dr. Professor Jargar and ask him a yes, few quick yes. questions? Yes, yeah, to Dr. Jargar. Yes, yes. sir. Uh, Dr. Jargar again, uh, you know, gave a very good. Uh, you know, uh, story about how, you know, he has seen the evolution of PCOS over the over the last four decades and how uh, things have been changing. 
And uh, so I wanted to ask you, sir, about uh, the metabolic effects, particularly when you've spoken about PCOS having very high risk of diabetes. Uh, would you uh, say that, you know, how do you think this diabetes uh, in women who have had PCOS differs from, uh, I mean, how do they differ from the women who have who have diabetes but had not, did not have PCOS? Very important question. You know, I'll tell you, when a person develops diabetes at any age, you know, there's a signal the fellow is not well. He needs some treatment. And as Nikhil, Nikhil was saying in his talk that when from GDM you want to follow them up, that lightweight uh, lifestyle education does not seem to work. It needs to be aggressive. It needs to be very relevant. It needs to be focused. It needs to be repetitive. Why does that need to happen? Because this gestation diabetes gives us an inkling. Yes, there is something grossly wrong with the metabolic machinery of this individual, right? Because if left unattended, uh, in another couple of years, you will have one quarter of people who will have permanent diabetes. And at a very young age, see the consequences of that problem at the age of 30 for another 50 years. Now, imagine a person at the age of 15, 16, you make a diagnosis, comes for a thatch of hair on the face, but you make a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And you see a triglyceride of 180, 210 at that 16 years old girl. In a similar fashion, it gives you a window of opportunity to look at this girl's health for the last 60 years, for the next 60 years. Like that GDM tells you how she's going to behave in another 50 years, 30 years, 40 years. So yes, we know <clears throat> that as I was showing you the data right from 80s, Insulin resistance definitely is there, but if you compare the insulin resistance between young girls with PCOD and who are otherwise normal, the insulin resistance in over and above that. Not only does it prognosticate what is going to happen to their metabolic uh, stats in terms of diabetes, but as I told you, these are the girls who in those second decade only will have a hypertriglyceride event. Wait for another half a decade, their HDL will go down. Wait for another decade, their LDL will be going up. <clears throat> so their cardiovascular health has already started getting perverted. At the age of 25 to 35, they have been having, harboring a metabolic problem, which is liable to give them an accelerated vasculopathy, vascular disease, endothelial dysfunction. So this is an opportunity uh, for the clinician, not just regulating a menstrual cycle, which is important at that age, uh, not to be folks, not to be obsessed with that thatch of hair on the face, which is again important in those young girls to get a good image of their own self and body, but also give them a proper perspective of it is not all about just a thatch of hair on the face and menstrual regularity. That should be focused on but the education for a total lifestyle and possible protection of a metabolic dysfunction, if not totally averted, but at least a diabetes occurring at the age of 25 is far different than a diabetes occurring at 55. You see, I'll tell you, there's published data available today which shows that uh, in 1980s or uh, di average diabetes in India used to occur at 48 years. And at that time, life, life expectancy was 55, 56 years. People used to be retired at the age of 54. Today, the same diabetes is occurring at 30 and 32. And people refuse to retire at 70. And a big chunk of people live at 85 and 90. Now, it's a great thing. But imagine living with a metabolic burden for 60 years. It's, I'm not saying it's not worthwhile living. The amount of time spent on health, the amount of time, money spent on investigation, the amount of time spent with the doctors, the amount of anxiety that you see in correlation to all that. So if it can be truncated in a significant number of people, it's important. If it can be delayed, it is important and relevant. And that's what you know, uh, preventive healthcare is all about. And here it gives an idea that yes, this girl's metabolic health is not on the road. It is derailed. We need to put it on the rails. 
I'll tell you, you know, uh, Rakesh, I'm sure you'll be seeing a lot of this in Hyderabad also. Many times I tell somebody, a girl of 16 comes with a pouch, a brahman and all that, you know, uh, uh, 70 kilos girl, and I tell mother, she looks a bit thickish. They, they refuse to accept that this is a pathological process. I said, her father should be 72. She is 74. Uh, and I saw a girl the other day studying in the 11th class, 124 kilos. One afternoon in my clinic, I was stunned. I saw eight girls, more than 90 kilos. I'm still like, you know, uh, uh, what sort of a, a life one is living, moving from doctor to doctor. <laughs> so that's why it's a window of opportunity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I guess, I guess what, you know, what you said, uh, it, it is very important. You know, somebody made a comment. We had a small webinar on this uh, PCOS uh, uh, Professor Jargar. And I had with me Dr. Usha Shiram and Shaila Sheikh. You remember, the, you know these two young. Oh, yeah, colleagues. I know them. So what happened? The comment were expressed, as you rightly said, the education about PCOS is very, very low. That's why you won't believe the comment was made by some, some other endocrinologists. You also know them. They said, sir, they all go to saloons. They don't come to us at all. You know, the, the awareness of PCOS in the country is very low. I, I think I will request you with Rakesh permission to tell to the audience, thousands have logged in at this time, Dr. Jargar, to you, to listen to you, Debjit and Nikhil, just, just in two minutes about the treatment. I mean, a little bit about lifestyle. Like that, everybody knows, and a little bit about the metformin and the spironolactone, a little bit about the, ov the ovulation induction, and whatever you want to say. Very, very briefly about the management. They have asked it on the, on the net, sir, some few lines about the management. Very simply, in a very short time. You see, understandably, you know, uh, if we look at herstism alone, you need an and androgen. And we have been using it liberally. Uh, spironolactone has been used for a long time. And many times, you know, before we push the patient to the cosmetologist, as you very rightly said, or to the electrolysis guy or a dermatologist more often, we invariably use suboptimal dose of uh, spironolactone. The 25 milligrams, you know, uh, and then uh, calling it a day. The dose is beyond 100 milligrams. If you want to give a real extensive to that 85 kilo uh, girl, um, alpha, this um, androgen blockade. Metformin, a lot of controversy is there, but nobody has controversy on metformin and polycystic ovarian syndrome. But not a minuscule dose of, we get stuck off with a minuscule dose of those 500 milligram tablets. Feel liberty after 18th birthday, give a full dose of metformin. And there's something that's going to have a long lasting effect. It might, you might start with a good metabolic memory right from that 18th birthday. But unfortunately, uh, many of us create timelines, uh, particularly the parents. Uh, how long does the need? She has been taking it for such a long, you know, for six months taking a, a tablet as if it's an antitubercular drug. Mm -hmm. So those timelines should not be given. It's a safe drug can be given for a long time. And uh, many times, you know, does help anovulation and uh, a lot of fertility could be helped. Dysglycemia could be helped. Clomiphene citrate. Uh, if it doesn't work, you know, that we have been routinely using for a lot, decades and decades and decades. And then, you know, a short of CG to help the ovulation. Somewhere in the middle of the cycle, timing it well, uh, when it is needed. And then different, and now, you know, people, two things have happened in Dr. Das in the recent times. You know, marriages are delayed quite a bit. You know, a person wants to do a PhD, a DM, and, uh, you know, wants to get a good job with Nikhil Tandon and by the time suddenly realizes he's 38. Now nothing is happening for the next 20 years. We are panicking. Now the way the reserve is getting lesser. So then, you know, you, you, you outly, you then short circuit it. Eh? And straight with said, no, no, just find out if she still has some over left behind before the panic sets in. She is almost in that preparatory for a perimenopausal state. And IVF has done wonderful things and people now get pregnant at any stage in life. We, we see regularly, uh, I saw the other day a lady who had got pregnant at the age of 46 and delivered a baby. Not that uh, she was desperate for it. She had already two girls. She wanted a boy and low blow, she got another one. And um, so uh, then, you know, the progressive depending on uh, what sort of uh, desperation you have. Somebody make a diagnosis at 25, you don't have had pregnancy till 26. 
comfortably metformin over a year or two add on to clomiphene and then slowly. Don't rush it through at that age. But you know, uh, panic sets in beyond 35th birthday and desperation after 40th birthday. Thank, so, you, thank you. Thank you, sir. You. Sir, I'll uh, quickly move on to Dr. Nikhil Tandon. Dr. Tripathi wants to make a comment. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so just a comment, uh, because, you know, I also for Dr. Tandon. So, you know, for both PCOS and uh, just some diabetes, insulin resistance plays a key role in, in pathogenesis, particularly PCOS. So, and the only drug that is available which targets insulin resistance is the thyroid pioglitazone. I know there's a lot of hesitancy on using We used to liberally in the US, although it's not recommended, not recommended by any ethnic society. So I don't understand why it should not be used, particularly if the patient not expecting for the child. Like low dose pioglitazone is very safe and targets insulin resistance and uh, will improve uh, triglyceride, SDL, and it will not lead to much weight gain if you use 15 milligram or maximum 30 milligram. So I don't know why it's not being used. And for Dr. Rendon also like, uh, for drug intervention, I know metformin was mentioned, but um, I think there was a study with the Tom Buchanan and uh, UCLA. He had done studies in the gestation diabetes and troglitazone and then pioglitazone. So are you planning an intervention with uh, thiazolidine diet? Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Tripathi, uh, uh, before uh, Nikhil responds, I did a program with DeFranzo uh, last month. Uh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and we knew that he has been a fan of- Yeah, I have a bias to pioglitazone too. Pyogalitazone, he comes from an institution. And I too, you know, I must tell you, yeah. when this pyogalitazone was banned in India, I was the first person who brought it to the notice of government of India. That is a good drug. It's a poor man's drug. It should be brought back. And it was brought back in less than a month. And uh, yes, I think, you know, we have been using it uh, quite a bit, right from its inception. But it became a victim of a quote unquote, uh, sponsored propaganda that it causes uh, very aggressive bladder cancers and other things. So there was some form of a media campaign some years back. Uh, so the industry certainly went scant with the formulations that they had been promoting for a decade or decade and a half. But I think many of us have no stuff. We are using it uh, liberally, uh, smallish doses. Uh, uh, and yes, you are right with some hesitancy. Uh, but it's a good molecule. It's an amazing insulin sensitizer. And uh, um, and I used it uh, in many people, uh, ladies with, you know, one doctor's uh, daughter. And uh, one day we'll give her, you know, pargolazone and metformin. And uh, she achieved ovulation within three months uh, and was pregnant in six. Uh, so, yes, we selectively use it. And uh, when you properly inform the people that you need to be a little bit careful. But you know, giving a drug that has a tendency uh, to put on weight in a person who already is obese, and at that age, when you're so you know concerned about the figure you have, particularly if you uh, are a Kashmiri girl who is infatuated with their looks, <laughs> because it'll be difficult. I Nikhil. think 15 milligram will be good. Uh, it won't cause yeah, much. They, <laughs> because uh, yeah, yeah, there's a trial in uh, yeah. The girls, we'll go to Nikhil. Nikhil. Yeah. So, so let me just respond to uh, Devdeet's uh, comment. Um, if you actually go back to the diabetes prevention program, there was a troglitazone arm. Right. Uh, if you actually go back and tease out the women with a prior history of gestational diabetes who were recruited as part of DPP, there were about 250 odd women. Interestingly, the number of years post the index pregnancy was about 10 or 11 years, which is, again, very, very different from what we are seeing out here. The rapidity of conversion from GDM to overt diabetes is tremendous. And, and, and this, again, became very stark when you compared women who are identified with Carpenter and Couston, where you did not segregate the so-called significant hyperglycemia. So, you know, and but even with IDPSG, when anything more than 126 fasting, anything more than 200 is no longer called GDM, it's called overt diabetes. Even in that, we're seeing very, very rapid conversion rate. So it's, it's, it's a slightly different and more aggressive progression, at least in South Asians. That's point number one. The second thing which is of interest, and while I totally agree with you about the critical role of, of, of insulin resistance, is that if you compare, and I'm moving away from GDM for a very brief moment, if you look at our own cohort data in terms of incident diabetes, and you compare our data with, let's say, the Pima data from the Gila River community, 
you will see that the contribution of beta cell failure is significantly more in a South Asian population compared to what was reported there. So at equivalent levels of BMI, the contribution of beta cell failure was much, much more. So it's a very interesting sort of basic observation that is not, you know, the, the insulin resistance story, which has been driven predominantly through the North American data, especially through the PIMA, may be only giving a part of the story in a South Asian context. I'm not saying insulin resistance is not important. Clearly, it is important. But I think the rate at which we seem to decline in beta cell function seems to be very, very different. So coming back to your question and, and sort of giving you a general response first, the way the study was conducted, Rakesh is a, has been you know a partner in crime, so to say. He was a very critical site for us during living, and he'll tell us tell you all the difficulties we faced. But the important point was that this was supposed to be an implementation science study. So we had to do an intervention which could be then taken up by a health system and not do a DPP style intervention in which you know you threw the kitchen sink at everybody. And that was the reason why we looked at a light touch. And unfortunately, it didn't work. We are planning on a pharmacological intervention. We're looking at that option. Metformin will remain one because metformin was part of DPP. Uh, but we're also concurrently looking at other agents, not necessarily insulin sensitizers. And I won't say more to that at this point in time, because that's you know still very active discussions going on there. The, the point is that, unfortunately, unlike 40-year-old pre-diabetics who are obese, 28-year-old uh, previous GDMs are not terribly enthusiastic about taking any medication. That's true. You know, because telling somebody who has no overt problem. And I, in a, in a parallel to what Dr. Zargar said, people are more concerned of what is afflicting them today and are not really interested in thinking about what may happen five or 10 years down the line. They're concerned about what's happening today. So it's going to be a challenge. We're looking at all of those things, but, but that is um, in response to what you said. And very quickly, I, you know, I think all of us use pyoglitazone. The only thing what has happened is possibly gone down instead of maybe a third line after, you know, when we were a resident with us, pyoglitazone was possibly third line. You know, SUs and metformin were first or second and first and uh, then pyo. I think pyo with the appearance of DPP-4 and SGLT-2 has possibly slipped to fifth line uh, for, for many of our practice. Uh, and that's the reality. Uh, there's with the buzz around and I think most of us have also capped it at 15 I don't think many of us go up to 30 anymore because of concerns of weight slightly different from a North American population where you know we're not so big to start with so uh, even a small amount of fluid retention actually translates into a more significant percentage body weight increase than it would in 100 kilograms uh, uh, you know big big North American person so there's my sort of general personal perspective on this. Um, thank you. What you, uh, Rakesh yeah. and Dr. Das. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the uh, excellent uh, and well-planned study the, which uh, spanned across three nations. And uh, I would like to ask you from, from this, uh, what are your, uh, I mean, what are your takes on, I mean, what could be the factors? What are the factors? I mean, you have rightly highlighted the weight as the important factor. Uh, and because in the study also, you looked at the those who lost weight versus those who did not lose weight. Could you tell us a few more factors which are important in, in saying that these are the women who are going to develop uh, develop diabetes? Yeah, so I think the first thing is, if you so just to put slightly a bit more perspective, the study included any woman who, in, who had GDM and when they were studied after delivery had either normal glucose tolerance or prediabetes. Very clearly, those who had prediabetes had a significant significantly higher incidence. And so if I was saying in, in, when they're limited resources and you have to focus on somebody, number one, I would ensure that more and more women go into a post-delivery GTT. In real life, it's possibly happening to 10 or 15% or 20%. You know, we're missing that out altogether. Then I would focus on women who have either impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance and, you know, devote my energies there. The NGT women also progress, but, you know, you can, you know, you can wait for them a little bit. But the pre-diabetes conversion rate is tremendous. It's, it's you know, a 20% over 16 or 18 months, which is an extremely high incident rate for diabetes. And as Dr. Zargar mentioned, listen, the average age of the, of the women who were participating in the study was 28 or 29. 
right? And if you compare prevalence of diabetes in this population compared to, let's say, in diab data, it's about ninefold higher. That is just a lot. The second thing is, of course, it depended on age. So the older the woman, the duration since their delivery. So, you know, if you if you recruited somebody later after the delivery, they were much more likely to have progress, which is easy to understand. And obviously, the more severe the hyperglycemia was, anybody who required pharmacological therapy, whether oral or insulin, were much, much more likely to have pro progressed to worse diabetes later. And of course, family history of diabetes comes into play. So I think it's sort of very logical and easy to understand uh, risk factors which are explaining the progression out here. Great. I think great answer. I just have one question to ask, uh, Nikhil. I, I don't know, we, we had proposed uh, that to this follow-up of the pregnant mothers to do immediately, maybe there are some studies that do immediately after second day of delivery and that matches to six weeks later. We had also suggested to twin it with their children, with their uh, uh, born children. Uh, is that happening? We had suggested in the ministry. So I'll tell you what really happens is um, um, the way I look at it. The first six months after delivery are really the toughest time, right? So even if, and I'm sorry, this is it's a personal view and it's a pragmatic view. Even if you get the information that they have abnormal glucose status, it is very difficult for the woman to start doing anything that you want them to do, right? At least in North India, there will be 500 older generation women in the family who say, ye nahi karo, laddu khilao, ye karo, wo karo. They will not be able to step out of the house for 40 days exercise, forget about it. They're not even getting sleep. So the way I look at it from a practical point of view, what you said, sir, is, is scientifically very appropriate. From a practical point of view, I would say, you know, even if you manage to delay the GTT for, you know, three, four, six months, it's all right. Because before that, even if you have an abnormal test, the mm -hmm. likelihood of them following your advice is remote. The vaccination part, sir, is again, I think we also thought exactly the same way that it should be done. The problem there is that very often women may go to a hospital for their delivery, but may go to a local pediatrician Vaccine. who's in the neighborhood for the vaccination. So it's not always possible for that person to arrange for the GTT. GTT. But if the health system takes over the responsibility, which means unfortunately only 30% or 25% of the population goes to a, to a government health system, you may be able to devise a post-pregnancy sort of uh, service. But at the moment, it really hasn't taken up. So. But, but, uh, but uh, on behalf of all of us, we congratulate you. Whatever you have done is, is revealing. You know, I had, I had seen the original Nobel Frankel's paper when he said the ideal ground for the experimentation of that. No, the, the numbers you have is really, you have half, you had 3,400, you have got 1,800 out of them. Great. I think, Rakesh, any other question you have? Otherwise, we'll close the session. I think we'll close the session, sir, in interest yes, of time. Yes. Thank the you. Pleasure. It is one of the, why I said heavyweight? It's not weight, it's heavy, but the, the intellectual discourse that we had today, this session, to my mind, one of the greatest sessions. I have no time, but I must tell you, that thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, okay. Abdul, you are my friend. I don't know what to tell you. But, you know, your presentation style, the storytelling, and the original data was great. As you thank know. you. Thank Nikhil, you so much. For you, I'll keep silent because I have no word put on record. My <laughs> appreciation, not only here, we meet very often. What all you were doing? You know, the other day he presented density control. Uh, so I will remain quiet here because I think the other session. But Nikhil, my sincere appreciation, my words fail to express my feelings and the gratitude. Dear friends, thank you very much. Big thank, hand you, you. thank you. Your friends, I just want to thank Devjit for accepting our invitation, Abdul Bhai for doing the job so nicely. And Nikhil, my friend, for taking all the trouble and yeah. presenting. And this and Rakesh for wonderful conduction. Okay. But one thing uh, is coming to my mind. Any city should have two, three, four sessions like this. And every session should be four hours, three hours like that. 
and it what a wonderful it. exchange of knowledge we have got the recording subject so, to uh, their activity or whatever the edit we can i mean i, I would like the discussions are really the best of part of the talk, session yeah. so thank you everybody also bhai to you, you. for untiring thank you. effort thank you thank you thank Dear, you so much uh, we have the last session last session of the day and you know happy bihu to arundhati arundhati can i see you the queen of asham arundhati was there i saw you yes sir i'm there uh, sir uh, happy bihu and uh, happy welcome dr mandal sir very sincere regards and greetings and happy bihu and abhay abhay has arrived abhay came little late from bombay uh, greetings to abhay and i have great pleasure it is independent lectures on very important aspects preventing the cv complications type 2 diabetes role of dpp4 plus sglt2 inhibitor translating science into practice the clinical perspective of gen 2.0 digital analogs and third one is the best <laughs> optimization moving towards a patient centric approach i hand over the session to professor pc das and dr philip rautrai and sorry for the late but sir it was beyond our control uh, um, for no my sense apologies but but you know it was a great session over to you uh, dr bishidas and philip dr bishidas to take over please thank you sir thank you for your kind words and uh, yeah as you have already told it is the last session i am having sore throat sir sorry so we are already one and a half hours late so without delay we will let us start with this session and uh, to all of us hello am i audible sir yes hello yes yes, yes. hello <clears throat> now as we have already discussed we know this is a very complex disease leading to different complications and there are different modes of uh, drugs which act in different uh, action and there are different combinations lot of uh, permutation and combination we have tried and we are practicing in our practice and, and these two novel drugs like gpp4 inhibitor and hglt2 inhibitor these have recently developed for last uh, decades and they have uh, wonderful they are wonderful molecules and having lot of benefits but combining these two how far it is beneficial for preventing the cv complications let's uh, listen from our speaker dr pius mandal over to dr pius mandal thank you uh, dr das uh, for your kind introduction and at first i want to express my thanks to dr kanun go for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk in this prestigious program now all of you uh, can you see my slides yes my slides are visible yeah yeah it is visible yeah. yes okay yeah. okay oh, now uh, all of you all... on this introduction slide uh, purno sir the introduction slide slides is not visible it's only the presenting slides are visible okay take it please continue dr okay. prof okay yeah yeah so uh... Um, we, we understand the global burden of type 2 diabetes at this point of time. Nearly eight crore type 2 diabetic persons are living in India. The important thing is that type 2 diabetes is associated with cardiovascular event. There is increased risk for cardiovascular event, increased risk for cardiovascular death, and all cause mortality. Not only that, uh, this heart failure is a very serious complication of type 2 diabetes. and large number of our type 2 diabetic patients nearly 50% of our type 2 diabetic they also suffer from kidney disease and when any type 2 diabetic patient suffers from kidney disease they are at increased risk for cardiovascular event or cause mortality and also heart failure so we want to prevent uh, this cardiovascular event and cardiovascular death so when we talk about the diabetes care we want to prevent the complication made with the uh, microvascular complications no there is a clear a uh, uh, good relation um, uh, of these microvascular complications with uh, good glycemic control but if you want to uh, reduce the cardiovascular event then we need to address cardiovascular risk factors as well so diabetes care means the prevention of complication and also to optimize the quality of life and also 
or improve, we want to improve the lifespan, reducing diabetes related uh, complications. Now, uh, this is the joint position statement by ESD and the American Diabetic Association. All of you have seen this thing. You know, when you talk about the glycemic, um, diabetes management, that means that we need to be more aggressive about this glycemic control. If we can achieve good glycemic control from the very early part of the disease, and if we can maintain this good glycemic control throughout the disease process, then definitely we can prevent diabetes-related complications, mainly microvascular complications and also to some extent macrovascular complications. So if you look at this new uh, guideline that emphasizes more on this aggressive management of this glycemic, we need to use more efficacious glucose-lowering drugs, CLP-1 receptors, uh, agonists, um, methamine, and combination of glucose-lowering drugs, insulin, and a combination of GLP-1 with uh, 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 with insulin and few minutes ago, you have heard about this dual uh, receptor agonist, the GLP-1 and GLP. Uh, so we need to use those uh, agents more and more so that we can achieve good glycemic control. So there is always there is a role of uh, combination uh, by, uh, therapy uh, uh, like this DPP-4 and SGLT-4. That will be helpful to achieve good glycemic control faster and uh, we can achieve better control, that would be uh, durable. And we also need to reduce the cardiorenal burden. We need to uh, protect, or protect our patient from cardiac uh, and also renal events. And uh, we need to um, pay more importance to weight reduction when someone can reduce a body weight. Uh, and we have heard lots of things from our previous uh, session. And that's what is the importance of uh, reducing body weight. If someone can reduce the body weight, that will be helpful uh, in achieving good glycemic control. And that will also reduce the cardiovascular risk factor. Diabetes is often associated with cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension and dyslipidemia and smoking. And there are other cardiovascular risk factors like albuminuria and chronic kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease. Now, uh, we need to address these cardiovascular risk factors too if we want to prevent cardiovascular events. Now, uh, is, uh, regarding these cardiovascular risk factors, there are the huge evidence that if you can address these uh, cardiovascular risk factors, then we can reduce the burden of cardiovascular events. And, uh, and we can reduce this cardiovascular burden if we uh, simultaneously uh, address these cardiovascular risk factors and that will be a great achievement in for our type 2 diabetic patients. Again, I'm telling you that when any type 2 diabetic patients suffer from kidney disease, there's increased risk for heart failure and cardiovascular disease. So yeah, you have seen this slide several times that the ominous of it. And there are multiple pathophysiological factors that are responsible for type 2 diabetes. So if we use more than one agent, that will add this more than patho more than one pathophysiological factors. And uh, and uh, what we can reach the target if we want to see gold sooner, and uh, and that would be uh, better. So in the market, uh, uh, in India market, there are the many uh, combination of uh, glucose lowering that fixed dose combination. This definitely those are very much helpful um, in terms of compliance and adherence, and also in terms of cost. That um, I'm going to talk on this uh, DPP four inhibitor and SGLT two inhibitor combination. The interesting thing is that there is no metformin in this combination. So um, uh, I would prefer always uh, that uh, this combi the, the, the use of this combination, DPP-4 inhibitor and SGLT2 inhibitors along with metformin, unless there is contraindication of using metformin or it, it, the, unless the patient is intolerant to metformin. Now, what are the benefits? Uh, definitely, if you use these two molecules uh, at the same time, then there will be the better uh, uh, improvement of the glycemic control. Let's see the all of you know the SCLT2 inhibitors, they induce the glycosuria, that with there with the loss of body weight and loss of systolic blood pressure. And uh, with the reduction of the body weight, uh, that will be the improvement of the insulin resistance. And also we know that uh, when there is a loss of body weight, that actually improves the sensitivity of the beta cells. But uh, uh, important thing is that uh, with the use of the SCLT2 inhibitor, what we found that there's the increased secretion of glucagon. 
And if you use the DPP4 inhibitor, DPP4 inhibitor itself is not the very potent glucose lowering agent, but DPP4 inhibitor uh, increases the in, uh, this endogenous um, uh, GLP1 level that actually stimulates the beta cell secretory insulin and suppresses the glucagon. This is the important thing. If you use these two, then uh, this effect, uh, the increased glucagon by cell will be mitigated by this uh, lowering of the glucagon by DPP4. And uh, SGLT2 inhibitor is the body weight, whereas the DPP4 is very much weight neutral. And uh, DPP4 inhibitors, uh, when you talk about the DPP4 inhibitors, uh, 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 the tolerability is very, very good. They are very much well tolerated. That's the very good thing at the DPP4 inhibitor. Now, as I mentioned that uh, uh, type 2 diabetes is associated with increases for cardiovascular disease. Uh, uh, there, is already, there, is, there is increased risk for us atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, there's the coronary heart disease, uh, the cerebrovascular disease and peripheral artery disease. The atherosclerotic process in diabetes is very much virulent, accelerated and very much diffuse. And uh, we know, all of us know that um, almost two thirds of type two diabetic cases, they die from the cardiovascular uh, event. So we need to reduce this cardiovascular event in our type 2 diabetic patients. The important thing is that type 1 and type 2 diabetes both are the risk factor for heart failure. We learned uh, this uh, fact of, uh, nearly 50 years ago or after the Framingham uh, study, uh, heart Framingham heart study, which uh, showed that there's a very strong relation uh, with diabetes, uh, between this diabetes to the heart failure there's increased risk of heart failure by two to five folds in men and women respectively. Now, uh, this is the one study uh, from uh, Denmark and which included that uh, uh, nearly 150,000 newly diagnosed type two diabetic patients. And they looked at the effect of this development of the heart failure on the mortality. Uh, compared to other cardiovascular disease like uh, ischemic heart disease, peripheral artery disease, and stroke, and also the chronic kidney disease. But uh, uh, they, they found that uh, with the development of heart failure, there was the increased risk for um, death, uh, maybe relative or absolute risk of death is increased, and that decreased the lifespan. And I want to tell you that diabetes itself is the uh, worst prognostic factor for uh, heart failure. And, uh, uh, and this large number of these heart failure patients, they die suddenly. Uh, and, and all of you know that type 2 diabetes uh, uh, is associated uh, or the heart in a subject who suffers from diabetes and heart failure, there is increased uh, risk for uh, readmission in hospital for heart failure. Heart failure, yes, we know uh, that uh, type 2 diabetes is uh, associated with the heart failure that may be again uh, heart failure with preserved rejection fraction or the, or, or the reduced rejection fraction. Uh, nearly 50% of type 2 diabetic uh, patients with heart failure they suffer from heart failure with preserved rejection fraction. And for many uh, of uh, this heart failure with the or heart failure with PGR projection fraction uh, may have underlying hypertension. Um, but uh, here I want to mention uh, this both of this heart failure with PGR projection fraction and reduction fraction may be associated with underlying atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. But definitely myocardial infarction is the risk factor for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And uh, and many uh, times we find that uh, without this uh, hypertension or underlying coronary artery disease, patients uh, may have a heart failure. And uh, this is mainly due to the microvascular disease and what we call the uh, what we call uh, diabetes cardiomyopathy. There are many uh, factors which are responsible for uh, this uh, development of heart failure in these um, patients. Uh, and these are the increased oxidative stress, uh, chronic inflammation, and um, the impairment of uh, insulin signaling pathway, and also the formation of advanced glycation end product, and also uh, impairment of the mitochondrial function, glucotoxicity, lipotoxicity, 
impairment of these um, uh, uh, gluco uh, the cardioprotective and cardio uh, reparative uh, process. So these are responsible uh, for um, the heart failure, the type two diabetic patients, and uh, uh, and uh, when you talk about this heart failure, uh, you, you can see here this uh, when the subject suffers from the heart failure. Uh, the group, this glycemic control is also uh, deteriorates due to several factors due to the uh, increased sympathetic uh, activity and uh, and secretion of more cytokines, sedentary lifestyle, and due to few drugs like diuretics. And uh, we can uh, see here that uh, type 2 diabetes uh, and 40 percent of type 2 diabetes. And diabetic patients they suffer from some degree of uh, kidney disease. Um, in from India, we have data that fifty percent nearly suffer from chronic diabetic kidney disease, may be in the form of albuminuria or uh, or reduced CGFR or both. Now, why I'm talking about all uh, this uh, kidney disease because there's a very common uh, coexistence of heart failure and CKD both in diabetic and the non-diabetic patients. And there is a very uh, 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 multi, uh, interaction, very much interaction of this heart failure with the CKD and uh, that is the multifactorial. Uh, and when any patient suffers from the CKD, then that actually causes the deterioration of the heart failure. Any patient who suffers from the heart failure, that causes the deterioration of uh, chronic kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease. Then it means the insult of one organ may be in the renal cortex or the myocardium uh, that actually influences the uh, uh, function of other organs and causes the um, aggravation of the disease pro process. When both of these heart failure and the CKD uh, exist in the same patient, there is um, increased risk for mortality. And if you see here. Uh, uh, that 63 percent of heart failure patients have renal impairment and three times more risk of heart failure in patients of CKD as compared to the non-CKD individuals. So with the progression of uh, heart failure, there is the progression of the kidney disease and vice versa. When there's the progression of the kidney disease, there is the increase, uh, uh, there is the uh, progression of the heart failure, the deterioration of heart failure, I must say, and that can cause um, uh, death. Uh, and uh, there is a clear cut evidence that any molecule which improves uh, the heart failure will also improve the renal outcome. Any molecule which improves the renal disease progression, um, that will also uh, will have beneficial effect on the heart failure. Now, uh, there is a recent publication. Um, uh, this recent meta-analysis, so we showed the SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the uh, heart failure hospitalization, all-cause mortality, and all-cause and the CV mortality in uh, patients uh, with or without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So uh, this is the uh, joint position statement for management of hyperglycemia. Um, so here's the clear cut mention about this risk reduction for the cardiorenal uh, disease and if someone uh, has the underlying atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or risk factor for the cardio cardiovascular disease, then uh, we need to prescribe SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP1 receptor uh, agonist. And anyone who suffers from heart failure uh, or the documented that has the documented uh, um, uh, heart failure with PWSL fraction or reduced ejection fraction. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, then uh, SGLT2 inhibitors with proven uh, benefit uh, uh, is the treatment of choice as a glucose lowering agent. And any patient whose EGFR is below 60 and who has the proteinuria uh, should receive uh, this SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, if the SGLT2 inhibitor is the contraindicated or the patient cannot tolerate, the GLP1 receptor agonist should be the choice. Um, who is uh, proved in the outcome trial to reduce the cardiovascular uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, uh, and, and there is also, I, as I mentioned, 
uh, we need to be a bit more aggressive in reducing uh, this glycemic, uh, improving the glycemic control. And uh, here you can see the, uh, there's a strong advice again the weight reduction, and uh, and we need to prescribe those agents which can reduce the body weight, uh, like the GLP-1 receptor agonists, particularly these semaglutide, or as a few uh, minutes ago, you have heard about uh, this uh, dual GLP-1 and GIP receptor agonists. Now, what is the role of the sodium glucose cotransmitter inhibitor uh, and the DPP-4 inhibitor? Uh, so these are the outcome uh, trials of, uh, of this SCLT2 inhibitors. The empiric canvas, and you can see the declared TIMI, and this is the credence, and this is the uh, DAPA CKD, this is the, uh, the Bharti CV, and there are also uh, here the uh, heart failure outcome trials, the SCLT2 inhibitors. The basic thing is that uh, uh, all the CBOT uh, trials with SCLT2 inhibitors clearly showed the benefit uh, of uh, hospitalization heart failure. and uh, and if we look at here, then we'll find this, uh, all these uh, SCLT2 inhibitors also improve the renal outcome. And similarly, uh, the renal outcome, this slide didn't include the um, uh, uh, MPA kidney outcome trial, but if you look at this credence and also the DEPA CKD, uh, you will realize that uh, all this, uh, with the improvement of this uh, renal outcome, there is also improvement in the uh, cardiovascular outcome. And this uh, SCLT2 inhibitor, sempagliflozin and dapagliflozin, clearly showed their beneficial effect in both in diabetic and non diabetic patients with preserved ejection fraction and also in the reduced ejection fraction. And, uh, and when well, there was, the, if you look at uh, this, uh, if you look at this uh, 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 worse, this worsening nephropathy, you will appreciate that with the improvement of the heart failure outcome, there is also improvement of the renal outcome. So any molecule, as I'm telling you, that any molecule which improves the heart failure outcome also have the impact on the renal outcome. And any molecule which improves the renal outcome also have the uh, beneficial effect on the cardiovascular uh, outcome and SCLT2 inhibitors is one of them uh, that improves this heart failure outcome as this, uh, and, uh, and when we use in the CKD uh, patient that also improve the uh, progression of the renal disease and also improves the uh, cardiovascular outcome. Deliver and remember phase up uh, these two uh, outcome trials included the patients with the PISA rejection fraction. And again, there's a uh, benefit uh, in the primary outcome, which was the composite of uh, cardiovascular data the, with the hospitalization for uh, heart failure. And um, both of this molecule, the, the dapagliflozin and empagliflozin was very much effective. And this is this this table shows the uh, CBOT trials or the DPP4 inhibitors. The important thing is that DPP4 inhibitors are very much uh, uh, neutral uh, uh, with regard to the cardiovascular risk reduction. But one important thing is that uh, in uh, this outcome trial, the saxagliptin actually uh, increased the risk for hospitalization of uh, heart failure. Uh, just a minute. Uh, here you can see uh, this, um, there's the increased heart failure and also the examined trial allogriptin also increased the risk for heart failure, uh, but that was not statistically significant, but linagliptin, sitagliptin uh, in their CVOT uh, didn't show any increased risk for hospitalization for heart failure. They were very much uh, neutral. Now, uh, when you talk about this SCLT2 and DPP4 inhibitors combination, we also need to know about the efficacy and also the safety. This review actually included um, uh, trials uh, which compared the SCLT2 DPP4 uh, with, uh, with DPP4, SCLT DPP4 with the SCLT2 inhibitor, and also 
uh, also the both, uh, and that included uh, this. Uh, Eight tiles, uh, which uh, we compared this SCLT2 inhibitor, DPP4, DPP4 inhibitor, SCLT2, and three tiles with this, five tiles with SCLT2 inhibitor and DPP4 inhibitors with SCLT2 inhibitors, and three tiles compared to both. And the interesting finding was that um, SCLT2 inhibitor uh, with DPP4 inhibitor, this combination uh, reduced the uh, SB1C. Uh, compared to DPP4 or SCLT2 inhibitor. But the interesting thing is that when a, a SCLT2 inhibitor was added to DPP4 inhibitor, there's a more HB1C reduction, but that didn't happen uh, when um, uh, DPP4 inhibitor was uh, added to SCLT2 inhibitor. And this was also true for the weight reduction. And, and there is not much concern about these safety issues. And uh, there is some evidence that uh, when this DPP4 inhibitors is used with SCLT2 inhibitors, that can reduce the risk for uh, uh, these uh, urinary tract infection, G uh, GTI, uh, genital, uh, genital urinary tract infection. Now, uh, uh, in the Indian market, we have a few um, these combinations, the empagliflozin, dinagliptin, dapagliflozin, saxagliptin, and um, and remogliflozin, remogliflozin, vildagliptin, dapa vilda, and the dapa ceta. The interesting thing is that we don't have any outcome trial with the vildagliptin, but we have a huge uh, clinical, a huge evidence from real study that vildagliptin is very much cheap. It doesn't increase the cardiovascular um, uh, risk for the cardiovascular event, or it uh, is not associated with increased risk for heart failure. Uh, what we gather from the real world study. And uh, if you look at here, this dapagliflozin and saxagliptin, uh, uh, I probably, I will not prefer to use this combination in a patient uh, who has history of heart failure because uh, the sabotimi, this the trial really showed that increased risk for hospitalization and heart failure with this uh, saxagliptin. Probably I will prefer to use other combination, empalina or, uh, or the, uh, or the uh, dapagliflozin with citagliptin maybe. And uh, we can use, of course, the uh, dapagliflozin and the vildagliptin, uh, as I have mentioned, though we don't have any uh, designated um, uh, uh, CVOT trial with the vildagliptin or any heart failure with the vildagliptin, uh, but we can use that. Now, uh, definitely uh, one important thing is that uh, decision making where to use this SCLT2 inhibitor and GPP4. Of course, uh, uh, when the patient is not uh, tolerant, when the patient is intolerant to metformin, or uh, when the metformin is contraindicated, then the SGLT2 inhibitor DPP4, or we can use uh, this uh, uh, combination uh, when the patient cannot reach to the target HB1C goal uh, with metformin and uh, to reduce the CB risk, including the heart failure. Uh, uh, if, uh, if the patient has underlying atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or if uh, there is a risk factors for cardiovascular disease, then we should use uh, this SCLT2 inhibitors uh, along, uh, we can uh, use GLP-1 receptor agonist, um, uh, and um, there's a very good choice if you use the SCLT2 inhibitors to so the GLP-1 receptor uh, agonist. But DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, uh, when we talk about this DPP-4 inhibitors combined with the SCLT2 inhibitors, we need to look at that which are the safe molecules DPP-4 is inhibitors with proven CB and heart failure safety, such as the linagliptin and citagliptin have shown a favorable CB safety profile, including the non increases for hospitalization due to heart failure in the CBOT trials. I've already mentioned that. And uh, regarding the CKD, uh, uh, we this is the uh, this is not this is the slide older slide where we can use this SCLT2 inhibitors. Uh, in patients with EGFR 20 milliliter per minute, and once it is started, uh, we should not be stopped uh, unless the patient goes into uh, for renal transplantation or, or, or dialysis. Regarding the DPP-4 inhibitors, 
with the uh, with the progression of this renal disease, we need to uh, reduce the need to reduce the dose of DPP four inhibitors except linagliptin. So uh, uh, we need to remember that, uh, and uh, we should use the DPP four with a proven renal safety uh, like linagliptin, or you can also use the cetaglitin. I think all these DPP four inhibitors are very much safe in a type two diabetic patients. They uh, they uh, don't increase the risk for cardiovascular event or increase the risk for heart failure. Uh, only the except the saxagliptin. Only thing we need to remember: they need to reduce the dose uh, adjustment with the uh, with the progression of this renal uh, disease. A very important thing is that so when we use this combination, uh, there is a very minimum chance of hypoglycemia, and and we know clearly that uh, hypoglycemia is the independent risk factor for cardiovascular event. So the combination of these SCLT2 inhibitors and DPP4 inhibitors will uh, definitely reduce the risk for hypoglycemia compared to sulfonylurea with metformin. And another important thing is I want to mention this the SGLT2 inhibitors mainly uh, 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 SGLT2 inhibitors that reduces the fasting and postprandial blood glucose, whereas the DPP4 inhibitors mainly uh, reduces the postprandial glycemic uh, uh, postprandial blood glucose level, but uh, both of these uh, molecules, uh, they reduce the glycemic variability, which is again the important risk factor for cardiovascular event. So whenever we are using these uh, two molecules, mm -hmm. there is a very uh, less chance of glycemic variability, and there is a um, patient may um, patient's uh, time in days uh, will improve. And there are evidences that DPP-4 inhibitors when used with the sulfonylurea and, uh, and, and uh, the insulin, uh, with the insulin that is uh, lower risk of hypoglycemia and that is mediated through GIP. Uh, thank you. I, I'll, I'll stop it here. And uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandel. Uh, from the city of joy and uh, with a great experience and you have given us this new combination and and shown the cardiovascular being the number one complications how this combination the pp4 with the zilt2 does a great job we'll come back to discussion i will hand over to the chairpersons uh, dr pishidas and dr uh, philip rautrai uh, before that i have a very pleasant job to perform may may I kindly invite dr ak birmani ak birmani sir is 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 the uh, physician from the city of Jamshedpur, Anil? Anil Anil will be the moderator for the discussion. Anil, are you there? Anil, he'll be here. And uh, dear friends, I hand over the session to the chairpersons to call the second speaker. Philip, you can call the second speaker. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Mandal. Thank you very much for your uh, nice elaboration on the topic. So as we move to the last session of this wonderful meeting, so I must, first of all, I must thank Dr. Alok Panunga, sir, for organizing such a, you know, academic, two days academic fiesta, extravaganza. And also I must uh, thank the organizing committee, Dr. Ashok Madhas, sir, and Dr. Jayant Pandas, sir, for this beautifully organized meeting. So as we know, uh, we all know the role of insulin as a cornerstone in the management of diabetes, be it type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. We all know its importance and also the importance of basal insulin. Now we have the generation, second generation basal insulin and how it is better in terms of both its efficacy in terms of lower incidence of hypoglycemia or increasing in the time in range. And most importantly, how we can translate these uh, advantages in our clinical practice. May I now call up on uh, respected Dr. Arundhati Dasgupta, ma'am, uh, who is a senior consultant endocrinologist, director of Rudraksha Superficial Care Celebrity. He is a, a recipient of many awards like A.B. Gandhi Award, Diabetes Awareness Initiative Awards. Uh, he has several national and international publications to her credit and author also of several chapters in many books. Welcome, Dr. Arundhati Dasgupta, ma'am. Thank you so much. Sure. And Dr. Arundhati carried in herself a great warmth and one of the most, most sought after speakers. I mean, not, not because uh, I must tell you that 
her talks are mm-hmm. absolutely exemplary and she's a great friend of ours and established she belongs to second batch of guwahati dm am i correct uh, on the second batch second batch of what a very young and has contributed immensely and here diction delivery and the content are fabulous over to arundhati thank you so much sir so that for that very very warm welcome i do not know whether i deserve all of that or not uh, but uh, since we are running short of time i'll try to kind of um, keep this brief we'll basically be discussing about translating science to how do you take your time we must have prepared we have dr abhay shaw after you that's all abhay that will finish okay, thank sir. you and thousands have logged in to listen okay, okay. so uh, basically the what i have been given is translating science to practice and what are the clinical perspectives of generation 2 basal insulin uh, when you're talking about translating science to practice that's in, that's a very you know it's just these are just four words but these are very important words because there is so much that we have evolved in terms of the science of the treatment of diabetes but, but whether that has translated from the books or the knowledge or the web to our clinical practice our day to day practice is something that we know that it has not really happened the way that it should have the lacune between science and practice still exists to a large extent and that is the gap that we will try to kind of cover up and narrow down it, the the basic purpose of all these meetings is basically to narrow down the gap between science and practice and today i'll be talking about generation 2 basal insulin now these are uh, aspects of insulin therapy that we are all aware of but at the same time i i feel and i guess all my seniors would agree and juniors also will agree that these are points that need to be reiterated in our minds again and again and again because uh, the impact of delayed insulin initiation is immense in in the uh, total outcome of the diabetes treatment and we are talking uh, day in day about about the timely initiation of basal insulin but it's not happening and today what we'll try to take a look at is basically these two aspects along with um when you're talking about generation to basal insulin is there any particular benefit that we are offering uh, to our patients if so is it you know is the cost benefit ratio good enough is it worthwhile to think of um, initiating generation to uh, basal insulin instead of one and what are the practical considerations for the use of generation to basal insulin talking about the impact of delayed insulin initiation now uh, we are aware that there has been a, la- a trial which is known as a landmark trial and a lot of uh, doctors from across uh, the country 382 sites actually have been a part of this uh, study which was a it was a large scale it was a longitudinal prospective real world study and the uh, con- the basic intention of the study was to investigate the management of the complications in type 2 diabetes across India. over a period of 3 years now as you can see there what were the basic uh, your, your slides are not moving my slides are not moving can you not no, see no no yes no now it is come oh, oh oh okay can you see this now the landmark mm-hmm. yes yes and the next no oh maybe ma'am in full screen mode it's not moving okay so what i'll do is i'll keep it this way so that will be easier uh, i hope i it's they are visible now so uh, this is uh, the landmark and this is these are the highlights that came out from uh, this study very disappointing statistics actually that four out of five people in india who have type 2 diabetes have uncontrolled diabetes right secondly <laughs> is then one in four indians with established type 2 diabetes take insulin and i think every one of us know how that you know i would i would in fact assume that the numbers would be higher because it is so very difficult to convince people to take insulin and the third point is basically a point which has an onus on us doctors the treating physicians that the average age we one see at which insulin is initiated is 9.2% so we cannot put all the blame on the patients because here is where our action starts unless the age we one see goes really high Or, or you know a lot of molecules have been used up and still we're not reaching results many of the doctors will not even think of initiating insulin delayed insulin we have known about uh, this but again i would want to reiterate generally there is a significant delay from where insulin is needed 
to where insulin is used. So you can see, uh, you know, the, the time from the start of regimen to intensification also. So from one OAD to two OADs and three OADs. So not only are we initiating insulin in a delayed manner, we're also intensifying insulin much slowly or much less aggressively than we need to do. And as a result, the implications are on a bad metabolic memory. Right, a bad metabolic memory leads to all of it. We we know the oxidative stress, the the uh, you know the uh, advanced glycosylation end products, the all the uh, all the protein, the collagen linking, all of it leading to ultimately to the chronic diabetes complications. And that is why, in spite of all our knowledge that we have about insulin today, in spite of all our knowledge that we have about diabetes control, Hb one C tightening, we are still at very poor figures when it comes to chronic diabetes complications. And that is where we really need to take a hold on things and start off insulin from the point that we think that insulin is needed and not allow it like another six months or another six months and so on. So these are the drawbacks of the delayed insulin initiation uh, in terms of microvascular complications, in terms of macrovascular complications, the drawbacks are immense and they are kind of moving forward in a categoric manner. Now, when we're talking about initiation of insulin, uh, basal insulin is what is recommended in most of the guidelines. Uh, it would depend which kind of insulin you are initiating, but a lot of times initiation with basal insulin with maybe an titration of the OAD or an adjustment of the OAD often does the trick because we have had the concept of treat the fixing the fasting first and then going on to the basal depending of course again on the the fasting and the pp uh, you know levels of um, at that point this is about the early initiation of insulin which significantly has an effect on the metabolic control and we've known it all along from the ukpds uh, you know study onwards we've known that the the concept of metabolic memory and how insulin significantly changes that and this is one slide that is shown at least at least 10 times in every I think conference which is telling us about the importance of the uh, aggressive intervention and how you know we should start off with the aggressive treatment from the very word go now when we're talking about an early basal insulin initiation this is the be smart technique we're talking about the basal early strategies to maximum hb1c reduction with both oral therapy so that's bot the basal and oral therapy combined together it is a convenient in insulin uh, in you know regimen it's a, it's a convenient it's an effective regimen of course uh, you could choose your doses depending on the fasting level depending on the body weight depending on your clinical discretion but generally this is what is said that you could start off with 0.1 or 0.2 units per kg per day depending on the degree of hyperglycemia or flatly at 10 units but that is something that we generally do not do we kind of you know decide the dose based on the sugar level that the patient has and the body weight of the patient um you could decide to inject the basal insulin either at night, which is usual protocol that is followed, but you could also start it, give it in the morning, because now that we have so many, um, you know, options available with more flexible insulin, with insulin that are more broad based, that act over a much flatter insulin. So we could, uh, we can decide on our, uh, you know, dosing timings according to the convenience of the patient. Flexibility of timing is one thing that has really, really helped us. Uh, convince patients, convinced ourselves and adjust the dose and made it much more simple for use, less intrusive. The very concept of, you know, that that insulin is cumbersome. I, ha I have to take it 20 minutes prior or after, you know, whatever we had, the problems that we had earlier on, or there were certain timings that you needed to, uh, you know, con confirm to that those have kind of gone out and we are when we're telling our patients that it's okay you can take it at any time it's all right even if you forget it at that particular time you can take it an hour later or two hours later or earlier and that really helps them in kind of accepting insulin better and helps us in putting insulin in place at earlier now if you have decided to initiate basal insulin what do you do with the other OEDs? Uh, metformin obviously can be con continued if there are no specific contraindications. The newer uh, therapies, the SGLT2 inhibitors, the incretin based therapies can very well be continued. If the patient is on thiazolidine dance, there would be a concern about increased body weight. So uh, probably the concomitant use of uh, thiazolidine dance and insulin is not really a combination that we kind of encourage a lot. It can be given at times. It's not that it cannot be given, but preferably because of the body weight and other um, factors, the bigly demand, the others that, that are there, that should be reduced or discontinued in favor of other 
molecules. What a lot of people uh, say is that if you're initiating uh, uh, an insulin, you stop the sulfonylureas. But a lot of times you cannot really do that because sulfonylureas are potent agents by themselves. Now, if you take away the sulfonylureas and you're putting only a basil and you're taking away the sulfonylurea in the morning, that might kind of actually lead to you know poorer glycemic control. So maybe you, you, you what you should do is uh, decide based on that individual patient's um, you know condition, but you could reduce the use of uh, the dosage of the sulfonylurea if uh, there is a concern about hypoglycemia. What are the benefits of early basal supported oral therapy? Not when all, you know, three groups, four groups have been used and there is nothing else to give. And then you're telling the patient that, okay, I've, I've kind of exhausted all my treatment. This is what I can give you. Not then. When you have used maybe one or two drugs and you think there is a scope of using a third drug, but you, you choose to prefer a basal uh, therapy there. That is where you are basically providing the patient with the chance of restoring some of the residual beta cell function over a short period of time. You could decide to use that for a short period or for a longer period. And of course, you know about the attenuation of the microvascular complications and, uh, you know, the with, with a lower risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain, which have been major concerns with the use of insulin. With the uh, advent of basal therapy, that has gone down a lot. And today, when we are talking about the next generation, the way forward with basal insulin, the generation two basal insulin, there we are talking of added benefits. Now, what are the generation two basal insulins? There are two, there is largely 300 and there's the Degludic. The basic concept is that these are, you know, basal insulins that have come a lot after the, you know, the initial basal insulins were introduced. Remember, NPH came in 1946 and it took so many years till 1992 Till for a basal insulin to come in. And then you had glargine and then you had detimer. By 2010, we had degludic, which was a new concept. We are talking about less variability, more pro prolonged action, a flatter curve. And then we had glargine 300 in 2011. So this, these two molecules, the degludic and the glargine 300, are actually a way forward that have been developed to overcome the limitations of the generation one uh, basal insulin. So if you're talking about glargine 100 and glargine 300, basically what is the difference? The same molecule, which has been kind of condensed, um, the molecular structure is the same. The uh, It just forms precipitates and the metabolism is such that because it is forming a precipitate, it is released slowly and thereby it acts for a longer duration of action. And there are no major peaks. It is, it is much, much flatter as compared to the glargine 100. So the absorption kinetics is what is basically different with a more gradual release with glargine 300 as compared to glargine 100. So what does that result in? When you're looking at the PKPD profile, of these patients and you're comparing glargine 100 with glargine 300, there is basically a stable and prolonged action with the, which offers you an injection timing flexibility of plus minus three hours. So you know, earlier on we were saying 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. So now what are we saying? We are saying you can give it at 7 p.m. You could give it at 10 p.m. You can go ahead and give it at 12 p.m. So that greatly enhances the flexibility of the, you know, of the of the insulin for the patient and makes it much easier for them to take your offered insulin in their day-to-day -day life. So, and when it comes to what are the benefits that we are talking about, why, apart from that flatter profile, what is it? Are you are we seeing benefits in terms of weight gain? Because flatter profile basically will translate into lower hypoglycemia. That is what is expected. So are we seeing that in our in our studies? Are we seeing that in the real world evidence? So what have we seen? Yes, sustainable HB1C reduction, much lower hypoglycemia. And weight gain was also seen to be much less. Now, there have been a number of studies that have been done across with the different generation two, with the generation one, which, uh, you know, there have been the benign trials and there have been the addition trials where glargine 300 and degludic have been compared to glargine 100 with much lesser incidence of hypoglycemia, as you can see. I'll just briefly touch upon the spe special population areas here because uh, these are also areas that you would want to know that, am I offering any benefit if I'm giving uh, a generation two in, in place of a generation one? So first of all, the, the CVD uh, you know, uh, population, uh, population which is at a higher risk of CVD or has CVD, 
Now, what was said that because Glargine 100 has established the CV safety, there is no reason, the regulatory body said that there is no reason to carry out another CV safety trial with Glargine 300. But having said that, there has been um, a, a look at or a re-look at some of the, uh, the data that is uh, you know, there where we have compared Glargine 100 and Glargine 300. And it has been seen that the second generation analogs are safe and effective and lesser hypoglycemia in general and nocturnal would translate into a CV safety benefit. Obesity, we must remember that both the addition and the begin pivotal trials had obesity because the average BMI was 34.8 in the addition and 30.1 for in the begin trials. And there were no concerns with the use of the second generation basal insulin in these populations with type 2 diabetes and obesity. In hospital patients, would you prefer a generation one or a generation two? Now, there have been a few published studies which have compared, you know, the insulin initiation with the second generation versus the first generation. And though the general hypoglycemia did not really differ in these in-hospital patients, the frequency of nocturnal hypoglycemia was significantly lower in the 300 group as compared to the 100 group. Now, there have been concerns about hypoglycemia and the use of deglutic, though a real-world study did find that, you know, uh, somewhat higher incidence of hypoglycemia with Degludic versus Glargine 300. And they hypothesized that, you know, it was a serum albumin level which was responsible for this because they found a negative correlation between a 24-hour hypoglycemia and the serum albumin level. And thereby, it has been said that if a patient has a low serum albumin level, and that has been corroborated by another study by Kawaguchi, that the mean percentage of time with hypoglycemia would be expected to be lower in those with Glargine 300 as compared to IDEC. But then again, we must remember, these are small studies, but these have been hypotheses that have been put forward. Another area which we might th not think to be very important, but is very important for the patient, of course, is the, is the pain that is associated with, uh, you know, the injection. Now, because these are one step ahead, the pens are also better. They are, the pens are such that they are easier to use and patients have reported lesser force to inject or, you know, lesser pain, ease of use. These are, fact, you know, the points taken from the patient's perspective. He's not understanding this flutter curve and all these things. He's understanding my flexibility of use. He's understanding lesser pain. He's understanding, okay, you know, um, you know, lesser hypoglycemia. He's understanding lesser weight gain when you're telling him. So these are points from the patient's point of view. And all in all, thereby, where we stand today with the availability of the generation two basal insulin, uh, definitely a lot of advantages being put forward by the studies, initial study, studies, the pivotal studies, and then subsequent studies, and the, now the real world data. If longer duration of action, greater flexibility, glycemic variability. We've recently had the in-range study, which has shown us the reduced glycemic variability with the use of basal uh, generation two insulin, easily titratable lesser hypoglycemia, leading to more patient satisfaction and, you know, lesser concerns about weight gain. Some practical considerations, what is the initiation dose? Again, I'll say this is, this is very, very individualized, but it has been put forward as 0.2 units per kg. Preferred timing of injection, any time of the day, but, you know, at around the same time, not like today you've taken in the morning and the, the next day you've taken at night. All eight OADs can be continued can be safely titrated maybe once in three days or with weekly titration schedules, as we've done with the generation one. And up to what dose would you go up with Glargine 300? Up to 0.5 units per kg per day has been put forward. And what are the advantages with over the first generation? Obviously, the ones that we've discussed, you know, variability, flexibility, hypoglycemia, um, weight gain, and safer titration. This is one uh, yes, I slide that I got from one of the you know, you know, company people, because this seems important because when they told me that, you know, this is associated with lesser pain, I had to understand why is it associated with lesser pain. And so this is what they gave me that, okay, this is a five second hold time, which is less, less injection force, easy to use. Apparently we are also getting patient data telling us that, yes, this is indeed a, an easier insulin to use when it uh, comes to uh, their compliance and their, you know, uh, and these are dedicated cartridges and other things, the total capacity being 450. So summarizing what we have discussed is that uh, early insulin initiation again and again is, is important to understand, is crucial to achieve effective glycemic control and delay may 
risk uh, may increase the risk of uh, complications. So today we have the options about generation one and generation two basal insulins to start off as basal therapy. Generation two basal insulins uh, that have come across have demonstrated you know good glycemic reduction uh, are convenient with a lot of advantages that we have discussed and therefore today remain a good choice when you are starting off insulin. For your patient, for your patients, and we are maybe going to see even better insulins come across to us today. But from where we have started off with the NPH insulin across the journey through the you know hundred glad gene and the detimer to the three hundred glad gene and degludic, whatever we have in our hands today, that has indeed been a great way forward. And today, when we give in basal insulins to our patients, we are a lot relaxed. We are not that concerned, and that is probably why we need to increase the use of insulin in our day-to-day -day practice. On that note, I'll stop sharing the slide and I'll hand it back to the audience. Thank you very much. I think you have, you have very simply given the message. I have no time to summarize it, but I'll tell you three sentences that you have, you have, you have said very beautifully, insulin nausea, we start late and escalate still later, which has to be addressed. Amongst benefits available, the basal insulin is the safest. All of us know if you start basal insulin, don't have to worry about hypoglycemia. It is absolutely safe. And amongst the molecules available in the armamentarium, Gen 2.0, Gen Basal 2.0 stands out as, as for its benefits of flexibility, plus minus three hours, for its efficacy, lesser volume, less pain, and various studies you gave, in range study, conclude study, so many other studies shown absolutely safe in comparison to other basal insulin, less hypoglycemia and much more acceptable. I think there are many, I like the way you said about the basal supported oral therapy. You know, that's one of the greatest things. You know, yesterday I was discussing with Arvind regarding an article on the BITS therapy, uh, the, the bedtime insulin, daytime sulfonuria. So that's what you said, that one of the greatest way of treating type 2 diabetes in our country, if you cannot give two injections, you can give a basal supported uh, oral therapy. Uh, the chairpersons will give their comments, but your talk was fabulous. Thank you very, very much for this great talk. You have to stay back for the discussion. Uh, over to Philip, and then uh, you have to invite the third speaker. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, Arundhati, ma'am, for your wonderful talk and how lucidly you have, uh, you know, explained uh, how to, you know, the idea about the how to translate into the clinical practice. And now, can we have the introduction slide for Dr. Abhishek? Although uh, Dr. Abhishek doesn't need any, you know, words of introduction, he's uh, very well known and from such a young age, he has achieved so many things. He is a DM endocrinology, currently working as a professor of endocrinology in a department uh, in IMA Sun Hospital, Bhubaneswar. He has made several contributions, he has conducted several diabetes detection camps, and he has uh, international and national publication uh, to his repute. He has invited faculty for so many, and most importantly, he is the organizing secretary for the ACCON 2018, co-organizing secretary for 14th Annual Conference of All India Association for obesity so over to you dr abave and uh, and philip uh, abave had been the member of the scientific committee yes. and uh, yes. he one of the part and parcel not today for the last 9 years and uh, in the making the program he is absolutely involved and taken up on himself to be the last speaker abave all is yours yeah uh, thank you ashok sir thank you alok sir and uh, thank you philip uh, for your kind introduction so actually, Arundhati has made my job a bit easy uh, with her presentation. And I am going to uh, this basal insulin optimization moving towards a more patient-centric approach in India. Yeah. So, uh, so I will discuss the topic in the how this basal insulin initiation occurs in diabetic management. Then second, we'll discuss why and how this basal insulin titration among the management, what are the titration inertia are there, what are the unmet needs for particular specific in the hypoglycemia risk with basal insulin, what are the unmet needs specifically uh, in relationship to the titration algorithms, 
and we'll discuss about the insulin intensification strategies and what is the concept of basal velos in the practical guideline point of view. So first thing is we'll discuss how, let us understand how of this basal insulin initiation in the management of diabetes. We know or already Arunduthi has also partly discussed that but one dose does not fit too well because we know that insulin requirement is dependent on the body weight, also dependent on how much insulin resistance in the body, but we don't know from our side that we cannot calculate insulin resistance as individually in every person and clinically also practically not required. So for all practical purpose, if adjuvance is less than 8% in 60 kg person, classically we give 0.2 unit per kg, which comes around 12 units. And if person is 80 kg, then it will come 16 units. If it's come 100 unit kg, then it will come 20 units. If adjuvance is less than 8. But if initial adjuvance is high, 9, 9.5, 10, probably a bit higher dose is beneficial. In that case, we can directly start with 0 0.2, 0 0.3 units per kg, which in 60 kg, it will be 18 units, 18 units, in 80 kg, 24 units, and in the 100 kg, it will be 30 units. So starting dose depends on the blood glucose level and also body weight. Both plays a critical role for knowing about the first starting dose of the insulin. There are different recommendations from the basal insulin initiation. Indian expert opinions are there. If you will see the B-smart expert opinion, usually they have actually advised that the basal insulin regimen the starts with either 10 units per day or 0.1 to 0 0.0 units per kg per day, depends on degree of hyperglycemia. And an open doctor-patient communication should be there, how rapidly or actively with the patient, doctor and patient is participating and how rapidly you are achieving the glycemic control with reduced hypoglycemia is what most factor when we are titrating this basal regimen. Then Delphi expert opinion shows start with 8 to 12 units of the basal insulin is the ideal initial dose. Start at 4 to 6 units if hypoglycemia is a concern. Then ask the patient to follow up every 1 to 2 weeks after initiating insulin for assessing the need for titration of the doses. Then let us understand why and how of this basal insulin titration in the diabetes management. We know that there are suboptimal sub glycemic control occurs despite of insulin use in the type 2 diabetic patients. We know almost 86 for type 2 diabetic patients using insulin plus OHAs or Soxaros now telling either bits therapy basal insulin or uh, bedtime insulin daytime sulfonria or along with any sort of sulfonria we can start um, giving uh, specifically uh, this basal insulin. And 80% of these patients using only insulin are not on the target. That means despite of use of insulin, still they are not achieving the target. Because we know that diabetes itself is a progressive disease that is associated with increased comorbidities and it necessitates insulin therapy in majority of the individuals of the type 2 diabetic patients. And we know that despite of insulin therapy, the glycemic control is not as achieved. The reason is probably we are not actually the, uh, doing proper uh, optimization of insulin therapies. And if we are not doing proper optimization, probably we cannot achieve the target and we are not reaching the goal. So the this needs for titration, that is systemic dose of titration helps the patient achieve the target. That means once we are starting an initial dose, gradually we have to increase the dose by every third day, every seven day, according to the patient's need, according to how uh, the doctor patient is communicating with each other. If patient is in the hospital, we, in hospital, we do almost daily change of titration. If someone is in the uh, at home, then that needs the doctor and patient relationship and communication. That leads to a early increase in the dose or the titration of the doses. And ultimately, that comes to help in the reduction of the blood glucose level. So uh, early titration is what most important. And this is the HVNC glycemic uh, glargine doses and uh, fasting trends observed in the patients HVNC less than seven with glargine doses and more than 8.5 units throughout the study. Then discussing the titration of the patients. This is online survey to determine the healthcare professionals and patients among close to 400 healthcare professionals and 318 patients attitude towards the basal insulin initiation titration and that from the US, France, both US and you know, some of the, um, the European countries, France and Germany participated in that. The key information regarding this vessel insulin titration should be reinforced with regular intervals. 
what scb has given that more than 75% reported discussing titration at the initial visit is utmost important whereas in the patient's point of view only 60 to 20 30% patient remembered such discussion initial discussion many were unaware of the need of uh, this titration of the basal insulin only close to 40% recalls mention of the time of uh, time needed to reach the glycemic control that means that when we first time discuss with the patient a lot of the time patient also take it lightly and sometimes also they forget that they thought that if doctor has written the dose probably that is the final dose they never uh, for subsequently few days neither they test the blood glucose nor the time uh, one to titrate and that leads to actually a persistent elevation of the blood glucose so titration is utmost important and most of the SCPs and patients agree that a more effective support tools to assist this vessel insulin initiation and titration is needed. And patients indicated that the provision of such tools should increase the confidence in the self titration. The lack of insulin initiation is a prominent, prominent cause of poor glycemic control. What are the evidence for global and national studies? This is the NANI studies, which has clearly shown that achievement of the glycemic goal less than 7% was suboptimal among the adult diabetic patients. Almost half of the study population did not reach the glycemic control. If you will see the from NANI's 1988 to 1994 to 2007 to 2010, there is definitely an um, increase in the people who have achieved target age 1C less than 7%. In the actual 1988 to 94, it was 40%. Now it has increased to almost 57%. But still, despite of this improvement, still close to 40% people are still there who are having age one more than 7%. So the lack of insulin titration is a prominent cause of poor glycemic control and evidence from the global and national studies. These are the studies which has, uh, this is the IDMPS Web 7 uh, India subgroup analysis. This shows the lack of titration of insulin and fear of hypoglycemia are two important factors are the key barriers. You will see what are the reasons for different key barriers or reasons of actually either discontinuation or uh, failure of titration of the doses. There are discontinuation of insulin, fear of hypoglycemia, occurrence of one episode of hypoglycemia, day-to-day -day blood glucose instability or variability, weight gain, lack of insulin, knowledge of insulin of titration, lack of support, lack of experience of self-management of insulin dosing, lack of diabetic education, the cost of medication and other things. What they found among those two important things, the fear of hypoglycemia and also the another important thing is occurrence of episodes of hypoglycemia and lack of insulin or titration has found to be three important factors and they play a critical role specifically for titration of the insulin doses. Then lack of titration of Insulin titration is considered one of the prominent cause of poor glycemic control as evidence from the global and national studies. This is These are the top five physician perceived patient barriers. What are the barriers? Patient's reluctance and unwillingness to consider basal insulin treatment. Patient's non-adherence to existing medical therapies. Patient's inability to self-monitor their blood glucose with sufficient frequency. Patient's concern about out-of-the-pocket cost and patient's lifestyle that includes diet and exercise. Majority time, what the found that the physician survey reported, patient's inability to self-titrate the dose of insulin is one of the major by barrier for insulin titration. So every patient should have some knowledge of how the, they would titrate their blood glucose if they are testing their or doing CGMS or if they are doing blood glucose monitoring point of view with point of test care mission, then they should actually know how they are actually going to increase the dose of the insulin. So if they will know that they can titrate the dose at home, they can in between in actual frequent intervals within 15 days, every 20 days, they can contact their physician and inform them about the blood glucose level. But every third to four days, they can do blood glucose at home and also they can titrate the doses. So titration inertia is a real reality. So this titration inertia is a key barrier to achieve the desired glycemic control with insulin therapies. There is progression of type 2 diabetes and increased association with comorbidities. Eventually, it necessitates insulin therapy in majority of the individuals of type 2 diabetic patients. The second inertia is, despite of use of insulin therapies, large prospective studies have clearly shown that in the clinical practice, the desired glycemic control is not routinely achieved. There is insufficient dose adjustment of insulin is termed as titration inertia. 
and this sub optimal insulin dose titration was one of the key barrier to achieve the optimal insulin therapies and also insulin optimal glycemic control so what are the factors which actually contributes this titration in asia there is reluctance by the cbg and the patients or both there is reluctance from both the side weight gain is one of the important factor because a lot of the time we know that once we have started a lot of people comes to us and discuss that we have gained a lot weight and so is it due to insulin of course we know that this is insulin is one of the factor and a lot of the people actually have that is one of the fat barrier then fear of hypoglycemia if someone develops a nocturnal hypoglycemia or severe hypoglycemia that actually leads to the lot of the time they either miss few doses of insulin or they take under dosing of do under dosing of insulin by themselves and another factor is defensive snacking and all those factors actually plays a critical role for particularly uncontrolled blood glucose then the effective effect of insulin therapies on the quality of life there is lack of flexibility with different types of other insulin regimens there is complex titration algorithms there is lack of constant cell glucose monitoring and also lack of education so among these this fear of hypoglycemia and complex titration regimen are the two most perceived important perceived uh, things or biggest inertia that which actually prevents the people prevents the patients for titration of the insulin doses so addressing the unmet needs of hypoglycemia risk with basal insulin we know that the people see the hypoglycemia is concern uh, impedes the aggressive treatment by either physicians or patients confidence and two out of five patients with type 2 diabetes reduces their insulin doses i have already previously discussed once they develop a sing even if a mild episode of hypoglycemia they automatically takes under dosing they do the under dosing of the insulin and again they also starts uh, taking defensive snacking in between and these are two important factors which not only increase the blood glucose not only increase the insulin level but also causes significant weight gain so if you see the hypoglycemia is a concern for people with the primary care physicians and diabetologist all have actually so close to 75 to 80% actually physicians and diabetologists tell that they have actually the concern about hypoglycemia if their patient develops one uh, de episode of hypoglycemia subsequently they did not become aggressive they did not go actually become very much uh, serious or very much uh, act proactive to reduce the blood glucose rapidly or they don't titrate very rapidly to reduce the blood glucose or to achieve the target so what the consequences of fear of hypoglycemia in type 2 diabetic patients with basal insulin the first is decrease for tight glycemic control there is poor adherence to the therapies there is reduced willingness to intensify therapy also there is compromised compliance of uh, for taking the therapy so for the hypoglycemic episodes if there is a fear for hypoglycemia that also leads to resistance to titration again poor glycemic control and patient can also resort to defensive snacking which also leads to weight gain as i have already discussed that part then again if you see compare basal insulin versus premix insulin regarding the hypoglycemia if you see the overall hypoglycemia you see it is 2.85 actually uh, 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 proportions but as 13.3 in particularly in premix insulin and if you see the overall mean number of confirmed hypoglycemic units per patient year if you see overall whether it is symptomatic hypoglycemia whether it is nocturnal hypoglycemia everywhere actually the basal insulin has significant less number of events in comparison to the premixed uh, related almost 50% reduction in uh, symptomatic and nocturnal hypoglycemia with basal insulin in comparison to the premixed insulin then basal insulin versus co formulation with hypoglycemia this is uh, glargin uh, glargin versus idegas that again shows that there is 86% higher rate of overall confirmed hypoglycemia with idegas in comparison to glargin u300 and that is also uh, glargin in comparison to glargin u100 and also if we take particularly confirmed uh, patient having hypoglycemia uh, hypoglycemia and without uh, this uh, hypoglycemia with hbnc less than 7% without confirmed hypoglycemia again in that group also glargin is far far superior than idegas in this present study then addressing the unmet needs of titration algorithm complexity to the basal insulin a strict and stringent of titration algorithm should be there and this is the basic reason behind hypoglycemia with the basal insulin because inside lanmet and tt triple t all has clearly shown 
that evaluated the glargin u1 rate is very much strict and stringent algorithm involves a stringent fasting and smbg values which is not is classically observed the routine routine clinical practice and if you are going very stringent that actually leads to increased risk of hypoglycemia and they attain the glycemic goals but hypoglycemia is seen more frequently that means if you are um, very much strict uh, you are trying for a stringent algorithm if you are want a very tight fasting and postprandial control if you are doing multiple smbgs and trying to titrate the dose early frequently probably the risk of hypoglycemia will be uh, more so that shows a more aggressive insulin dosing adjustment or titration leads to higher rate of hypoglycemia so these all three trials has clearly shown that again from the stringent to simple algorithm so now the motto is actually it should be a patient friendly algorithm so that the patient it will be the easy for the patient to titrate it will be easy for the patient to the follow and it will be easy for the patient to know how they can op titrate the dose and if required they can take the help of their physician but everything is from the patient side so it should be as simple as possible so this is the atlantus and goal age agency they focuses on op titrating the insulin dose of glargin u100 for optimal glycemic control but gradual and slowly without pushing the patient so much as to cause hypoglycemia so you should very slowly increase by 2 units or decrease by 2 units or 1 units slowly you go so that every third day fourth day you just up titrate or down titrate according to the goal according to the blood glucose level and don't be hasty and don't go for very high doses as a doctor we know and we can do that but when the patient is doing patient should be advised to go very slowly and that will help to prevent hypoglycemia in those group patients so use of glargin 100 with a simple algorithm with active titration leads to a significant improvement in the glycemic control in the people of type 2 diabetic patients so a patient centric basal insulin op titration strategy as i have discussed if any baseline age range is less than 80 you reduce by 2 units our target is between 80 to 130 to so keep that if the within the target if it is 130 to 160 increase by 2 units 160 to 180 increase by 4 units and more than 180 increase by 6 units so a active titration period lasts up to 12 weeks so every third to fourth day or twice weekly you can titrate the dose and you can actually gradually increase the dose so this titration period usually classically takes around 8 to 12 weeks and um, period of maximum glycemic burden reduction this titration insulin dose based on the average three most recent fasting glucose and increase the dose once or twice a week if fasting is above the target as already i have discussed so the barrier to patient centric approach in the what are the barriers because despite of all sort of discussions still there are lot of barriers if you are even if you are going for the patient centric approach we face a lot of barrier the biggest barriers or the biggest problem is there is a low level of awareness among our patients and physicians and in our pg opd we are actually a physician hardly giving few minutes to a patient in that case actually discussing diabetic education with the patient actually it's bit difficult again if you will see the diabetic educator point of view probably in our country we don't have that much of number of diabetic educators who can provide or we can give uh, adequate education to the patients again there is low level of adherence to the therapies there is constraint in the patient's time and resources there is insufficient glucose monitoring by smbg devices and there is undue medical and financial burden of the therapies a lot of the time because we know our country in our country all medical facilities everything is our own pocket driven things it's not majority part it's not insulin driven and that is one of the biggest challenge and biggest issue for our population so developing a educational self management program and using simple titration algorithms is essential for optimizing clinical outcomes in people of type 2 diabetic patients so the implementing a patient centric approach in india is definitely a possible solution the everybody should know the what is the significance of smbg the highlights it should be highlighted to everybody it should be highlighted to each and every patient and also the highlights the in every national and international guideline which has highlighted that it should be actually discussed with the patient and that will motivate the patient for smbg there is a lack of lack of structured patient education program or patient support program is there is uh, there in our country and that is one of the biggest challenge and that if we have that patient uh, structured patient education program or patient support program probably the 
that will help for optimizing not only dose of insulin also optimizing the dose of OHA also and that will make the quite a big number of people at achieving the target age when she less than 7%. And third must is to encourage the better adherence to insulin therapies, patient support from the providers, diabetic support educations. And another biggest thing is that should be some support from the family because family members are the members which actually come in contact, in contact with daily basis. So if the family members are well educated and your family members are supportive, that gives a biggest boost for, to the patient for, uh, from the insulin continuation point of view, from the titration point of view, and also further um, uh, intensification point of view. So several trials have shown patients can titrate their insulin regimen as effectively as physicians if they will give in a simple titration algorithm. Hence, developing a simple titration algorithm will help in optimizing the basal insulin therapies. Then insulin intensification strategies a stepwise progress towards glycemic control. So when to stop titration vessel and add prandial insulin? What is the current opinion? First titrate the vessel and add prandial insulin if the patient is unable to achieve HbA1c target with 0.5 unit per kg per day of basal insulin. That means you are already giving 0.5 units per kg per day of basal insulin. Still, the patient is not achieving HbA1c. Or HbA1c goal is not achieved despite of normal fasting plasma glucose. Your fasting is very much close to normal, but still HbA1c is high. Probably that is a prandial rise and we have to target that prandial rise. So a targeted PPG level, persistent level of goal with basal insulin. That means even if you are doing a fasting PP, every time the PP is high, but your fasting is in the normal range, then probably you cannot further titrate the dose of basal. You have to start a prandial insulin and you have to either go for basal plus therapies or subsequently basal bolus therapies for uh, achieving the target HVNC level. So what is the concept of basal plus and practical? As I have discussed, that once you are thinking about basal plus, then you have to choose what is the largest meal for the patient. So if you are targeting that largest meal and if you are giving the prandial insulin at that, that will actually, vessel is taking care of the whole throughout 24 hours and the largest meal, if you are giving the prandial insulin with the largest meal, then probably you can, even if achieve the majority of the body which will come down to normal. So as I have shown, one of the major meal, breakfast will give highest peak and contributes to most of the PPG. So if you are thinking breakfast, then you give here. If you are thinking the lunch is the biggest one, you give at lunch. If you think dinner is the biggest one, you give that dinner. So that will take care the rest of the part. So, as you see, the, at the time of injection, if you are giving, then not only subsequent blood glucose is coming down, so that will help to achieve or that will reduce the HVNC level and that will also help to reduce the postprandial blood glucose level. So, the proof of concept studies comparing basal plus therapy with, uh, therapy with insulin glargine alone. So, it is a type 2 diabetic patients, HVNC between 7.5 to 9.5 with BMI up to 33.1. And mean diabetic duration is close to 12 years. Glargine, insulin glargine is given um, uh, initially to 135 patients, then divided two group up to in, uh, and given three months of glargine alone. Another group, glargine plus once daily glulysin was given in the another 50 patients. So that shows that adding glucosin to glargine further improves the glycemic control. See, if you will see that at the uh, at randomization at the end point, you see. Glargine glucosin is definitely has significant lower HVNC in comparison to the glargine group. Again, those people see that um, uh, the percentage of people who are achieving HVNC less than 7%. Again, glargine and glucosin group, it is 22% versus only 9% in the glargine group. So, addition of glucosin not only reduces the postprandial blood glucose, also helps in significant reduction in the HVNC level and a large major percentage of people achieving the target HVNC of less than 7%. Again, basal plus approach with glargine and glucosin, the point of uh, clinical practice. A mealtime insulin may begin with one of the methods describing below depending on the patient's characteristics. A fixed dose of single bolus dose of 4 to 6 units is administered with the largest meal of the day, where actually there is significant rise in the postprandial blood glucose is happening. A dose defined uh, based on the uh, level of PPG level, 
and glucose values divided by two or in the majority divided by divided by 18 into two. That means if you are actually having a PPG, if divided by the glucose level by two, and if it is more than 18, probably they require the, power, the prandial insulin. A dose based on the previous uh, basal dose. So that means if you are knowing the previous, suppose someone is on the previously premix insulin, now we are shifting to basal plus. So 50% should be given, 50 to 60% should be given as a basal, and this 30 to 40% should be given as a single dose. A dose based of the patient's weight, it is 0 0.5, 0 0.05 unit per kg should be given. So key message is titration, inertia due to fear of hypoglycemia and weight gain leads to inadequate insulin of titration and poor glycemic control. <laughs> if you are going with systematic yet patient-friendly dose of titration strategies with the basal <laughs> insulin, that helps a good glycemic control. Simplicity and convenience of one daily regimen of, with basal insulin allows the patient empowerment for effective insulin dosing management in the Indian setting. Due to progressive nature of diabetes, that results in the subsequent incentive mechanism is utmost important because even if you are starting basal, either you are in due course of time, you have to go for basal plus or basal bolus therapies. Rapid acting and long acting insulin analogs mimic endogenous prandial and basal insulin secretion. A stepwise intensification of basal insulin gargin with a single injection of blue lysine also can be considered or is helpful, or a lot of the patients could achieve target agency with this much of insulin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, Aware for a very comprehensive presentation. And now Bob, I'll request Dr. Dr. Peshidas, Professor Peshidas, to kindly invite Dr. Anil Kumar Birmani, who is here with us, to take up the uh, panel discussion. We'll have a very short panel discussion for about 10 to 12 minutes. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Anil, are you there? Sir, Anil? all the speakers have uh, spoken very nicely and vividly and uh, given a clear picture about the basal insulin and the combination of the DPP-4 and SGL2 inhibitors and the how to um, titrate the dose of basal insulin in the patient-centric approach. A lot of factors of patient factors uh, play a role in controlling of diabetes. <clears throat> so all the speakers have presented very nicely. Now I, I invite Dr. A.K. Birmani, uh, who is the moderator for the panel discussion, to take over the mic. Thank you. Sir. You can take up speaker by speaker, sir. Start yeah. with the, yeah. the yeah. topics. So, uh, good evening to everybody and thank you Alok and Professor Ashok Das for inviting me here. Uh, I will start with the first speaker, uh, Dr. Mandal. I hope he is there. Dr. Mandal, yeah. are you there? Yes, I am. Dr. Mandal, you very nicely talked about the role of SGLT2 inhibitors and combination therapy uh, in reducing uh, cardiorenal risk as well as optimal glycemic control. Now, we have sufficient evidence today that optimal glycemic control reduces microvascular complications but has minimal effect on macrovascular complications. And to reduce macrovascular complications, we need to control the conventional risk factors. So what are the current targets uh, for two of the risk factors like blood pressure and lipids in, in patients of diabetes with high cardiovascular risk? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh... Yes, we need to address the cardiovascular risk factors if we need to uh, reduce the cardiovascular event in our type 2 diabetic patients. The more important thing is that we need to address all the cardiovascular risk factors simultaneously so that we can achieve the bigger benefit or greater benefit. Now, uh, the patients uh, with the hypertension, we need to bring down this blood pressure at least from the 140 by 80. And if the patient has underlying or, uh, uh, kidney disease uh, or the decay diabetic kidney disease, then we need to bring down this target is to uh, keep the blood pressure below 130 uh, in 80. And <clears throat> regarding uh, lipid profile, that's uh, this target should be uh, lowering of the LDL cholesterol. And if the patient doesn't, uh, you mentioned that the patient has a high risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in that case the blood uh, LDL cholesterol should be below 100. And if the patient has previous cardiovascular event like MI or uh, angioplasty or, or or the CABG, then we need to at least bring down that below 70. And uh, if we look at this uh, uh, lipid association in the guideline, then we need to bring it down below uh, 50. And 
and usually I follow that, that you need to keep it below, right. below 50. And uh, triglycerides should not be uh, the primary target uh, when you consider the lipid involving, but of course, if it is more than um, 500, then you need to bring down uh, this. So the, so the current uh, 2023 ADA standards have now brought down the blood pressure to 130 by 80, 18. that we should be less than 130 by 80 blood pressure. And uh, lipids, of course, we should be following the Lipid Association of India guidelines. Uh, the LDL should be less than 17 all diabetics. And maybe as the risk increases to less than 50 or even less than 30. Now, suppose you have reached, the patient has reached the LDL goal. What do you understand by the term residual risk? And what do you do? Yes, uh, the residual, residual risk means that in spite of uh, reaching to the target LDL goal, you will find that you cannot prevent this uh, uh, cardiovascular event. Uh, and in that case, we know that if you bring down this LDL cholesterol further, there will be the further reduction of cardiovascular event. And uh, we need to give the maximum tolerated dose of uh, LDL uh, loading is in the statin. Uh, and we know clear there is a clear as relation uh, with this uh, loading of the LDS, LDL cholesterol with the cardiovascular events. For example, if, uh, if someone's LDL cholesterol is 100, and if you bring down to the 70, there is a 30% reduction of the LDL level. Uh, so there will be the 30% reduction of the LDL, uh, sorry, cardiovascular event. So if we reduce this further, then um, there will be more reduction of the cardiovascular event. And if, if after reaching to the tolerated dose, if uh, we cannot reach to the target uh, LDL goal, then we need to add, uh, Another agents, for example, uh, we can add azetimibe with uh, with LDL cholesterol, uh, the stat statin with the statin. So, so basically, you uh, as you said rightly, uh, residual risk is something you know. Once you have reached the LDL goals, uh, there there are still patients who get a cardiovascular event. So we must look at the non-HDL. And, and try to target that because it is the ethogenic proteins, other proteins that may be responsible for the, uh, for the residual risk. And there we need to intensify statin therapy or add azetamide or even add PCSK. Anyway, uh, now you have talked about SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 are also the drugs that uh, are guideline directed drugs for the <laughs> of, uh, uh, cardiovascular risk. Where would you place pyoglitazone today in cardiovascular risk reduction? Yes, uh, definitely. This, uh, I, uh, in, the, in our previous session, we discussed a bit about this pyoglitazone. There's a very good insulin sensitizer. And uh, the only problem with the pyoglitazone is that uh, it can increase the risk for heart failure. It can cause the pre retention. So, definitely, the patient who has history of heart failure, the patients with a heart current heart failure, we cannot use the pyoglitazone. But uh, from the proactive study, what we learned that uh, uh, if the patient, uh, it reduces the risk for uh, stroke at least. So then post-stroke patient ischemic stroke, we can uh, use this pyoglitazone particularly to reduce the risk uh, for further uh, stroke. But if someone has, a, doesn't have any uh, evidence of heart failure, then uh, in particular in the young patient, uh, we can use this pyoglitazone. I also personally prescribe the pyoglitazone uh, with metformin in significant number of patients. And the durability of the pyoglitazone is a very important uh, uh, what we have observed from several studies and uh, from our practice. Uh, 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 yeah, the, the, the durability the, of the pyoglitazone. The virus study all, all have shown, and the current recommendations of, uh, again, ADA. They have now, there's a strong recommendation to use pyoglitazone, especially in patients with past history of TIA or stroke or stroke. MI. So it is a wonderful drug, but judicious use is very important and you must know where to use. And, and you know, Tenjo, Forest Dandona of, 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 our, of our origin, you know, they have given pyoglitazone in the first treatment, combination therapy, and have used, they said we don't have complications. They give a combination of four drugs sometimes, and pyoglitazone is an integral part of it. In right. fact, people join Anil, there was Debjit Tripathi and from USA, and he was talking about, uh, why not we give, uh, given pyoglitazone. You were there, I had that. So I think it's correct. I have just have one question for Dr. 
Mandal, uh, I think your the, the combination of 12 of DPP4 and SGLT2 inhibitor is a very intelligent combination. I must tell you because I work for the DCGI, the, the SGLT2 inhibitor that is hetagliptin alone, introduced by 27 companies, is not moving well. It is the combinations are moving well, and if you combine with 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 uh, uh, you have five plus one six of the ominous octet we're addressing. So right. that's why I think this combination is very good. I think we'll go to now Arundhati, Dr. Sir. Arundhati. Sasuk, sir, 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 your thought process, uh, DPP, CETA plus metformin, DPP, CETA plus pyrotazone. It is, it, is, it is definitely there. Indian government has not allowed yet four drug combination FDC. You know, we not, the... four, not four, not four, sir, three. three. DPP, three. SGLT three. plus metformin, yeah, DPP, SGLT plus pyo. Yeah, I think pyo has come only by Dr. Glenmark and the metformin has come by many companies. And, you know, there is no head-to-head -head trial between them. But I think definitely they'll be much better than double drug combination. So, Pio actually said they have come with tenilgliptin. Um, that is actually... Um, right. with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, Jita, Met, Pio. Yeah. yeah. So, yes. bit uh, yes. odd. Otherwise... But I um, think it will be... It is the offering that uh, maybe a combination of metformin and SGLT2 and Pio, that, that is in the offering, very much in the offering. I think... I think <laughs> To come and they are they have actually a new study has compared this combination which uh, Abhay is telling uh, liptin plus SGLT2 plus metformin with uh, in a uh, plus pyograzone in place of pyo the other study they have taken uh, sulfonuria and you know the hypoglycemia was as expected more but I think this combination but the bottom line is that we have shown the way to the world India gives the the concept of FDC mm -hmm. for the for convenience, for increased compliance, and for decreasing the cost. And that has come to stay. But I liked your presentation, Dr. Mandal. Thank you very much. Let's go Dr. Arundhati now, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Dr. Arundhati, that was an excellent talk. Uh, and uh, I agree with you. Millions and millions of dollars are spent on clinical research, on <coughs> randomized control trials. But then translating into clinical practice is very poor. And, and it is something very important. Uh, you have very nicely talked about the benefits about the latest generation two basal insulins. At the moment, we have five basal insulins in our armamentarium. We have NPH, we have Detamir, we have the Glargin, and then we have the elder brother Glargin, Taujo, and then we have the Deglude. Now, uh, agreed that uh, the gener second generation are uh, better as far as the hypoglycemia is concerned and the flexibility is concerned. But if you look at the glycemic efficacy remains the same of all the five insulins. There is no difference as far as the glycemic efficacy is concerned. So where would you particularly use each? Because everyone has got its place today in our country. So where will you, in one one word, each will give the indication, indication for NPH, indication for Detamir, indication for all the five. Sir, uh, in the area where I practice, I actually cater to a very diverse segment uh, one segment is who uh, a segment who cannot even think of buying the basal insulin no matter how the price has come down they cannot i can they can not even buy it even if i tell them to so that is where i would generally place the end today i also use uh, some amount of n in during pregnancy when i'm using uh, detamir and n is where what i use in pregnancy and in people where economy is a big factor is a big factor where uh, these are not major concerns. All these years, we have been using a lot of Glargine, sir, Glargine 100. Uh, now, with the advent of Glargine 300, there is a general tendency to generally, you know, use general Glargine 300 because there is not much of a difference when it comes to the cost, a little bit of difference. But uh, I think today... Uh, I use uh, Glargin 300 more often because of the data that has come forward. I feel more secure. I feel more safe and uh, lesser worries about hypoglycemia. Also, it is it becomes easier to convince the patients. When you tell them that the, about the flexibility, that is one word that really works well with them. That, you know, two hours here and there, then they're a lot uh, you know easier and not major concerns about hypoglycemia. In all these years of using Glargin, sir, or, and also Decludec to its credit, 
I don't think hypoglycemia has been a major issue with any of us, maybe one or two of weight cases. So uh, where there are concerns of hypo, generally, if I decide on a basal insulin today, I would choose a generation two a basal insulin, unless I have particular reasons not to choose generation two. Pregnancy is where I'll use detrimer and human insulin. In, in fact, we had a study, the Professor Anil Virmani, you know, the insulin is given not always by the medical personnel. Somebody's daughter-in-law will come back from her work and give. Somebody's daughter will come back and give. Husband never gives. I know somebody come will give. So what happens? This flexibility in timing is a great boon. Am I correct, Anil? So therefore, three plus three, six hours of flexibility gives a window of opportunity to give and they don't omit the drop. Second thing, I fully agree. Arundhati's friends are all good friends. She has not seen any hypoglycemia that much. I will give an example of a CEO. You know, I spent some time in Calcutta. I was called the director of Indian Diabetes. I had a CEO. You know, he drinks like fish, but not what doesn't drink water. So he is very severely diabetic. So what happened? He went to the bathroom and he he's the CEO of the office. So he went to the bathroom and took an injection uh, he took an ordinary NPH insulin and you know in an inebriated state he forgot to take food and did not take food so he reached home I got a phone call from his wife sir my husband is behaving very badly sweating you know I knew what it was so you know I think the 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 flexibility and hypoglycemia freedom are mm -hmm. there in cases I so I, from that day I said that you know you are CEO, why are you not taking your analog insulin? And he, he started taking it. So I some we sometimes underestimate that the patient cannot take. Number two, the study which uh, which uh, uh, Arundhati presented at the beginning, the insulin use alone, Anil, is only 0.5%, 0.7%. But insulin plus oral is 24%. So that is the latest statistics. So therefore, I think I also promote quite a bit of, uh, of, of insulin plus oral, which has been one of the mainstay. And, and there's an article in one of the books that we have written. Arvind, S.R. Arvind written the article. He has written how he was influenced by Dr. Sheshaya and Dr. He, he was trained at Mohan Center and by Dr. Uh, Vishwanathan, Mohan's father. How he was influenced to give this combination therapy and he has given that. I'll pass on that book to you. Uh, so therefore, I think it has a, it has a, it has a great time. But if it cannot be done, you know, I walked in Jipmar for entire life you know there is a government hospital we have only approached to np at that time but once i became ms dean and director i can buy i can influence to buy things but i think uh, there is a benefit and as you rightly said these had to be customized individualized depending upon the uh, affordability appropriateness right. uh, another, another can i ask last question to you on the uh, there is a, a controversy regarding initiating insulin in the Indian scenario, where we have a very high carbohydrate intake, should should we not initiate insulin, premix insulin rather than a basal insulin? You know, I know all the international guidelines do recommend initiating basal insulin, but RSSGI is the first guideline that has come out that yes, you can even start initiate with a premix. So, what is your opinion regarding that? So premix is, is a is a very good insulin. There is no doubt about that. And we all of us are using premix. There's nothing, they're not taking away anything from premix. But having said that, I mean, the one thing that definitely is a negative point for premix is its fixed ratio, 30, 70 or 50, 50. The carbohydrate intake does not necessarily occur in that order. So that is why I would think that if, if we need to give a coverage for that particular carbohydrate uh, intake at night or in the morning, whatever it is, I would personally prefer a basal plus regimen. Or maybe we put in something like, like say an A-carbose or a Voglibose, if it does the trick uh, for that carbohydrate intake and add on a basal insulin or a basal plus for me, sir. A fixed ratio is, is, is difficult. But having said that, then people do not agree. They'll not agree to take two insulins at night. That is when you would choose the premix. There are also uh, periods of time when the patient is presenting with very high fasting, very high PP, only controlling the fasting will not do at that point in time. Maybe there's an urgent requirement to bring the you know, blood sugar levels down. That is when we will choose a premix if the patient doesn't uh, agree for a basal bolus, Thank which you. most people will not. Arundhati, a bit would be ideal. Birmani was, Birmani was uh, one thing to add. What Arundhati is telling is absolutely right. But if in this gathering, 
whoever we are sitting, if you will see the number of insulin, what we are writing in our clinical practice, probably premix will be much more higher than other things. We are, actually we have shifted from premix to vessel or vessel plus or vessel bolus or even if uh, this uh, co-formulations. But still, if you will see in last one month, how many, how many prescriptions I have written in insulin, if you will compare, definitely the premix will come everybody from everybody's pen. Premix will still, it will come high. Because our people want that. They can't change that. You can't change their pattern. You can't change their diet pattern. They will look at that. And another important thing is, now this Lantos insulin actually is off patent. Now, even if in this Zonos, this, everything is actually, we are getting glargin insulin. So, glargin is now affordable. So, uh, from the cost point of view, again, that is one of the important factor that one might not, might not afford Pujo, might not afford Rajodec, but then uh, this glargin also is one of the uh, best insulin which significantly reduces our headache regarding the uh, hypoglycemia point of view. Right. It is, it, is, it is easier for the patient to take premix insulin because he doesn't need to titrate. It is we who titrate for him. That is another part. Uh, just, 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 just moving around, uh, uh, moving off from you, Arundhati, I just want to beg uh, to differ with you on one point. You talked about early insulin initiation. Do you really believe in early insulin initiation or timely insulin initiation? <laughs> Certainly time, but a lot of times uh, early is timely. <laughs> there is a difference between the two. People start, Arun, that people start really in their practice, people start early insulin initiation. Every month you lose 300, 400 patients. Yeah, yeah. so it should be timely insulin <laughs> initiation, not early insulin right is, yeah. Okay, and coming to you, Abe. Something very really interesting. Yeah. You yes. know, you know the what has been talked about today in two zero two two October, published in Diabetes Care Anil, first year uh -huh. control matters. You must have seen that paper by Lee Pong, and he says thirteen thousand thirty four patients followed up for thirteen years. He found the nephropathy and, and 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 cardiopathy and eye complications were more in the people whose first year H one C was not. 6.5 or not between 6 and 5 percent. Yeah, I've seen that. Who what you saw that paper? Those people who were S one C above seven. He found, uh, I think I remember the percentage. The 32 people out that had retinopathy, nephropathy about 56, and cardiac complication about 17. And he says use the term uh, a propensity to end of life. That means they are going towards progressing towards life. I mean, especially in the in the in the some population. So what she has said that if you want to produce results, produce in the first year. Therefore, if you have a in our country, if you have blood sugar of average you, H1C we have is 8.4, 8.6, 9, rarely 7.8, around 8 we have, 8, 8, 8.5 we have. So the there is a thought process that let us control it first for at least over a year. Then the legacy effect is much longer. The second is that you, you tell somebody, Anil, that you take insulin today, you will see after 10 years, even then you get the legacy effect. They may not be impressed. You tell some person with diabetes that you take this injection for 6 months, 3 months, 9 months. In the first year you control well, the whole life you are going to have legacy effect. I, I'm just telling you, you'll be more convinced. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you, but my only fact is that let us be very practical oriented. I just told you. Refuse to take insulin. Our, our aim is, as you very rightly said, if you can get to goal with oral uh, drugs, then why to start insulin? Okay, so unless, unless, unless the oral drugs fail, earlier the tradition was that three drugs fail, then you start in, in insulin. But today we have a lot of drugs in our hand. So and, that, that and with hemoglobin coming, you can further delay insulin therapy now. So, so, so we have to cater to what our customers want. Yeah, they the don't want to take insulin right for first day. Yeah. As simple as that. We yeah. have a tendency to except, put... except for pregnancy. Except for pregnancy, no patient wants to take insulin. The time, the time period given to establish good control with combination oral in that paper is six weeks. If you do not achieve good control six weeks, you have a you can discuss with your patients. Right. But the important point, you see, we don't want to uh, medicalize insulinization. But we are just telling, as you rightly said, appropriate and timely insulinization. And you know, prepare the patient, prepare the patient for insulin. Yeah, sir. Actually, what, sir, what we were, sir, actually, also, sir, 
one of our one of our patients actually is a doctor his father is 22 years diabetic and he's on glibenclamide since last 20 years he's on glibenclamide and yes. his his age one is 6.5 no hypoglycemia what, what, what to be done he is not at all ready to change he is not at all ready to change no i am perfectly fine and i am taking this uh, initially was taking dionyl now chala, now is taking jo son ka jo is taking that and uh, it's perfect the number rule is when something is not broken don't try to fix it so if it's well controlled if he doesn't have a card cardiovascular risk, let him continue. And, and the important thing is not on metformin, only given club, not it on metformin. Matter. As long as it's controlled, how does and it for last, for last 22 years, actually, he's on given club. Okay. Now, coming to you, Abhay, uh, again, an excellent talk as usual. Uh, what is over basalization and how will you recognize it? Over? Basalization. Okay. Sir, over basalization is actually it's a um, partly uh, this is a, what I have discussed. There is inertia from the patient point of view. Also, there are some inertia from the doctor point of view. If we are not communicating with the patients properly, the right like part hastily increasing the dose rapidly because as in the hospital, a lot of the time, what we do? Suppose today the blood glucose is 300, we directly increase our basal by 10 units, 15 units. So patient use a lot of time, sees that doctor has increased the dose by 15 units. Sometimes at home, with a blood glucose of 200, like that, they increase by 10 to 15 units. And suddenly the next day, there will be sudden hypoglycemia. So always, whenever you are giving a trick to the patient, always give increase by 2 units or for maximum 4 units, not more than that. And even if you are achieving a target within six to weeks, eight to weeks, that is okay. No need to that. I don't want in a hurry. I'm not in a hurry. I don't want to achieve my target within seven days, 10 days. Gradually, so that the patient will properly know how the patient is going to titrate, whether it is increased or decreased, and that will prevent over vesselization or under vesselization. But if you know, sometimes what the patients, those are clever patients, what they do that doctor has increased directly by 15 units, Today, I will directly increase by 10 to 15 units. And these people actually will be trapped and these people actually create problem. So what is what is the beam score? So the, actually the rule is only increase by just two to four units or reduce by two units, one units. And that will actually give confidence to the patients actually for particularly uh, uh, increasing the doses or reducing that, the doses. So, but what is beam score? Beam, beam yeah. score. For? For, for uh, diagnosing over basalization. Mm, uh, what is you... the beam score? The bedtime and the AM morning for, uh, yeah. sugar. The difference yeah. between the two. Between the bedtime. Tells you when you have, you have, you have over basalization. It is more than 50. Yeah. 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 So the actually, if it is actually that uh, see the what is the bedtime uh, uh, in, so, uh, in blood glucose level and the morning blood, blood glucose exactly. level divided by insulin. If it is more than fifteen, then actually you need a prandial blood glucose uh, exactly. in, injection. Absolutely. And if it is less than that, there is only vessel is sufficient. There is no need of giving a prandial. Okay, what is the difference between optimization and intensification of insulin therapy? Yeah. So the optimization is suppose I have started with, today. I have started with. Uh, vessel insulin. First, I have to optimize the vessel because my target with vessel is to fix the fasting first. So with vessel, gradually I am increasing the doses as I have actually discussed with the patient. Gradually patient is in increasing and patient is communicating with me every seven days or ten days. And once I have seen that my fasting is controlled, but I am doing a six-point testing or seven-point testing, I am seeing all prandials are increasing. Or only one uh, with the major meal, that is one price in prandial is increasing. Then probably once I have uh, fasting is controlled, my basal titration is over. Then, or optimization, I have optimized my the basal dose. Then I have to titrate or I have to intensify the dose. But then intensification, you have to go for either basal plus if someone is taking one major meal and direct two small snacks. Then probably only with intensification with one short course of insulin, you can go for directly at that maximum bill and you can totally control the blood coach. But like our um, Odisha people, West Bengal people, they have two large carb mills. So in that case, probably they require two short acting insulins. And when you are seeing that still there is three peaks with breakfast, lunch, dinner, all are producing peak, probably there we have to go for a complete vessel bolus therapies during the intensification phase.
but but if the patient is having two large meals don't you think premix insulin would be much better but if someone is taking lunch and dinner how premix is you cannot uh, do that premix it will be difficult so uh, there is flexibility to it basal bolus or basal plus or basal 2 plus whatever may be that is flexibility is there but if someone is taking only breakfast and dinner is too large meal then probably the premix is a better option rather than going for basal 2 plus uh, just last question to all the three. Just last question to all the three. Now, you have got three drugs. Uh, which three drugs would you prefer as the first line treatment? Metformin, SGLT2, DPP4, number one. Metformin, SGLT2 inhibitors, pioglitazone, number two. Metformin, SGLT2, and A and Boglibose or Acarbose, whatever it is, number three. Which three among the three? I'm talking oral. I'm talking oral. Okay. okay. Oral GLP1 would like boss. Oral GLP1 would like. No, no. I oral GLP1 because nobody can afford it. And a lot of technical problems. The third option, I think there will be not many buyers. Correct. Window has come. The price is getting first and second. The price is getting first and second. First and second. Or in the way, have to choose which one. I will choose for metformin, DP4 and GLP2. You will choose that one. Okay, Arundhati, what one will you choose? Depending on the BMI and the other comorbidities. I'll decide on that. Okay, very good. Well, Dr. Mandal, sir, what would you choose? Yes, I, I, I'll go for this uh, metformin, DPP4, and SGLT training. Okay. Friends, thank you very much. Sir, people are still hesitant to use pyoglitazone. <laughs> I'll tell you why they're hesitant to use. Despite, despite listening to deep down, so, People are still to use but, but you see that, you know, the pyogrithone is gaining more and more important. I know the, we have latest the, the, listened to the latest cell uh, of the pyogrithone. I'll, I'll just give an example. You know, the still sulfonuria metformin and number one, number one drug. The DPP-4 has shown a 10 to 20, that is 100% rise. SGLT-2 has shown from 7 to 21. 300% rise, rising very fast, SGLT2. Now, coming to pyogritazone, which was almost in the same, just invisible line, has shown itself about uh, 150 to 200% rise. So, yeah. it's slowly rising. The only other drawback is that we are not, not, not promoting 7.5. Many combinations are promoting only 15. 15. So, there is one caveat in that because, you know, we are still holding on to total dose of pyogritazone. So, there are a few issues you are going to address and uh, we'll see how it is. About imiglibin, Anil, please excuse me. What is your experience of their efficacy, glycemic efficacy? Same yeah, as I, I have just put 10 patients on imiglibin. I need to get data after about two months. Same. Let same. Us... But, sir, but, uh, my take home is, sir, my take home is actually if someone is going to spend 50, 40, 50 rupees with imiglinin and will leave SGLD2 or all those three no, drugs, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. disaster. No, imiglinin is an add on drug. Add on no, drug. I know, that's what I'm telling you. Cost, actually... cost is, cost is no, only 18 no, rupees no, per no, day. No, no, cost only 18 rupees per day for your kind information. How much? You know, 18. Z uh, imi imiglin of Zydus is costing 8 rupees 80 pesa. Deal, Anil, one minute. Anil, what happened? Glycemic efficacy is not that strong. We we had we had uh, not that agree. I think Mandel, Mandel sir, I agree with you. Uh, the, we had written to the uh, DCGI that this 500 tablet won't do. Make 1000 milligram tablet twice daily. Then no. that is daily. Then My this is a placebo. One minute. They say the cost will go very high. Then in the thing, we had Jidus, Jidus. So they reduced the price immediately to seven rupees. And uh, that is for the 500, I think nine rupees. So the, what you say is correct. But uh, but we have to see, you know, a new drug, yeah, we, we, take, uh, we take it. time to adapt. We take time to adapt. I have not used okay. it. How will we know? Can I ask one question to Professor Das? That what do you think about uh, this reason for this under prescription of pyoglitazone? In spite of you know that there is a very is a very good glucose you know, lowering uh, agent. Durability uh, is very good. Is very good. The wonderful drug. Hmm. I use it regularly. You have to little cost us about three things. Hmm. Number one about the weight gain, heart failure, heart problem. No. And also look whether the person is getting a little bit of pedal edema. 
then you can leave that little bit of pedal anima less than grade one i don't bother if it's grade one grade two i bother it is a wonderful drug i have written about pyrotazone and habit you, you write h a b i t habit you you take out h a b it remains take out b it remains so by habit from that year when it went into disreputation our minds are not yet free that it side effect pharmacopia intelligence of india and world pharmacopia intelligence has said it is quite safe and people are using it live trip and center so i think in years to come in months to come in days to come you will find a significant difference with the and the control is superb the glycemic efficacy not on the first day not the second day third day onwards is great am i correct uh, arunjati it takes three days to control so it is it is biotrazon takes almost it's two weeks, weeks. after four to, to six three weeks, weeks. Six weeks. They were referring to that. It takes time. So therefore, you know, it is a. If there is no mass trial, it is a wonderful pro-cardiac drug. That was proactive trial showed lot of benefits we have with that drug. But I think you know, it will it will re-establish itself in a very short time. And the time is coming, uh, Anil ji, when people will take to triple drug combination or even fourth drug combination. in the initial treatment for at least for few months to to reap the consequences for entire life so i strongly believe in that and uh, i think uh, the practices are changing i'm very happy to note that dpp4 and hglt2 200% 300% rights the reason is the it has come come very affordable but that is not the only reason there's lot of education lot of programs people realize doctors realize and you know i don't know about tier 2 tier 3 cities they are the commonly used drug today so dear friends uh, it's great to have you here i understand it's little late and there's a festival day i offer on behalf of nu city uh, great thanks to all of you and uh, thanks a very simple word i must tell you that i must tell you that uh, i really sincerely appreciate your your participation in it you take any speciality there is no reason now the festival is continuously going on hockey world cup Yeah, yeah. It whether it is whether it is uh, it is hypertension. We we'll take it ophthalmology. Take it skin. The diabetes is the happening place. Is the happening place. You know, while we are discussing it now, something else diabetes is happening somewhere in Delhi. You know, there is something else happening. Moon is speaking somewhere. Somebody. So I personally believe that has driven the diabetes care, diabetes academics, and 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 diabetes therapy to a higher level. With that note, uh, I thank uh, Anil. I thank uh, uh, Professor Pishidas and Dr. Rautre. I thank the three eminent speakers, uh, Dr. Mandal, Dr. Arundhati, and 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 Ave for their great lectures. I really enjoyed throughout the meeting their great lecture. Thank you very much. I request to stay for one minute. Alok, are you there? Alok. Yes, sir. Have... Alok sir is there. Alok. Alok sir is there. Yes. Sir, unmute I... yourself. Alok, unmute yourself. Yes. Let us be here for one to say. Yes, sir. We had one. Yes, yes. I have unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I'm, sir. Start, start speaking. So, Professor Das, our dear friend, Doctor Birmani, Arundhati, Abhay, Professor Joint Panda. संबित दास देवाशीष दास डॉक्टर मंडल भारत पानीग्राही डॉक्टर मंडल ऑन द स्टेज एंड ऑल द मेंबर्स ऑफ साइंटिफिक कमिटी दोज हु हैव रियली वर्कड हार्ड टू मेक दिस एडिशन पॉसिबली द बेस्ट एडिशन इन एन यूसीडी हिस्ट्री वेयर साइंस टुक प्ले टुक ओवर एवरीथिंग एंड आई हैव नेवर सीन such interest of faculty members and delegates to stick to science and practical utility in clinical medicine so this was a wonderful show it was a team effort and uh, professor ashok das has never taken his dinner before 11:30 when we conduct the scientific meetings we start at 10 and uh, bhauja gives him food and uh, by 11:30 we complete so this is excellent and i thank everybody all delegates and mind can you please uh, 
um, share the screen of our sponsors. <coughs> Mayank, can you kindly share the screen of our sponsors? Hello, Mayank, can you hear me? Uh, anyway, so yes, sir. this time, uh, Mayank, please share the sponsor screen. So, the the scientific uh, extra bonanza, this scientific event could only be possible with the help of our dear friends from the pharma industry. They are unconditional academic support. Even though it is a virtual meeting, they have done whatever they could. And I have never questioned any one of them, those who came voluntarily. And we have accepted everything as a gift. So my first uh, thanks goes to US Vitamins. Mike, can we see the screen? Hello. Mike? Yes, sir. Please uh, allow me one minute. OK, OK. So US Vitamin, uh, Madam Farida and her team, they are a part of a new CD. They treat as if a new CD is their conference, connecting to doctors, connecting to faculties, spreading the message, and everything that we need help. Today morning, Professor Samal wanted somebody to come with a laptop, and he will, yesterday morning, and he will give the inaugural speech. Somebody from USB came and supported, Professor Niranjan Tripathi like that. So my, <clears throat> I'm really grateful to USB team for their unconditional support. Same thing with Sanofi, the talk that all of you are giving now, it is uh, sponsored by them. Novo Nordics has been always a partner to us. Glenmark, with their increased presence in the field of oral drugs and gliptins and everything, they were also supporting us. Danone, the protein company for the first time supported us. Along with Dr. Reddy's, they are also protein companies for us. Wakad, Biocon Biologics, had a talk yesterday. Jarun Pharmaceutical, Mr. Umakan Nayak and his team, they were really very helpful. Boringer Ingleham, Rutunjoy and their team, Medley, Rishi and their team, Mankind, everybody, from the mankind like uh, Prabhas and others, Alkem, Abbott, and all of them really helped us. So my unconditional thanks to all the partners, those who made this possible. Professor Das, I kindly invite Jayant to speak a few lines. Jayant, Jayant, are you there? Jayant, Jayant, are you there? Yeah. I, think, I think we should make it brief now. Because, ha, huh. Jayant, if you're there, uh, please speak for about a couple of minutes. I if, think he's not there. Uh, we, we have away, away, away. One minute. Can you speak? One minute. Away. Sir, is you. sir as usual, a bit brief uh, like this. Kanungo, uh, sir, usually plan this thing six months back. Every time, every monthly, we have a discussion. What will be the plan? What are the new things we'll do? What are the new um, ideas we'll incorporate every times, every year's um, NUCD? And uh, this year, the scientific agenda was uh, mesmerizing, and uh, all the stalwarts from different parts, everybody participated, and all... uh, everybody the uh, talks are all are brilliant talks this year. Thank you, thank you. I I think uh, uh, Alok uh, Ave. My dear friend, Dr. Mandel, Dr. All of you present here today, it's my great uh, pleasure and honor to say that uh, we started this journey nine years back. This has been a journey of diabetes academics and has made a dent in the country's uh, 
diabetes education program. Believe me, the amount of feedback we have from various parts of the country, somebody has said it is one of the best national programs, program at the national level. Very, very encouraging, encouraging program. We have resolved to book out, bring out a small booklet, at least with the major points that has been discussed here and the presentations with the permission of the presenters. We have also resolved that we should make some sort of a uh, email uh, entry to a uh, email communication to all the people who have attended this meeting and so that we can send them reminders, not reminders, send them literatures and all that. We'll start it from the kids, uh, Dr. Karungo's Karungo uh, Institute of Diabetes. And we have taken resolution. But I will say the last word that a good beginning was made nine years back. All the nine years, we have well continuation. But you know, there are only two ways along a mountain. You have to either go up, otherwise you'll come down. We resolve to go up. And we resolve to make it better and better. And this program will continue for eternity. There is no end and endless progression for any city. Thank you very much. We'll meet next year. And Thank you. Yes. Hello. Uh, the, the last but not the least, this technical uh, high uh, drama could be only possible by a thoughtful preparation of the format by Saurav Tripathi, yes. my son, and he has done it yes. and he's still following it by Hardik Chandrana and his team, my yes. aunt particularly, doing the all hard work and Sanjay Swai for uploading the program. And for your information, whole NUCD 9th edition will be available at NUCD.in in YouTube for years to come. You can also see last two years in the YouTube. So dear friends, thank you very much for everything that you have joined with a special thanks to Professor Asok Das. I think most important are the people who have joined for this program because you are, we are here. So we thank you profusely the thousands of logging in. We thank the entire, entire people who have joined us. Thank you very much for reposing faith in us and joining us. Thanks to all faculty, all chair. We had 91 faculty and we had uh, for everybody. And it will be incomplete. Please, please it will be incomplete if you don't thank Priyadarshini. Yeah. Priyadarshini, uh, my executive assistant, yeah, yeah. untiringly has worked for the conference in, and she was the contact point. Thank you, Priyadarshini, for everything. All the communications to us, to the speakers, to the to the chairpersons, she was the main person. Priyadarshini, thank you very much. She will join from her house virtually in all the meetings that we held. And, you know, absolutely fabulous service, Priyadarshini. Dear friends, thank you very much and see you much before the 10th NUCD, but 10th NUCD will try to make it with, 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 with Alok's resolution up to and beyond your expectation. Thank you. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Joint is there. Joint has come. Uh, one second. Mayank, Joint has come. It will be incomplete if he doesn't speak. Yes, Mayank, sir. please on. On the session. Joint, few lines. Yes. Joint. Actually, sir, uh, I had an exigency. Uh, Honorable Governor of uh, Andhra Pradesh came, so formally I had to receive him uh, in the Kotak Club. <laughs> it, it, it's a uh, pleasure that uh, NGD reached uh, so successful forms in the uh, content of academics and the uh, uh, rolling out the uh, plan and the plan good with the committee. It uh, went very well. So I congratulate the whole team. And uh, in future days, it will be still mature and uh, full of science and will be adored internationally, I'm sure. So uh, I'm proud to be a member of the team and looking forward to uh, further 
uh, escalation in the scientific and the administrative growth. I thank Dr. Kanongo, uh, Professor Das, and the whole team, scientific team for the program. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Let us close. Sir, sir. Abha. Ito, I'm mute. Everybody has told. Everybody yeah. has good told. Good night, sir. Good night. <laughs> good night. Good night. Sir, I'm out there. I'm going to do an analysis how to improve and how to go further. The analysis. Chintan Thank you. 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 Thank you.